ventilator. The ventilator is the breathing machine that goes to a patient. The tube goes into the patient's mouth, into the patient's lung, and inflates and deflates the lungs to help you breathe. If a patient's heart is not doing well, we put them on a cardiac bypass machine. This only affects the lungs and helps with the breathing. So now we need to bypass the lungs and this machine will purify the lungs and oxygenate the patient and give the patient oxygen while his lungs are healing. I have some tears and crying right now because I'm so tired. But I'm going to take a deep breath and keep going on. I think I just needed that a little let down. But now I'm going to continue on and powering through back into the unit to stay strong. Today is day five of a 13 hour shift week. I usually do three days a week. I'm up to five 13 hour shifts this week and I'm tired. So I'm about to change my scrubs to head home to see my babies. And our thanks to Elisa Sopo for that. And hopefully when she gets home, she gets big hugs from her entire family, everything that she needs, because she's going to wake up and do it again. Yeah, tomorrow. nice long rest. Get it while you can. Like you said, exhausted. Just the emotional toll that is taking on everybody. Again, cannot thank our healthcare workers enough right now. In today's quick hits, volunteers in Iowa, Cedar Rapids, uh, are using 3D printers to help workers on the front line. Since schools are closed, the school district there is now using all of their 3D printers to create face guards. So far, they've created thousands of guards for doctors and patients to use. Krispy Kreme is offering a sweet thank you to healthcare workers. On Mondays, anyone in the medical industry can get up to five dozen original glazed donuts for free. The offer starts today and will last every Monday until May 11th. And while many are binge watching shows during the lockdown, Netflix Tiger King is now TV's most popular, according to Rotten Tomatoes. It has a 97% critics rating and 96% audience scoring. And I tell you what, once you let Joe Exotic enter your world, <laughs> your life will be changed forever. One way or another, it is a fascinating show to say the least. All right. Stocks, they have been on a roller coaster over the past month and, and today it looks no differently to start the week, but there is a silver lining for consumers. Let's get over to CNBC's Karen Cho, who's live in London for us with a preview of the markets and news on prices at the pump. Uh, hi, Karen. Good morning. Philip and Francis, thank you very much. We are setting up for another volatile session and a volatile week. Futures trading higher initially, now moving south for the Dow. As you take a look at the early morning action on Wall Street, now investors last week pushed up the Dow 12% over the course of the week. Its biggest weekly gain since 1938 as investors responded to fiscal stimulus, open-ended asset purchases from the Fed, also the president signing into law two $2 trillion stimulus package. But the president also shuffled out his date when he expects business to return to normal from about mid-April to about the 30th of April now. And remember, the longer the lockdown, the longer the stricter measures take place, the bigger the economic hit. So investors will weigh that this week, along with the more jobs numbers coming out from the private sector, also the payrolls report. And don't forget, of course, uh, investors looking very much towards the oil price slump. We've seen WTI below $20 and Brent prices touching 23 That is the lowest we've seen since 2002. That drop will have an impact on the stock market. We continue to see the Saudis wage that price war with the Russians and they say they're not in talks to end it any time soon. So uh, I'll send it back to you on that note. Expect some more wild swings on Wall Street. Karen Cho joining us uh, with the very latest on what's going on with our money. Karen, thank you. Hi everyone, we're doing the best to flatten this curve and we're seeing the rate of every two days it be expanded to now every three days. So this chart continues to go on, go on the upward spiral, but look at the percentage compared to last Tuesday, we were at 30.8% now at 16.8. So a little bit of progress, gonna watch the consistency for at least the next five to seven days. Workers at a major grocery delivery service are threatening to strike. Employees at Instacart are fighting for better working conditions as they deliver food to millions of Americans during the pandemic. Sam Brock has the story. 
As many as 200,000 Instacart workers could instantly be off the front lines. A lot of us are really literally making the decision between, you know, our health and our financial security right now. They're demanding hazard pay and better safety gear or they'll strike no longer shopping for and delivering your groceries. Instacart telling employees through blog post, we're immensely grateful for all that you do to support families and people in need. They're offering more than a month of pay for anyone diagnosed with COVID-19 and one-time bonuses. The anxiety also being felt at traditional grocers. Is it scary at all to go to work right now? I don't sleep much because I'm scared of what I will bring home to my children. Candace Oglesby lives in North Texas. Her son is immunocompromised. The cashier says she's in contact with people all day long and wants her national grocery employer, who she's not identifying, to acknowledge that and pay. They're putting their life and they're putting their safety and their health on the line. Many of America's largest grocery stores have ramped up pay and protections, from temporary salary hikes to bonuses. And across the board, companies are putting up plexiglass at registers, installing social distancing reminders, and cleaning stores round the clock. Grocers in particular are at a higher risk, not as high a risk as, say, a healthcare worker, but they are at a higher risk than the general public. If you're worried about your safety when shopping, Anytime you use any surface that people touch a lot, like card handles, for example, make sure you wipe it down with a disinfectant wipe, wear gloves, or you can also use a cloth as a barrier if you need to. Once you get inside the supermarket, stand at least six feet away from everybody else and do not touch your face. Now, once you get home, you got all these bags, wipe off every surface they touch, and for anything that comes inside of a box, take the contents out and wipe that off too. As shelves remain stocked, the people making sure they stay that way deemed essential employees by only a few states, opening up access to emergency child care and testing. I would give anything to be able to test myself right now. Sam Brock, NBC News, Miami. I would think those Instacart workers would have more leverage than ever mm -hmm. right now. I don't think the yeah, delivery service has never been in higher demand. We all need them. All right. So if you want to spread a message, one way to do it is on the side of a mountain. An artist in Switzerland used the side of the Matterhorn as his canvas. The mountain, which borders Italy, was lit up with words like hope and stay home. It also had an image of a heart. All of this to show support for everyone battling this pandemic. It looks like just computer graphics right there, but very much the real deal. Sure is. Yeah. Thank you for watching early today on this Monday. I'm Philip Mena. And I'm Francis Rivera. Stay healthy, stay safe. We'll see you back here tomorrow. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. This is all I've got left. Good afternoon from the spin room. It's news made for your streaming world. NBC News Now. President Trump extends social distancing guidelines through the month of April as the number of confirmed cases of coronavirus fast approaches 150,000 in the United States alone. As cases surge across the nation, more steps are being taken to screen travelers from going from state to state to stem the spread. And with so many health care workers fighting the war on the front lines, a message of hope and thanks from those giving back. I would like people to note that there's hope and there's something that we can all do. A lesson on how to say thanks. It's Monday and early today starts right now. Good to have you with us this morning. I'm Francis Rivera. And I'm Philip Mena. As millions of Americans continue to hunker down in their homes, President Trump extends social distancing for another month. Here's what you need to know at this hour. The spread of the coronavirus is fast and furious. This country now has the most number of cases worldwide, topping 142,000, surpassing China and Italy. The number of fatalities has now surpassed 2,000. And things could get much worse. The nation's top infectious disease expert, Dr. Anthony Fauci, estimates that coronavirus could kill up to 200,000 Americans, adding that the country could see millions of cases. Meanwhile, two major health insurers are waiving the cost of coronavirus treatments. Cigna and Humana will cover payments for insured members. It'll include things like treatment, hospitalizations, and ambulance transfers. As cases surge in New York, an emergency field hospital will go up in Central Park. Crews are setting up right now that site. It's along 5th Avenue and 99th Streets. Patients from Mount Sinai will be treated there. It's expected to be up and running by tomorrow. 
And after canceling the Detroit Auto Show, FEMA will be using that venue as a makeshift hospital. Michigan is becoming one of the epicenters of this virus with more than 5,000 cases. Tickets for the show will be refunded. And in the Hawkeye State, volunteers are using 3D printers to help workers on the front lines. Since schools are closed, the district is now using all of their 3D printers to create face guards. So far, they've created thousands of guards for doctors and patients to use. And here to keep you entertained during self-isolation is the HQ Trivia. It abruptly went out of business last month, but the mobile quiz app is back online thanks to an anonymous donor. Talk about a win-win situation here. You can foster a dog and get free beer in the process. Bush is offering a free three-month supply of beer for anyone who fosters or adopts a dog from Midwest Animal Rescue in Minnesota. And live from your living room, it's the Backstreet Boys. They reunited from five different locations to perform I Want It That Way. It was all for iHeartRadio's Living Room Concert for America. They were just one of the performers for the Benefit Concert that was hosted by Elton John. President Trump is abandoning hopes of restarting the economy by Easter after that dire new prediction from his top infectious disease expert. Dr. Anthony Fauci said yesterday the U.S. could see more than 100,000 deaths from coronavirus. Well, just hours later, the president announced that he is extending the federal social distancing guidelines. If we can hold that down, as we're saying to 100,000, it's a horrible number. Maybe even less, but to 100,000. So we have between 100 and 200,000. We all together have done a very good job. The better you do, the faster this whole nightmare will end. Therefore, we will be extending our guidelines to April 30th to slow the spread. The president said he hopes the country will be on the road to recovery by June 1st. NBC's Kathy Park has more. Francis Philip, good morning. The coronavirus crisis is intensifying across the country, and President Trump extended the social distancing guidelines until the end of April. Meantime, here in New York, it's still considered the epicenter of the U.S. outbreak as the death toll approaches 1,000. As the coronavirus continues its deadly march across the country, this warning for Americans. Looking at what we're seeing now, you know, I would say between 100 and 200,000 cases, excuse me, deaths. I mean, we're going to have millions of cases, but I I just don't think that we really need to make a projection when it's such a moving target. What we do know, Jake, is that we got a serious Mm -hmm. problem in New York. We have a serious problem in New Orleans, and we're going to be developing serious problems in other areas. This after the CDC issued a late Saturday travel advisory for New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut residents, telling them to refrain from non-essential domestic travel for two weeks. The notice creating confusion after President Trump first weighed the possibility of a short-term quarantine in those states, but later backed away from the idea. Governors were given full discretion over the new rollout and said the advisory is already in practice. It's totally consistent with everything we're doing. That's something that, uh, as I say, it's de facto happening already. We're uh, discouraging people from traveling uh, and making sure they stay as home as much as possible. With at least 59,000 positive cases and approximately 42 percent of coronavirus deaths in the U.S. centered in New York, Governor Andrew Cuomo extended the stay-at-home order through April 15th, stretching into major holidays like Easter and Passover. The state is trying to get ahead of the outbreak's peak, mobilizing a temporary hospital at this Manhattan Convention Center and awaiting the arrival of the U.S. naval ship that will provide extra beds for non-COVID-19 cases. And even more help is on the way. The president announcing that a flight arrived at JFK with millions of critical medical supplies for health care workers stretched thin. And after pressure from New York's governor, the governor of Rhode Island repealed the executive order that had police and National Guard members knocking on doors and checking cars for visiting New Yorkers, telling them they must self-quarantine for 14 days. And behind me is the Javits Center, which has been transformed into a temporary hospital with 1,000 beds. And over at Central Park, there is an emergency field hospital also in the works. Triage tents were going up this weekend, and it should be operational on Tuesday. Guys, back to you. All right, that's Kathy Park reporting. Thanks, Kathy. 
With nearly 60,000 confirmed cases, New York is a major hotspot for the virus. But officials are warning that the worst is yet to come for America's cities. Some states have even started screening people trying to drive across state lines, we just saw. Here with more is NBC's Aaron McLaughlin. As the spread of COVID-19 accelerates a warning. All corners of the country are at risk and America's cities vulnerable. Every metro area should assume that they could have an outbreak equivalent to New York. Sunday, new disaster declarations in Connecticut, Oregon, Georgia, and a disaster request from Pennsylvania, where confirmed cases spiked by more than 20 percent. Please stay calm, stay home, and stay safe. In Louisiana, there's worry. They're days away from potential catastrophe. We're on a trajectory currently to exceed our capacity in the New Orleans area for ventilators by about April the 4th. But there's also defiance. Despite an order banning gatherings larger than 50, Pastor Tony Spell refuses to cancel Sunday service, attended by hundreds. The church, again, is not a non-essential, okay? The church is the most essential thing in all the world. While some shrug off the threat, states are taking extraordinary measures to slow the virus spread. Our huge concern is that if people start to travel south, then we are going to have um, a huge uprise in our cases. In Florida, they're expanding checkpoints at major interstates, screening motorists coming from COVID hotspots, including New York and Louisiana. In North Carolina, the Outer Banks now require an entry permit, while states see a surge of cases, including Michigan. Detroit's now home to the third largest outbreak behind New York and Chicago. Here, too, there's a concern about resources. The scarcity of resources is not something I thought I would ever have to face in this country, and I know that in my state it's already happening. Similar worry in California, where there's more than 5,000 confirmed cases. This weekend, the number in critical care doubled to more than 400. And across the country, convention centers now turned makeshift hospitals. Our thanks to Aaron for that report. The world continues to be ravaged by the deadly coronavirus that is quickly spreading from continent to continent. Global cases have now surpassed 720,000, with the United States leading, while hard-hit Europe continues to struggle with a mounting death toll. As cases rise, it's forcing more countries to enforce even stricter lockdowns. Meanwhile, in Asia, the former epicenter of the virus is slowly emerging from the lockdown. For the latest, we turn to NBC's Ali Ruzi, live in London. Ali, good morning. Apologies for that. It is we have a problem there with Elia Ruzzi's audio. And most of the nation right now may be under self-isolation and travel advisories due to the coronavirus outbreak. So Hollywood is taking the party to living rooms via the Internet. Hottest artists like Alicia Keys, you saw Backstreet Boys there, Billie Eilish, there's Mariah Carey, much more. They all performed from their own living rooms. It's a part of the coronavirus benefit concert held by iHeartRadio and Fox, and the event was hosted by that man there, Elton John. Reportedly has raised over a million dollars so far. Many people across the South and Midwest are also facing life-threatening tornadoes. The hardest hit area is Jonesboro, Arkansas, where the city took a direct hit. Highway cameras capture the path of destruction. More than 20 people were hurt. The city's mayor said that the shelter-in-place order over the coronavirus likely helped save lives in the situation as well. well let's see uh, how this last Monday in March is going to shake out. Janessa Webb, good morning. Good morning. You know, we had a direct hit on the mall in Jonesboro, Arkansas. If people would have been at work, we could have seen many lives lost, no lives lost in that area. But we are still seeing the injuries and they're picking up the pieces. And the severe weather threat continues to be heightened across the deep south all the way into the southeast going into your Tuesday afternoon. I do think the south from Baton Rouge uh, to central Texas, this will be expanded throughout the afternoon. Potentially could see another one to two inches of rain. The torrential rain going to run through the Mississippi Valley all the way into the Tennessee Valley as well. This will be continuous until Wednesday afternoon. That's a look at the big weather story of the day. Here's a closer look at your day ahead.
So some of that rain making its way across uh, the northeast as well this afternoon. Daytime highs, they are going to start to uh, climb down. We're in the mid-40s across uh, central Texas into the south. Highs back in the 80s. So severe weather, it continues for the deep south, but a quiet weather pattern is coming. All right. Thanks, Janessa. Mm -hmm. A 93-year-old woman got some sweet news from her granddaughter after weeks of being apart in quarantine. It's a boy. I just had a feeling. <laughs> you have a rat hole. Oh, yes, I did. <laughs> How did you know? I just had a feeling. Like a picture. That's the way to spread the good news. The couple traveled from Illinois to Ohio to surprise her with the announcement. But Grandma says she already had a feeling, and Grandma's no, so mm -hmm. something to look forward to. Yeah, it sure is. A happy, hopeful moment. Yes. Hopefully that baby boy is born in safer times mm -hmm. a few months down the road. The world continues to be ravaged by the deadly coronavirus that is quickly spreading from continent to continent. Global cases have now surpassed 720,000, with the U.S. leading, while hard hit Europe continues to struggle with a mounting death toll. As cases rise, it is forcing more countries to enforce even stricter lockdowns. Meanwhile, in Asia, the former epicenter of the virus is slowly emerging from lockdown. For the latest, we turn now to NBC's Ali Ruzi, who's live in London. Ali, good morning. Good morning, Francis. That's right, a staggering 723,000 cases worldwide and 34,000 deaths. Almost every corner of the world has been affected, and it won't be long, Francis, till we pass a million cases. In Italy, the number of daily deaths fell slightly from 889 to 756, but the overall death toll, still the largest in the world, keeps rising. Now over a startling 10,800 people have died there. Uh, and with over 97,000 cases, cemeteries are overflowing, forcing churches to store the dead as they wait cremation, while families aren't even allowed to attend funerals, uh, leaving the dead with very little dignity. Italy has also deployed helicopters as an eye in the sky to sort of enforce these locks down for people that aren't, uh, aren't abiding by them. And the situation in Spain, Francis, isn't much better, with almost 7,000 deaths there and a very strict lockdown in space in, in, in place. Spain and Italy alone account for more than half of the world's death toll. Francis? The news that we're getting used to hearing by the day. Thank you, Ali Ruzi, for us. Well, some residents in Maine tried to force some out-of-towners into quarantine by chopping down a tree and using it to block their driveway. It happened in the town of Vinyl Haven. A man told police that armed neighbors chopped down a tree to barricade the driveway because he thought he had coronavirus. When police arrived, the group had gone. The three roommates from New Jersey rented a house while they were finishing construction. The coronavirus outbreak is having a major impact on gasoline prices at the pump. The average retail price per gallon in the U.S., has dropped nearly 23 cents in the past two weeks to $2.15. That's more than 50 cents lower than this time a year ago. Over the past five weeks, the price has fallen over 37 cents. And according to analysts, gas may fall 50 cents more in the near future. Among the coronavirus deaths we learned about Sunday, country music superstar Joe Diffie died of complications due to the virus. Diffie became well-known in the 90s with several number one singles. Among his popular tunes here, the most popular ones, Prop Me Up Beside the Jukebox and John Deere Green. The Grammy winner was born and raised in Oklahoma. Joe Diffie was 61 years old. Meanwhile, we've also learned that Grammy-winning singer-songwriter John Prine has been hospitalized for COVID-19-type symptoms. Prine's family says he is critically ill and has been placed on a ventilator. Workers at a New York Amazon warehouse are planning to walk out this morning. Employees plan to strike at a Staten Island location after a co-worker tested positive for COVID-19. An Amazon spokesperson tells NBC News that they are following all guidelines from local health officials and taking extreme measures to protect their staff. The workers want that facility shut down and cleaned. That location has about 4,500 employees. For the latest coronavirus news anytime, go to our live blog at NBCNews.com slash coronavirus. 
The nation is mourning the loss of a civil rights leader today. Reverend Joseph Lowry has died. His fight for justice began in Alabama during widespread unrest. And Reverend Lowry was known as the dean of the civil rights movement for his work alongside Martin Luther King Jr. He was also the founder of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Lowry delivered the benediction for President Obama's inauguration in 2009, and he was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom later that year. Reverend Dr. Joseph Lowry was 98 years old. everyone we're doing all we can to flatten this curve a positive spin now and for the implied growth rate we were seeing a rate of every 3.5 days now it's, it's longer in some areas you can see the expansion of the growth of, of the coronavirus 16.6 so we're down dramatically about 20 percent Heroes on the front lines are risking their lives around the clock taking care of the sick. And now so many people in communities all across the country are stepping up to help them cope. NBC's Steve Patterson reports. From coast to coast, applause for today's heroes. Now, Americans are creating new ways to help our nation's health care workers and first responders. I would like people to know that there's hope and there's something that we can all do. In New Orleans, Devin DeWolf is mobilizing relief for the front lines by organizing food deliveries. Inspired by the fight in his wife, Annalise, an ER doctor. What is that moment like to, to just get a little bit of relief? To step into that break room and have the door close, everybody wash their hands and take some food is really healing. The effort feeding 12 area hospitals. I think it's just, you know, a way that everybody can get involved and do something and um, show some solidarity right now. An aid mission spreading across the country. In New York, Island Auto Group is lending cars to first responders so they don't have to take public transportation. It was very scary. You know, I get infected or uh, my brothers and sisters I work with get infected. In Missouri, a Joplin pharmacy started making and delivering its own hand sanitizer. The idea was to help people that are serving other people in this situation. We want to help them stay safe, stay healthy. In Texas, a Dallas hotel is offering rooms to local first responders for free. Let's help out these first responders who are, you know, on the front line trying to save us and trying to get this epidemic, I guess we call it, over with. And at Elmhurst Hospital in New York, one of the hardest hit in the nation, a simple sign saying thank you, summing up the sentiments of Americans everywhere, grateful to those risking their own lives to save others. Steve Patterson, NBC News. Seems like we're hearing more and more about that each day, all the efforts out there to help those, the helpers who are keeping people alive. Yeah, I've been clicking on it, um, you know, since we're just at home and on social media and clicking on all the videos of people all over the world giving uh, standing ovations and mm -hmm. just giving that well-deserved recognition to all those uh, first responders and all those healthcare workers that are you know, risking their lives every day for that's us. That's what we can do, just click and especially all the GoFundMes, yeah. people with the meals and just everything else they could do yeah. right there. All right, when an 87-year-old woman found herself quarantined and without food in the house, our Rhode Island Police Department went grocery shopping for her. Warwick PD responded to the woman's call and went to the woman's house for a grocery list. Thankfully, an officer was able to get everything on the list for her. And there we go, another example of that right there. Yeah, we're seeing uh, signs all over the city. If you need help, if you need some groceries for the elderly, let us know, and the number's right there. Everybody coming together, do what we can when we can. We thank you for waking up with us on this Monday. I'm Francis Rivera. And I'm Philip Mana. Stay safe out there. We'll see you back here tomorrow morning. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. This is all I've got left. Good afternoon from the spin It's room. news made for your streaming world. NBC News Now. New York State has surpassed 1,000 deaths from the coronavirus as a field hospital is being built in Central Park while area hospitals are pushed to the limit. States ramping up travel advisories as others are watching and learning from New York's rapid explosion of coronavirus cases. And the incredible story of how a newspaper delivery man's simple act of kindness towards a neighbor has snowballed into so much more. Early today starts right now. Glad you're with us to start off this week. I'm Francis Rivera. And I'm Philip Mena. The stark reality of the coronavirus pandemic is coming into focus here in America. The White House has now extended its social distancing guidelines at least until April 30th. 
President Trump says he believes Easter will mark the peak number in the United States. In New York City, the number of confirmed cases has soared to nearly 60,000. A field hospital is being constructed in Central Park. It'll be able to accommodate 68 patients and will have 10 ventilators for the most seriously ill. The U.S. Naval Hospital ship Comfort is expected to arrive in New York Harbor today. About 1,000 beds will be available to people who do not have COVID-19, and that'll free up some spaces in hospitals battling the pandemic. Volunteers in Iowa are doing their part to keep our health care workers protected. The Cedar Rapids School District reallocated all of their 3D printers so volunteers could make thousands of face masks. And as more people stay at home and order food and supplies, there are growing concerns about the safety of the people filling those orders. After an Amazon employee tested positive, employees at a Staten Island warehouse are threatening to walk out today. They want the facility shut down and cleaned. And some Instacart workers are also threatening to strike today unless the company improves its coronavirus response. Meanwhile, two major health insurers are waiving the cost of coronavirus treatments. Cigna and Humana will waive co-payments for insured members. This will cover treatment, hospitalizations, and ambulance transfers. And Krispy Kreme is offering a sweet thank you to health care workers. On Mondays, anyone in the medical industry can get up to five dozen original glazed donuts for free. The offer starts today and lasts every Monday until May 11th. President Trump is abandoning hopes of restarting the economy by Easter after that dire new prediction from his top infectious disease expert. Dr. Anthony Fauci said yesterday the U.S. could see more than 100,000 deaths from coronavirus. Our Capitol Hill correspondent, Tracy Potts, joining us now with more. Uh, Tracy, good morning. So the president is extending the social distancing guidelines for at least another month. Exactly. So now he says that uh, people across America should be social distancing until April 30th, until the end of next month. Remember, the president had said that he wanted uh, the economy going again, people out and about, businesses working by Easter. But the latest projections don't seem to support that. In fact, those latest projections show that millions of Americans will end up infected with this virus. And as many as 200,000, maybe less, but as many as 200,000 uh, could die as a result of that. If we could hold that down, as we're saying, to 100,000, it's a horrible number. Maybe even less, but to 100,000. So we have between 100 and 200,000. Uh, we all together have done a very good job. The better you do, the faster this whole nightmare will end. Therefore, we will be extending our guidelines to April 30th to slow the spread. The president also taking some heat from governors across the country, uh, specifically Democrats who say he's playing politics with doling out some of those supplies, masks and, and respirators, while the president accuses some states of hoarding the supplies. Philip? Joining us with uh, the very latest on the coronavirus here in the States. Tracy, thank you. And at the epicenter of the U.S. pandemic, New York Governor Andrew Cuomo is extending a stay-at-home order for at least two more weeks. The decision comes on the heels of a new travel advisory from the CDC, urging people in the tri-state area to refrain from all non-essential domestic travel. NBC's Kathy Park has the latest. Francis Philip, good morning. The coronavirus crisis is intensifying across the country, and President Trump extended the social distancing guidelines until the end of April. Meantime, here in New York, it's still considered the epicenter of the U.S. outbreak as the death toll approaches 1,000. As the coronavirus continues its deadly march across the country, this warning for Americans. Looking at what we're seeing now, you know, I would say between 100 and 200,000 cases, excuse me, deaths. I mean, we're going to have millions of cases, but I, I just don't think that we really need to make a projection when it's such a moving target. What we do know, Jake, is that we got a serious mm -hmm. problem in New York. We have a serious problem in New Orleans, and we're going to be developing serious problems in other areas. This after the CDC issued a late Saturday travel advisory for New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut residents, telling them to refrain from non-essential domestic travel for two weeks. The notice creating confusion after President Trump first weighed the possibility of a short-term quarantine in those states, but later backed away from the idea. Governors were given full discretion over the new rollout and said the advisory is already 
in practice. It's totally consistent with everything we're doing. That's something that, uh, as I say, it's de facto happening already. We're uh, discouraging people from traveling. Uh, and making sure they stay as home as much as possible. With at least 59,000 positive cases and approximately 42 percent of coronavirus deaths in the U.S. centered in New York, Today, Governor Andrew Cuomo extended the stay-at-home order through April 15th, stretching into major holidays like Easter and Passover. The state is trying to get ahead of the outbreak's peak, mobilizing a temporary hospital at this Manhattan Convention Center and awaiting the arrival of the U.S. naval ship that will provide extra beds for non-COVID-19 cases. And even more help is on the way. The president announcing that a flight arrived at JFK with millions of critical medical supplies for health care workers stretched thin. And after pressure from New York's governor, the governor of Rhode Island repealed the executive order that had police and National Guard members knocking on doors and checking cars for visiting New Yorkers, telling them they must self-quarantine for 14 days. And behind me is the Javits Center, which has been transformed into a temporary hospital with 1,000 beds. And over at Central Park, there is an emergency field hospital also in the works. Triage tents were going up this weekend, and it should be operational on Tuesday. Guys, back to you. All right. Thanks to Kathy Park for that report. As the virus spreads around the world, more countries are shutting borders and cutting travel to and from in an effort to curb infection rates. But these measures have left some Americans trapped in other countries, struggling to find a way back home. Here's NBC's Sarah Harmon. Tens of thousands of Americans are stranded overseas. In India, there's chaos as the government imposes a lockdown on more than a billion people, including Peter Joseph from San Diego. He's been stuck in his hostel for eight days. We feel completely not heard. Uh, We feel abandoned. On the other side of the world, Peru closing its borders, sending Americans scrambling to the airport. Yes, looking forward to going home. Green Bay Packers quarterback Aaron Rodgers describing his own harrowing escape in a radio interview. There was some moments where we were worried we were not going to get out. It was absolute pandemonium at the airport. Others weren't so lucky. Yesterday, the only meal we got was lunch. Zachary Mechstroth has been stuck in a youth hostel in Cusco for 13 days. You got a repatriation flight through the State Department, but you weren't allowed to leave the youth hostel. Correct. So... The hostel manager said that if I were to leave with that document, I would get arrested. The State Department saying we have no higher duty than to protect American citizens and have launched an unprecedented global effort to bring home our citizens from every corner of the globe. But not everyone can be rescued easily. Those on cruise ships stranded at sea, unwelcome in any harbor. The Zan Dam off the coast of Panama, carrying four dead and more than 100 sick, transferring its healthy passengers to another vessel, as stranded Americans around the world wonder when and how they'll ever get home. Sarah Harmon, NBC News. The coronavirus continues its global rampage with no signs of slowing down. Over 721,000 people have been infected worldwide and over 33,000 people have died. In Europe, the number of deaths in Italy is overwhelming, but Spain is quickly catching up. Meanwhile, in Asia, the former epicenter of the virus is still reporting new cases as it slowly emerges from lockdown. For the latest, we turn to NBC's Ellie Ruzzi, who's live in London. Ellie, good morning. Good morning, Francis. That's right, a staggering 723,000 people have been affected around the world with over 34,000 deaths. And almost every corner of the world has been affected by the coronavirus. And it won't be long till we surge past a million global numbers. Now, in Italy, the daily death rate fell slightly, but it still has the highest death rate in the world with over 10,800 people have died from the virus and 97,000 thousand cases. Cemeteries there are are overflowing. Uh, The dead are being stored in churches. Uh, Families are not allowed to attend funerals, robbing the dead of all of their dignity. Uh, In Italy, they've also deployed helicopters in the sky, sort of an eye in the sky to catch people out who are not abiding by the strict lockdowns that have been put in place. And the situation in Spain isn't much better either. That country has about 7,000 deaths 
deaths right now. It's also on a very strict lockdown. If you combine the death toll from Italy and Spain, that accounts for over half of the world's death toll. Uh, in the UK, the heir to the throne, the prime minister and the health minister have all tested positive for COVID-19. And a senior health official in this country says that lockdown and social distancing in this country may be extended until June. Uh, in, in the Vatican, somebody tested uh, positive for COVID-19 in the, in the pontiff's residence. Uh, his office say that he has been tested for the virus and has now um, tested negative for it, Francis. All right, Ali Ruzzi for us live in London. Ali, thank you for the update. Breaking news out of Arizona, where a po Phoenix police officer is dead and two more are injured after a shooting at a home. The Phoenix Police Department says Commander Greg Carnicle was shot and killed while responding to a domestic violence call late last night. He was a 31-year veteran just months away from retirement. The two injured officers are expected to survive. According to our Phoenix affiliate, the situation appears to be over and police are planning to give us an update at a press conference later this morning. The many people across the South and Midwest are also facing the added threat of tornadoes. The hardest hit area is in Jonesboro, Arkansas, where the city took a direct hit. Highway cameras captured the path of destruction. More than 20 people were hurt. The city's mayor says that the shelter-in-place order to prevent the spread of coronavirus likely helped save lives in this situation as well. Let's get the latest on that severe weather. It is Monday morning. Janessa Webb, good morning. Hey, good morning. Just getting word from the National Weather Service confirming an EF3 also an EF1 tornado across the Arkansas area. So two tornadoes touching down. The great news is that it was a direct hit on the mall. If people would have been out and about, we could have had a massive uh, loss of lives. So good news there, but we're also still watching the severe weather threat across the deep south. It will continue for the next uh, two days, unfortunately, with damaging winds, also a few tornadoes possible. Temperatures are very warm across the south. We're back into the mid 80s. Also, the torrential rain going to be an issue up to one to two inches. That's a look at the big weather story of the day. Here's a closer look at your day ahead. So that rain that we're seeing across the south, it starts to filter into the northeast as well. Temperatures cooling off. We're back in the mid 40s, but still very warm for at least the next three days across the deep south into the southeast. After we get over this severe weather hump, we are in a stretch of just quiet. Oh, that's nice. I like that. A little bit of calm in our madness. All right. In uh, today's headlines, animal shelters, they're struggling during this coronavirus pandemic. So to help, between now and April 25th, Bush is offering a three-month supply of beer for anyone who fosters or adopts a dog from Midwest Animal Rescue Services. New Balance is helping the effort to stock medical supplies. The Boston-based footwear company is working to develop and manufacture facial masks. The company says the mask will be produced at its New England factories. Netflix's Tiger King is now television's most popular, According to Rotten Tomatoes, it has a 97% critics rating, 96% audience score. Everyone, sing a tiger, tiger saw a man. Leading the news, New Yorkers who break the social distancing rules could be fined hundreds of dollars. Mayor Bill de Blasio has authorized people to ticket people who are told to disperse but fail to do so. The fines would range from $250 to $500. In case you missed it over the weekend, we have some stunning images from the Vatican. Pope Francis delivering his special Ruby and Orbi prayer, which means to the city and the world. St. Peter's Square completely empty as the pontiff prayed for an end to the COVID-19 pandemic. The blessing was broadcast out to the faithful via Facebook, YouTube, television and radio. Among the coronavirus deaths we learned about Sunday, country music superstar Joe Diffie died of complications due to the virus. Diffie became well known in the 1990s with several number one singles. Among his most popular tunes, Prop Me Up Beside the Jukebox and John Deere Green. The Grammy winner was born and raised in Oklahoma. Joe Diffie was 61 years old. Meanwhile, we also learned that Grammy-winning singer and songwriter John Prine has been hospitalized for COVID-19 type symptoms. Prine's family says he is critically ill and has been placed on a ventilator. 
Eight people are dead in the Philippines after a medevac plane exploded into a ball of flames during takeoff in Manila. Airport officials say the plane was carrying six Filipino crew members and two passengers, one American and one Canadian. The flight was headed to Tokyo and was reportedly carrying supplies on a medical mission. A desperate search for a missing girl in Alabama has been called off after police say they located the child after she disappeared for nearly two days. Officials say four-year-old Evelyn Vady Sides was reported missing on Wednesday afternoon after she went walking with her dog. Rescuers say they found the child and her dog safe, adding that she is in good shape and is responsive. Evelyn and her furry friend have since been reunited with her parents. Good morning, everyone. We're doing our best to flatten the curve, and we continue to watch the data of our, our implied growth rate. Now, a positive spin this morning, a rate of 2.5 days has increased to 3.5. So we're seeing kind of an expansion of uh, the bar graph and less people. This could mean less people are being tested, but from last Tuesday, look at the percentage. It is way down. We were at about 30.4, now at 16.6. So you're seeing the trend of this bar graph still going up. We're going to watch for still that consistency. That is really going to be key for at least the next three to five days. So we're just not seeing that yet, but, you know, our percentages, they are definitely down. Yeah, it looks like yeah. encouraging numbers, but we are far, far, far from, far from far. out of the woods here. So a couple more weeks, keep up the social distancing, and hopefully this will all be over very, very soon. All right. Keeping fingers crossed tight. We are back with the story about the good deeds by and for the hardworking people bringing us mail, packages, and newspapers. NBC's Kate Snow has the story. It all started when newspaper delivery man Greg Daly was grocery shopping and suddenly thought about an 88-year-old customer. You know, I thought to myself, well, if Mrs. Ross can't get the paper at her sidewalk, which is probably 20 feet, how is she getting groceries? He called her, and sure enough, she needed items. Five minutes later, I'm standing online to pay for the stuff that I, that I have, and she called me back. And she goes, Greg, would you mind grabbing something for Mrs. Miller across the street? That's when he started putting this note inside every newspaper he delivers, offering to pick up groceries or basically anything. You know, they're amazing people, and you know, if you get a chance to help them, you help them. It's very nice to meet you. <laughs> Sandy Driska and her husband are quarantined at home. Your godson. Oh, gosh, Greg. And you know, he's not even asking for money. He's doing this out of the kindness of his heart. All over the country, families are appreciating delivery people, leaving notes and goodie bags, snacks and cold drinks, even toilet paper. Can we take one of these? Yeah, absolutely. It's for you. Oh, uh, man, you, you are life saving. Thank you. In Phoenix, the Wilson family left hand sanitizer on their mailbox, thanking their mail carrier, Marco. Ann Diles, whose family's been delivering mail in Kentucky since the 1940s, wanted to help her mail carrier stay healthy, too. I think we should all take care of our mail carriers, so I think everybody should at least help them out a little bit. It feels good to help and to receive. Basically, it gives, you, it gives you a warm feeling, and it also gives you so much faith in humanity that really throughout this virus, we're all there to help one another, and we'll get through it. And our thanks to Kate Snow for that amazing story there. And I'm telling you, when it comes to just anything to help out humanity right about now, for the taking. Those yeah. delivery workers are really our lifeline right now. We're so yeah. grateful. You know how when you used to see uh, service members, you'd say thank you for your mm -hmm. service, and it's almost like these are our lifeline now, and we really appreciate people out there delivering the goods when we need them. It's the whole new world, and this is the positive side of it. Yeah. We love seeing. Sure is. All right, check out this principal here. Didn't let a little school closure keep her from giving some good news to a student. Take a look. I want to announce something to you today. Okay. You are GTA's 2020 class valedictorian. I am. You are. Oh my gosh, thank you so you much. Are. Principal Flooring surprised Caitlin Watson there right at the drive-thru with the honorary title and said that calling or video calling her just didn't feel good enough. So Caitlin just got the news that I'm valedictorian. I can yeah, quit now. No right? more ice cream cones. And to be able to have it on camera <laughs> for all cool. of us to see too with that video. Yeah. Great to be able to share. That's right. Congratulations, sir. Thanks for watching early today. I'm Philip Meta. And I'm Francis Rivera. Your news continues right here. Stay safe. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. This is all I've got left. Good afternoon from the spin It's room. news made for your streaming world. NBC News Now.
Over the weekend, the explosion of the coronavirus to all four corners of the nation spreading like a tsunami as the U.S. fast approaches 150,000 positive cases. This morning, we'll give you a revealing look at what one intensive care nurse faces in the midst of this pandemic. And workers at a major grocery delivery service are threatening to strike today, how it could impact your family. And we're following breaking news out of Arizona, where three police officers were ambushed. Early today starts right now. Good morning, I'm Philip Mena. And I'm Francis Rivera. As millions of Americans enter their 15th day on lockdown, President Trump extends the shutdown guidelines an additional month. Here's what you need to know at this hour. The spread of the coronavirus is fast and furious. This country now has the most number of cases worldwide, topping 142,000, surpassing China and Italy. The number of fatalities has now surpassed 2,000. In California, officials are preparing for surging cases as the numbers there top 6,000. Meanwhile, on the East Coast, a hospital ship is supposed to arrive in New York today. About 1,000 beds will be available to people who do not have COVID-19. That will help free up some space in hospitals overwhelmed by the pandemic. And two major health insurers are waiving the cost of coronavirus treatments. Cigna and Humana will cover payments for insured members. It will include things like treatment, hospitalizations, and ambulance transfers. And soccer star Cristiano Ronaldo and his Italian soccer teammates are giving up four months of wages to help curb the impact of the pandemic there. That's about $100 million. Ronaldo has also donated $1.1 million to help fight the virus in Portugal. After an Amazon employee tested positive, employees at a Staten Island warehouse are threatening to walk out today. They want the facility shut down and cleaned. And some Instacart workers are also threatening to strike today unless the company improves its coronavirus response. I talk about a win-win situation here. You can now foster a dog and get some free beer in the process. Bush is offering a free three-month supply of beer for anyone who fosters or adopts a dog from Midwest Animal Rescue in Minnesota. NFL legend Peyton Manning went back to school and crashed his former professor's class. Some students in the online communications class at the University of Tennessee could not believe it. Manning says he just wanted to cheer him up during the pandemic. Plus, here to keep you entertained during self-isolation is HQ Trivia. It abruptly went out of business last month. The mobile quiz app is back online thanks to an anonymous donor. And police in the U.K. got creative in an effort to keep those hardcore Instagrammers at home. They dyed that famous Blue Lagoon in Harpoor Hill black. Buxton police say they did what they had to do so people can follow orders and just stay at home. With nearly 60,000 confirmed cases, New York is a major hotspot for the virus. But officials are warning that the worst is yet to come for America's cities. Some states have even started screening people trying to drive across state lines. Here's NBC's Aaron McLaughlin. As the spread of COVID-19 accelerates, a warning. All corners of the country are at risk and America's cities vulnerable. Every metro area should assume that they could have an outbreak equivalent to New York. Sunday, new disaster declarations in Connecticut, Oregon, Georgia, and a disaster request from Pennsylvania, where confirmed cases spiked by more than 20 percent. Please stay calm, stay home, and stay safe. In Louisiana, there's worry. They're days away from potential catastrophe. We're on a trajectory currently to exceed our capacity in the New Orleans area for ventilators by about April the 4th. But there's also defiance. Despite an order banning gatherings larger than 50, <laughs> Pastor Tony Spell refuses to cancel Sunday service, attended by hundreds. The church, again, is not a non-essential. Okay? The church is the most essential thing in all the world. While some shrug off the threat, states are taking extraordinary measures to slow the virus spread. Our huge concern is that if people start to travel south, then we are going to have um, a huge uprise in our cases. In Florida, they're expanding checkpoints at major interstates, screening motorists coming from COVID hotspots, including New York and Louisiana. In North Carolina, the Outer Banks now require an entry permit, while states see a surge of cases, including Michigan. Detroit's now home to the third largest outbreak behind New York and Chicago. Here, too, there's a concern about resources. The scarcity of resources is not something I thought I would ever 
have to face in this country. And I know that in my state, it's already happening. Similar worry in California, where there's more than 5,000 confirmed cases. This weekend, the number in critical care doubled to more than 400. And across the country, convention centers now turned makeshift hospitals. Our thanks to Aaron for that report. President Trump is abandoning hopes of restarting the economy by Easter after that dire new prediction from his top infectious disease expert. Dr. Anthony Fauci said yesterday that the U.S. could see more than 100,000 deaths from coronavirus. Let's turn to our Capitol Hill correspondent, Tracy Potts, who joins us with more. And Tracy, the president is extending those social uh, distancing guidelines for at least another month. Right, Francis. Remember, the president wanted to get the economy going again, have everyone out and about, businesses open by Easter. Well, he's backing off that now based on the latest projections. The president now saying that Americans should be staying inside, social distancing, uh, and not going out unless necessary uh, until the end of April, until April 30th. That is the guideline now from the federal government based on these latest projections that show not not only will millions of Americans uh, get this virus, but as many as 200,000 could die from it. If we could hold that down, as we're saying to 100,000, it's a horrible number. Maybe even less, but to 100,000. So we have between 100 and 200,000. Uh, we all together have done a very good job. The better you do, the faster. This whole nightmare will end. Therefore, we will be extending our guidelines to April 30th to slow the spread. Now, the president also locked in a battle with some governors accusing some states of hoarding supplies, uh, some hospitals of hoarding supplies, whereas some states, uh, specifically with Democratic governors, say that the federal government is slow to send them those supplies. Francis? All right, Tracy Potts, keeping us up to date. Tracy, thank you. The world continues to feel the wrath of the deadly coronavirus that is quickly spreading from continent to continent. Global cases have now surpassed 720,000, with the U.S. leading this dubious list, followed by hard-hit Europe, where they continue to struggle with the mounting death toll. As cases rise, it's forcing more countries to enforce stricter lockdowns and travel bans. Meanwhile, in Asia, the former, the former epicenter of the virus is still reporting new cases as it slowly emerges from the lockdown. And for the latest, we turn now to NBC's Ali Aruzi, live for us from London. Hey, Ali, good morning. Good morning, Philip. That's right. A staggering 723,000 cases around the world, and we've gone over 34,000 deaths. Now, in hard-hit Italy, we've seen a slight fall in the number of daily deaths, but they still have the world's largest death toll at over 10,080, with 97 uh, positive cases there. Cemeteries are overflowing in Italy because they just can't cope with the number of dead. They're being forced to... Uh, to store people in churches, and families aren't even allowed to attend the funeral. And uh, they've also deployed helicopters in Italy, Philip, as a sort of eye in the sky to try and find people that are evading strict lockdown rules. In Spain, there are also very strict lockdown rules, and the situation isn't much better there than in Italy. They have almost 7,000 people that have died of COVID-19. If you combine the total number of deaths in Spain and Italy, that makes up for half the global death toll, which is really quite remarkable. Over in Italy, in the Vatican City, somebody at the Pope's office had tested positive for COVID-19. Uh, the Vatican say that the Pope has been tested and he is negative. Here in the UK, Philip, the heir to the throne, uh, the Prime Minister and the Health Minister have all contracted COVID-19 and a senior health official in this country says that social distancing and lockdown rules may stay in place uh, till June. Uh, Africa is also getting affected quite badly by the virus. Nigeria going into lockdown. That's the most populated country in Africa. All right. It seems pretty much no part of the globe is untouched by this. Uh, Ali Ruzi for us in London. Thanks, Ali.
Now to breaking news in Arizona where a Phoenix police officer is dead and two more are injured after a shooting at a home. The Phoenix Police Department says Commander Greg Carnicle was shot and killed while responding to a domestic violence call late last night. He was a 31-year veteran just months shy away from retirement. The two injured officers are expected to survive. According to our Phoenix affiliate, the situation appears to be over and police are planning to give us an update at a press conference later this morning. All right, let's see what the last Monday of the longest month in the history of uh, months <laughs> seems like uh, has in store for us. Janessa Webb, good morning. Good morning. It has definitely been a long month and it was a long weekend. We had a severe weather outbreak across the central part of the U.S., Arkansas, seeing two touchdown in EF1 and EF3, the National Weather Service just confirming. Also, the severe weather threat will continue to start off the week. It will push out of here by Wednesday. But unfortunately, the torrential rain going to be a really big issue from Oklahoma City all the way into Memphis, where they could see another one to two inches. So the brunt of this storm will run through the deep south to the southeast before it starts to push offshore. Also, warm temperatures in place with the highs. They're still in the mid 80s. That's a look at the big weather story of the day. Here's a closer look at your day ahead. So some of that rain that we're seeing across the south, it starts to make its way into the northeast as well. We're seeing kind of that fluctuation in temperatures. If you're across northern New England in the mid-30s, New York City, mid-50s. So that warm air, we're talking near 90 degrees across the south. That's sparking up the severe weather. Wow, I would think so. Thank you, Janessa. We are back now with a deeply personal look at a day in the life of an intensive care nurse. Like so many of our health care's heroes, she's working around the clock tending to coronavirus patients and also taking care of her own family during this difficult time. And this is her story. Time to start the day again. Good morning. My name is Elise Sopo. I'm a nurse practitioner in the medical ICU at North German Hassett. I'm about to take my temperature because every morning and every night, I'm taking my temperature to make sure I stay healthy to take care of my patients. So I'm by one of the nurses station right now and we have the doctor just watching in the room to make sure everything's going okay with the nursing staff inside. The unit that I work in is a COVID quarantined critical care unit, highest acuity, sickest patients that we have in the health system right now. People are 20, 30, 40, 50, much younger than we expected. This is the tubing from the, the ventilator. The ventilator is the breathing machine that goes to a patient. The tube goes into the patient's mouth, into the patient's lung, and inflates and deflates the lungs to help you breathe. If a patient's heart is not doing well, we put them on a cardiac bypass machine. This only affects the lungs and helps with the breathing. So now we need to bypass the lungs, and this machine will purify the lungs and oxygenate the patient and give the patient oxygen while his lungs are healing. I have some tears and crying right now because I'm so tired. But I'm going to take a deep breath and keep going on. I think I just needed that. A little let down, but now I'm going to continue on and powering through back into the unit to stay strong. Today is day five of a 13 hour shift week. I usually do three days a week. I'm up to five 13 hour shifts this week and I'm tired. So I'm about to change my scrubs to head home to see my babies. And our thanks to Elisa Sopo for that. And hopefully when she gets home, she gets big hugs from her entire family, everything that she needs because she's going to wake up and do it again. Yeah, tomorrow. nice long rest. Get it while you can. Like you said, exhausted. Just the emotional toll that it's taking on everybody. Again, cannot thank our healthcare workers enough right now.
In today's quick hits, the volunteers in Iowa, Cedar Rapids, uh, are using 3D printers to help workers on the front line. Since schools are closed, the school district there is now using all of their 3D printers to create face guards. So far, they've created thousands of guards for doctors and patients to use. Krispy Kreme is offering a sweet thank you to healthcare workers. On Mondays, anyone in the medical industry can get up to five dozen original glazed donuts for free. The offer starts today and will last every Monday until May 11th. And while many are binge watching shows during the lockdown, Netflix Tiger King is now TV's most popular, according to Rotten Tomatoes. It has a 97% critics rating and 96% audience scoring. And I tell you what, once you let Joe Exotic enter your world, <laughs> your life will be changed forever. One way or another, it is a fascinating show to say the least. All right. Stocks, they have been on a roller coaster over the past month and, and today it looks no differently to start the week, but there is a silver lining for consumers. Let's get over to CNBC's Karen Cho, who's live in London for us with a preview of the markets and news on prices at the pump. Uh, hi, Karen. Good morning. Philip and Francis, thank you very much. We are setting up for another volatile session and a volatile week. Futures trading higher initially, now moving south for the Dow. And as you take a look at the early morning action on Wall Street, now investors last week pushed up the Dow 12% over the course of the week. Its biggest weekly gain since 1938 as investors responded to fiscal stimulus, open-ended asset purchases from the Fed, also the president signing into law $2 trillion stimulus package. But the president also shuffled out his date when he expects business to return to normal from about mid-April to about the 30th of April now. And remember, the longer the lockdown, the longer the stricter measures take place, the bigger the economic hit. So investors will weigh that this week, along with the more jobs numbers coming out from the private sector, also the payrolls report. And don't forget, of course, uh, investors looking very much towards the oil price slump. We've seen WTI below $20 and Brent prices touching 23 That is the lowest we've seen since 2002. That drop will have an impact on the stock market. We continue to see the Saudis wage that price war with the Russians and they say they're not in talks to end it any time soon. So uh, I'll send it back to you on that note. Expect some more wild swings on Wall Street. Karen Cho joining us uh, with the very latest on what's going on with our money. Karen, thank you. Hi everyone, we're doing the best to flatten this curve and we're seeing the rate of every two days it be expanded to now every three days. So this chart continues to go on, go on the upward spiral, but look at the percentage compared to last Tuesday, we were at 30.8% now at 16.8. So a little bit of progress, gonna watch the consistency for at least the next five to seven days. Workers at a major grocery delivery service are threatening to strike. Employees at Instacart are fighting for better working conditions as they deliver food to millions of Americans during the pandemic. Sam Brock has the story. As many as 200,000 Instacart workers could instantly be off the front lines. A lot of us are really literally making the decision between, you know, our health and our financial security right now. They're demanding hazard pay and better safety gear or they'll strike, no longer shopping for and delivering your groceries. Instacart telling employees through blog post, we're immensely grateful for all that you do to support families and people in need. They're offering more than a month of pay for anyone diagnosed with COVID-19 and one-time bonuses. The anxiety also being felt at traditional grocers. Is it scary at all to go to work right now? I don't sleep much because I'm scared of what I will bring home to my children. Candace Oglesby lives in North Texas. Her son is immunocompromised. The cashier says she's in contact with people all day long and wants her national grocery employer, who she's not identifying, to acknowledge that and pay. They're putting their life and they're putting their safety and their health on the line. Many of America's largest grocery stores have ramped up pay and protections, from temporary salary hikes to bonuses. And across the board, companies are putting up plexiglass at registers, installing social distancing reminders, and cleaning stores around the clock. Grocers in particular are at a higher risk, not as high a risk as, say, a healthcare worker, but they are at a higher risk than the general public. If you're worried about your safety when shopping, anytime you use any surface that people touch a lot, like card handles, for example, make sure you wipe it down with a disinfectant wipe, wear gloves, or you can also use a cloth as a barrier if you need to. Once you get inside the supermarket, stand at least six feet away from everybody else and do not touch your face. And once you get home, you got all these bags, 
wipe off every surface they touch. And for anything that comes inside of a box, take the contents out and wipe that off too. As shelves remain stocked, the people making sure they stay that way deemed essential employees by only a few states, opening up access to emergency childcare and testing. I would give anything to be able to test myself right now. Sam Brock, NBC News, Miami. I would think those Instacart workers would have more leverage than ever mm -hmm. right now. I don't think yeah, the delivery service has never been in higher demand. We all need them. All right. So if you want to spread a message, one way to do it is on the side of a mountain. An artist in Switzerland used the side of the Matterhorn as his canvas. The mountain, which borders Italy, was lit up with words like hope and stay home. It also had an image of a heart. All of this to show support for everyone battling this pandemic. It looks like just computer graphics right there, but very much the real deal. Sure is. Yeah. Thank you for watching early today on this Monday. I'm Philip Mena. And I'm Francis Rivera. Stay healthy, stay safe. We'll see you back here tomorrow. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. This is all I've got left. Good afternoon from the spin room. It's news made for your streaming world. NBC News Now. New York State has surpassed 1,000 deaths from the coronavirus as a field hospital is being built in Central Park while area hospitals are pushed to the limit. States ramping up travel advisories as others are watching and learning from New York's rapid explosion of coronavirus cases. And the incredible story of how a newspaper delivery man's simple act of kindness towards a neighbor has snowballed into so much more. Early today starts right now. Glad you're with us to start off this week. I'm Francis Rivera. And I'm Philip Mena. The stark reality of the coronavirus pandemic is coming into focus here in America. The White House has now extended its social distancing guidelines at least until April 30th. President Trump says he believes Easter will mark the peak number in the United States. In New York City, the number of confirmed cases has soared to nearly 60,000. A field hospital is being constructed in Central Park. It'll be able to accommodate 68 patients and will have 10 ventilators for the most seriously ill. The U.S. Naval Hospital ship Comfort is expected to arrive in New York Harbor today. About 1,000 beds will be available to people who do not have COVID-19, and that'll free up some spaces in hospitals battling the pandemic. Volunteers in Iowa are doing their part to keep our health care workers protected. The Cedar Rapids School District reallocated all of their 3D printers so volunteers could make thousands of face masks. And as more people stay at home and order food and supplies, there are growing concerns about the safety of the people filling those orders. After an Amazon employee tested positive, employees at a Staten Island warehouse are threatening to walk out today. They want the facility shut down and cleaned. And some Instacart workers are also threatening to strike today unless the company improves its coronavirus response. Meanwhile, two major health insurers are waiving the cost of coronavirus treatments. Cigna and Humana will waive co-payments for insured members. This will cover treatment, hospitalizations and ambulance transfers. And Krispy Kreme is offering a sweet thank you to health care workers. On Mondays, anyone in the medical industry can get up to five dozen original glazed donuts for free. The offer starts today and lasts every Monday until May 11th. President Trump is abandoning hopes of restarting the economy by Easter after that dire new prediction from his top infectious disease expert. Dr. Anthony Fauci said yesterday the U.S. could see more than 100,000 deaths from coronavirus. Our Capitol Hill correspondent, Tracy Potts, joining us now with more. Uh, Tracy, good morning. So the president is extending the social distancing guidelines for at least another month. Exactly. So now he says that uh, people across America should be social distancing until April 30th, until the end of next month. Remember, the president had said that he wanted uh, the economy going again, people out and about, businesses working by Easter. But the latest projections don't seem to support that. In fact, those latest projections show that millions of Americans will end up infected with this virus. And as many as 200,000, maybe less, but as many as 200,000 uh, could die as a result of that. If we can hold that down, as we're saying, to 100,000, it's a horrible number. Maybe even less, but to 100,000. So we have between 100 and 200,000. Uh, we all together have done a very good job. The better you do, the faster this whole nightmare will end. Therefore, we will be extending our guidelines to April 30th 
to slow the spread. The president also taking some heat from governors across the country, uh, specifically Democrats who say he's playing politics with doling out some of those supplies, masks and, and respirators, while the president accuses some states of hoarding the supplies. Philip? Joining us with uh, the very latest on the coronavirus here in the States. Tracy, thank you. And at the epicenter of the U.S. pandemic, New York Governor Andrew Cuomo is extending a stay-at-home order for at least two more weeks. The decision comes on the heels of a new travel advisory from the CDC, urging people in the tri-state area to refrain from all non-essential domestic travel. NBC's Kathy Park has the latest. Francis Philip, good morning. The coronavirus crisis is intensifying across the country, and President Trump extended the social distancing guidelines until the end of April. Meantime, here in New York, it's still considered the epicenter of the U.S. outbreak as the death toll approaches 1,000. As the coronavirus continues its deadly march across the country, this warning for Americans. Looking at what we're seeing now, you know, I would say between 100 and 200,000 cases, but excuse me, deaths. I mean, we're going to have millions of cases, but I, I just don't think that we really need to make a projection when it's such a moving target. What we do know, Jake, is that we got a serious mm -hmm. problem in New York. We have a serious problem in New Orleans, and we're going to be developing serious problems in other areas. This after the CDC issued a late Saturday travel advisory for New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut residents, telling them to refrain from non-essential domestic travel for two weeks. The notice creating confusion after President Trump first weighed the possibility of a short-term quarantine in those states, but later backed away from the idea. Governors were given full discretion over the new rollout and said the advisory is already in practice. It's totally consistent with everything we're doing. That's something that, uh, as I say, it's de facto happening already. We're to, uh, discouraging people from traveling uh, and making sure they stay as home as much as possible. With at least 59,000 positive cases and approximately 42 percent of coronavirus deaths in the U.S. centered in New York, Today, Governor Andrew Cuomo extended the stay-at-home order through April 15th, stretching into major holidays like Easter and Passover. The state is trying to get ahead of the outbreak's peak, mobilizing a temporary hospital at this Manhattan Convention Center and awaiting the arrival of the U.S. naval ship that will provide extra beds for non-COVID-19 cases. And even more help is on the way. The president announcing that a flight arrived at JFK with millions of critical medical supplies for health care workers stretched thin. And after pressure from New York's governor, the governor of Rhode Island repealed the executive order that had police and National Guard members knocking on doors and checking cars for visiting New Yorkers, telling them they must self-quarantine for 14 days. And behind me is the Javits Center, which has been transformed into a temporary hospital with 1,000 beds. And over at Central Park, there is an emergency field hospital also in the works. Triage tents were going up this weekend, and it should be operational on Tuesday. Guys, back to you. All right. Thanks to Kathy Park for that report. As the virus spreads around the world, more countries are shutting borders and cutting travel to and from in an effort to curb infection rates. But these measures have left some Americans trapped in other countries, struggling to find a way back home. Here's NBC's Sarah Harmon. Tens of thousands of Americans are stranded overseas. In India, there's chaos as the government imposes a lockdown on more than a billion people, including Peter Joseph from San Diego. He's been stuck in his hostel for eight days. We feel completely not heard. Uh, we feel abandoned. On the other side of the world, Peru closing its borders sending Americans scrambling to the airport. Yes, <laughs> looking forward to going home. Green Bay Packers quarterback Aaron Rodgers describing his own harrowing escape in a radio interview. There was some moments where we were worried we were not going to get out. It was absolute pandemonium at the airport. Others weren't so lucky. Yesterday, the only meal we got was lunch. Zachary Mechstroth has been stuck in a youth hostel in Cusco for 13 days. You got a repatriation flight through the State Department, but you weren't allowed to leave the youth hostel. Correct. So... The hostel manager said that if I were to leave with that document, I would get arrested. The State Department saying we have no higher duty than to protect American citizens and have launched an unprecedented global effort to bring home our citizens from every corner of the globe. 
But not everyone can be rescued easily. Those on cruise ships stranded at sea, unwelcome in any harbor. The Zan Dam off the coast of Panama, carrying four dead and more than 100 sick, transferring its healthy passengers to another vessel. As stranded Americans around the world wonder when and how they'll ever get home. Sarah Harmon, NBC News. The coronavirus continues its global rampage with no signs of slowing down. Over 721,000 people have been infected worldwide and over 33,000 people have died. In Europe, the number of deaths in Italy is overwhelming, but Spain is quickly catching up. Meanwhile, in Asia, the former epicenter of the virus is still reporting new cases as it slowly emerges from lockdown. For the latest, we turn to NBC's Ellie Ruzzi, who's live in London. Ellie, good morning. Good morning, Francis. That's right, a staggering 723,000 people have been affected around the world with over 34,000 deaths. And almost every corner of the world has been affected by the coronavirus. And it won't be long till we surge past a million global numbers. Now, in Italy, the daily death rate fell slightly, but it still has the highest death rate in the world with over 10,800 people have died from the virus and 97,000 thousand cases. Cemeteries there are, are overflowing. Uh, the dead are being stored in churches. Uh, families are not allowed to attend funerals, robbing the dead of all of their dignity. Uh, in Italy, they've also deployed helicopters in the sky, sort of an eye in the sky to catch people out who are not abiding by the strict lockdowns that have been put in place. And the situation in Spain isn't much better either. That country has about 7,000 deaths right now. It's also on a very strict lockdown. If you combine the death toll from Italy and Spain, that accounts for over half of the world's death toll. Uh, in the UK, the heir to the throne, the prime minister and the health minister have all tested positive for COVID-19. And a senior health official in this country says that lockdown and social distancing in this country may be extended until June. Uh, in in the Vatican, somebody tested uh, positive for COVID-19 in, in the pontiff's residence. Uh, his office say that he has been tested for the virus and has now um, tested negative for it, Francis. All right, Ali Ruzzi for us. Live in London, Ali, thank you for the update. Breaking news out of Arizona, where a po Phoenix police officer is dead and two more are injured after a shooting at a home. The Phoenix Police Department says Commander Greg Carnicle was shot and killed while responding to a domestic violence call late last night. He was a 31-year veteran just months away from retirement. The two injured officers are expected to survive. According to our Phoenix affiliate, the situation appears to be over and police are planning to give us an update at a press conference later this morning. And many people across the South and Midwest are also facing the added threat of tornadoes. The hardest hit area is in Jonesboro, Arkansas, where the city took a direct hit. Highway cameras captured the path of destruction. More than 20 people were hurt. The city's mayor says that the shelter-in-place order to prevent the spread of coronavirus likely helped save lives in this situation as well. Let's get the latest on that severe weather. It is Monday morning. Janessa Webb, good morning. Hey, good morning. Just getting word from the National Weather Service confirming an EF3, also an EF1 tornado across the Arkansas area. So two tornadoes touching down. The great news is that it was a direct hit on the mall. If people would have been out and about, we could have had a massive uh, loss of lives. So good news there, but we're also still watching the severe weather threat across the deep south. It will continue for the next uh, two days, unfortunately, with damaging winds, also a few tornadoes possible. Temperatures are very warm across the south. We're back into the mid 80s. Also, the torrential rain going to be an issue up to one to two inches. That's a look at the big weather story of the day. Here's a closer look at your day ahead. So that rain that we're seeing across the south, it starts to filter into the northeast as well. Temperatures cooling off. We're back in the mid-40s, but still very warm for at least the next three days across the deep south into the southeast. After we get over this severe weather hump, we are in a stretch of just quiet.
Oh, that's nice. I like that. A little bit of calm in our madness. All right. In uh, today's headlines, animal shelters, they're struggling during this coronavirus pandemic. So to help, between now and April 25th, Bush is offering a three-month supply of beer for anyone who fosters or adopts a dog from Midwest Animal Rescue Services. New Balance is helping the effort to stock medical supplies. The Boston-based footwear company is working to develop and manufacture facial masks. The company says the mask will be produced at its New England factories. Netflix's Tiger King is now television's most popular. According to Rotten Tomatoes, it has a 97% critics rating. 96% audience score. Everyone, sing a tiger. Tiger saw a man. Leading the news, New Yorkers who break the social distancing rules could be fined hundreds of dollars. Mayor Bill de Blasio has authorized people to ticket people who are told to disperse but fail to do so. The fines would range from $250 to $500. In case you missed it over the weekend, we have some stunning images from the Vatican. Pope Francis delivering his special Ruby and Orbi prayer, which means to the city and the world. St. Peter's Square completely empty as the pontiff prayed for an end to the COVID-19 pandemic. The blessing was broadcast out to the faithful via Facebook, YouTube, television and radio. Among the coronavirus deaths we learned about Sunday, country music superstar Joe Diffie died of complications due to the virus. Diffie became well known in the 1990s with several number one singles. Among his most popular tunes, Prop Me Up Beside the Jukebox and John Deere Green. The Grammy winner was born and raised in Oklahoma. Joe Diffie was 61 years old. Meanwhile, we also learned that Grammy-winning singer and songwriter John Prine has been hospitalized for COVID-19 type symptoms. Prine's family says he is critically ill and has been placed on a ventilator. Eight people are dead in the Philippines after a medevac plane exploded into a ball of flames during takeoff in Manila. Airport officials say the plane was carrying six Filipino crew members and two passengers, one American and one Canadian. The flight was headed to Tokyo and was reportedly carrying supplies on a medical mission. A desperate search for a missing girl in Alabama has been called off after police say they located the child after she disappeared for nearly two days. Officials say four-year-old Evelyn Vady Sides was reported missing on Wednesday afternoon after she went walking with her dog. Rescuers say they found the child and her dog safe, adding that she is in good shape and is responsive. Evelyn and her furry friend have since been reunited with her parents. Good morning, everyone. We're doing our best to flatten the curve, and we continue to watch the data of our, our implied growth rate. Now, a positive spin this morning, a rate of 2.5 days has increased to 3.5. So we're seeing kind of an expansion of the bar graph and less people. This could mean less people are being tested, but from last Tuesday, look at the percentage. It is way down. We were at about 30.4, now at 16.6. So you're seeing the trend of this bar graph still going up. We're going to watch for still that consistency. That is really going to be key for at least the next three to five days. So we're just not seeing that yet, but you know, our percentages, they are definitely down. Yeah, it looks like yeah. encouraging numbers, but we are far, are far, far, from, far from, from out of the woods here. So right. a couple more weeks, keep up the social distancing, and hopefully this will all be over very, very soon. All right. Keeping fingers crossed tight. We are back with the story about the good deeds by and for the hardworking people bringing us mail, packages, and newspapers. NBC's Kate Snow has the story. It all started when newspaper delivery man Greg Daly was grocery shopping and suddenly thought about an 88-year-old customer. You know, I thought to myself, well, if Mrs. Ross can't get the paper at her sidewalk, which is probably 20 feet, how's she getting groceries? He called her, and sure enough, she needed items. Five minutes later, I'm standing online to pay for the stuff that I, that I have, and she called me back. And she goes, Greg, would you mind grabbing something for Mrs. Miller across the street? That's when he started putting this note inside every newspaper he delivers, offering to pick up groceries or basically anything. You know, they're amazing people, and you know, if you get a chance to help them, you help them. It's very nice to meet you. Sandy Driska and her husband are quarantined at home. Your godson. Oh, gosh, Greg. And you know, he's not even asking for money. He's doing this out of the kindness of his heart. All over the country, families are appreciating delivery people, leaving notes and goodie bags, snacks and cold drinks, even toilet paper. Can we take one of these? Yeah, absolutely. It's for you. 
Oh, uh, man, you, you're a lifesaver. Thank you. In Phoenix, the Wilson family left hand sanitizer on their mailbox, thanking their mail carrier, Marco. Ann Dials, whose family's been delivering mail in Kentucky since the 1940s, wanted to help her mail carrier stay healthy, too. I think we should all take care of our mail carriers, so I think everybody should at least help them out a little bit. It feels good to help and to receive. Basically, it gives you it gives you a warm feeling, and it also gives you so much faith in humanity that really throughout this virus, we're all there to help one another, and we'll get through it. And our thanks to Kate Snow for that uh, amazing story there. And I'm telling you, when it comes to just anything to help out humanity right about now, for the take. Those delivery workers are really our lifeline right now. We're so yeah. grateful. You know how when you used to see uh, service members, you'd say thank you for your service, and it's almost like these are our lifeline now, and we really appreciate people out there delivering the goods when we need them. It's the whole new world, and this is the positive side of it. Yeah. We love seeing. Sure is. All right, check out this principal here. Didn't let a little school closure keep her from giving some good news to a student. Take a look. I want to announce something to you today. Okay. You are GTA's 2020 class valedictorian. I am. You are. Oh my gosh, thank you so you much. Are. Principal Flooring surprised Caitlin Watson there right at the drive-thru with the honorary title and said that calling or video calling her just didn't feel good enough. So Caitlin just got the news that I'm valedictorian. I can yeah. quit now. No right? more ice cream cones. And to be able to have it on camera <laughs> for all cool. of us to see too in that video. Yeah. Great to be able to share. That's right. Congratulations, Sarah. Thanks for watching early today. I'm Philip Meta. And I'm Francis Rivera. Your news continues right here. Stay safe. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. This is all I've got left. Good afternoon from the spin room. It's news made for your streaming world. NBC News Now. Oh, we get to have our very own Today Family Getaway. Yeah. It's so exciting to be here. We are serving up a Today Cafe special. Universal Orlando Resort is the place. We have just loved seeing your beautiful shining faces. How sweet is that? Need your true crime fix on the go? Dateline episodes are available as podcasts. Mysteries with a twist from the true crime original. Wow. Listen to Dateline wherever you get your podcasts. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. This is all I've got left. Who brought more to the caucuses? It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, 3 to 11 p.m. Eastern. We've got this fundamental thing about human beings, and then we've got the way that we constitute our politics. And the danger is that if our politics grow too tribal, then we'll lose the sort of way of talking. Why is this happening with Chris Hayes? Subscribe now. President Trump extends social distancing guidelines through the month of April as the number of confirmed cases of coronavirus fast approaches 150,000 in the United States alone. As cases surge across the nation, more steps are being taken to screen travelers from going from state to state to stem the spread. And with so many health care workers fighting the war on the front lines, a message of hope and thanks from those giving back. I would like people to note that there's hope and there's something that we can all do. A lesson on how to say thanks. It's Monday and early today starts right now. 
Good to have you with us this morning. I'm Francis Rivera. And I'm Philip Mena. As millions of Americans continue to hunker down in their homes, President Trump extends social distancing for another month. Here's what you need to know at this hour. The spread of the coronavirus is fast and furious. This country now has the most number of cases worldwide, topping 142,000, surpassing China and Italy. The number of fatalities has now surpassed 2,000. And things could get much worse. The nation's top infectious disease expert, Dr. Anthony Fauci, estimates that coronavirus could kill up to 200,000 Americans, adding that the country could see millions of cases. Meanwhile, two major health insurers are waiving the cost of coronavirus treatments. Cigna and Humana will cover payments for insured members. It'll include things like treatment, hospitalizations, and ambulance transfers. As cases surge in New York, an emergency field hospital will go up in Central Park. Crews are setting up right now at that site. It's along 5th Avenue and 99th Streets. Patients from Mount Sinai will be treated there. It's expected to be up and running by tomorrow. And after canceling the Detroit Auto Show, FEMA will be using that venue as a makeshift hospital. Michigan is becoming one of the epicenters of this virus with more than 5,000 cases. Tickets for the show will be refunded. And in the Hawkeye State, volunteers are using 3D printers to help workers on the front lines. Since schools are closed, the district is now using all of their 3D printers to create face guards. So far, they've created thousands of guards for doctors and patients to use. And here to keep you entertained during self-isolation is HQ Trivia. It abruptly went out of business last month, but the mobile quiz app is back online thanks to an anonymous donor. Talk about a win-win situation here. You can foster a dog and get free beer in the process. Bush is offering a free three-month supply of beer for anyone who fosters or adopts a dog from Midwest Animal Rescue in Minnesota. And live from your living room, it's the Backstreet Boys. They reunited from five different locations to perform I Want It That Way. It was all for iHeartRadio's Living Room Concert for America. They were just one of the performers for the Benefit Concert that was hosted by Elton John. President Trump is abandoning hopes of restarting the economy by Easter after that dire new prediction from his top infectious disease expert. Dr. Anthony Fauci said yesterday the U.S. could see more than 100,000 deaths from coronavirus. Well, just hours later, the president announced that he is extending the federal social distancing guidelines. If we could hold that down, as we're saying to 100,000, it's a horrible number. Maybe even less, but to 100,000. So we have between 100 and 200,000. Uh, we all together have done a very good job. The better you do, the faster this whole nightmare will end. Therefore, we will be extending our guidelines to April 30th to slow the spread. The president said he hopes the country will be on the road to recovery by June 1st. NBC's Kathy Park has more. Francis Philip, good morning. The coronavirus crisis is intensifying across the country, and President Trump extended the social distancing guidelines until the end of April. Meantime, here in New York, it's still considered the epicenter of the U.S. outbreak as the death toll approaches 1,000. As the coronavirus continues its deadly march across the country, this warning for Americans. Looking at what we're seeing now, you know, I would say between 100 and 200,000 cases, but excuse me, deaths. I mean, we're going to have millions of cases, but I, I just don't think that we really need to make a projection when it's such a moving target. What we do know, Jake, is that we got a serious mm -hmm. problem in New York. We have a serious problem in New Orleans, and we're going to be developing serious problems in other areas. This after the CDC issued a late Saturday travel advisory for New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut residents, telling them to refrain from non-essential domestic travel for two weeks. The notice creating confusion after President Trump first weighed the possibility of a short-term quarantine in those states, but later backed away from the idea. Governors were given full discretion over the new rollout and said the advisory is already in practice. It's totally consistent with everything we're doing. That's something that, uh, as I say, it's de facto happening already. We're uh, discouraging people from traveling uh, and making sure they stay as home as much as possible. With at least 59,000 positive cases and approximately 42 percent of coronavirus deaths in the U.S. centered in New York, Today, Governor I'm Andrew Cuomo extended the stay-at-home order through April 15th, stretching into major holidays like Easter and Passover. 
The state is trying to get ahead of the outbreak's peak, mobilizing a temporary hospital at this Manhattan Convention Center and awaiting the arrival of the U.S. naval ship that will provide extra beds for non-COVID-19 cases. And even more help is on the way. The president announcing that a flight arrived at JFK with millions of critical medical supplies for health care workers stretched thin. And after pressure from New York's governor, the governor of Rhode Island repealed the executive order that had police and National Guard members knocking on doors and checking cars for visiting New Yorkers, telling them they must self-quarantine for 14 days. And behind me is the Javits Center, which has been transformed into a temporary hospital with 1,000 beds. And over at Central Park, there is an emergency field hospital also in the works. Triage tents were going up this weekend, and it should be operational on Tuesday. Guys, back to you. All right, that's Kathy Park reporting. Thanks, Kathy. With nearly 60,000 confirmed cases, New York is a major hotspot for the virus. But officials are warning that the worst is yet to come for America's cities. Some states have even started screening people trying to drive across state lines, we just saw. Here with more is NBC's Aaron McLaughlin. As the spread of COVID-19 accelerates, a warning. All corners of the country are at risk and America's cities vulnerable. Every metro area should assume that they could have an outbreak equivalent to New York. Sunday, new disaster declarations in Connecticut, Oregon, Georgia, and a disaster request from Pennsylvania, where confirmed cases spiked by more than 20 percent. Please stay calm, stay home, and stay safe. In Louisiana, there's worry. They're days away from potential catastrophe. We're on a trajectory currently to exceed our capacity in the New Orleans area for ventilators by about April the 4th. But there's also defiance. Despite an order banning gatherings larger than 50, <laughs> Pastor Tony Spell refuses to cancel Sunday service, attended by hundreds. The church, again, is not a non-essential. Okay? The church is the most essential thing in all the world. While some shrug off the threat, states are taking extraordinary measures to slow the virus spread. Our huge concern is that if people start to travel south, then we are going to have um, a huge uprise in our cases. In Florida, they're expanding checkpoints at major interstates, screening motorists coming from COVID hotspots, including New York and Louisiana. In North Carolina, the Outer Banks now require an entry permit, while states see a surge of cases, including Michigan. Detroit's now home to the third largest outbreak behind New York and Chicago. Here, too, there's a concern about resources. The scarcity of resources is not something I thought I would ever have to face in this country, and I know that in my state it's already happening. Similar worry in California, where there's more than 5,000 confirmed cases. This weekend, the number in critical care doubled to more than 400. And across the country, convention centers now turned makeshift hospitals. Our thanks to Aaron for that report. The world continues to be ravaged by the deadly coronavirus that is quickly spreading from continent to continent. Global cases have now surpassed 720,000, with the United States leading, while hard-hit Europe continues to struggle with a mounting death toll. As cases rise, it's forcing more countries to enforce even stricter lockdowns. Meanwhile, in Asia, the former epicenter of the virus is slowly emerging from the lockdown. For the latest, we turn to NBC's Ali Ruzi, live in London. Ali, good morning. Apologies for that. It is we have a problem there with Elia Ruzzi's audio. And most of the nation right now may be under self-isolation and travel advisories due to the coronavirus outbreak. So Hollywood is taking the party to living rooms via the Internet. Hottest artists like Alicia Keys, you saw Backstreet Boys there, Billie Eilish, there's Mariah Carey, much more. They all performed from their own living rooms. It's a part of the coronavirus benefit concert held by iHeartRadio and Fox, and the event was hosted by that man there, Elton John, reportedly has raised over a million dollars so far.
Many people across the South and Midwest are also facing life-threatening tornadoes. The hardest hit area is Jonesboro, Arkansas, where the city took a direct hit. Highway cameras captured the path of destruction. More than 20 people were hurt. The city's mayor said that the shelter-in-place order over the coronavirus likely helped save lives in the situation as well. Let's see uh, how this last Monday in March is going to shake out. Janessa Webb, good morning. Good morning. You know, we had a direct hit on the mall in Jonesboro, Arkansas. If people would have been at work, we could have seen many lives lost, no lives lost in that area. But we are still seeing the injuries and they're picking up the pieces. And the severe weather threat continues to be heightened across the deep south all the way into the southeast going into your Tuesday afternoon. I do think the south from Baton Rouge uh, to central Texas, this will be expanded throughout the afternoon. Potentially could see another one to two inches of rain. The torrential rain going to run through the Mississippi Valley all the way into the Tennessee Valley as well. This will be continuous until Wednesday afternoon. That's a look at the big weather story of the day. Here's a closer look at your day ahead. So some of that rain making its way across uh, the northeast as well this afternoon. Daytime highs, they are going to start to uh, climb down. We're in the mid-40s across uh, central Texas into the south. Highs back in the 80s. So severe weather, it continues for the deep south, but a quiet weather pattern is coming. All right. Thanks, Janessa. The 93-year-old woman got some sweet news from her granddaughter after weeks of being apart in quarantine. I just had a feeling. <laughs> you have a rat hole. Oh, oh, yes, I did. Oh, yeah. How did you know? I just you had a feeling. That's the way to spread the good news. The couple traveled from Illinois to Ohio to, to surprise her with the announcement. But Grandma said she already had a feeling, and Grandma's no, so mm -hmm. something to look forward to. Yeah, yeah it sure Grandma's. is. A happy, hopeful moment. Yes. Hopefully that baby boy is born in safer times mm -hmm. a few months down the road. The world continues to be ravaged by the deadly coronavirus that is quickly spreading from continent to continent. Global cases have now surpassed 720,000 with the U.S. leading, while hard hit Europe continues to struggle with a mounting death toll. As cases rise, it is forcing more countries to enforce even stricter lockdowns. Meanwhile, in Asia, the former epicenter of the virus is slowly emerging from lockdown. For the latest, we turn now to NBC's Ali Aruzi, who's live in London. Ali, good morning. Good morning, Francis. That's right, a staggering 723,000 cases worldwide and 34,000 deaths. Almost every corner of the world has been affected, and it won't be long, Francis, till we pass a million cases. In Italy, the number of daily deaths fell slightly from 889 to 756, but the overall death toll, still the largest in the world, keeps rising. Now over a startling 10,800 people have died there. Uh, and with over 97,000 cases, cemeteries are overflowing, forcing churches to store the dead as they wait cremation, while families aren't even allowed to attend funerals, uh, leaving the dead with very little dignity. Italy has also deployed helicopters as an eye in the sky to sort of enforce these locks down for people that aren't, uh, aren't abiding by them. And the situation in Spain, Francis, isn't much better, with almost 7,000 deaths there and a very strict lockdown in space in, in, in place. Spain and Italy alone account for more than half of the world's death toll. Francis? The news that we're getting used to hearing by the day. Thank you, Ali Ruzi, for us. Well, some residents in Maine tried to force some out-of-towners in a quarantine by chopping down a tree and using it to block their driveway. It happened in the town of Vinyl Haven. A man told police that armed neighbors chopped down a tree to barricade the driveway because he thought he had coronavirus. When police arrived, the group had gone. The three roommates from New Jersey rented a house while they were finishing construction. The coronavirus outbreak is having a major impact on gasoline prices at the pump. The average retail price per gallon in the U.S., has dropped nearly 23 cents in the past two weeks to $2.15. That's more than 50 cents lower than this time a year ago. Over the past five weeks, the price has fallen over 37 cents. And according to analysts, gas may fall 50 cents more in the near future. Among the coronavirus deaths we learned about Sunday, country music superstar Joe Diffie died of complications due to the virus. 
Diffie became well known in the 90s with several number one singles. Among his popular tunes here, most popular ones, Prop Me Up Beside the Jukebox and John Deere Green. The Grammy winner was born and raised in Oklahoma. Joe Diffie was 61 years old. Meanwhile, we've also learned that Grammy-winning singer-songwriter John Prine has been hospitalized for COVID-19-type symptoms. Prine's family says he is critically ill and has been placed on a ventilator. Workers at a New York Amazon warehouse are planning to walk out this morning. Employees plan to strike at a Staten Island location after a co-worker tested positive for COVID-19. An Amazon spokesperson tells NBC News that they are following all guidelines from local health officials and taking extreme measures to protect their staff. The workers want that facility shut down and cleaned. That location has about 4,500 employees. For the latest coronavirus news anytime, go to our live blog at NBCNews.com slash coronavirus. The nation is mourning the loss of a civil rights leader today. Reverend Joseph Lowry has died. His fight for justice began in Alabama during widespread unrest. And Reverend Lowry was known as the dean of the civil rights movement for his work alongside Martin Luther King Jr. He was also the founder of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Lowry delivered the benediction for President Obama's inauguration in 2009, and he was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom later that year. Reverend Dr. Joseph Lowry was 98 years old. Hi, everyone. We're doing all we can to flatten this curve, a positive spin. Now, and for the implied growth rate, we were seeing a rate of every 3.5 days. Now, it's, it's longer in some areas. You can see the expansion of the growth of, of the coronavirus, 16.6. So we're down dramatically about 20%. Heroes on the front lines are risking their lives around the clock taking care of the sick. And now so many people in communities all across the country are stepping up to help them cope. NBC's Steve Patterson reports. From coast to coast, applause for today's heroes. Now, Americans are creating new ways to help our nation's health care workers and first responders. I would like people to know that there's hope and there's something that we can all do. In New Orleans, Devin DeWolf is mobilizing relief for the front lines by organizing food deliveries. Inspired by the fight in his wife, Annalise, an ER doctor. What is that moment like to, to just get a little bit of relief? To step into that break room and have the door close, everybody wash their hands and take some food is really healing. The effort feeding 12 area hospitals. I think it's just, you know, a way that everybody can get involved and do something and um, show some solidarity right now. An aid mission spreading across the country. In New York, Island Auto Group is lending cars to first responders so they don't have to take public transportation. It was very scary. You know, I get infected or uh, my brothers and sisters I work with get infected. In Missouri, a Joplin pharmacy started making and delivering its own hand sanitizer. The idea was to help people that are serving other people in this situation. We want to help them stay safe, stay healthy. In Texas, a Dallas hotel is offering rooms to local first responders for free. Let's help out these first responders who are, you know, on the front line trying to save us and trying to get this epidemic, I guess we call it, over with. And at Elmhurst Hospital in New York, one of the hardest hit in the nation, a simple sign saying thank you, summing up the sentiments of Americans everywhere, grateful to those risking their own lives to save others. Steve Patterson, NBC News. Seems like we're hearing more and more about that each day, all the efforts out there to help those, the helpers who are keeping people alive. Yeah, I've been clicking on it, um, you know, since we're just at home and on social media and clicking on all the videos of people all over the world giving uh, standing ovations and mm -hmm. just giving that well-deserved recognition to all those uh, first responders and all those healthcare workers that are you know, risking their lives every day for that's us. That's what we can do, just click, and especially all the GoFundMes, yeah. people with the meals and just everything else they could do yeah. right there. All right, when an 87-year-old woman found herself quarantined and without food in the house, our Rhode Island Police Department went grocery shopping for her. Warwick PD responded to the woman's call and went to the woman's house for a grocery list. Thankfully, an officer was able to get everything on the list for her. And there we go, another example of that right there. Yeah, we're seeing uh, signs all over the city. If you need help, if you need some groceries for the elderly, let us know, and the number's right there. Everybody coming together, do what we can when we can. We thank you for waking up with us on this Monday. I'm Francis Rivera. And I'm Philip Mena. Stay safe out there. We'll see you back here tomorrow morning. 
You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. This is all I've got left. Good afternoon from the spin It's room. news made for your streaming world. NBC News Now. We're here for them. We are the community. It's definitely good to hear. You always want to hear that the wages are going up. We work hard, we bleed, we sweat, we cry when it comes to these cars. Without this pill, we die. He's doing the best he can for the country, and they're getting in the way. We're going to build the wall. We have no choice. This is an emergency. There are zero hours left to take action. Because we're incarcerated doesn't mean that we should lose our right to vote. This is the perfect time to graduate. There's like a lot of shooting happening. These are thoughtful voters who, more than anything, want these candidates to cut to the chase. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt, covering coronavirus with facts over fear. How do we know who belongs in isolation? What should we be conscious of? What's being worked on today? At a time of national crisis, turn to the most trusted TV news anchor in America. Need your true crime fix on the go? Dateline episodes are available as podcasts. Mysteries with a twist from the true crime original. Wow. Listen to Dateline wherever you get your podcasts. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. This is all I've got left. Who brought more to the caucuses? It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, 3 to 11 p.m. Eastern. Vegas, Manchester, from Washington. Why should your judgment be valued? I'd stake my judgment against anyone out there. Is party unity your concern right now, or is simply winning as many states as you well, can? Well, it's both. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. If it's digging in on the issues. Let's talk about money and politics. If it's asking the questions you want to ask. How do you reassure those supporters that you will sustain this? Just watch me. If it's navigating the winding road to the White House. And if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. The coronavirus outbreak. What's next? NBC News has in-depth coverage, answers to your questions, insight from medical experts, and up-to-the-minute live blog updates. For continuing coverage, turn to the networks and platforms of NBC News. New York State has surpassed 1,000 deaths from the coronavirus as a field hospital is being built in Central Park while area hospitals are pushed to the limit. States ramping up travel advisories as others are watching and learning from New York's rapid explosion of coronavirus cases. And the incredible story of how a newspaper delivery man's simple act of kindness towards a neighbor has snowballed into so much more. Early today starts right now. Glad you're with us to start off this week. I'm Francis Rivera. And I'm Philip Mena. The stark reality of the coronavirus pandemic is coming into focus here in America. The White House has now extended its social distancing guidelines at least until April 30th. President Trump says he believes Easter will mark the peak number in the United States. In New York City, the number of confirmed cases has soared to nearly 60,000. A field hospital is being constructed in Central Park. It'll be able to accommodate 68 patients and will have 10 ventilators for the most seriously ill. The U.S. Naval Hospital ship Comfort is expected to arrive in New York Harbor today. About 1,000 beds will be available to people who do not have COVID-19, and that'll free up some spaces in hospitals battling the pandemic. Volunteers in Iowa are doing their part to keep our health care workers protected. The Cedar Rapids School District reallocated all of their 3D printers so volunteers could make thousands of face masks. And as more people stay at home and order food and supplies, there are growing concerns about the safety of the people filling those orders. After an Amazon employee tested positive, employees at a Staten Island warehouse are threatening to walk out today.
They want the facility shut down and cleaned. And some Instacart workers are also threatening to strike today unless the company improves its coronavirus response. Meanwhile, two major health insurers are waiving the cost of coronavirus treatments. Cigna and Humana will waive co-payments for insured members. This will cover treatment, hospitalizations and ambulance transfers. And Krispy Kreme is offering a sweet thank you to health care workers. On Mondays, anyone in the medical industry can get up to five dozen original glazed donuts for free. The offer starts today and lasts every Monday until May 11th. President Trump is abandoning hopes of restarting the economy by Easter after that dire new prediction from his top infectious disease expert. Dr. Anthony Fauci said yesterday the U.S. could see more than 100,000 deaths from coronavirus. Our Capitol Hill correspondent, Tracy Potts, joining us now with more. Uh, Tracy, good morning. So the president is extending the social distancing guidelines for at least another month. Exactly. So now he says that uh, people across America should be social distancing until April 30th, until the end of next month. Remember, the president had said that he wanted uh, the economy going again, people out and about, businesses working by Easter. But the latest projections don't seem to support that. In fact, those latest projections show that millions of Americans will end up infected with this virus. And as many as 200,000, maybe less, but as many as 200,000 could die as a result of that. If we can hold that down, as we're saying, to 100,000, it's a horrible number. Maybe even less, but to 100,000. So we have between 100 and 200,000. We all together have done a very good job. The better you do, the faster this whole nightmare will end. Therefore, we will be extending our guidelines to April 30th to slow the spread. The president also taking some heat from governors across the country, uh, specifically Democrats who say he's playing politics with doling out some of those supplies, masks and, and respirators, while the president accuses some states of hoarding the supplies. Philip? Joining us with uh, the very latest on the coronavirus here in the States. Tracy, thank you. And at the epicenter of the U.S. pandemic, New York Governor Andrew Cuomo is extending a stay-at-home order for at least two more weeks. The decision comes on the heels of a new travel advisory from the CDC urging people in the tri-state area to refrain from all non-essential domestic travel. NBC's Kathy Park has the latest. Francis Philip, good morning. The coronavirus crisis is intensifying across the country, and President Trump extended the social distancing guidelines until the end of April. Meantime, here in New York, it's still considered the epicenter of the U.S. outbreak as the death toll approaches 1,000. As the coronavirus continues its deadly march across the country, this warning for Americans. Looking at what we're seeing now, you know, I would say between 100 and 200,000 cases, excuse me, deaths. I mean, we're going to have millions of cases, but I I just don't think that we really need to make a projection when it's such a moving target. What we do know, Jake, is that we got a serious Mm -hmm. problem in New York. We have a serious problem in New Orleans, and we're going to be developing serious problems in other areas. This after the CDC issued a late Saturday travel advisory for New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut residents, telling them to refrain from non-essential domestic travel for two weeks. The notice creating confusion after President Trump first weighed the possibility of a short-term quarantine in those states, but later backed away from the idea. Governors were given full discretion over the new rollout and said the advisory is already in practice. It's totally consistent with everything we're doing. That's something that, uh, as I say, it's de facto happening already. We're uh, discouraging people from traveling uh, and making sure they stay as home as much as possible. With at least 59,000 positive cases and approximately 42 percent of coronavirus deaths in the U.S. centered in New York, Governor Andrew Cuomo extended the stay-at-home order through April 15th, stretching into major holidays like Easter and Passover. 
The state is trying to get ahead of the outbreak's peak, mobilizing a temporary hospital at this Manhattan Convention Center and awaiting the arrival of the U.S. naval ship that will provide extra beds for non-COVID-19 cases. And even more help is on the way. The president announcing that a flight arrived at JFK with millions of critical medical supplies for health care workers stretched thin. And after pressure from New York's governor, the governor of Rhode Island repealed the executive order that had police and National Guard members knocking on doors and checking cars for visiting New Yorkers, telling them they must self-quarantine for 14 days. And behind me is the Javits Center, which has been transformed into a temporary hospital with 1,000 beds. And over at Central Park, there is an emergency field hospital also in the works. Triage tents were going up this weekend, and it should be operational on Tuesday. Guys, back to you. All right. Thanks to Kathy Park for that report. As the virus spreads around the world, more countries are shutting borders and cutting travel to and from in an effort to curb infection rates. But these measures have left some Americans trapped in other countries, struggling to find a way back home. Here's NBC's Sarah Harmon. Tens of thousands of Americans are stranded overseas. In India, there's chaos as the government imposes a lockdown on more than a billion people, including Peter Joseph from San Diego. He's been stuck in his hostel for eight days. We feel completely not heard. Uh, we feel abandoned. On the other side of the world, Peru closing its borders, sending Americans scrambling to the airport. Yes, <laughs> looking forward to going home. Green Bay Packers quarterback Aaron Rodgers describing his own harrowing escape in a radio interview. There was some moments where we were worried we were not going to get out. It was absolute pandemonium at the airport. Others weren't so lucky. Yesterday, the only meal we got was lunch. Zachary Mextroth has been stuck in a youth hostel in Cusco for 13 days. You got a repatriation flight through the State Department, but you weren't allowed to leave the youth hostel. Correct. So... The hostel manager said that if I were to leave with that document, I would get arrested. The State Department saying we have no higher duty than to protect American citizens and have launched an unprecedented global effort to bring home our citizens from every corner of the globe. But not everyone can be rescued easily. Those on cruise ships stranded at sea, unwelcome in any harbor. The Zan Dam off the coast of Panama, carrying four dead and more than 100 sick, transferring its healthy passengers to another vessel, as stranded Americans around the world wonder when and how they'll ever get home. Sarah Harmon, NBC News. The coronavirus continues its global rampage with no signs of slowing down. Over 721,000 people have been infected worldwide and over 33,000 people have died. In Europe, the number of deaths in Italy is overwhelming, but Spain is quickly catching up. Meanwhile, in Asia, the former epicenter of the virus is still reporting new cases as it slowly emerges from lockdown. For the latest, we turn to NBC's Ali Ruzzi, who's live in London. Ali, good morning. Good morning, Francis. That's right, a staggering 723,000 people have been affected around the world with over 34,000 deaths. And almost every corner of the world has been affected by the coronavirus. And it won't be long till we surge past a million global numbers. Now, in Italy, the daily death rate fell slightly, but it still has the highest death rate in the world with over 10,800 people have died from the virus and 97,000 thousand cases. Cemeteries there are, are overflowing. Uh, the dead are being stored in churches. Uh, families are not allowed to attend funerals, robbing the dead of all of their dignity. Uh, in Italy, they've also deployed helicopters in the sky, sort of an eye in the sky to catch people out who are not abiding by the strict lockdowns that have been put in place. And the situation in Spain isn't much better either. That country has about 7,000 deaths right now. It's also on a very strict lockdown. If you combine the death toll from Italy and Spain, that accounts for over half of the world's death toll. Uh, in the UK, the heir to the throne, the prime minister and the health minister have all tested positive for COVID-19. And a senior health official in this country says that lockdown and social distancing in this country may be extended until June. Uh, in 
in, in the Vatican. Somebody tested uh, positive for COVID-19 in the, in the pontiff's residence. Uh, his office say that he has been tested for the virus and has now um, tested negative for it, Francis. All right, Ali Ruzzi for us, live in London. Ali, thank you for the update. Breaking news out of Arizona, where a po Phoenix police officer is dead and two more are injured after a shooting at a home. The Phoenix Police Department says Commander Greg Carnicle was shot and killed while responding to a domestic violence call late last night. He was a 31-year veteran, just months away from retirement. The two injured officers are expected to survive. According to our Phoenix affiliate, the situation appears to be over, and police are planning to give us an update at a press conference later this morning. The many people across the South and Midwest are also facing the added threat of tornadoes. The hardest hit area is in Jonesboro, Arkansas, where the city took a direct hit. Highway cameras captured the path of destruction. More than 20 people were hurt. The city's mayor says that the shelter-in-place order to prevent the spread of coronavirus likely helped save lives in this situation as well. Let's get the latest on that severe weather. It is Monday morning. Janessa Webb, good morning. Hey, good morning. Just getting word from the National Weather Service confirming an EF3, also an EF1 tornado across the Arkansas area. So two tornadoes touching down. The great news is that it was a direct hit on the mall. If people would have been out and about, we could have had a massive uh, loss of lives. So good news there, but we're also still watching the severe weather threat across the deep south. It will continue for the next uh, two days, unfortunately, with damaging winds, also a few tornadoes possible. Temperatures are very warm across the south. We're back into the mid-80s. Also, the torrential rain going to be an issue up to one to two inches. That's a look at the big weather story of the day. Here's a closer look at your day ahead. So that rain that we're seeing across the south, it starts to filter into the northeast as well. Temperatures cooling off. We're back in the mid-40s, but still very warm for at least the next three days across the deep south into the southeast. After we get over this severe weather hump, we are in a stretch of just quiet. Oh, that's nice. I like that. A little bit of calm in our madness. All right. In uh, today's headlines, animal shelters, they're struggling during this coronavirus pandemic. So to help, between now and April 25th, Bush is offering a three-month supply of beer for anyone who fosters or adopts a dog from Midwest Animal Rescue Services. New Balance is helping the effort to stock medical supplies. The Boston-based footwear company is working to develop and manufacture facial masks. The company says the mask will be produced at its New England factories. Netflix's Tiger King is now television's most popular, According to Rotten Tomatoes, it has a 97% critics rating, 96% audience score. Everyone, sing a tiger, tiger saw a man. Leading the news, New Yorkers who break the social distancing rules could be fined hundreds of dollars. Mayor Bill de Blasio has authorized people to ticket people who are told to disperse but fail to do so. The fines would range from $250 to $500. In case you missed it over the weekend, we have some stunning images from the Vatican. Pope Francis delivering his special Ruby and Orbi prayer, which means to the city and the world. St. Peter's Square completely empty as the pontiff prayed for an end to the COVID-19 pandemic. The blessing was broadcast out to the faithful via Facebook, YouTube, television and radio. Among the coronavirus deaths we learned about Sunday, country music superstar Joe Diffie died of complications due to the virus. Diffie became well known in the 1990s with several number one singles. Among his most popular tunes, Prop Me Up Beside the Jukebox and John Deere Green. The Grammy winner was born and raised in Oklahoma. Joe Diffie was 61 years old. Meanwhile, we also learned that Grammy-winning singer and songwriter John Prine has been hospitalized for COVID-19-type symptoms. Prine's family says he is critically ill and has been placed on a ventilator. Eight people are dead in the Philippines after a medevac plane exploded into a ball of flames during takeoff in Manila. Airport officials say the plane was carrying six Filipino crew members and two passengers, one American and one Canadian. The flight was headed to Tokyo and was reportedly carrying supplies on a medical mission. A desperate search for a missing girl in Alabama has been called off after police say they located the child after she disappeared for nearly two days. Officials say four-year-old Evelyn Vady Sides was reported missing on Wednesday afternoon after she went walking with her dog. Rescuers say they found the child and her dog safe, adding that she is in good shape and is responsive. Evelyn and her furry friend have since been reunited with her parents. 
Good morning, everyone. We're doing our best to flatten the curve, and we continue to watch the data of our, our implied growth rate. Now, a positive spin this morning, a rate of 2.5 days has increased to 3.5. So we're seeing kind of an expansion of the bar graph and less people. This could mean less people are being tested. But from last Tuesday, look at the percentage. It is way down. We were at about 30.4, now at 16.6. So you're seeing the trend of this bar graph still going up. We're going to watch for still that consistency. That is really going to be key for at least the next three to five days. So we're just not seeing that yet, but you know, our percentages, they are definitely down. Yeah, it looks like yeah. encouraging numbers, but we are far, 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 from, far from out of the woods here. So a couple more weeks, keep up the social distancing, and hopefully this will all be over very, very soon. All right. Keeping fingers crossed tight. We are back with the story about the good deeds by and for the hardworking people bringing us mail, packages, and newspapers. NBC's Kate Snow has the story. It all started when newspaper delivery man Greg Daly was grocery shopping and suddenly thought about an 88-year-old customer. You know, I thought to myself, well, if Mrs. Ross can't get the paper at her sidewalk, which is probably 20 feet, how's she getting groceries? He called her, and sure enough, she needed items. Five minutes later, I'm standing online to pay for the stuff that I, that I have, and she called me back. And she goes, Greg, would you mind grabbing something for Mrs. Miller across the street? That's when he started putting this note inside every newspaper he delivers, offering to pick up groceries or basically anything. You know, they're amazing people, and you know, if you get a chance to help them, you help them. They're very nice to meet you. Sandy Driska and her husband are quarantined at home. Your godson. Oh, gosh, Greg. And you know, he's not even asking for money. He's doing this out of the kindness of his heart. All over the country, families are appreciating delivery people, leaving notes and goodie bags, snacks and cold drinks, even toilet paper. Can we take one of these? Yeah, absolutely. It's for you. Oh, uh, man, you, you are life saving. Thank you. In Phoenix, the Wilson family left hand sanitizer on their mailbox, thanking their mail carrier, Marco. Ann Dials, whose family's been delivering mail in Kentucky since the 1940s, wanted to help her mail carrier stay healthy, too. I think we should all take care of our mail carriers, so I think everybody should at least help them out a little bit. It feels good to help and to receive. Basically, it gives, you, it gives you a warm feeling, and it also gives you so much faith in humanity that really throughout this virus, we're all there to help one another, and we'll get through it. And our thanks to Kate Snow for that uh, amazing story there. And I'm telling you, when it comes to just anything to help out humanity right about now, for the take. Those no. delivery workers are really our lifeline right now. We're so yeah. grateful. You know how when you used to see uh, service members, you'd say thank you for your mm -hmm. service, and it's almost like these are our lifeline now, and we really appreciate people out there delivering the goods when we need them. It's the whole new world, and this is the positive side of it. Yeah. We love seeing. Sure is. All right, check out this principle here. Didn't let a little school closure keep her from giving some good news to a student. Take a look. I want to announce something to you today. Okay. You are GTA's 2020 Class Valedictorian. I am. You are. Oh gosh, thank you so you much. Are. Principal Flooring surprised Caitlin Watson there right at the drive-thru with the honorary title and said that calling or video calling her just didn't feel good enough. So Caitlin just got the news that I'm valedictorian. I can yeah. quit now. No right? more ice cream cones. And to be able to have it on camera <laughs> for all cool. of us to see too in that video. Yeah. Great to be able to share. That's right. Congratulations, Sarah. Thanks for watching early today. I'm Philip Meta. And I'm Francis Rivera. Your news continues right here. Stay safe. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. This is all I've got left. Good afternoon from the spin room. It's news made for your streaming world. NBC News Now. If it's digging in on the issues. Let's talk about money and politics. If it's asking the questions you want to ask. How do you reassure those supporters that you will sustain this? Just watch me. If it's navigating the winding road to the White House. And if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Need your true crime fix on the go? Dateline episodes are available as podcasts. Mysteries with a twist from the true crime original. Wow. Listen to Dateline wherever you get your podcasts. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. This is all I've got left. Who brought more to the caucuses? It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, 3 to 11 p.m. Eastern.
NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt, covering coronavirus with facts over fear. How do we know who belongs in isolation? What should we be conscious of? What's being worked on today? At a time of national crisis, turn to the most trusted TV news anchor in America. Over the weekend, the explosion of the coronavirus to all four corners of the nation spreading like a tsunami as the U.S. fast approaches 150,000 positive cases. This morning, we'll give you a revealing look at what one intensive care nurse faces in the midst of this pandemic. And workers at a major grocery delivery service are threatening to strike today. How it could impact your family. And we're following breaking news out of Arizona, where three police officers were ambushed. Early today starts right now. Good morning, I'm Philip Mena. And I'm Francis Rivera. As millions of Americans enter their 15th day on lockdown, President Trump extends the shutdown guidelines an additional month. Here's what you need to know at this hour. The spread of the coronavirus is fast and furious. This country now has the most number of cases worldwide, topping 142,000, surpassing China and Italy. The number of fatalities has now surpassed 2,000. In California, officials are preparing for surging cases as the numbers there top 6,000. Meanwhile, on the East Coast, a hospital ship is supposed to arrive in New York today. About 1,000 beds will be available to people who do not have COVID-19. That will help free up some space in hospitals overwhelmed by the pandemic. And two major health insurers are waiving the cost of coronavirus treatments. Cigna and Humana will cover payments for insured members. It will include things like treatment, hospitalizations, and ambulance transfers. And soccer star Cristiano Ronaldo and his Italian soccer teammates are giving up four months of wages to help curb the impact of the pandemic there. That's about $100 million. Ronaldo has also donated $1.1 million to help fight the virus in Portugal. After an Amazon employee tested positive, employees at a Staten Island warehouse are threatening to walk out today. They want the facility shut down and cleaned. And some Instacart workers are also threatening to strike today unless the company improves its coronavirus response. I talk about a win-win situation here. You can now foster a dog and get some free beer in the process. Bush is offering a free three-month supply of beer for anyone who fosters or adopts a dog from Midwest Animal Rescue in Minnesota. NFL legend Peyton Manning went back to school and crashed his former professor's class. Some students in the online communications class at the University of Tennessee could not believe it. Manning says he just wanted to cheer him up during the pandemic. Plus, here to keep you entertained during self-isolation is HQ Trivia. It abruptly went out of business last month. The mobile quiz app is back online thanks to an anonymous donor. And police in the U.K. got creative in an effort to keep those hardcore Instagrammers at home. They dyed that famous Blue Lagoon in Harpoor Hill black. Buxton police say they did what they had to do so people can follow orders and just stay at home. With nearly 60,000 confirmed cases, New York is a major hotspot for the virus. But officials are warning that the worst is yet to come for America's cities. Some states have even started screening people trying to drive across state lines. Here's NBC's Aaron McLaughlin. As the spread of COVID-19 accelerates, a warning. All corners of the country are at risk and America's cities vulnerable. Every metro area should assume that they could have an outbreak equivalent to New York. Sunday, new disaster declarations in Connecticut, Oregon, Georgia, and a disaster request from Pennsylvania, where confirmed cases spiked by more than 20 percent. Please stay calm, stay home, and stay safe. In Louisiana, there's worry. They're days away from potential catastrophe. We're on a trajectory currently to exceed our capacity in the New Orleans area for ventilators by about April the 4th. But there's also defiance. Despite an order banning gatherings larger than 50, Pastor Tony Spell refuses to cancel Sunday service, attended by hundreds. The church, again, is not a non-essential. Okay? The church is the most essential thing in all the world. 
While some shrug off the threat, states are taking extraordinary measures to slow the virus spread. Our huge concern is that if people start to travel south, then we are going to have um, a huge uprise in our cases. In Florida, they're expanding checkpoints at major interstates, screening motorists coming from COVID hotspots, including New York and Louisiana. In North Carolina, the Outer Banks now require an entry permit, while states see a surge of cases, including Michigan. Detroit's now home to the third largest outbreak behind New York and Chicago. Here, too, there's a concern about resources. The scarcity of resources is not something I thought I would ever have to face in this country, and I know that in my state it's already happening. Similar worry in California, where there's more than 5,000 confirmed cases. This weekend, the number in critical care doubled to more than 400. And across the country, convention centers now turned makeshift hospitals. Our thanks to Aaron for that report. President Trump is abandoning hopes of restarting the economy by Easter after that dire new prediction from his top infectious disease expert. Dr. Anthony Fauci said yesterday that the U.S. could see more than 100,000 deaths from coronavirus. Let's turn to our Capitol Hill correspondent, Tracy Potts, who joins us with more. And Tracy, the president is extending those social uh, distancing guidelines for at least another month. Right, Francis. Remember, the president wanted to get the economy going again, have everyone out and about, businesses open by Easter. Well, he's backing off that now based on the latest projections. The president now saying that Americans should be staying inside, social distancing, uh, and not going out unless necessary uh, until the end of April, until April 30th. That is the guideline now from the federal government based on these latest projections that show not only will millions of Americans uh, get this virus, but as many as 200,000 could die from it. If we could hold that down, as we're saying, to 100,000, it's a horrible number. Maybe even less, but to 100,000. So we have between 100 and 200,000. Uh, we all together have done a very good job. The better you do, the faster this whole nightmare will end. Therefore, we will be extending our guidelines to April 30th to slow the spread. Now, the president also locked in a battle with some governors accusing some states of hoarding supplies, uh, some hospitals of hoarding supplies, whereas some states, uh, specifically with Democratic governors, say that the federal government is slow to send them those supplies. Francis? All right, Tracy Potts, keeping us up to date. Tracy, thank you. The world continues to feel the wrath of the deadly coronavirus that is quickly spreading from continent to continent. Global cases have now surpassed 720,000, with the U.S. leading this dubious list, followed by hard-hit Europe, where they continue to struggle with the mounting death toll. As cases rise, it's forcing more countries to enforce stricter lockdowns and travel bans. Meanwhile, in Asia, the former, the former epicenter of the virus is still reporting new cases as it slowly emerges from the lockdown. And for the latest, we turn now to NBC's Ali Aruzi live for us from London. Hey, Ali, good morning. Good morning, Philip. That's right. A staggering 723,000 cases around the world, and we've gone over 34,000 deaths. Now, in hard-hit Italy, we've seen a slight fall in the number of daily deaths, but they still have the world's largest death toll at over 10,080, with 97 uh, positive cases there. Cemeteries are overflowing in Italy because they just can't cope with the number of dead. They're being forced to... Uh, to store people in churches and families aren't even allowed to attend the funeral. And uh, they've also deployed helicopters in Italy, Philip, as a sort of eye in the sky to try and find people that are evading strict lockdown rules. In Spain, there are also very strict lockdown rules and the situation isn't much better there than in Italy. They have almost 7,000 people that have died of COVID-19. If you combine the total number of deaths 
deaths in Spain and Italy, that makes up for half the global death toll, which is really quite remarkable. Over in Italy, in the Vatican City, somebody at the Pope's office had tested positive for COVID-19. Uh, the Vatican say that the Pope has been tested and he is negative. Here in the UK, Philip, the heir to the throne, uh, the Prime Minister and the Health Minister have all contracted COVID-19 and a senior health official in this country says that social distancing and lockdown rules may stay in place uh, till June. Uh, Africa is also getting affected quite badly by the virus. Nigeria going into lockdown. That's the most populated country in Africa. All right. It seems pretty much no part of the globe is untouched by this. Uh, Ali Ruzi for us in London. Thanks, Ali. Now to breaking news in Arizona where a Phoenix police officer is dead and two more are injured after a shooting at a home. The Phoenix Police Department says Commander Greg Carnicle was shot and killed while responding to a domestic violence call late last night. He was a 31-year veteran just months shy away from retirement. The two injured officers are expected to survive. According to our Phoenix affiliate, the situation appears to be over and police are planning to give us an update at a press conference later this morning. All right, let's see what the last Monday of the longest month in the history of uh, months <laughs> seems like uh, has in store for us. Janessa Webb, good morning. Good morning. It has definitely been a long month and it was a long weekend. We had a severe weather outbreak across the central part of the U.S., Arkansas, seeing two touchdown, an EF-1 and EF-3, the National Weather Service just confirming. Also, the severe weather threat will continue to start off the week. It will push out of here by Wednesday. But unfortunately, the torrential rain going to be a really big issue from Oklahoma City all the way into Memphis, where they could see another one to two inches. So the brunt of this storm will run through the deep south to the southeast before it starts to push offshore. Also, warm temperatures in place with the highs. They're still in the mid 80s. That's a look at the big weather story of the day. Here's a closer look at your day ahead. So some of that rain that we're seeing across the south, it starts to make its way into the northeast as well. We're seeing kind of that fluctuation in temperatures. If you're across northern New England in the mid-30s, New York City, mid-50s. So that warm air, we're talking near 90 degrees across the south. That's sparking up the severe weather. Wow, I would think so. Thank you, Janessa. We are back now with a deeply personal look at a day in the life of an intensive care nurse. Like so many of our health care's heroes, she's working around the clock tending to coronavirus patients and also taking care of her own family during this difficult time. And this is her story. Time to start the day again. Good morning. My name is Elise Sopo. I'm a nurse practitioner in the medical ICU at North German Hassett. I'm about to take my temperature because every morning and every night, I'm taking my temperature to make sure I stay healthy to take care of my patients. So I'm by one of the nurses station right now and we have the doctor just watching in the room to make sure everything's going okay with the nursing staff inside. The unit that I work in is a COVID quarantined critical care unit, highest acuity, sickest patients that we have in the health system right now. People are 20, 30, 40, 50, much younger than we expected. This is the tubing from the, the ventilator. The ventilator is the breathing machine that goes to a patient. The tube goes into the patient's mouth, into the patient's lung, and inflates and deflates the lungs to help you breathe. If a patient's heart is not doing well, we put them on a cardiac bypass machine. This only affects the lungs and helps with the breathing. So now we need to bypass the lungs, and this machine will purify the lungs and oxygenate the patient and give the patient oxygen while his lungs are healing. Now, I want to do this. I have some tears and crying right now because I'm so tired. But I'm going to take a deep breath and keep going on. I think I just needed that a little let down, but now I'm going to continue on and powering through back into the unit to stay strong. Today is day five of a 13 hour shift week. I usually do three days a week. I'm up to five 13 hour shifts this week and I'm tired. So I'm about to change my scrubs to head home to see my babies. 
And our thanks to Elisa Sopo for that. And hopefully when she gets home, she gets big hugs from her entire family, everything that she needs, because she's going to wake up and do it again. Yeah, tomorrow. nice long rest. Get it while you can. Like you said, exhausted. Just the emotional toll that is ticking on everybody. Again, cannot thank our healthcare workers enough right now. In today's quick hits, the volunteers in Iowa, Cedar Rapids, uh, are using 3D printers to help workers on the front line. Since schools are closed, the school district there is now using all of their 3D printers to create face guards. So far, they've created thousands of guards for doctors and patients to use. Krispy Kreme is offering a sweet thank you to healthcare workers. On Mondays, anyone in the medical industry can get up to five dozen original glazed donuts for free. The offer starts today and will last every Monday until May 11th. And while many are binge watching shows during the lockdown, Netflix Tiger King is now TV's most popular, according to Rotten Tomatoes. It has a 97% critics rating and 96% audience scoring. And I tell you what, once you let Joe Exotic enter your world, <laughs> your life will be changed forever. One way or another, it is a fascinating show to say the least. All right. Stocks, they have been on a roller coaster over the past month and, and today it looks no differently to start the week, but there is a silver lining for consumers. Let's get over to CNBC's Karen Cho, who's live in London for us with a preview of the markets and news on prices at the pump. Uh, hi, Karen. Good morning. Philip and Francis, thank you very much. We are setting up for another volatile session and a volatile week. Futures trading higher initially, now moving south for the Dow as you take a look at the early morning action on Wall Street. Now, investors last week pushed up the Dow 12% over the course of the week. Its biggest weekly gain since 1938 as investors responded to fiscal stimulus, open-ended asset purchases from the Fed, also the president signing into law a $2 trillion stimulus package. But the president also shuffled out his date when he expects business to return to normal from about mid-April to about the 30th of April now. And remember, the longer the lockdown, the longer the stricter measures take place, the bigger the economic hit. So investors will weigh that this week, along with the more jobs numbers coming out from the private sector, also the payrolls report. And don't forget, of course, uh, investors looking very much towards the oil price slump. We've seen WTI below $20 and Brent prices touching 23 That is the lowest we've seen since 2002. That drop will have an impact on the stock market. We continue to see the Saudis wage that price war with the Russians, and they say they're not in talks to end it any time soon. So uh, I'll send it back to you on that note. Expect some more wild swings on Wall Street. Karen Cho joining us uh, with the very latest on what's going on with our money. Karen, thank you. Hi, everyone. We're doing the best to flatten this curve, and we're seeing the rate of every two days it be expanded to now every three days. So this chart continues to go on, go on the upward spiral, but look at the percentage. Compared to last Tuesday, we were at 30.8%, now at 16.8%. So a little bit of progress. Going to watch the consistency for at least the next five to seven days. Workers at a major grocery delivery service are threatening to strike. Employees at Instacart are fighting for better working conditions as they deliver food to millions of Americans during the pandemic. Sam Brock has the story. As many as 200,000 Instacart workers could instantly be off the front lines. A lot of us are really literally making the decision between, you know, our health and our financial security right now. They're demanding hazard pay and better safety gear or they'll strike, no longer shopping for and delivering your groceries. Instacart telling employees through blog post, we're immensely grateful for all that you do to support families and people in need. They're offering more than a month of pay for anyone diagnosed with COVID-19 and one-time bonuses. The anxiety also being felt at traditional grocers. Is it scary at all to go to work right now? I don't sleep much because I'm scared of what I will bring home to my children. Candace Oglesby lives in North Texas. Her son is immunocompromised. The cashier says she's in contact with people all day long and wants her national grocery employer, who she's not identifying, to acknowledge that and pay. They're putting their life and they're putting their safety and their health on the line. Many of America's largest grocery stores have ramped up pay and protections, from temporary salary hikes to bonuses. And across the board, companies are putting up plexiglass at registers, installing social distancing reminders, and cleaning stores round the clock. 
grocers in particular are at a higher risk, not as high a risk as, say, a healthcare worker, but they are at a higher risk than the general public. If you're worried about your safety when shopping, anytime you use any surface that people touch a lot, like card handles, for example, make sure you wipe it down with a disinfectant wipe, wear gloves, or you can also use the cloth as a barrier if you need to. Once you get inside the supermarket, stand at least six feet away from everybody else and do not touch your face. Now, once you get home, you got all these bags, wipe off every surface they touch. And for anything that comes inside of a box, take the contents out and wipe that off too. As shelves remain stocked, the people making sure they stay that way deemed essential employees by only a few states, opening up access to emergency childcare and testing. I would give anything to be able to test myself right now. Sam Brock, NBC News, Miami. I would think those Instacart workers would have more leverage than ever mm -hmm. right now. I don't think yeah, the delivery service has never been in higher demand. We all need them. All right. So if you want to spread a message, one way to do it is on the side of a mountain. An artist in Switzerland used the side of the Matterhorn as his canvas. The mountain, which borders Italy, was lit up with words like hope and stay home. It also had an image of a heart. All of this to show support for everyone battling this pandemic. It looks like just computer graphics right there, but very much the real deal. Sure is. Yeah. Thank you for watching early today on this Monday. I'm Philip Mena. And I'm Francis Rivera. Stay healthy, stay safe. We'll see you back here tomorrow. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. This is all I've got left. Good afternoon from the spin It's room. news made for your streaming world. NBC News Now. We're here for them. We are the community. It's definitely good to hear. You always want to hear that the wages are going up. We work hard, we bleed, we sweat, we cry when it comes to these cars. Without this pill, we die. He's doing the best he can for the country, and they're getting in the way. We're going to build the wall. We have no choice. This is an emergency. There are zero hours left to take action. Because we're incarcerated doesn't mean that we should lose our right to vote. This is the perfect time to graduate. There's like a lot of shooting happening. These are thoughtful voters who, more than anything, want these candidates to cut to the chase. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt, covering coronavirus with facts over fear. How do we know who belongs in isolation? What should we be conscious of? What's being worked on today? At a time of national crisis, turn to the most trusted TV news anchor in America. Need your true crime fix on the go? Dateline episodes are available as podcasts. Mysteries with a twist from the true crime original. Wow. Listen to Dateline wherever you get your podcasts. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. This is all I've got left. Who brought more to the caucuses? It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, 3 to 11 p.m. Eastern. from Washington. Why should your judgment be valued? I'd stake my judgment against anyone out there. Is party unity your concern right now, or is simply winning as many states as you well, can? Well, it's both. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. If it's digging in on the issues. Let's talk about money and politics. If it's asking the questions you want to ask. How do you reassure those supporters that you will sustain this? Just watch me. If it's navigating the winding road to the White House. And if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. The coronavirus outbreak. What's next? NBC News has in-depth coverage, answers to your questions, insight from medical experts, and up-to-the-minute live blog updates. For continuing coverage, turn to the networks and platforms of NBC News. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. This is all I've got left. Good afternoon from the spin It's room. news made for your streaming world. NBC News Now.
New York State has surpassed 1,000 deaths from the coronavirus as a field hospital is being built in Central Park while area hospitals are pushed to the limit. States ramping up travel advisories as others are watching and learning from New York's rapid explosion of coronavirus cases. And the incredible story of how a newspaper delivery man's simple act of kindness towards a neighbor has snowballed into so much more. Early today starts right now. Glad you're with us to start off this week. I'm Francis Rivera. And I'm Philip Mena. The stark reality of the coronavirus pandemic is coming into focus here in America. The White House has now extended its social distancing guidelines at least until April 30th. President Trump says he believes Easter will mark the peak number in the United States. In New York City, the number of confirmed cases has soared to nearly 60,000. A field hospital is being constructed in Central Park. It'll be able to accommodate 68 patients and will have 10 ventilators for the most seriously ill. The U.S. Naval Hospital ship Comfort is expected to arrive in New York Harbor today. About 1,000 beds will be available to people who do not have COVID-19, and that'll free up some spaces in hospitals battling the pandemic. Volunteers in Iowa are doing their part to keep our health care workers protected. The Cedar Rapids School District reallocated all of their 3D printers so volunteers could make thousands of face masks. And as more people stay at home and order food and supplies, there are growing concerns about the safety of the people filling those orders. After an Amazon employee tested positive, employees at a Staten Island warehouse are threatening to walk out today. They want the facility shut down and cleaned. And some Instacart workers are also threatening to strike today unless the company improves its coronavirus response. Meanwhile, two major health insurers are waiving the cost of coronavirus treatments. Cigna and Humana will waive co-payments for insured members. This will cover treatment, hospitalizations, and ambulance transfers. And Krispy Kreme is offering a sweet thank you to health care workers. On Mondays, anyone in the medical industry can get up to five dozen original glazed donuts for free. The offer starts today and lasts every Monday until May 11th. President Trump is abandoning hopes of restarting the economy by Easter after that dire new prediction from his top infectious disease expert. Dr. Anthony Fauci said yesterday the U.S. could see more than 100,000 deaths from coronavirus. Our Capitol Hill correspondent, Tracy Potts, joining us now with more. Uh, Tracy, good morning. So the president is extending the social distancing guidelines for at least another month? Exactly. So now he says that uh, people across America should be social distancing until April 30th, until the end of next month. Remember, the president had said that he wanted uh, the economy going again, people out and about, businesses working by Easter. But the latest projections don't seem to support that. In fact, those latest projections show that millions of Americans will end up infected with this virus. And as many as 200,000, maybe less, but as many as 200,000 could die as a result of that. If we could hold that down, as we're saying, to 100,000, it's a horrible number. Maybe even less, but to 100,000. So we have between 100 and 200,000. We all together have done a very good job. The better you do, the faster this whole nightmare will end. Therefore, we will be extending our guidelines to April 30th to slow the spread. The president also taking some heat from governors across the country, uh, specifically Democrats who say he's playing politics with doling out some of those supplies, masks and, and respirators, while the president accuses some states of hoarding the supplies. Philip? Joining us with uh, the very latest on the coronavirus here in the states. Tracy, thank you. And at the epicenter of the U.S. pandemic, New York Governor Andrew Cuomo is extending a stay-at-home order for at least two more weeks. The decision comes on the heels of a new travel advisory from the CDC urging people in the tri-state area to refrain from all non-essential domestic travel. NBC's Kathy Park has the latest. Francis Philip, good morning. The coronavirus crisis is intensifying across the country, and President Trump extended the social distancing guidelines until the end of April. Meantime, here in New York, it's still considered the epicenter of the U.S. outbreak as the death toll approaches 1,000. As the coronavirus continues its deadly march across the country, this warning for Americans. Looking at what we're seeing now, you know, I would say between 100 and 200,000 cases, excuse me, deaths. 
I mean, we're, we're going to have millions of cases, but I, I just don't think that we really need to make a projection when it's such a moving target. What we do know, Jake, is that we got a serious mm -hmm. problem in New York. We have a serious problem in New Orleans, and we're going to be developing serious problems in other areas. This after the CDC issued a late Saturday travel advisory for New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut residents, telling them to refrain from non-essential domestic travel for two weeks. The notice creating confusion after President Trump first weighed the possibility of a short-term quarantine in those states, but later backed away from the idea. Governors were given full discretion over the new rollout and said the advisory is already in practice. It's totally consistent with everything we're doing. That's something that, uh, as I say, it's de facto happening already. We're uh, discouraging people from traveling. Uh, and making sure they stay as home as much as possible. With at least 59,000 positive cases and approximately 42 percent of coronavirus deaths in the U.S. centered in New York, Today, Governor Andrew home Cuomo home extended the stay-at-home order through April 15th, stretching into major holidays like Easter and Passover. The state is trying to get ahead of the outbreak's peak, mobilizing a temporary hospital at this Manhattan Convention Center and awaiting the arrival of the U.S. naval ship that will provide extra beds for non-COVID-19 cases. And even more help is on the way. The president announcing that a flight arrived at JFK with millions of critical medical supplies for health care workers stretched thin. And after pressure from New York's governor, the governor of Rhode Island repealed the executive order that had police and National Guard members knocking on doors and checking cars for visiting New Yorkers, telling them they must self-quarantine for 14 days. And behind me is the Javits Center, which has been transformed into a temporary hospital with 1,000 beds. And over at Central Park, there is an emergency field hospital also in the works. Triage tents were going up this weekend, and it should be operational on Tuesday. Guys, back to you. All right. Thanks to Kathy Park for that report. As the virus spreads around the world, more countries are shutting borders and cutting travel to and from in an effort to curb infection rates. But these measures have left some Americans trapped in other countries, struggling to find a way back home. Here's NBC's Sarah Harmon. Tens of thousands of Americans are stranded overseas. In India, there's chaos as the government imposes a lockdown on more than a billion people, including Peter Joseph from San Diego. He's been stuck in his hostel for eight days. We feel completely not heard. Uh, we feel abandoned. On the other side of the world, Peru closing its borders sending Americans scrambling to the airport. Yes, <laughs> looking forward to going home. Green Bay Packers quarterback Aaron Rodgers describing his own harrowing escape in a radio interview. There was some moments where we were worried we were not going to get out. It was absolute pandemonium at the airport. Others weren't so lucky. Yesterday, the only meal we got was lunch. Zachary Mextroth has been stuck in a youth hostel in Cusco for 13 days. You got a repatriation flight through the State Department, but you weren't allowed to leave the youth hostel. Correct. So... The hostel manager said that if I were to leave with that document, I would get arrested. The State Department saying we have no higher duty than to protect American citizens and have launched an unprecedented global effort to bring home our citizens from every corner of the globe. But not everyone can be rescued easily. Those on cruise ships stranded at sea, unwelcome in any harbor. The Zan Dam off the coast of Panama, carrying four dead and more than 100 sick, transferring its healthy passengers to another vessel, as stranded Americans around the world wonder when and how they'll ever get home. Sarah Harmon, NBC News. The coronavirus continues its global rampage with no signs of slowing down. Over 721,000 people have been infected worldwide and over 33,000 people have died. In Europe, the number of deaths in Italy is overwhelming, but Spain is quickly catching up. Meanwhile, in Asia, the former epicenter of the virus is still reporting new cases as it slowly emerges from lockdown. For the latest, we turn to NBC's Ali Ruzzi, who's live in London. Ali, good morning. 
Good morning, Francis. That's right, a staggering 723,000 people have been affected around the world with over 34,000 deaths. And almost every corner of the world has been affected by the coronavirus. And it won't be long till we surge past a million global numbers. Now, in Italy, the daily death rate fell slightly, but it still has the highest death rate in the world with over 10,800 people have died from the virus and 97,000 thousand cases. Cemeteries there are, are overflowing. Uh, the dead are being stored in churches. Uh, families are not allowed to attend funerals, robbing the dead of all of their dignity. Uh, in Italy, they've also deployed helicopters in the sky, sort of an eye in the sky to catch people out who are not abiding by the strict lockdowns that have been put in place. And the situation in Spain isn't much better either. That country has about 7,000 deaths right now. It's also on a very strict lockdown. If you combine the death toll from Italy and Spain, that accounts for over half of the world's death toll. Uh, in the UK, the heir to the throne, the prime minister and the health minister have all tested positive for COVID-19. And a senior health official in this country says that lockdown and social distancing in this country may be extended until June. Uh, in in, in the Vatican, somebody tested uh, positive for COVID-19 in the in the pontiff's residence. Uh, his office say that he has been tested for the virus and has now um, tested negative for it, Francis. All right, Ali Ruzzi for us, live in London, LA. Thank you for the update. Breaking news out of Arizona, where a po Phoenix police officer is dead and two more are injured after a shooting at a home. The Phoenix Police Department says Commander Greg Carnical was shot and killed while responding to a domestic violence call late last night. He was a 31-year veteran just months away from retirement. The two injured officers are expected to survive. According to our Phoenix affiliate, the situation appears to be over and police are planning to give us an update at a press conference later this morning. And many people across the South and Midwest are also facing the added threat of tornadoes. The hardest hit area is in Jonesboro, Arkansas, where the city took a direct hit. Highway cameras captured the path of destruction. More than 20 people were hurt. The city's mayor says that the shelter-in-place order to prevent the spread of coronavirus likely helped save lives in this situation as well. Let's get the latest on that severe weather. It is Monday morning. Janessa Webb, good morning. Hey, good morning. Just getting word from the National Weather Service confirming an EF3, also an EF1 tornado across the Arkansas area. So two tornadoes touching down. The great news is that it was a direct hit on the mall. If people would have been out and about, we could have had a massive uh, loss of lives. So good news there, but we're also still watching the severe weather threat across the deep south. It will continue for the next uh, two days, unfortunately, with damaging winds, also a few tornadoes possible. Temperatures are very warm across the south. We're back into the mid-80s. Also, the torrential rain going to be an issue up to one to two inches. That's a look at the big weather story of the day. Here's a closer look at your day ahead. So that rain that we're seeing across the south, it starts to filter into the northeast as well. Temperatures cooling off. We're back in the mid-40s, but still very warm for at least the next three days across the deep south into the southeast. After we get over this severe weather hump, we are in a stretch of just quiet. Oh, that's nice. I like that. A little bit of calm in our madness. All right. In uh, today's headlines, animal shelters, they're struggling during this coronavirus pandemic. So to help, between now and April 25th, Bush is offering a three-month supply of beer for anyone who fosters or adopts a dog from Midwest Animal Rescue Services. New Balance is helping the effort to stock medical supplies. The Boston-based footwear company is working to develop and manufacture facial masks. The company says the mask will be produced at its New England factories. Netflix's Tiger King is now television's most popular, according According to Rotten Tomatoes, it has a 97% critics rating, 96% audience score. Everyone, sing a tiger, tiger saw a man. Leading the news, New Yorkers who break the social distancing rules could be fined hundreds of dollars. Mayor Bill de Blasio has authorized people to ticket people who are told to disperse but fail to do so. The fines would range from $250 to $500. In case you missed it over the weekend, we have some stunning images from the Vatican. Pope Francis delivering his special Ruby and Orbi prayer, which means to the city and the world. St. Peter's Square completely empty as the pontiff prayed for an end to the COVID-19 pandemic. The blessing was brought
broadcast out to the faithful via Facebook, YouTube, television, and radio. Among the coronavirus deaths we learned about Sunday, country music superstar Joe Diffie died of complications due to the virus. Diffie became well known in the 1990s with several number one singles. Among his most popular tunes, Prop Me Up Beside the Jukebox and John Deere Green. The Grammy winner was born and raised in Oklahoma. Joe Diffie was 61 years old. Meanwhile, we also learned that Grammy-winning singer-songwriter John Prine has been hospitalized for COVID-19-type symptoms. Prine's family says he is critically ill and has been placed on a ventilator. Eight people are dead in the Philippines after a medevac plane exploded into a ball of flames during takeoff in Manila. Airport officials say the plane was carrying six Filipino crew members and two passengers, one American and one Canadian. The flight was headed to Tokyo and was reportedly carrying supplies on a medical mission. A desperate search for a missing girl in Alabama has been called off after police say they located the child after she disappeared for nearly two days. Officials say four-year-old Evelyn Vady Sides was reported missing on Wednesday afternoon after she went walking with her dog. Rescuers say they found the child and her dog safe, adding that she is in good shape and is responsive. Evelyn and her furry friend have since been reunited with her parents. Good morning, everyone. We're doing our best to flatten the curve, and we continue to watch the data of our, our implied growth rate. Now, a positive spin this morning, a rate of 2.5 days has increased to 3.5. So we're seeing kind of an expansion of the bar graph and less people. This could mean less people are being tested, but from last Tuesday, look at the percentage. It is way down. We were at about 30.4, now at 16.6. So you're seeing the trend of this bar graph still going up. We're going to watch for still that consistency. That is really going to be key for at least the next three to five days. So we're just not seeing that yet, but you know, our percentages, they are definitely down. Yeah, it looks like yeah. encouraging numbers, but we are far, 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 from, far from out of the woods here. So a couple more weeks, keep up the social distancing, and hopefully this will all be over very, very soon. All right. Keeping fingers crossed tight. We are back with the story about the good deeds by and for the hardworking people bringing us mail, packages, and newspapers. NBC's Kate Snow has the story. It all started when newspaper delivery man Greg Daly was grocery shopping and suddenly thought about an 88-year-old customer. You know, I thought to myself, well, if Mrs. Ross can't get the paper at her sidewalk, which is probably 20 feet, How's she getting groceries? He called her, and sure enough, she needed items. Five minutes later, I'm standing online to pay for the stuff that I, that I have, and she called me back. And she goes, Greg, would you mind grabbing something for Mrs. Miller across the street? That's when he started putting this note inside every newspaper he delivers, offering to pick up groceries or basically anything. You know, they're amazing people, and you know, if you get a chance to help them, you help them. It's very nice to meet you. <laughs> Sandy Driska and her husband are quarantined at home. Your godson. Oh, gosh, Greg. And you know, he's not even asking for money. He's doing this out of the kindness of his heart. All over the country, families are appreciating delivery people, leaving notes and goodie bags, snacks and cold drinks, even toilet paper. Can we take one of these? Yeah, absolutely. It's for you. Oh, man, you, you are life saving. Thank you. In Phoenix, the Wilson family left hand sanitizer on their mailbox, thanking their mail carrier, Marco. Ann Dials, whose family's been delivering mail in Kentucky since the 1940s, wanted to help her mail carrier stay healthy, too. I think we should all take care of our mail carriers, so I think everybody should at least help them out a little bit. It feels good to help and to receive. Basically, it gives, you, it gives you a warm feeling, and it also gives you so much faith in humanity that really throughout this virus, we're all there to help one another, and we'll get through it. And our thanks to Kate Snow for that amazing story there. And I'm telling you, when it comes to just anything to help out humanity right about now, for the taking. Those okay. delivery workers are really our lifeline right now. We're so yeah. grateful. You know how when you used to see uh, service members, you'd say thank you for your service, and it's almost like these are our lifeline now, and we really appreciate people out there delivering the goods when we need them. It's the whole new world, and this is the positive side of it. Yeah. We love seeing. Sure is. All right, check out this principal here. Didn't let a little school closure keep her from giving some good news to a student. Take a look.
I want to announce something to you today. Okay. You are GTA's 2020 class valedictorian. I am. You are. Oh my gosh, thank you so you much. Are. Principal Flooring surprised Caitlin Watson there right at the drive-thru with the honorary title and said that calling or video calling her just didn't feel good enough. So Caitlin just got the news that... I'm valedictorian. I can yeah, quit now. No right? more ice cream cones. And to be able to have it on camera <laughs> for all cool. of us to see, too, in that video. Yeah. Great to be able to share. That's right. Congratulations, Sarah. Thanks for watching early today. I'm Philip Meta. And I'm Francis Rivera. Your news continues right here. Stay safe. You're watching NBC News Now. The battle against ISIS is now in its final stages. So you have smugglers using your ranch as a lookout point. There have been report after report of unsanitary and overcrowded conditions. That facility is cleaned every day. State of the Union address. Is anybody really getting much out of this anymore? President Trump became the first sitting U.S. president to set foot in North Korea this weekend. Welcome back to NBC News. Now we've got some breaking news. And all of a sudden, the entire apartment started rocking. NBC News can confirm that Iran seized a British oil tanker. For not following international maritime regulations. Right now, San Juan is at a standstill. The spin room, this will be the center of the political universe. Dehydration, uh, fatigue, malnourishment, a lot of people are simply feeling hopeless for what lies ahead. In the time that you and I have been talking, we've lost at least two football fields worth of the Amazon. It's just a horror story. The Apollo 11 launch was 50 years ago today. I want to dig into our video archive. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. Oh, we got our very own Today Family Getaway. It's so exciting to be here. We are serving up a Today Cafe special. Universal Orlando Resort is the place. We have just loved seeing your beautiful shining faces. How sweet is that? Need your true crime fix on the go? Dateline episodes are available as podcasts. Mysteries with a twist from the true crime original. Wow. Listen to Dateline wherever you get your podcasts. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. This is all I've got left. Who brought more to the caucuses? It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, 3 to 11 p.m. Eastern. We've got this fundamental thing about human beings, and then we've got the way that we constitute our politics. And the danger is that if our politics grow too tribal, then we'll lose the sort of way of talking. Why is this happening? With Chris Hayes, subscribe now. From the president, a new timeline announcing the federal government's social distancing guidelines will stay in place Thank you. for at least another month. The peak in death rate is likely to hit in two weeks. Therefore, we will be extending our guidelines to April 30th to slow the spread. The president Sunday backing off his hope that the country would open up by Easter, now circling a new date on the calendar when he says life will finally get back to normal. We can expect that by June 1st, we will be well on our way to recovery. We think by June 1st, a lot of great things will be happening. Nothing would be worse than declaring victory before the victory is won. It comes as the president is now bracing Americans for a significant death toll. If we could hold that down, as we're saying to 100,000, it's a horrible number maybe even less, but to 100,000. So we have between 100 and 200,000. The White House Coronavirus Task Force emphasizing those higher figures. It's anywhere in the model between 80,000 and 160,000, maybe even potentially 200,000 people succumbing to this. I think it's entirely conceivable that if we do not mitigate to the extent that we're trying to do, 
that you could reach that number. Yeah, 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 it's possible. The president stressing the U.S. is facing an unprecedented crisis. I've been watching that for the last week on television. Body bags all over in hallways. I've been watching them bring in trailer trucks, freezer trucks, they're freezer trucks, because they can't handle the bodies. There's so many of them. I've seen things that I've never seen before. I mean, I've seen them, but I've seen them on television in faraway lands. I've never seen them in our country. Those comments following this dire assessment from Dr. Deborah Burks. No state, no metro area will be spared. A sobering reality check there from Dr. Deborah Burks. As for those dates, so April 30th right now, that's when the government hopes that they'll be able to loosen up those social distancing guidelines. Ja uh, excuse me, June 1st, when the president hopes Americans will return to their normal lives. That leaves the month of May when Americans, according to the president, would hopefully be able to return to their work, slowly venture out to bars and restaurants and get back to a little bit of normalcy. This morning, as an emergency field hospital is being built in iconic Central Park, New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut are now under a 14-day travel advisory. The CDC is urging people in the nation's worst coronavirus hotspot to halt non-essential domestic travel, as cases top 70,000 in the three states, with over 1,000 deaths. Not a lockdown, something much more consistent with what we've been actually saying and doing in the city and state already, which is telling people to stay home unless they have an essential reason to go somewhere. Today, the USNS Comfort is due to dock in New York Harbor. It will serve as a floating thousand bed hospital for non-coronavirus patients, freeing up beds on land. We still have to take care of pregnant women who have to deliver. We have to take care of patients who need emergency uh, surgery. We have to take care of kids. In the Bronx, ERs are packed. We are seeing a lot of younger patients that are coming through the door that are sicker as well. And that, that is surprising and a little scary. Of State Representative Isaac Robinson. Uh, Representative Robinson was a phenomenal advocate on behalf of the people of Hamtramck and Detroit. He had a big heart and um, a moral compass that drove all the work that he did on the behalf of the people he represented. And um, his passing is a, a day of sadness that I think everyone around the Capitol and certainly in his district um, are feeling. Since the last press conference on Thursday, President Trump approved my request for a major disaster declaration. The declaration means that Michigan is now eligible for participation in the Federal Emergency Management Agency programming, that's FEMA, uh, to provide relief for Michiganders impacted by COVID-19 and measures to slow the spread of the virus. This is helpful. This is a good thing for our state. I'm hopeful that next the president will review my request for individual assistance programs that provide meals to families who need them and the rental assistance and temporary housing for families. I look forward to the federal government's continued partnership and we are grateful for the, um, the things that have happened over the course of the last few days to help us fight this virus, truly grateful. I sent a letter to the United States Secretary of Defense, Mark Esper, requesting that the Department of Defense direct FEMA to support Michigan's request to use the Michigan National Guard for humanitarian purposes and to use the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers to help construct temporary hospitals. Over the weekend, we received a shipment of 112,000 N95 masks from the Strategic National Stockpile with another 8,000 on the way. Again, this is good news, but we still need more. We know that a hospital, one hospital in the Detroit area will go through 10,000 of these masks in a day. And so this is a, a helpful now in this moment, but we have a much greater need that we all need to be a part of making sure we meet. I want to acknowledge a few more businesses that have stepped up, and a number have, but Steelcase in particular, production of masks and face shields for our nurses and doctors. Dow and the dedicated employees um, that they have, have are manufacturing hand sanitizer. I signed a number of executive orders in the past couple of days, including orders that push all April 2020 state and city income tax filing deadlines to July of 2020. 
We've also uh, expanded absentee voting in the May 5th election. Uh, we've established a $2 million water restart grant program to restore service and access to clean water for Michiganders. We uh, are protecting vulnerable populations in Michigan's county jails and local lockups in juvenile detention centers during the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. And we've relaxed the scope of practice laws to give hospitals and other healthcare facilities the flexibility that they need to successfully deploy qualified physician assistants, nurses, and other healthcare providers to combat COVID-19. I signed two executive directives temporarily restricting discretionary spending by our state departments and agencies and temporarily suspending hiring, the creating of new positions, filling vacant positions, transfers, and promotions within the executive branch of state government. We are doing our part. I signed an agreement between Michigan and the U.S. Department of Labor to implement pandemic unemployment assistance and compensation programs to grant benefits to workers who do not already qualify for unemployment benefits. Workers include the self-employed, 1099 independent contractors, and low-wage workers who can no longer work because of this pandemic. The agreement also includes weekly benefits for all unemployed workers by $600 and extends benefit payments from 26 to 39 weeks. And I accepted the recommendation of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, the Detroit District, for an alternative care facility convert conversion at the TCF Center in the city of Detroit. FEMA will fund the construction and supply the state, which will have, and this uh, space will have 900 bed spaces approximately. So we have a few more updated numbers. Um, as of 3 o'clock yesterday, we had 5,486 confirmed cases of COVID-19, 132 deaths. We know that this number is going to continue to go up. Despite our aggressive efforts, this is to be expected. We will not see the benefit of these aggressive efforts for a little while. And that's why it's so important everyone continues to do your part. But I think it's important to pause for a minute and remember that each of these 132 Michiganders who've lost their lives had stories and families and friends and loved ones, people that we need to think about the real loss as we are combating a pandemic that is hurting our state and our people. We can't lose sight of that. Over the weekend, MDHHS launched a new volunteer website, www.michigan.gov slash fight COVID-19, where trained medical professionals can register to serve their fellow Michiganders by assisting hospitals in fighting COVID-19. We expect a great need for additional medical support in the coming days, and so we ask, please sign up now. State residents can also use the site to find out how they can help in their local communities, how they can connect to give blood or donate money or needed medical supplies. We've seen an incredible amount of strength and courage of Michiganders during this hard time of uncertainty, whether it's from communities donating food, money, and resources to those that need it, or from businesses using their technology to manufacture personal protective equipment. To bend the curve and slow the spread of COVID-19 in our state, we must all work together as Michiganders. Whether you're a medical professional looking to volunteer or someone who can give blood or donate to your local food bank, everyone can help out. We will get through this together. And when you see those numbers rise, don't think that it doesn't mean your participation, your staying at home isn't having an impact because it is and it will. Today I also signed two supplemental budgets that reprioritize funding to slow the spread of COVID-19. The supplemental was negotiated in good faith with my administration and the legislative leaders. Key priorities from both sides were included in the bill. But the world has changed since those negotiations and we must react and change along with it. I'll commend our State Budget Director, Chris Kolb, 
and the legislative leaders who engaged and agreed that due to the incredible toll that COVID-19 has taken on our health and our families and our economies, that it was important that I veto a number of line items to save tax dollars. It's too early to determine the exact impact on state revenues and knowing there is the potential for a significant loss in revenue, now is not the time to sign a bill for supplemental funding for anything other than dollars that can be utilized to help our COVID-19 response. I want to thank the legislative leaders, the Senate Majority Leader Mike Shirky, the Senate Democratic Leader Jim Ananek, the House Speaker Lee Chatfield, and the, the House Democratic Leader Chris Gregg. I'm grateful for their partnership during this tough time. With this action today, we will be committing $150 million to combat COVID-19. To date, the state has already expended more than $80 million to begin securing the more than 20 million masks, 2,000 ventilators, nearly 9,000 ounces, I'm sorry, 9 million ounces of hand sanitizer, more than 255,000 boxes of gloves, 2.4 million gowns, more than 2,000 beds, 210,000 testing kits, 3,000 thermometers, 185,000 face shields, 22,000 cart 22, cartons of disinfecting wipes, as well as other needed supplies. We have contracted for these things, and it is our hope that they all will um, get to Michigan as our contracts um, re reflect and require. Getting through this crisis requires all hands on deck. We're working together in an unprecedented way to fight this unprecedented enemy, COVID-19. I'm proud of the leadership of our team, um, and that is inclusive of everyone here at the Capitol. People across our state are stepping up and doing their part during this time of crisis. Amy, who is using her time to clean up local rivers and waterways, all while social distancing. Lisa, who is taking care of her 90-year-old mother and sewing masks for her neighbors who are healthcare workers. Paul, who is working from home wherever possible and maintaining our phone and internet services. Marie, who is working with our church to deliver food to families in need. Courtney, who's a teacher who's using Zoom to stay connected to our students. The coming days will be unlike any challenge we've ever had before. It will require fortitude, strength, and grace. Our frontline care workers, they need more support. Our sick will need more beds and care. Our, unemployment, our unemployed will need help. Our businesses will need information. But Michiganders are strong, smart, and determined people. We've always looked to one another. No matter who you are, where you come from, how you identify, no matter your age, your risk factors, your race or socioeconomic status, your health and safety matters. And I will keep fighting for you. We will get through this together, so long as everyone does their part. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to our Chief Medical Executive, Dr. Janae Keldew. Thank you, Governor Whitmer. <clears throat> I was saddened to hear of the passing of Representative Isaac Robinson yesterday, and my deepest condolences go out to his family. As the governor mentioned, COVID-19 continues to spread rapidly in Michigan. As of yesterday, Michigan had 5,486 cases. We saw an increase of over 1,800 cases in just two days. We also know of 132 deaths. We are still in the early stages of spread in Michigan and cases have not yet peaked. We, like other states in the country, are working hard to develop the best predictive models that will tell us how this disease will spread in our state. Current models suggest we are likely several weeks away from a peak in the number of cases here in Michigan. The goal of our response has been to slow the spread of the disease as much as possible, particularly so we protect our most vulnerable and so that we do not overwhelm our hospitals. Unfortunately, we know that several of our hospitals in the state, particularly in Southeast Michigan, are at capacity. Last week, we started implementing our hospital load balancing plan and we are pleased that many hospital leaders have stepped up to be relief hospitals in support of our public health response. 
based on the trajectory of the spread of this disease and the number of people that are requiring hospitalization, we need to utilize alternative, non-traditional sites of care. As the governor mentioned, we've already identified the TCF Center in Detroit as a site and plans are already underway to implement the build out at that facility to, to, to be able to take care of COVID-19 patients. We will need additional medical professionals, doctors, nurses, physician assistants, respiratory therapists and others to respond to this crisis. Yesterday, Governor Whitmer also signed an executive order relaxing scope of practice laws in the state. This important order will allow qualified professionals to work in medical facilities to help take care of this increased patient load. This past weekend, we also announced a new volunteer website, www.michigan.gov slash fight COVID-19. We encourage medical professionals who are willing and able to sign up. We are truly going to need everyone to chip in and donate their skills and expertise to fight this pandemic. We also continue to rapidly expand our testing capacity in the state. We've completed at least 15,000 tests between our state lab, uh, hospitals, and private laboratories. This broader testing will help us to get a better understanding of where the disease is in the state. While we are expanding our hospital capacity, getting more medical professionals to help, and expanding our testing, the most important thing we can all do right now is heed the governor's executive order to stay home and stay safe. No one is immune to this disease. People, young people in their 20s. America's Motor City now on the front lines in the fight against coronavirus. The U.S. Surgeon General now declaring Detroit a coronavirus hotspot. More than 5,000 cases have been reported in Michigan, and those numbers are expected to grow. Our emergency rooms have been packed. We are literally running out of inpatient capacity. Bob Riney oversees operations for the Henry Ford Health System in Detroit. In a leaked draft memo obtained by NBC News, the hospital outlines protocol in a worst case scenario, saying they would give priority treatment to those who would likely survive. The hospital acknowledged the letter, tweeting, we crafted a policy to provide guidance for making difficult patient care decisions. We hope never to have to apply them. Riney says hospitals are fighting a battle with no end in sight. Professionally, have you ever seen anything like this? You know, I've been in healthcare for 40 years and uh, been through a lot of different challenges that the industry has faced, but this one is different. This weekend, President Trump approved a disaster declaration for Michigan, unlocking federal assistance to help recovery efforts there. But not before criticizing the state's governor, Gretchen Whitmer, and her response to the outbreak, tweeting, failing Michigan governor must work harder. It's got to be all hands on deck. Uh, we are not one another's enemies. The enemy is the virus, and it is spreading, and it is taking American lives. Detroit's famous auto show has been canceled this year. Now, FEMA reportedly plans to turn the downtown convention space where it would have taken place into a makeshift field hospital for coronavirus patients. While this Ford plant is now rushing to manufacture masks and other personal protective equipment. Attention please, there is no congregating allowed. Cases are also skyrocketing in other major cities like Chicago, where an infant believed to be the nation's youngest victim died after testing positive for the virus. And down south, another American hotspot, New Orleans. We are being as creative as we can be, uh, but uh, unleashing more equipment is something that we desperately need as well. There are more than 3,000 cases in Louisiana, but in one town Sunday, Hundreds ignored the state's ban on large gatherings to attend church services. American cities stretch to their limit as the virus continues to surge. 
Interestingly, Michigan has put its manufacturing might into the battle against coronavirus, turning traditional auto manufacturing plants into manufacturing locations for traditional medical supply devices. Now, the governor did confirm that she received over 100,000 uh, N95 masks over the weekend. The U.S. Surgeon General declaring Detroit a hotspot and saying cases could get worse over the next week. And joining us now, the White House's Coronavirus Task Force Coordinator, Dr. Deborah Burks. Dr. Burks, good morning to you. It's good to have you with good us. Good morning. Good morning. So we've, we've heard this news now from the White House recommending that social distancing, what people should be doing, staying home, is expanded now for another month. The initial 15 days would have expired today, I believe. So what led to this change? What's the situation on the ground that requires this? You know, we get data every day um, from around the globe, but more importantly from the United States. I think everyone understands now that you can go from five to 50 to 500 to 5,000 cases very quickly. We see this in many metropolitan areas. We're very worried about every city in the United States and the potential for this virus to get out of control. And we really believe that Americans with the right information will stay home. And the president had said a couple of weeks ago he was hopeful, aspirational, that we could be back in business and packing masses on Easter Sunday. Obviously, this has changed. Now he's talking about potentially June 1st being a time that uh, America could return somewhat to normal. Where are you on that timeline? You know, I think we watch everything very carefully. Um, we, w we look at models, but we validate those models with the data that's coming in. And United States will look different than Europe, and Europe look different than Asia. And I think that we all have to be aware of that. It's not perfect science right now, because we're projecting based on what we have today. And we know that the doubling rate of this virus is very high. And so that's why these 30 days allows us to really do both diagnostics, finding out who is positive because they're sick, and allows us to also get surveillance fully in place to really answer your question. Yeah, it, you know, you're, you are in the middle of getting data, but you've seen quite a bit of data. I mean, to put it simply, is it worse than you would have expected it to be? Is, or is it better? Is the social distancing having an effect? I think in some of the metro areas, we were late in getting people to follow the 15-day guidelines. And so we know that from the time you start doing everything that you need, staying home, social distancing, not going out to any restaurant, bars, or even being careful in the grocery stores, absolutely religious hand washing, all of this, um, we see some metro areas came late to that. I think it will be when this is over, we'll have a lot of time to really compare data about what really worked with this epidemic so that if it comes back in the fall, we'll be better prepared both with treatments, but also in really understanding how it spreads. Dr. Fauci said yesterday we could see millions of cases in this country and as many as one to 200,000 deaths. Do you agree with that analysis? Is that a worst case scenario or something that uh, we should prepare ourselves as potentially likely? So in the flu models, the worst case scenario is between 1.6 million and 2.2 million deaths. That's the projection if you do nothing. So we've never really done all of these things that we're doing. We put them into a model. We've looked at the Italy data with their self-isolation. And that's where we come up with, if we do things together well, almost perfectly, we could get in the range of 100,000 to 200,000 fatalities. We don't even want to see wow, that. that, uh, that I know, but you know, you kind of take my breath away with that because what I hear you saying is that's sort of the best case scenario. If everything works and people do the things you're asking them to do, maybe you can hold the deaths to one to 200,000 in this country. Well, the best case scenario would be 100% of Americans doing precisely what is required. 
but we're not sure based on the data that you're sharing from around the world and seeing these pictures that all of America is responding in a uniform way to protect one another. So we also have to factor that in. Cities that don't social distances, that don't stay at home, that believe you can have social interactions, that believe you can have gatherings of homes of 20 and, and 10 people even, that is going to spread the virus even if everyone looks well. Yeah, I was, I was going to say, I believe on Meet the Press yesterday, you said that um, no state, no metro area will be spared. And I can imagine, you know, I grew up in Arizona. I, I remember watching things and thinking, oh, that's a big city problem. That's not going to happen here. What's your message to not just the, the metro areas, but to rural areas as well? So this virus, we think, can spread with a lot of asymptomatic and mild cases. And it's not until it gets into the vulnerable groups that you start to see the hospitalizations. So if you wait for that, if the metros and the rural areas don't take care now, by the time you see it, it has penetrated your community pretty significantly. And that's what we're concerned about. And that's why you have to prepare even though you think it's not there. Dr. Burks, I know it's a busy day, uh, nothing but busy days for you lately. Thank you very much for your time, ma'am. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Savannah. These days, connection and community come in unexpected forms, from virtual happy hours. Mine's a quarantini because it's, it's water. To brunches and dinner parties now happening remotely. Thank God for all of our devices and our FaceTimes and our duos and our Zooms and everything we're using because it, it does not feel so awful. It, it, you still feel connected. NASA astronaut Nick Hagg says some of the tools he used in space can help those of us trapped in our personal capsules here on Earth. When I was on orbit, I'd do crossword puzzles uh, with my boys over a video chat. And just being able to connect that way uh, was such a huge emotional boost. Zoom meetings have exploded in popularity over the past few weeks. It's now the number one free app for iPhone and Android. But not everyone has access to the Internet or feels comfortable using it. Hi, Grandma. Hello. The phone call is back. Verizon says its phone... The coronavirus crisis, a plane operating as an air ambulance to help fight the outbreak, bursting into flames during takeoff in the Philippines, killing a U.S. and Canadian national as well as doctors and nurses. 
riposino in pace. In Italy, priests bless coffins in rows, the death toll now nearly 11,000. The terrible new challenge, how to deal with so many dead. Italy has banned public funerals. Instead, they are attended by a handful of family, grieving alone, not allowed to see the body of their loved one. <laughs> Coronavirus remorseless, removing sacred traditions, dividing families in life and death. In Spain, the hospital is now inundated with patients. The Spanish death toll, more than 6,800. A court of justice turned into a morgue to house the many taken by this most unjust of killers. France's frightening numbers, now more than 40,000 infected. So many, they're sending patients to Germany. So far, France has seen more than 2,600 die. But the numbers in Europe could be overshadowed by countries like India, where recorded infections are only beginning their ascent. India locking down, leading to crowds trying to get home the reality of social distancing in a country of 1.3 billion. The British beginning a programme of screening health workers for the virus. One drive through testing centre in a shuttered amusement park. A reminder of happier times. I want to update you on the latest steps the government is taking. The Prime Minister, himself infected with coronavirus, rallying his country on a cell phone from self-isolation. We are going to do it. We are going to, to do it together. The UK, like the US, facing a long fight. One British government health official says life will return to some kind of normality, but that could take three to six months. Another lesson from over here, Savannah. Some people struggling in Italy to keep to the lockdown. This is a a marathon, not a sprint, but there they have found 50 people get this who are tested positive for coronavirus out and about. Those folks will now likely face jail, Savannah. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. This is all I've got left. Good afternoon from the spin It's room. news made for your streaming world. NBC News Now. White terrorism and white supremacist terrorism in this country is not some weird analog to al-Qaeda or ISIS. It's not some foreign thing that looks like something that we've been fighting in the war on terror. It's actually fundamentally as American as anything. And it is an existential threat to the multiracial, pluralistic, equal, and open democracy that we've been fighting for in this country since people died on the battlefield in the Civil War. Hey everybody, Steve Kornacki back here at the big board. It's more than numbers. These are the states that are going to winnow the field. They're probably going to create a front runner. It's what those numbers mean. Ideologically, you're seeing in this first wave a very similar electorate to what you saw in 2016. But age-wise, this is the big variable. This is why we don't allow Steve Kornacki to leave the building this (laughs) time of year. Nobody breaks it down like Kornacki. Need your true crime fix on the go? Dateline episodes are available as podcasts. Mysteries with a twist from the true crime original. Wow. Listen to Dateline wherever you get your podcasts. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. This is all I've got left. Who brought more to the caucuses? It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, 3 to 11 p.m. Eastern. Something new from Meet the Press, the Chuck Todd cast. An insider's take on politics and more with some of my favorite reporters. Get it for free wherever you get your podcasts. We've got this fundamental thing about human beings. And we've got the way that we constitute our politics. And the danger is that if our politics grow too tribal, they grow excessively tribal, then we'll lose this sort of way of talking. Why is this happening with Chris Hayes? Subscribe now. Vegas. Manchester, Washington. 
Why should your judgment be valued? I'd stake my judgment against anyone out there. Is party unity your concern right now, or is simply winning as many states as you well, can? Well, it's both. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Oh, we get to have our very own Today family getaway. Yeah. It's so exciting to be here. We are serving up a Today Cafe special. Universal Orlando Resort is the place. We have just loved seeing your beautiful, shining faces. How sweet is that? You're watching NBC News Now. The battle against ISIS is now in its final stages. So you have smugglers using your ranch as a lookout point. There have been report after report of unsanitary and overcrowded conditions. That facility is cleaned every day. State of the Union address. Is anybody really getting much out of this anymore? President Trump became the first sitting U.S. president to set foot in North Korea this weekend. Welcome back to NBC News. Now we've got some breaking news. And all of a sudden, the entire apartment started rocking. NBC News can confirm that Iran seized a British oil tanker. For not following international national maritime regulation. Right now, San Juan is at a standstill. The spin room, this will be the center of the political universe. Dehydration, uh, fatigue, malnourishment, a lot of people are simply feeling hopeless for what lies ahead. In the time that you and I have been talking, we've lost at least two football fields worth of the Amazon. It's just a horror story. The Apollo 11 launch was 50 years ago today. I want to dig into our video archive. Liftoff, we have a liftoff. This morning, as an emergency field hospital is being built in iconic Central Park, New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut are now under a 14-day travel advisory. The CDC is urging people in the nation's worst coronavirus hotspot to halt non-essential domestic travel, as cases top 70,000 in the three states, with over 1,000 deaths. Not a lockdown, something much more consistent with what we've been actually saying and doing in the city and state already, which is telling people to stay home unless they have an essential reason to go somewhere. Today, the USNS Comfort is due to dock in New York Harbor. It will serve as a floating thousand bed hospital for non-coronavirus patients, freeing up beds on land. We still have to take care of pregnant women who have to deliver. We have to take care of patients who need emergency uh, surgery. We have to take care of kids. In the Bronx, ERs are packed. We are seeing a lot of younger patients that are coming through the door that are sicker as well. And that, that is surprising and a little scary. Concerns are also growing about the lack of personal protective equipment, or PPE, for healthcare workers. It's incredibly frustrating for us. Our, our co-workers are getting sick. President Trump once again casting doubt on the amount of protective gear New York authorities are requesting. We're delivering millions and millions of different products, and all we do is hear that, can you get some more? Also in need, police officers. More than 5,000 members of the NYPD have called out sick. An estimated 900 are believed to have COVID-19. We are hurting. We are crying. And we continue to fight. The department is also reporting the death of its first uniformed officer, 23-year veteran detective Cedric Dixon. Two other civilian employees have also died. May we never forget the sacrifice of those workers who put themselves in harm's way to keep you and your family safe. New York City's mayor says there will now be fines for not social distancing in public here in the city, ranging from $250 to $500. As for this field hospital, it is set to open tomorrow. And joining us now, the White House's Coronavirus Task Force Coordinator, Dr. Deborah Burks. Dr. Burks, good morning to you. It's good to have you with good us. Good morning. Good morning. So we've heard... We've heard this news now from the White House recommending that social distancing, what people should be doing, staying home, is expanded now for another month. The initial 15 days would have expired today, I believe. So what led to this change? What's the situation on the ground that requires this? You know, we get data every day um, from around the globe, but more importantly, from the United States. I think everyone understands now that you can go from five to 50 to 500 to 5,000 cases very quickly. We see this in many metropolitan areas. We're very worried about every city in the United States and the potential for this virus to get out of control. And we really believe that Americans with the right information will stay home. 
And the president had said a couple of weeks ago he was hopeful, aspirational, that we could be back in business and packing masses on Easter Sunday. Obviously, this has changed. Now he's talking about potentially June 1st being a time that uh, America could return somewhat to normal. Where are you on that timeline? You know, I think we watch everything very carefully. Um, we w we look at models, but we validate those models with the data that's coming in. And United States will look different than Europe, and Europe look different than Asia. And I think that we all have to be aware of that. It's not perfect science right now, because we're projecting based on what we have today. And we know that the double ring rate of this virus is very high. And so that's why these 30 days allows us to really do both diagnostics, finding out who's positive because they're sick, and allows us to also get surveillance fully in place to really answer your question. Yeah, it, you know, you're, you are in the middle of getting data, but you've seen quite a bit of data. I mean, to put it simply, is it worse than you would have expected it to be, is, or is it better? Is the social distancing having an effect? I think in some of the metro areas, we were late in getting people to follow the 15-day guidelines. And so we know that from the time you start doing everything that you need, staying home, social distancing, not going out to any restaurant, bars, or even being careful in the grocery stores, absolutely religious hand washing, all of this, um, we see some metro areas came late to that. I think it will be when this is over, we'll have a lot of time to really compare data about what really worked with this epidemic so that if it comes back in the fall, we'll be better prepared both with treatments, but also in really understanding how it spreads. Dr. Fauci said yesterday we could see millions of cases in this country and as many as one to 200,000 deaths. Do you agree with that analysis? Is that a worst case scenario or something that uh, we should prepare ourselves as potentially likely? So in the flu models, the worst case scenario is between 1.6 million and 2.2 million deaths. That's the projection if you do nothing. So we've never really done all of these things that we're doing. We put them into a model. We've looked at the Italy data with their self-isolation. And that's where we come up with, if we do things together well, almost perfectly, we could get in the range of 100,000 to 200,000 fatalities. We don't even want to see wow, that. that, that I know, but you know, you kind of take my breath away with that because I, what I hear you saying is that's sort of the best case scenario. If everything works and people do the things you're asking them to do, maybe you can hold the deaths to one to 200,000 in this country. Well, the best case scenario would be 100% of Americans doing precisely what is required. But we're not sure, based on the data that you're sharing from around the world and seeing these pictures, that all of America is responding in a uniform way to protect one another. So we also have to factor that in. Cities that don't social distances, that don't stay at home, that believe you can have social interactions, that believe you can have gatherings of homes of 20 and, and 10 people even, that is going to spread the virus even if everyone looks well. Yeah, I was, I was going to say, I believe on Meet the Press yesterday, you said that um, no state, no metro area will be spared. And I can imagine, you know, I grew up in Arizona. I, I remember watching things and thinking, oh, that's a big city problem. That's not going to happen here. What's your message to not just the, the metro areas, but to rural areas as well? So this virus, we think, can spread with a lot of asymptomatic and mild cases. And it's not until it gets into the vulnerable groups that you start to see the hospitalizations. So if you wait for that, if the metros and the rural areas don't take care now, by the time you see it, it has penetrated your community pretty significantly. And that's what we're concerned about. And that's why you have to prepare even though you think it's not there. Dr. Burks, I know it's a busy day. Uh, nothing but busy days for you lately. Thank you very much for your time, ma'am. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Savannah. You're watching NBC News Now. The battle against ISIS is now in its final stages. So you have smugglers using your ranch as a lookout point. 
There have been report after report of unsanitary and overcrowded conditions. That facility is cleaned every day. State of the Union address. Is anybody really getting much out of this anymore? President Trump became the first sitting U.S. president to set foot in North Korea this weekend. Welcome back to NBC News. Now we've got some breaking news. And all of a sudden, the entire apartment started rocking. NBC News can confirm that Iran seized a British oil tanker. For not following international maritime regulation. Right now, San Juan is at a standstill. The spin room. This Amid the coronavirus crisis, a plane operating as an air ambulance to help fight the outbreak bursting into flames during takeoff in the Philippines, killing a US and Canadian national as well as doctors and nurses. In Italy, priests bless coffins in rows, the death toll now nearly 11,000. The terrible new challenge, how to deal with so many dead. Italy has banned public funerals. Instead, they are attended by a handful of family, grieving alone, not allowed to see the body of their loved one. <laughs> Coronavirus remorseless, removing sacred traditions, dividing families in life and death. In Spain, the hospital is now inundated with patients. The Spanish death toll, more than 6,800. A court of justice turned into a morgue to house the many taken by this most unjust of killers. France's frightening numbers, now more than 40,000 infected. So many, they're sending patients to Germany. So far, France has seen more than 2,600 die. But the numbers in Europe could be overshadowed by countries like India, where recorded infections are only beginning their ascent. India locking down, leading to crowds trying to get home the reality of social distancing in a country of 1.3 billion. The British beginning a program of screening health workers for the virus. One drive through testing center in a shuttered amusement park, a reminder of happier times. I want to update you on the latest steps the government is taking. The prime minister himself infected with coronavirus, rallying his country on a cell phone from self-isolation. We are going to do it. We are going to, to do it together. The UK, like the US, facing a long fight. One British government health official says life will return to some kind of normality, but that could take three to six months. Another lesson from over here, Savannah. Some people struggling in Italy to keep to the lockdown. This is a, a marathon, not a sprint. But there they have found 50 people, get this, who are tested positive for coronavirus out and about. Those folks will now likely face jail, Savannah. From the president, a new timeline announcing the federal government's social distancing guidelines will stay in place Thank you. for at least another month. The peak in death rate is likely to hit in two weeks. Therefore, we will be extending our guidelines to April 30th to slow the spread. The president Sunday backing off his hope that the country would open up by Easter, now circling a new date on the calendar when he says life will finally get back to normal. We can expect that by June 1st we will be well on our way to recovery. We think by June 1st a lot of... Great things will be happening. Nothing would be worse than declaring victory before the victory is won. It comes as the president is now bracing Americans for a significant death toll. If we could hold that down, as we're saying, to 100,000, it's a horrible number. Maybe even less, but to 100,000. So we have between 100 and 200,000. The White House Coronavirus Task Force emphasizing those higher figures. It's anywhere in the model between 80,000 and 160,000, maybe even potentially 200,000 people succumbing to this. I think it's entirely conceivable that if we do not mitigate to the extent that we're trying to do, that you could reach that number. Yeah, 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 it's possible. The president stressing the U.S. is facing an unprecedented crisis. I've been watching that for the last week on television. Body bags all over in hallways. I've been watching them bring in trailer trucks, freezer trucks. They're freezer trucks because they can't handle the bodies. There's so many of them. I've seen things that I've never seen before. I mean, I've seen them, but I've seen them on television in faraway lands. I've never seen them in our country. Those comments following this dire assessment from Dr. Deborah Burks. No state, no metro area will be spared. 
A sobering reality check there from Dr. Deborah Burks. As for those dates, so April 30th right now, that's when the government hopes that they'll be able to loosen up those social distancing guidelines. Ja uh, excuse me, June 1st, when the president hopes Americans will return to their normal lives. That leaves the month of May when Americans, according to the president, would hopefully be able to return to their work, slowly venture out to bars and restaurants and get back to a little bit of normalcy. This morning, as an emergency field hospital is being built in iconic Central Park, New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut are now under a 14-day travel advisory. The CDC is urging people in the nation's worst coronavirus hotspot to halt non-essential domestic travel, as cases top 70,000 in the three states, with over 1,000 deaths. Not a lockdown, something much more consistent with what we've been actually saying and doing in the city and state already, which is telling people to stay home unless they have an essential reason to go somewhere. Today, the USNS Comfort is due to dock in New York Harbor. It will serve as a floating thousand bed hospital for non-coronavirus patients, freeing up beds on land. We still have to take care of pregnant women who have to deliver. We have to take care of patients who need emergency uh, surgery. We have to take care of kids. In the Bronx, ERs are packed. We are seeing a lot of younger patients that are coming through the door that are sicker as well. And that, that is surprising and a little scary. Concerns are also growing about the lack of personal protective equipment, or PPE, for healthcare workers. It's incredibly frustrating for us. Our, our co-workers are getting sick. President Trump once again casting doubt on the amount of protective gear New York authorities are requesting. We're delivering millions and millions of different products, and all we do is hear that, can you get some more? Also in need, police officers. More than 5,000 members of the NYPD have called out sick. An estimated 900 are believed to have COVID-19. We are hurting. We are crying and we continue to fight. The department is also reporting the death of its first uniformed officer, 23-year veteran detective Cedric Dixon. Two other civilian employees have also died. May we never forget the sacrifice of those workers who put themselves in harm's way to keep you and your family safe. New York City's mayor says there will now be fines for not social distancing in public here in the city, ranging from $250 to $500. As for this field hospital, it is set to open tomorrow. America's Motor City now on the front lines in the fight against coronavirus. The U.S. Surgeon General now declaring Detroit a coronavirus hotspot. More than 5,000 cases have been reported in Michigan, and those numbers are expected to grow. Our emergency rooms have been packed. We are literally running out of inpatient capacity. Bob Riney oversees operations for the Henry Ford Health System in Detroit. In a leaked draft memo obtained by NBC News, the hospital outlines protocol in a worst case scenario, saying they would give priority treatment to those who would likely survive. The hospital acknowledged the letter, tweeting, We crafted a policy to provide guidance for making difficult patient care decisions. We hope never to have to apply them. Riney says hospitals are fighting a battle with no end in sight. Professionally, have you ever seen anything like this? You know, I've been in healthcare for 40 years and uh, been through a lot of different challenges that the industry has faced, but this one is different. This weekend, President Trump approved a disaster declaration for Michigan, unlocking federal assistance to help recovery efforts there. But not before criticizing the state's governor, Gretchen Whitmer, and her response to the outbreak, tweeting, failing Michigan governor must work harder. It's got to be all hands on deck. Uh, we are not one another's enemies. The enemy is the virus, and it is spreading, and it is taking American lives. Detroit's famous auto show has been canceled this year. Now, FEMA reportedly plans to turn the downtown convention space where it would have taken place into a makeshift field hospital for coronavirus patients. While this Ford plant is now rushing to manufacture masks and other personal protective equipment. Attention please, there is no congregating allowed. Cases are also skyrocketing in other major cities like Chicago, where an infant believed to be the nation's youngest victim 
died after testing positive for the virus. And down south, another American hotspot, New Orleans. We are being as creative as we can be, uh, but uh, unleashing more equipment is something that we desperately need as well. There are more than 3,000 cases in Louisiana, but in one town Sunday, hundreds ignored the state's ban on large gatherings to attend church services. American cities stretch to their limit as the virus continues to surge. Interestingly, Michigan has put its manufacturing might into the battle against coronavirus, turning traditional auto manufacturing plants into manufacturing locations for traditional medical supply devices. Now, the governor did confirm that she received over 100,000 uh, N95 masks over the weekend. The U.S. Surgeon General declaring Detroit a hotspot and saying cases could get worse over the next week. And joining us now, the White House's Coronavirus Task Force Coordinator, Dr. Deborah Burks. Dr. Burks, good morning to you. It's good to have you with good us. Good morning. Good morning. So we've, we've heard this news now from the White House recommending that social distancing, what people should be doing, staying home, is expanded now for another month. The initial 15 days would have expired today, I believe. So what led to this change? What's the situation on the ground that requires this? You know, we get data every day um, from around the globe, but more importantly, from the United States. I think everyone understands now that you can go from five to 50 to 500 to 5,000 cases very quickly. We see this in many metropolitan areas. We're very worried about every city in the United States and the potential for this virus to get out of control. And we really believe that Americans with the right information will stay home. And the president had said a couple of weeks ago he was hopeful, aspirational, that we could be back in business and packing masses on Easter Sunday. Obviously, this has changed. Now he's talking about potentially June 1st being a time that uh, America could return somewhat to normal. Where are you on that timeline? You know, I think we watch everything very carefully. Um, we, w we look at models, but we validate those models with the data that's coming in. And United States will look different than Europe, and Europe look different than Asia. And I think that we all have to be aware of that. It's not perfect science right now, because we're projecting based on what we have today. And we know that the double ring rate of this virus is very high. And so that's why these 30 days allows us to really do both diagnostics, finding out who's positive because they're sick, and allows us to also get surveillance fully in place to really answer your question. Yeah, it, you know, you're, you are in the middle of getting data, but you've seen quite a bit of data. I mean, to put it simply, is it worse than you would have expected it to be? Is, or is it better? Is the social distancing having an effect? I think in some of the metro areas, we were late in getting people to follow the 15-day guidelines. And so we know that from the time you start doing everything that you need, staying home, social distancing, not going out to any restaurant, bars, or even being careful in the grocery stores, absolutely religious hand washing, all of this, um, we see some metro areas came late to that. I think it will be when this is over, we'll have a lot of time to really compare data about what really worked with this epidemic so that if it comes back in the fall, we'll be better prepared both with treatments, but also in really understanding how it spreads. Dr. Fauci said yesterday, we could see millions of cases in this country and as many as one to 200,000 deaths. Do you agree with that analysis? Is that a worst case scenario or something that uh, we should prepare ourselves as potentially likely? So in the flu models, the worst case scenario is between 1.6 million and 2.2 million deaths. That's the projection if you do nothing. So we've never really done all of these things that we're doing. We put them into a model. We've looked at the Italy data with their self-isolation. And that's where we come up with, if we do things together well, almost perfectly, we could get in the range of 100,000 to 200,000 fatalities. We don't even want to see wow, that. that, that I know, but you know, you kind of take my breath away with that because what I hear you saying is that's 
sort of the best case scenario if everything works and people do the things you're asking them to do maybe you can hold the deaths to one to two hundred thousand in this country well the best case scenario would be a hundred percent of americans doing precisely what is required but we're not sure based on the data that you're sharing from around the world and seeing these pictures that all of america is responding in a uniform way to protect one another so we also have to factor that in cities that don't social distances that don't stay at home that believe you can have social interactions that believe you can have gatherings of homes of twenty and and ten people even that is going to spread the virus even if everyone looks well yeah, I was, I was going to say, I believe on Meet the Press yesterday, you said that um, no state, no metro area will be spared. And I can imagine, you know, I grew up in Arizona. I, I remember watching things and thinking, oh, that's a big city problem. That's not going to happen here. What's your message to not just the, the metro areas, but to rural areas as well? So this virus, we think, can spread with a lot of asymptomatic and mild cases. And it's not until it gets into the vulnerable groups that you start to see the hospitalizations. So if you wait for that, if the metros and the rural areas don't take care now, by the time you see it, it has penetrated your community pretty significantly. And that's what we're concerned about. And that's why you have to prepare even though you think it's not there. Dr. Burks, I know it's a busy day. Uh, nothing but busy days for you lately. Thank you very much for your time, ma'am. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Savannah. After weeks in limbo at sea, overnight, two Holland American cruise ships given the green light to cross the Panama Canal. The government there granting priority canal privileges to the MS Zandam and the MS Rotterdam, citing humanitarian and safety reasons. On board the Zandam, the bodies of four passengers who it's feared may have died from coronavirus. The cruise line says more than 100 others have fallen ill with flu-like symptoms, and at least two on board have tested positive for the virus. Cliff and Doris Kober, both healthy and in a cabin, they now call their jail cell. You've been on a ship with coronavirus. I assume you've been hiding in your room, but what has that anxiety been like? I mean, you're you're so close to it all. But I visualize a big bad boogeyman germ waiting outside the door. There is also passenger confusion. On Sunday, the Colbers say because they have no symptoms, they were told they were selected to move from the Zandam, the ship with suspected coronavirus, to the Rotterdam. Orlando Ashford, Holland America president, in a video statement. So first and foremost, I want to dispel the myth that there is an intention to create a healthy ship and a sick ship that will be managed separately. Instead, Holland America says the passengers who had interior rooms were moved to the other ship to give them a window and ventilation. The biggest problem now, where will both ships dock? They're scheduled to come to Port Everglades in Fort Lauderdale, but now there is growing pressure to turn them away, unless there is a way to isolate everyone with or without symptoms. Fort Lauderdale's mayor. These two ships cannot dock in Fort Lauderdale if there are sick passengers on board without any medical treatment there to meet them. But this morning, that emergency medical plan does not exist. The Colbers ask, what's the difference between them coming by boat and all the New Yorkers who traveled to Florida from the epicenter on planes and in cars? These ships are blocked. People coming into the airport can turn around, go back home or get a car and go somewhere else. We can't. We're in the middle of the ocean. We're stuck. So why are they picking on us? The passengers who got on these cruise ships got on March 7th. It was 24 hours later that the State Department issued its warning, as you noted at the top, Hoda. One of the questions that Colbers and other passengers have on these ships, of course, is, if I'm not sick, will I get sick? And if I can't come into port here, is it possible that we could die at sea? Very, very difficult situation, Hoda. Oh, that is totally terrifying. So the question is, Gary, if they do get turned away from Fort Lauderdale, like how does this whole thing get resolved and how long will it take? 
Well, there's going to be a commission meeting, and the Broward County commissioners are going to have a meeting tomorrow to decide. They have a very short window because the ships are already in the Caribbean Sea to decide will they let them in. One idea being floated is that everybody on board, whether they're ex showing symptoms or not, would be taken down to Homestead Air Reserve Base and treated and uh, quarantined there for at least 14 days. But that is a plan that does not currently exist, and the mayor of Fort Lauderdale says he believes it's going to take President Trump's intervention to make something like that happen. This morning, a food and supply lifeline is about to be shut off. Instacart employs 200,000 independent contractors, and some are threatening to sit on the delivery sidelines unless they get additional hazard pay of at least $5 per trip and basic protective gear like hand sanitizer and masks. A lot of us are really literally making the decision between, you know, our health and our financial security right now. One man who just quit his Instacart job writing on Twitter, hashtag Instacart strike on Monday. Instacart's attempting to strike break by offering bonuses of $25. No. Just last week, the company announcing plans to beef up its workforce with 300,000 more people. Instacart declined to comment on specifics, but in a statement said they're immensely grateful for the work of their employees, offering bonuses ranging from $25 to $200, more than a month of sick leave, and soon, hand sanitizer manufactured just for their shoppers. It's honestly, daily, I sort of go through this argument in my head of, am I a potential vector or am I actually helping? Shane Schlager delivers for DoorDash, a competitor service. He says he gets hand sanitizer for work, but not much else. Do you think you should be getting other PPE, masks and gloves? Should that be a given in this field? I think it should be. I've been personally using my own gloves. Um, I couldn't find any masks or I probably would uh, use those. DoorDash says they're providing financial assistance to eligible dashers diagnosed with COVID-19 or quarantined and changing the default delivery method to a no contact option, minimizing face time between dashers and customers. Schlager still delivering for now, but hundreds of miles away in Staten Island, a hundred workers at an Amazon warehouse are walking off the job today. We're very low on masks. We don't have the proper gloves. All we want is the building to be closed and professionally sanitized. I'm afraid to go to work. Amazon responding by saying these accusations are simply unfounded. We've taken extreme measures to keep people safe, tripling down on deep cleaning, procuring safety supplies that are available, and changing processes to ensure those in our buildings are keeping safe distances. This trend of striking for safety coming at a critical time for homebound Americans. A new study finding 40 million households have used online grocery delivery in just the last month, doubling the figure from just six months earlier. A surge in need as those on the delivery front lines are looking for a little peace of mind in these uncertain times. And a lot of companies, including Instacart and Amazon, are offering sick paid leave, but only if the employees test positive for COVID-19 or are quarantined. And of course, if you think you might be sick or have the coronavirus, the last thing public officials want you to do is to be out in public, much less delivering groceries or food. These days, connection and community come in unexpected forms from virtual happy hours. Mine's a quarantine because it's it's water. To brunches and dinner parties now happening remotely. Thank God for all of our devices and our FaceTimes and our duos and our Zooms and everything we're using because it, it does not feel so awful. It, it, you still feel connected. NASA astronaut Nick Hag says some of the tools he used in space can help those of us trapped in our personal capsules here on Earth. When I was on orbit, I'd do crossword puzzles uh, with my boys over a video chat. And just being able to connect that way uh, was such a huge emotional boost. Zoom meetings have exploded in popularity over the past few weeks. It's now the number one free app for iPhone and Android. But not everyone has access to the Internet or feels comfortable using it. Hi, Grandma. Hello. The phone call is back. Verizon says its phone traffic has gone way up. Each weekday, nearly 800 million calls are being made, twice the volume of Mother's Day. And people are staying on longer, too, 33%. Right now, one of the most kind things we could do is pick up the phone, take a picture of your smiling face, send it to that person who we know is alone or scared right now. For some special occasions, there are drive-by birthday wishes. For others, sign language. 
Grandma, you look at me. the sign. It's a boy. I just had a feeling. <laughs> and for something that lasts even longer, old-fashioned letters are making a bit of a comeback, says Arkansas High School student Michelle Wells. Not a lot of people my age really do it, but I really enjoy it. If there's no time for that, a short text can say so much. Experts say even the little pings matter. Just checking in regularly with someone can make a big difference. For today, Joe Fryer, NBC News, Los Angeles. We're here for them. We are the community. It's definitely good to hear. You always want to hear that the wages are going up. We work hard, we bleed, we sweat, we cry when it comes to these cars. Without this pill, we die. He's doing the best he can for the country, and they're getting in the way. We're going to build the wall. We have no choice. This is an emergency. There are zero hours left to take action. Because we're incarcerated doesn't mean that we should lose our right to vote. This is the perfect time to graduate. There's like a lot of shooting happening. These are thoughtful voters who, more than anything, want these candidates to cut to the chase. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt, covering coronavirus with facts over fear. How do we know who belongs in isolation? What should we be conscious of? What's being worked on today? At a time of national crisis, turn to the most trusted TV news anchor in America. Need your true crime fix on the go? Dateline episodes are available as podcasts. Mysteries with a twist from the true crime original. Wow. Listen to Dateline wherever you get your podcasts. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. This is all I've got left. Who brought more to the caucuses? It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, 3 to 11 p.m. Eastern. Manchester, Washington. Why should your judgment be valued? I'd stake my judgment against anyone out there. Is party unity your concern right now, or is simply winning as many states as you well, can? Well, it's both. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. If it's digging in on the issues. Let's talk about money and politics. If it's asking the questions you want to ask. How do you reassure those supporters that you will sustain this? Just watch me. If it's navigating the winding road to the White House. And if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. The coronavirus outbreak. What's next? NBC News has in-depth coverage, answers to your questions, insight from medical experts, and up-to-the-minute live blog updates. For continuing coverage, turn to the networks and platforms of NBC News. Amid the coronavirus crisis, a plane operating as an air ambulance to help fight the outbreak, bursting into flames during takeoff in the Philippines, killing a U.S. and Canadian national as well as doctors and nurses. In Italy, priests bless coffins in rows, the death toll now nearly 11,000. The terrible new challenge, how to deal with so many dead. Italy has banned public funerals, instead they are attended by a handful of family, grieving alone, not allowed to see the body of their loved one. Coronavirus remorseless, removing sacred traditions, dividing families in life and death. In Spain, the hospital is now inundated with patients. The Spanish death toll, more than 6,800. A court of justice turned into a morgue to house the many taken by this most unjust of killers. France's frightening numbers, now more than 40,000 infected. So many, they're sending patients to Germany. So far, France has seen more than 2,600 die. But the numbers in Europe could be overshadowed by countries like India, where recorded infections are only beginning their ascent. India locking down, leading to crowds trying to get home. The reality of social distancing in a country of 1.3 billion. 
the British beginning a program of screening health workers for the virus. One drive through testing centre in a shuttered amusement park, a reminder of happier times. I want to update you on the latest steps the government is taking. The Prime Minister, himself infected with coronavirus, rallying his country on a cell phone from self-isolation. We are going to do it. We are going to, to do it together. The UK, like the US, facing a long fight. One British government health official says life will return to some kind of normality, but that could take three to six months. Another lesson from over here, Savanna. Some people struggling in Italy to keep to the lockdown. This is a, a marathon, not a sprint. But there, they have found 50 people get this who are tested positive for coronavirus out and about. Those folks will now likely face jail, Savannah. After weeks in limbo at sea, overnight, two Holland American cruise ships given the green light to cross the Panama Canal. The government there granting priority canal privileges to the MS Zandam and the MS Rotterdam, citing humanitarian and safety reasons. On board the Zandam, the bodies of four passengers who it's feared may have died from coronavirus. The cruise line says more than 100 others have fallen ill with flu-like symptoms, and at least two on board have tested positive for the virus. Cliff and Doris Kober, both healthy and in a cabin, they now call their jail cell. You've been on a ship with coronavirus. I assume you've been hiding in your room, but what has that anxiety been like? I mean, you're you're so close to it all. But I visualize a big bad boogeyman germ waiting outside the door. There is also passenger confusion. On Sunday, the Colbers say because they have no symptoms, they were told they were selected to move from the Zandam, the ship with suspected coronavirus, to the Rotterdam. Orlando Ashford, Holland America president, in a video statement. So first and foremost, I want to dispel the myth that there is an intention to create a healthy ship and a sick ship that will be managed separately. Instead, Holland America says the passengers who had interior rooms were moved to the other ship to give them a window and ventilation. The biggest problem now, where will both ships dock? They're scheduled to come to Port Everglades in Fort Lauderdale, but now there is growing pressure to turn them away unless there is a way to isolate everyone with or without symptoms. Fort Lauderdale's mayor. These two ships cannot dock in Fort Lauderdale if there are sick passengers on board without any medical treatment there to meet them. But this morning, that emergency medical plan does not exist. The Colbers ask, what's the difference between them coming by boat and all the New Yorkers who traveled to Florida from the epicenter on planes and in cars? These ships are blocked. People coming into the airport can turn around, go back home or get a car and go somewhere else. We can't. We're in the middle of the ocean. We're stuck. So why are they picking on us? The passengers who got on these cruise ships got on March 7th. It was 24 hours later that the State Department issued its warning, as you noted at the top, Hoda. One of the questions that Colbers and other passengers have on these ships, of course, is, if I'm not sick, will I get sick? And if I can't come into port here, is it possible that we could die at sea? Very, very difficult situation, Hoda. Oh, that is totally terrifying. So the question is, Gary, if they do get turned away from Fort Lauderdale, like how does this whole thing get resolved and how long will it take? Well, there's going to be a commission meeting, and the Broward County commissioners are going to have a meeting tomorrow to decide. They have a very short window because the ships are already in the Caribbean Sea to decide, will they let them in? One idea being floated is that everybody on board, whether they're ex showing symptoms or not, would be taken down to Homestead Air Reserve Base mm -hmm. and treated and uh, quarantined there for at least 14 days. But that is a plan that does not currently exist, and the mayor of Fort Lauderdale says he believes it's going to take President Trump's intervention to make something like that happen. Mm -hmm. Johnson & Johnson is one of several companies that has developed a potential vaccine slated to be tested in clinical trials later this year. Alex Gorski is the chairman and CEO of Johnson & Johnson. Mr. Gorski, good morning. It's good to have you here. Well, Savannah, thank you very much for having us on this morning.
Yes, I, we mentioned just one of them. But there are actually several companies that are in this kind of arms race to get a vaccine. Moderna is in clinical trials already. Innovio slated to start clinical trials next month. A German company, CureVac, also researching a vaccine. Tell me about Johnson & Johnson's candidate for a vaccine. Why is it so promising and when might clinical trials start? Sure, Savannah. First of all, just let me say how much we appreciate the important public service that you and your team are providing, keeping your viewers really educated and informed about this disease. And I know myself just watching over the weekend, it can be pretty distressing when you're seeing what's happening with, you know, mothers and fathers and patients and in some hospitals, particularly like in New York City. But what I can also tell you is we're seeing incredible collaboration and, and good news stories as well taking place, whether it's between some of the biopharmaceutical companies collaborating together, as you just mentioned, trying to get these vaccines out, uh, or other places. But look, today at Johnson & Johnson, we're really pleased to be able to announce that we have a vaccine candidate that based upon the testing that we've done, and, and we've been doing a lot in this area, in areas like SARS, Ebola, as were mentioned earlier, that we've got a candidate that has a high degree of probability of being successful against the COVID-19 virus. Now we also, and very important, is we've got the production capabilities to be able to ramp up production of this in a, in a relatively short period of time so that it can become available. That's why we're entering into this agreement with the government where you know, we're going to be investing more than a billion dollars, accelerating the clinical development as well as the production. And we want to make sure the patients, certainly here in the United States, but around the world, can get access in a very affordable way. In fact, we're going to make sure that we're offering yeah. this at a not-for-profit basis here uh, in, in the United States and around the globe. Well, that is uh, all really promising news. As you mentioned, you're working with BARDA, the Biomedical Advanced Research and Development Associates at the Department of Health and Human Services. So um, you mentioned a couple things there. I just want to drill down on it. How soon do you think, if the vaccine ultimately proves to be a successful one, how soon could it get to market? Because, you know, most estimates are 12 to 18 months. Is that the timeline for you as well, if this turns out to be uh, a successful vaccine? Well, Savannah, we've got all hands on deck. And in fact, this is like a moonshot for us at Johnson & Johnson. What would usually take five to seven years, we expect to be able to accomplish in five to seven months. So to give you an idea, we, we're working right now on early tests that tend to be very predictive of how these vaccines are eventually going to work in humans. And we want to, first of all, make sure that they're safe, that the platform is safe, that it can be effective. We anticipate starting in humans in September, we could have something called interim results where we, we use you know, statistical methodology to look and, and see, do we have a high degree of uh, success? We should have that by the end of the year, such that in an emergency yeah. situation, we could have vaccines ready in Q1 and Q2 of 2021. Now, it's also really important in these situations is that we ramp up production. So literally within the next few days and weeks, we're going to start ramping up production of these vaccines as well. And we should be able to have several hundred million doses available by the middle of next year. And our goal is to have a billion prepared by the end of 2021. So it's, again, it, we're- It's so interesting we're, because you're kind of, you're starting, sorry to interrupt, but I just, I hope people really focus on this because it's interesting and, and the companies have to who are doing this are taking a risk. You're basically producing the vaccine before you even know that it's effective in the hopes that this will be the one. That's, look, that's what we have to do in this case. We're going to do everything mm -hmm. possible to make sure that we have a safe, effective vaccine available in the kind of quantities that can really make a difference. And frankly, just like the heroes in the hospitals are working right now, the leaders in our laboratories are working 24 seven to do everything they can to accelerate this process. Can I ask you one more question before I let you go about Tylenol? Sure. Obviously it's a fever reducer. It's been harder and harder to find. I mean, I can't find it in my drugstore shelves right now. Uh, what is the company doing to ramp up supply so you can meet that demand? Sure. Well, look, it's the world's largest healthcare company. In addition to what we're doing, vaccines, we have taken our Tylenol lines, for example, and we've diverted certain formulations like the rapid release gel to just the caplet formulation that we can produce in much higher quantities and again, 24 seven. 
Uh, we've converted some of our lines to hand sanitizer lines to make sure that you know we can get access to more hand sanitizer. So really, there's not an area of our business that we're not looking to say, where can we make a difference? Because ultimately, all of us are going to need to work together to kill this virus. Yeah, we, we really appreciate your time and uh, this news this morning. I know will give people a lot of uh, hope that perhaps you will be successful. Johnson & Johnson CEO Alex Gorski, sir, thank you very much. We really appreciate it. Well, Savannah, thank you so much. As many as 200,000 Instacart workers could instantly be off the front lines as early as tomorrow. A lot of us are really literally making the decision between, you know, our health and our financial security right now. They're demanding hazard pay and better safety gear or they'll strike no longer shopping for and delivering your groceries. Instacart telling employees through blog post, we're immensely grateful for all that you do to support families and people in need. They're offering more than a month of pay for anyone diagnosed with COVID-19 and one-time bonuses. The anxiety also being felt at traditional grocers. Is it scary at all to go to work right now? I don't sleep much because I'm scared of what I will bring home to my children. Candace Oglesby lives in North Texas. Her son is immunocompromised. The cashier says she's in contact with people all day long and wants her national grocery employer, who she's not identifying, to acknowledge that and pay. They're putting their life and they're putting their safety and their health on the line. Many of America's largest grocery stores have ramped up pay and protections, from temporary salary hikes to bonuses. And across the board, companies are putting up plexiglass at registers, installing social distancing reminders, and cleaning stores round the clock. Grocers in particular are at a higher risk, not as high a risk as, say, a healthcare worker, but they are at a higher risk than the general public. If you're worried about your safety when shopping, anytime you use any surface that people touch a lot, like card handles, for example, make sure you wipe it down with a disinfectant wipe, wear gloves, or you can also use a cloth as a barrier if you need to. Once you get inside the supermarket, stand at least six feet away from everybody else and do not touch your face. And once you get home, you got all these bags, wipe off every surface they touch. And for anything that comes inside of a box, take the contents out and wipe that off too. As shelves remain stocked, the people making sure they stay that way deemed essential employees by only a few states, opening up access to emergency childcare and testing. I would give anything to be able to test myself right now. Sam Brock, NBC News, Miami. We're back now with a deeply personal look at a day in the life of an intensive care nurse. Like so many of our healthcare heroes, she's working around the clock, tending to coronavirus patients and also taking care of her own family during this difficult time. This is her story. Time to start the day again. Good morning. My name is Elise Silpo. I'm a nurse practitioner in the medical ICU at North German Hassett. I'm about to take my temperature because every morning and every night, I'm taking my temperature to make sure I stay healthy to take care of my patients. So I'm by one of the nurses station right now and we have the doctor just watching in the room to make sure everything's going okay with the nursing staff inside. The unit that I work in is a COVID quarantined critical care unit, highest acuity, sickest patients that we have in the health system right now. People are 20, 30, 40, 50, much younger than we expected. This is the tubing from the, the ventilator. The ventilator is the breathing machine that goes to a patient. The tube goes into the patient's mouth, into the patient's lung, and inflates and deflates the lungs to help you breathe. If a patient's heart is not doing well, we put them on a cardiac bypass machine. This only affects the lungs and helps with the breathing. So now we need to bypass the lungs and this machine will purify the lungs and oxygenate the patient and give the patient oxygen while his lungs are healing. I have some tears and crying right now because I'm so tired. But I'm going to take a deep breath and keep going on. I think I just needed that a little let down, but now I'm gonna continue on and powering through back into the unit to stay strong. 
Today is day five of a 13-hour shift week. I usually do three days a week. I'm up to five 13-hour shifts this week, and I'm tired. So I'm about to change my scrubs to head home to see my babies. Our deepest thanks to Elisa Sopo and everyone working right now. If it's digging in on the issues. Let's talk about money and politics. If it's asking the questions you want to ask. How do you reassure those supporters that you will sustain this? Just watch me. If it's navigating the winding road to the White House. And if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Need your true crime fix on the go? Dateline episodes are available as podcasts. Mysteries with a twist from the true crime original. Wow. Listen to Dateline wherever you get your podcasts. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. This is all I've got left. Who brought more to the caucuses? It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, 3 to 11 p.m. Eastern. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt, covering coronavirus with facts over fear. How do we know who belongs in isolation? What should we be conscious of? What's being worked on today? At a time of national crisis, turn to the most trusted TV news anchor in America. As the coronavirus continues its deadly march across the country, this warning for Americans. Looking at what we're seeing now, you know, I would say between 100 and 200,000 cases, but excuse me, deaths. I mean, we're, we're going to have millions of cases, but I, I just don't think that we really need to make a projection when it's such a moving target. What we do know, Jake, is that we got a serious mm -hmm. problem in New York. We have a serious problem in New Orleans, and we're going to be developing serious problems in other areas. This after the CDC issued a late Saturday travel advisory for New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut residents, telling them to refrain from non-essential domestic travel for two weeks. The notice creating confusion after President Trump first weighed the possibility of a short-term quarantine in those states, but later backed away from the idea. Governors were given full discretion over the new rollout and said the advisory is already in practice. It's totally consistent with everything we're doing. That's something that, uh, as I say, it's de facto happening already. We're to, uh, discouraging people from traveling uh, and making sure they stay as home as much as possible. With at least 59,000 positive cases and approximately 42 percent of coronavirus deaths in the U.S. centered in New York, Today Governor Andrew Cuomo extended the stay-at-home order through April 15th, stretching into major holidays like Easter and Passover. The state is trying to get ahead of the outbreak's peak, mobilizing a temporary hospital at this Manhattan Convention Center and awaiting the arrival of the U.S. naval ship that will provide extra beds for non-COVID-19 cases. And even more help is on the way. The president announcing that a flight arrived at JFK with millions of critical medical supplies for health care workers stretched thin. And after pressure from New York's governor, the governor of Rhode Island repealed the executive order that had police and National Guard members knocking on doors and checking cars for visiting New Yorkers, telling them they must self-quarantine for 14 days. And Kathy joins us now live from the Javits Center here in Manhattan. Kathy, normally that's a convention center now being made into an emergency field hospital. When will that be ready to operate and what's happening in Central Park? Well, Kate, a thousand beds have been added to the convention center behind me turned temporary hospital and should be ready to go come tomorrow. And you mentioned Central Park. There is another emergency field hospital that's currently in the works. We saw triage tents going up today and those should be operational on Tuesday. 
The silent descent of the unmistakable funnel captured on highway cameras. The warning's coming just in time. Valley View Fire Department, tornado warning near your area. Minutes later, a direct hit on Jonesboro, Arkansas. The tornado swelling by the second. One store owner nearly caught in its path, watching the twister chew through buildings just blocks away. All Queens, he's on the ground. And drive me Jonesboro, I'd say to hell. In the storm's wake, miles of destruction and more than 20 people injured. The city mayor saying their shelter in place for coronavirus may have actually saved lives. I will say that, and I hate to say this, but with the coronavirus, I think there was not as many people in that building, and it could have been much worse. For the Burke family, the storm hits especially hard. Jared is a doctor, now living apart from wife Alyssa and son Zeke. His work with COVID-19 patients keeping him from moments like this. This photo from just days ago captured the father high-fiving his son through a glass door. The picture taken in a home that no longer stands. On our Facebook page, Alyssa wrote, Our house is gone. Jared was inside, but he survived by the grace of God. Please pray for us as we begin to pick up the pieces. Tonight, the family's fate shared by dozens of others. Now fighting to move forward from one crisis to another. Morgan Chesky, NBC News. There is some good news tonight about the good deeds by and for the hardworking people bringing us mail, packages, and newspapers. Is this silk almond milk? Is it silk? It all started when newspaper delivery man Greg Daly was grocery shopping and suddenly thought about an 88-year-old customer. You know, I thought to myself, well, if Mrs. Ross can't get the paper at her sidewalk, which is probably 20 feet, how's she getting groceries? He called her, and sure enough, she needed items. Five minutes later, I'm standing online to pay for the stuff that I, that I have, and she called me back. And she goes, Greg, would you mind grabbing something for Mrs. Miller across the street? That's when he started putting this note inside every newspaper he delivers, offering to pick up groceries or basically anything. You know, they're amazing people, and you know, if you get a chance to help them, you help them. It's very nice to meet you. Sandy Driska and her husband are quarantined at home. Your godson. Oh, gosh, Greg. And you know, he's not even asking for money. He's doing this out of the kindness of his heart. All over the country, families are appreciating delivery people, leaving notes and goodie bags, snacks and cold drinks, even toilet paper. Can we take one of these? Yeah, absolutely. It's for you. Oh, man, you, you are life saver. Thank you. In Phoenix, the Wilson family left hand sanitizer on their mailbox, thanking their mail carrier, Marco. Ann Diles, whose family's been delivering mail in Kentucky since the 1940s, wanted to help her mail carrier stay healthy, too. I think we should all take care of our mail carriers, so I think everybody should at least help them out a little bit. It feels good to help and to receive. Basically, it gives you, it gives you a warm feeling, and it also gives you so much faith in humanity that really throughout this virus, we're all there to help one another and we'll get through it. The shock of the coronavirus pandemic has been both medical and financial. On Thursday, we learned a staggering 3.28 million unemployment claims had been filed in a single week. The previous high set in 1982 was 695,000. This as businesses, large and small, and all of their employees wonder what their future looks like on the other side of this crisis, whenever that comes. NBC senior business correspondent Stephanie Rule has our Sunday Spotlight. As the coronavirus continues to send shockwaves across the U.S., businesses big and small have already adapted their message. Better days will take some work. But Ram is more than willing to do our share. We know you might not be thinking of Burger King right now. We're thinking about you. Use disinfecting products registered to kill 99.9% .9 of bacteria and viruses on your surfaces. But messaging alone won't be enough. Mass layoffs and the possibility of a major recession have consumer spending grinding to a halt. With millions of Americans dealing with orders to stay at home, retailers are scrambling to adapt to rapidly changing consumer habits. Several brands are taking advantage of this new way of living, meeting customers where they are. Advertising executives say this can provide a little relief during tough times. You want to make people feel better and you want that feeling to be attached to your brand. 
you make people feel better by doing things, doing things for them. Famed entrepreneur Mark Cuban says that brands need to keep customer concerns top of mind to stay relevant. How important is it for companies to show they're going the extra mile now? People are very socially conscious now. They want to know that the brands they associate with are going to compliment them. One company making that change, Nike. The fitness giant is rolling out an expanded version of their online workout app, Nike Training Club, offering free and subscription-based services. Nike has closed almost all of its stores, but digital sales are up by over 40 percent and app usage up over 100 percent. Other major online retailers are hiring by the thousands to keep up with demand, including Walmart and Amazon. E-commerce sales overall are up 25 percent since the first week of March. Online grocery sales have doubled in just a few weeks. For big brands that aren't as nimble, this crisis could spell disaster. And for former retail giants like Macy's and JCPenney, who were facing declining sales and closed stores before the crisis, the future now looks dire. This week, Macy's releasing a statement saying that COVID-19 is, quote, taking a heavy toll. The department store putting a freeze on hiring and spending. Small businesses face their own unique set of challenges. The impact is already being felt at the fishing docks in Barnegat Light, New Jersey. Uh, we're wondering what's going to happen with our beaches, our lifeguards, our employees, uh, where these people are going to go. The future remains uncertain, but experts already predict the effects of the crisis on American business are likely to be far-reaching and long-lasting. We saw almost 10,000 store closures last year. We're likely going to see 15 to 25,000 store closures this year. The sector's hardest hit, specialty retail apparel, department stores, and movie theaters. For Sunday Today, Stephanie Rule, New Jersey. Tonight, as the spread of COVID-19 accelerates, a warning. All corners of the country are at risk and America's cities vulnerable. Every metro area should assume that they could have an outbreak equivalent to New York. Sunday, new disaster declarations in Connecticut, Oregon, Georgia, and a disaster request from Pennsylvania, where confirmed cases spiked by more than 20 percent. Please stay calm, stay home, and stay safe. In Louisiana, there's worry. They're days away from potential catastrophe. We're on a trajectory currently to exceed our capacity in the New Orleans area for ventilators by about April the 4th. But there's also defiance. Despite an order banning gatherings larger than 50, Pastor Tony Spell refuses to cancel Sunday service, attended by hundreds. The church, again, is not a non-essential, okay? The church is the most essential thing in all the world. While some shrug off the threat, states are taking extraordinary measures to slow the virus spread. Our huge concern is that if people start to travel south, then we are going to have um, a huge uprise in our cases. In Florida, they're expanding checkpoints at major interstates, screening motorists coming from COVID hotspots, including New York and Louisiana. In North Carolina, the Outer Banks now require an entry permit, while states see a surge of cases, including Michigan. Detroit's now home to the third largest outbreak behind New York and Chicago. Here, too, there's a concern about resources. The scarcity of resources is not something I thought I would ever have to face in this country, and I know that in my state it's already happening. Similar worry in California, where there's more than 5,000 confirmed cases. This weekend, the number in critical care doubled to more than 400, and across the country, convention centers now turned makeshift hospitals. And Aaron's with us now. Aaron, Texas adding new restrictions tonight. That's right, Kate. Today, Texas announced new restrictions for anyone flying in from cities such as Miami and Detroit, new checkpoints along the Louisiana border. It has always been here. The Army, the Navy, the Marines, they, they've always been here for us when we needed them. And they're here again for you now. And for me, the, the flashbacks I get, knowing that the city is under such stress now, it's, it's real personal for me. The fire department, I spent 30 years in it. So when September 11th happened, it was personal. It was friends. It was leaders, people I had worked with. Everybody was affected by September 11th. And that's what's happening now. 
Everybody you know is affected by the coronavirus in one way or another. A friend, a relative, uh, a loved one that you can't go and see because they're uh, in quarantine or you don't want to. I mean, I stopped to see a hundred year old lady uh, last week and just, you know, talk to her from six feet away. And I know everybody's doing that and it's important. But this, this is a big time visible sign of what our government is like when we put it into action. And the mayor said it. And it's really, I'm, I'm really proud to be part of it now. I know how tough the people of this city are, and I've seen us take on some seemingly insurmountable, insurmountable challenges. Once again, we need to do it. Once again, we need to be together, six feet apart. I saw the mayor taking pictures with uh, some of the military folks. I never noticed it before, taking a picture with someone who was two or three feet away. It's weird. It's really strange what we're all going through. But it's necessary, and it is going to make a difference. The more we separate, the more everybody stays away, the better off we'll be and the faster we'll get out of this. But thank goodness now, help has arrived. It's going to make a big difference. FEMA's working with the city, with the state, to supply everything we possibly can, working with HHS to get as many medical people here as we can, people to help us with the uh, forensics and the mortuary problems that we're going to have, because we are going to have an awful lot of folks that aren't going to make it. But we're doing the best we can. And it's, uh, it's an honor to be back in the middle of, 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 uh, of such, a, such a tough, tough battle that we have in front of us. With September 11th, it seemed like every day we were fixing stuff, and it was getting a slightly better. The grief, of course, was, was enormous. But the operation seemed to get slightly better every day. With this, it seems to be we're not there yet. It's not going to get better. It might not get better for us here in the city for weeks, maybe a month. I hope not. I don't know. I listen to Dr. Fauci on here about models and worst case scenarios, best case scenarios. We just don't know. So we are preparing for the worst case. And that's all we can do at this point. And we're doing a good job. And uh, we're here for you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tom. Uh, now, uh, such an honor uh, to bring to you the military leader of this effort. Uh, he comes from a family long connected to the U.S. Navy. Uh, he is someone we're thinking about right now as one of our saviors, one of the people who led the forces that came to help us in our hour of need. But his day job is vice commander of U.S. Fleet Forces. So he has a big, big job and a lot to think about. But right now, his mind, his heart, his soul is focused on New York City. And I'm proud to say he is also a resident of Manhattan and has a family here and understands what we are all going through. And I just want to express, on behalf of 8.6 million New Yorkers, my gratitude for your leadership and for all the men and women who serve under your command. An honor to present to you Rear Admiral John Muston. Mr. Mayor, Mr. Administrator, uh, Commissioner, thank you for being here today to welcome this great ship. To the officers, the crew, the medical professionals of USNS Comfort, thank you for the vital mission that you've undertaken. I'd also like to recognize and thank the many, many contributors who worked tirelessly behind the scenes to make this day possible. Each of those who helped to fit out and prepare this ship in record time, from the maintenance community to the dock workers, to the ship's company, to the doctors, to the dredgers. Thank you, all of you, for the agility and professionalism that you have all shown over the past few weeks. That focused collective effort will save American lives. Today, I also want to recognize that not all of our nation's heroes wear military uniforms. Especially today, we acknowledge that many wear scrubs. Let us not forget, nor fail to recognize, that the doctors and nurses across America, those who are treating patients in these unprecedented times, they are all heroes. And like those heroes, the unmistakable white hull and red cross of this great ship have been a welcome sight around the world, standing at the forefront of our humanitarian missions overseas. This ship, re ship represents all that is good about the American people, all that is generous, all that is ready, 
responsive, and resolute. Like her sister ship, the USNS Mercy, was recently moored and is already serving patients in Los Angeles, this great ship will support civil authorities by increasing medical capacity and collaboration for medical assistance. Not treating COVID-19 patients, but by acting as a relief valve for other urgent needs. Freeing New York's hospitals and our precious medical professionals to focus on this pandemic. So now this great ship will serve and support our fellow Americans in this time of need, providing critical surge hospital capacity to America's largest city. As a resident New Yorker myself, I can attest to the invincible spirit of New York. From the ships that she built in World War II, to her unflappable determination following 9-11 and Hurricane Sandy, I have great confidence that New York will weather today's storm as well, this time with the support of another great American community, the Naval families on board and supporting the crew of the USNS Comfort. Words are incapable of expressing the depth of my gratitude for those on this mission and for the families that they leave behind. The men and women on board Comfort are mothers, their fathers, their sons, daughters, sisters, and brothers. And while our lives may look drastically different today than they did even a month ago, the circumstances for these men and women are no exception. They left their families during this uncertain time in our nation's history knowing that they can make a difference. That is what the U.S. Navy does, and this is an example of Americans helping their fellow men. I know that for our military families, social distancing is not a new concept, but rather a frequent reality. And I remain grateful for all that each of them do for our nation and for our communities every single day. As you heard from the administrator, the last time this great hospital ship, all 70,000 tons of her, was in New York, was in the wake of 9-11 where she served as a respite and comfort for first responders working around the clock. Today, like then, we bring a message to all New Yorkers. Now your Navy has returned, and we are with you, committed in this fight. Mr. Mayor, every sailor, every Marine, and every civilian on this mission stands proudly, stands ready to serve the people of New York City. We have not yet begun to fight, and we will not give up this ship. Thank you. Beautifully said, Admiral, and thank you so much. All right, we're going to take questions now from the media, and just please project your voices so I can hear you well. Go ahead. Oh, we have microphones, even better. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So what's your, what's your message to President Trump after the comfort docked here to help New York City? And when it came in here to the pier, what was your emotion yeah. and what was your reaction overall? It's a very emotional moment. Um, I went up on the roof here to watch the comfort come in and I had this incredible feeling of peace actually, that help was finally coming, that um, we were not alone. And I just have a reverence for the military. I come from a family that had a deep involvement in the military. I have a reverence for the military. Feeling the presence of the United States military here just gave me a sense that things were going to be okay. Um, and just, it's such a moving sight. The ship is so impressive. It just looming there in our harbor, you know, was like a beacon of hope. And it really felt that way to me. Uh, my message to the president is thank you and we need more help. And that's not because um, any of us likes to have to say that, but because it's true that the toughest weeks are ahead. We are bracing ourselves for something we've never seen before in any of our lives. And, and the federal government in many ways is the only force that can help us to reach the level of preparation we need to, to save every life we can save. So I'm going to keep calling the president. I'm going to keep appealing to him to get us all the help we need for these really tough weeks. And then again, we will turn around and help everyone else in this country right after. I'll go to this side. Yes. Mr. Mayor, as you know, normally this time of year, we'd be very busy and focused on the state budget yes. in Albany. I, I just want to ask, I know it's kind of a secondary issue now, but there is a lot getting crafted yes. up there. Do you have any concerns in terms of what you've been hearing in terms of how the city will be affected? I have real concerns. I have deep concerns because what's being discussed is essentially 
health care for people who need it. When you, you know, we can talk about the Medicaid budget, but that's, I think, the wrong way to think about it. What it equals is health care for people who need health care right now and need it more than ever because of the pandemic. I spoke at length last night with Speaker Carl Hastie and Majority Leader Andrea Stewart-Cousins. I let them know that from the perspective of 8.6 million people in New York City, we cannot afford Medicaid cuts, health care cuts at this dire moment. The state must accept the Medicaid funding that was in the third stimulus bill. We need that money to be accepted and we need to make sure that the health care so many people are depending on is not disrupted. So I, I understand that the state has a budget challenge. We have a huge budget challenge. I mean, I'm right now in the middle of cutting a huge amount out of this budget for this city right now. But what I will not cut is health care. And I said that the other day. We're going to find some really tough cuts we have to make, but it will never be about health care. It will never be about the fight against COVID-19. So I urge the state, accept the federal money, do not cut Medicaid, do not cut health care for New Yorkers who need it. Let's get, oh, okay, well, let's keep going back and forth. Whoever's at the microphone, go ahead. Can you tell, tell us what, the, uh, what kind of services the ship will be providing and who, how will it be decided what patients will be going to the ship and which patients will stay at the hospitals? I'm going to start and I'll let the Admiral uh, join in, obviously. What I have to explain to everyone, I think it is such a shock to hear this that people are still kind of adjusting to it. The intensive care units in our hospitals used to be a small part of our hospitals. Again, at the beginning of this month, we had about 20,000 working hospital beds in New York City. What we have to do is convert as many as possible, potentially almost all of those traditional hospital beds into ICU beds. We have to make whole hospitals into intensive care units to get through these next weeks. That's how dire, that's how tough this situation is. If we're going to turn a hospital, I mean, think of Bellevue, think of NYU Langone, you go by these huge buildings, they're all, they're gonna be all ICU if we can bring all the pieces together, the staff and the equipment and everything. Well, what happens to everyone else who doesn't need intensive care? We have to have hospitals for them too. What happens to people who've, uh, been infected with COVID-19, but are not at the point where they need intensive care, hopefully on the way to recovery. They need a hospital bed in many cases too, but we can't put them in an intensive care unit, which has to be reserved for those we're trying to save. So what the USNS Comfort allows, and Javits Center, and so many other places being developed right now, is the ability to take all those other patients and give them care. And each location will be different, but it will allow us to keep a healthcare system going while we convert the core hospitals into something we've never done. And this is beyond anyone's imagination. I asked the head of our public hospitals, Dr. Mitch Katz, I said, have you ever heard of any place where they had to turn hospitals into all ICU? He said, no, no one's ever come near having to do that in the last hundred years in this country. Uh, but because the comfort is here, because of what's happened at Javits Center, we're gonna have the ability to do that uh, and save a lot of lives. Admiral, you wanna join in? Just uh, in terms of the specifics and the mechanics, we've been working very closely with the local healthcare officials to determine what that process looks like. So, so frankly, we are prepared to receive and we trust the screening process that is in effect at the Javits Center so that we will receive advance notice so that the ship can prepare to receive the patients. But, uh, but in terms of what the healthcare providers determine are the best patients for us, those are the ones that we would expect to receive. How can you um, take us to the mechanics of this transfer of patients? Uh, how are you communicate this to the patients? What kind of situations um, are these patients experiencing? And are the families going to be able to visit them uh, on board of the Comfort? All right, I'm going to start and I'm going to give you the disclaimer right away that all of this is being worked out in real time. So. Um, I guarantee you we're not going to have all those questions I and mean, all those answers today because we're literally in a wartime situation building it as we go along. Uh, Dr. Raul Pereira Hensa, Deputy Mayor, if at any you want to jump in on any of these questions about procedure, please do, or Admiral as well. I think the common sense basic answer is we're going to work out the protocol between all the players, how to get the right patients to the right locations, again, reserving the hospitals for ICU to the maximum extent, hospital, uh, maximum extent possible, 
Some places will specialize in uh, convalescent COVID-19 patients, meaning patients on the way to recovery, no longer intensive care. Some places will specialize in all sorts of other medical needs that require hospitalization. Because remember, all the folks with heart disease, all the folks with cancer, there's still so many people that will need hospitalization for other things that are not COVID-19. So we're working out those protocols right now. As to things like visitation, I think a fair statement would be the normal rules will not apply. I'm, just gonna, I'm the non-doctor telling all New Yorkers right now. We're going to always try to respect families, uh, but we have to be clear that the normal rules of going to a hospital just aren't going to exist in this kind of wartime environment, and people should get used to a different set of standards. It will be determined for each location what that is, um, but there's going to be such urgency dealing with a huge uptick in cases that we can't do all the things we normally do. Admiral, you want to add, or, or Deputy Mayor? Deputy Mayor. Okay. Deputy Mayor? Yes, as the mayor outlined, we have uh, stood up a hospital executive committee, which includes all the public hospitals, the voluntary hospitals, the independent hospitals, and uh, the command from Comfort and Javits. Uh, there is a screening mechanism, very complex, in order to allocate who goes where. As the mayor pointed out, we are prepared to convert as many of the regular beds in all hospitals in the city into ICU beds. Uh, hopefully we'll get the ventilators so the most severe uh, cases end up being taken care of there. The visitation piece will require a screening like we're doing for everyone right now. So if there is any risk that a patient that has no uh, COVID-19 that is being taken care of here at the Comfort has a relative that could be potentially infected. Of course, there will be screening for them not to come in. You had said that Saturday you would decide whether or not to close the playgrounds. Why have you left the playgrounds open when, for example, Hoboken has closed its parks and Bergen County has closed its parks? Why do we not have consistency on that guideline for social distancing? This is an issue that obviously we're working with the state on, and the states have all been working together, and there is not one uniform standard. That's just the truth. We are very cognizant. Look, 8.6 million people in a very small space. I don't think taking away parks is a great idea unless we have evidence that people are not following the rules in a really substantial way. I have had this conversation daily with our police commissioner. He says overwhelmingly they are seeing compliance. We know warmer weather is coming, not today, but warmer weather is coming. We're gonna watch carefully. What I said yesterday is this. Right now, the police and all our agencies are authorized to use fines. We've given enough warning, enough education. Anyone who, if you, Andrew, were in the park and officer said, sir, you're not practicing social distancing, I need to move, and you said, I'm not gonna move, they're gonna say, sir, you're about to be given a fine, this is your last chance. And if you don't move or you don't uh, follow the instruction, you're gonna get a fine. If we see any uh, basketball courts where there's games going on and we've warned people to stop, we're gonna take down the rims, we're gonna take out tennis nets, we're gonna take out soccer nets, whatever it takes. On the playgrounds, if we see individual playgrounds where there's non-compliance, we can close the playground. If we see it broadly, all the playgrounds will be closed. But to date, based on the sheer facts coming back from the police department, parks department, non-compliance is limited. You will find some instances, I'm sure you will, Andrew, but not enough to tell 8.6 million people they cannot have parks. And that's the balance we're trying to strike. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, yesterday we heard the pretty scaring numbers from the federal government. Do you have uh, any particular forecast and scenario for the city? I mean, the particular for New York City. I've been real honest with New Yorkers. At this point, we assume at least half of all New Yorkers will contract this disease. Again, consistently we see for 80%, that means, thankfully, a fairly mild experience that they get through okay, recover quickly. But right now, uh, at least 50%, it could be substantially more. We see this horrible increase in the number of deaths. Uh, and I've been honest, I think the weeks ahead will be tougher. To date, I still fear that the worst is not gonna be April, but actually in the beginning of May. 
But no projection is perfect. I guarantee you, and I wish I couldn't, but I guarantee you that April is going to be exceedingly tough. Um, and we have to understand that any projection of things being all okay by Easter, there's just no way that's true for New York City. Uh, this is a question actually for the former fire commissioner, Von Essen. Hi, Commissioner, can I ask you a question over here? Hey, welcome back to New York. Oh, thank you. Um, I never left. <laughs> well, great to have you here now. Um, I'm wondering, you mentioned mortuary logistics. Um, what are you working on right now? What's the current city capacity um, to hold the deceased? And is there any consideration of turning places like MSG, Madison Square Garden, into no. a mortuary facility? No, fortunately, we, we're not thinking of anything like that. But we are sending refrigeration trucks to New York to help with uh, some of the problem on a temporary basis. I was speaking to Commissioner Criswell this morning. We've sent, uh, the military has sent 42 folks to the Manhattan uh, Medical Examiner's Office to help over there. And we need, you have a desperate, New York City has a, we in New York City have a desperate need for help over in Queens. And we're working on that as we speak. There's uh, folks trying to put it all together. There's only so many of these teams that the military has. We have 50 states and a couple of territories and commonwealths that we're, we're trying to not hold back resources, but trying to make it make a plan ready that, that works for the whole country. So it's 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 difficult, but everybody's trying, and we will get more help here for New York. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, clearly, as you pointed out, this is a very visual representation of the help that's arrived. Uh, but can you give us a clearer sense of how much more help is going to be needed? I mean, if you will, how many? equivalents of the comfort does New York City need to get through the worst of this, sir? Yeah, it's a great, great way of thinking about it. Um, think of this ship, which is 750 beds to begin, has a capacity potentially of 1,000 beds. So here's the way to think of what we're all working on right now. We started with around 20,000 working beds in New York City. We have to get over 60 thousand by the beginning of May, according to what we know now, like adding 40 U.S. comforts. I mean, that's the magnitude of what we're talking about. And um, the amazing thing is that we believe with enough people working together that we can get there. As hard as that sounds, you know, here's this extraordinary contribution from the federal government. Here's a Javits Center where they're talking about up to 3,000 beds right there. The surge capacity in the hospitals, where every hospital is adding 50% more beds, that's on top of that original 20,000, they're all finding additional beds to add in their facilities, you know, creating new spaces. Mitch Katz said a long time ago, he can turn a cafeteria into an ICU if he needs to. He can put up a tent in the parking lot, turn it into an ICU. And then the hotels, and the other buildings that we'll be moving to. So it's a Herculean task. It's never been attempted in the history of New York City. We believe that's the number. We'd love to find out it's a lesser number. But that's the number we're shooting for. And I believe with enough work, enough creativity, enough teamwork, we can get to it. Um, last night, your administration made an announcement about um, all of the supplies and the ventilators you've um, given to the uh, to the hospitals throughout the city to date. I'm wondering how your administration is handling um, supply distribution to private hospitals. A lot of it has been focused on going to the public hospitals, rightfully so. But I'm wondering if any of these supplies and ventilators have gone to the private hospitals on Staten Island. And yes. I have a second question. Absolutely. And um, I've had this conversation daily with Borough President Otto to make sure uh, that supplies are getting where they're needed. Um, yes, the city has provided supplies to Rumsey in, in substantial numbers and will continue to do so. Um, the supplies for Staten Island University Hospital come from a combination of sources, state, city, Northwell, uh, the Northwell Hospital system. But I'm keeping an eye and my team is on all of it. We really don't see a separation between public hospitals, voluntaries, independents in this kind of situation. We're all working together. Remember the other day, we got in 400 ventilators from the federal government. We sent 100 to the public hospitals, 300 to the voluntaries and independents. So that's going to be the pattern, of, not necessarily that percentage, but that approach 
we're all sharing to make sure at any given moment a hospital has what it needs. Go ahead. Um, how, how are you guys planning to get um, Go ahead. Uh, pa uh, COVID patients from the outer boroughs to the comfort places like Staten Island? How, Again, how the, idea, the idea is to keep folks who need that urgent care, that ICU care, in hospitals that will be converted increasingly to ICU care. Uh, folks who do not require ICU care uh, but do need hospitalization for COVID-19, the goal is to keep them as close as possible, of course, uh, to their home and in their home borough. So we're continuing to build out capacity in Staten Island, and we will continue as in every borough. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. With uh, rent due tomorrow for many people, I wanted to ask about a proposal from some local officials who want to allow people to apply their security deposits to next month's rent. Do you support that? Are you doing anything to make that a reality? I do support that. And I think the my understanding is that we need some kind of uh, state action to allow that to happen. But I think that's exactly the right approach. Look, everyone's hand to mouth, or so many people at least, are hand to mouth right now. Uh, their income has just been blown away. Uh, federal help is coming, but that will take time. Uh, people need help right now. Applying the security deposits, actually it helps the renter to pay the rent. It actually helps in many cases landlords, especially smaller landlords, because that money is in escrow right now, and, and the smaller landlords need money to get by as well. So it frees it up for them. There has to be some process to eventually restore that deposit you know, over time, maybe an installment plan over time. But the immediate relief is needed. So I think it's a great idea. Uh, we're working with uh, folks at the state level to see how to make that happen. Okay, go ahead. Mr. Mayor, um, in terms of, uh, you've talked about the ventilators and the hospital beds. Where are you at in terms of the PPE for the uh, hospital workers, nurses, doctors, where, where we stand on that? So on, on personal protective equipment, this week, and I'm always giving you this update week by week, if it ever turns into needing to tell you day by day, I will. This week, in terms of personal protective equipment for our hospitals, we do have a sufficient supply. We have sent it out and continue to send it out around the city. Hospitals, this is something Dr. Katz said yesterday that everyone has to keep in mind. Hospitals are teaching their professionals, their healthcare workers, a new way of handling this equipment. Because until there is a truly ample supply like there used to be in peacetime, uh, folks are being trained to handle the supply differently, to stretch it out, to reuse it whenever safe. That's a whole different way of life. And instead of seeing in the supply closet, you know, a month or two supply, people are seeing less, they're seeing days or a few weeks. And I think it is understandably unnerving to the healthcare professionals. But we're all working together to help everyone understand a new reality for this moment in history. The supply today is sufficient. It will take us into next week. The thing I'm worried about right now is ventilators overwhelmingly. I've asked the President and the White House for 400 more. We will take them from any source. If 400 more come in some other way, that's great. But we need that to make sure we will get to April 5th okay. As we approach April 5th, which I've said is a very a day I'm really concerned about in terms of equipment and in terms of personnel, I will update New Yorkers as to whether we have enough to get through the next week. But that's how tight it has been. Number one concern, ventilators. Right behind it, uh, the need for more doctors, nurses, respiratory therapists to actually handle ICU capacity and give some relief uh, to these health workers who have gone through so much. Yeah. Go ahead. So you said $1.3 billion you were looking to cut from the budget, but that, that number might need to update. Yeah, it will Have go up. We'll give you an updated number shortly, but it's definitely going to go up. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And will patients treated on the comfort have to pay their medical bills as usual, or will this be paid for by the federal government? Well, I don't know, Admiral. I mean, first of all, insurance is insurance, so whoever has insurance, I assume that's the go-to. But Admiral or Raul, do you know the answer to anyone who doesn't? Uh, absolutely, yes, sir. 
When the president declared a national emergency, the implication from the Department of Defense is that we provide this service and we are not looking to check insurance cards or, or send any invoices or bills. This is an investment by the government on behalf of the people of America, so uh, there, there is no additional cost to the patient. Well done. So we like that plan. <laughs> Admiral, that's a great plan. We thank you for that. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. You mentioned that 750 beds are available immediately on the Comfort. Does that mean that patients will start being moved today? And if so, or if not, how many patients will be moved in what sort of time frame? So I want to make sure they're fully docked before any patients go in. They're still, they're still securing it. But uh, between the Admiral and Deputy Mayor, who wants to speak about the timelines? You want to start? or? So as the mayor mentioned, obviously we want to take care of uh, all of the, the regular husbanding services required once the ship comes into port. We're prepared to begin receiving patients tomorrow. Um, I, I won't open the, uh, the box to say while we may be ready internally to do that sooner, we want to use a very methodical process that's been developed in conjunction with the local health authorities, which is predicated on starting tomorrow. So that. Just a, a, a quick point. We're going to do the assessment that I talked about before with the hospital committee going through the Javits Center. And as the patients start coming from the hospitals, screening will happen today and probably in the next day or two, you will start seeing patients here. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Mayor. Uh, did you get any results, any outcomes of the drug test which was uh, started last week? Uh, wait, which one? I'm sorry, clarify. I mean, last Wednesday, uh, you were supposed to, t uh, to start the drug test of the new kind of uh, medications uh, in, uh, regarding this problem. Yeah, there's several different approaches that are being tested now in, uh, certainly in our public health system, but I want to make sure we give you a fully accurate answer, so I'm not updated on that. I'll make sure our team from Health and Hospitals get you that answer. Okay, everybody, thank you very much. Good day for New York City. Thank you, everyone. Tonight, tens of thousands of Americans are stranded overseas. In India, there's chaos as the government imposes a lockdown on more than a billion people, including Peter Joseph from San Diego. He's been stuck in his hostel for eight days. We feel completely not heard. Uh, we feel abandoned. On the other side of the world, Peru closing its borders virtually overnight, sending Americans scrambling to the airport. Yes, <laughs> looking forward to going home. Green Bay Packers quarterback Aaron Rodgers describing his own harrowing escape in a radio interview. There was some moments where we were worried we were not going to get out. It was absolute pandemonium at the airport. Others weren't so lucky. Yesterday, the only meal we got was lunch. Zachary Mechstroth has been stuck in a youth hostel in Cusco for 13 days. You got a repatriation flight through the State Department, but you weren't allowed to leave the youth hostel. Correct. So... The hostel manager said that if I were to leave with that document, I would get arrested. 
The State Department saying we have no higher duty than to protect American citizens and have launched an unprecedented global effort to bring home our citizens from every corner of the globe. But not everyone can be rescued easily. Those on cruise ships stranded at sea, unwelcome in any harbor. The Zan Dam off the coast of Panama carrying four dead and more than 100 sick. Tonight, transferring its healthy passengers to another vessel as stranded Americans around the world wonder when and how they'll ever get home. Sarah Harmon, NBC News. I'm happy to say Morgan Radford joins me now from home for the highs and lows of the week. Morgan, we just could not go another week without seeing you. How you doing? How are you, Willie? I am sitting here. I am ready for the highs and the lows. Oh, you've got the mug. Okay, let's do it just like normal. But this week, we're going with all highs to shine a light on the good things we're seeing across the country right now and around the world. Our next high goes to the spirit and creativity of communities that refuse to let a little social distance ruin their celebrations. Traditional birthday parties have given way for the time being to parades of honking cars and front lawn sing-alongs. The honking and singing that especially moved us this week was coming from Pasadena, California. 15-year-old Coco Johnson returned home from the hospital after her last chemotherapy appointment and got quite a surprise from the neighborhood. A hero's welcome for Coco with friends and neighbors lining the street and hanging out of their cars with signs and decorations to celebrate the last of the teenagers' treatments for bone cancer. It was really overwhelming. I was just like shocked. I was so surprised. The light at the end of the tunnel will be there soon, hopefully. Absolutely, Coco. Morgan, I say this is a tradition we continue after we're through this coronavirus episode in this country. Parades in the streets really, all the time. I love it. I love how I love how creative people are getting with showing how they care. I mean, Coco, we are with you all the way. Absolutely. Our next high goes to all you parents out there suddenly transformed into teachers, coaches, and in some cases, dance instructors. When one little girl in Nebraska had her dance competition canceled, her father, a state trooper, stepped in to make sure the show went on. That is Lieutenant Tyler Cranky with the Nebraska State Patrol dancing with six-year-old Mila, cape and all. After that dance competition was canceled, Mila's instructor told students to teach their parents the routine as practice. Dad said it took him about a week to learn the dance, and he posted it to Facebook, hoping he might give a smile to some people this week. I would say mission accomplished here, Morgan. Yes, I'm ready for that parent patrol <laughs> dance troupe to hit the road. I'd buy tickets to that because dad's got moves. I got to get me one of those capes, too, when I dance with my kids. From the president, a new timeline announcing the federal government's social distancing guidelines will stay in place Thank you. for at least another month. The peak in death rate is likely to hit in two weeks. Therefore, we will be extending our guidelines to April 30th to slow the spread. The president Sunday backing off his hope that the country would open up by Easter, now circling a new date on the calendar when he says life will finally get back to normal. We can expect that by June 1st, we will be well on our way to recovery. We think by June 1st, a lot of great things will be happening. Nothing would be worse than declaring victory before the victory is won. It comes as the president is now bracing Americans for a significant death toll. If we could hold that down, as we're saying to 100,000, it's a horrible number. Maybe even less, but to 100,000. So we have between 100 and 200,000. The White House Coronavirus Task Force emphasizing those higher figures. It's anywhere in the model between 80,000 and 160,000, maybe even potentially 200,000 people succumbing to this. I think it's entirely conceivable that if we do not mitigate to the extent that we're trying to do, that you could reach that number. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's possible. The president stressing the U.S. is facing an unprecedented crisis. I've been watching that for the last week on television. Body bags all over in hallways. I've been watching them bring in trailer trucks, freezer trucks. They're freezer trucks because they can't handle the bodies. There's so many of them. I've seen things that I've never seen before. I mean, I've seen them, but I've seen them on television in faraway lands. I've never seen them in our country. Those comments following this dire assessment from Dr. Deborah Burks. No state, no metro area will be spared. A sobering reality check there from Dr. Deborah Burks. As for those dates, so April 30th right now, that's when the government hopes that they'll be able to loosen up those social distancing guidelines. Jan, uh, excuse me, June 1st, when the president hopes Americans will return to their normal lives. That leaves the month of May when Americans, according to the president, would hopefully be able to return to their work, slowly venture out to bars and restaurants and get back to a little bit of normalcy. This morning, as an emergency field hospital is being built in iconic Central Park, New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut are now under a 14-day travel advisory. The CDC is urging people in the nation's worst coronavirus hotspot to halt non-essential domestic travel, as cases top 70,000 in the three states, with over 1,000 deaths. Not a lockdown, something much more consistent with what we've been actually saying and doing in the city and state already, which is telling people to stay home unless they have an essential reason to go somewhere. Today, the USNS Comfort is due to dock in New York Harbor. It will serve as a floating thousand bed hospital for non-coronavirus patients, freeing up beds on land. We still have to take care of pregnant women who have to deliver. We have to take care of patients who need emergency uh, surgery. We have to take care of kids. <laughs> In the Bronx, ERs are packed. We are seeing a lot of younger patients that are coming through the door that are sicker as well. And that, that is surprising and a little scary. Concerns are also growing about the lack of personal protective equipment, or PPE, for healthcare workers. It's incredibly frustrating for us. Our, our coworkers are getting sick. President Trump once again casting doubt on the amount of protective gear New York authorities are requesting. We're delivering millions and millions of different products, and all we do is hear that, can you get some more? Also in need, police officers. More than 5,000 members of the NYPD have called out sick. An estimated 900 are believed to have COVID-19. We are hurting, we are crying, and we continue to fight. The department is also reporting the death of its first uniformed officer, 23-year veteran detective Cedric Dixon. Two other civilian employees have also died. May we never forget the sacrifice of those workers who put themselves in harm's way to keep you and your family safe. New York City's mayor says there will now be fines for not social distancing in public here in the city, ranging from $250 to $500. As for this field hospital, it is set to open tomorrow. America's Motor City now on the front lines in the fight against coronavirus. The U.S. Surgeon General now declaring Detroit a coronavirus hotspot. More than 5,000 cases have been reported in Michigan, and those numbers are expected to grow. Our emergency rooms have been packed. We are literally running out of inpatient capacity. Bob Riney oversees operations for the Henry Ford Health System in Detroit. In a leaked draft memo obtained by NBC News, the hospital outlines protocol in a worst case scenario, saying they would give priority treatment to those who would likely survive. The hospital acknowledged the letter, tweeting, we crafted a policy to provide guidance for making difficult patient care decisions. We hope never to have to apply them. Riney says hospitals are fighting a battle with no end in sight. Professionally, have you ever seen anything like this? You know, I've been in healthcare for 40 years and uh, been through a lot of different challenges that the industry has faced, but this one is different. This weekend, President Trump approved a disaster declaration for Michigan, unlocking federal assistance to help recovery efforts there. But not before criticizing the state's governor, Gretchen Whitmer, and her response to the outbreak, tweeting, failing Michigan governor must work harder. 
it's got to be all hands on deck. Uh, we are not one another's enemies. The enemy is the virus, and it is spreading, and it is taking American lives. Detroit's famous auto show has been canceled this year. Now, FEMA reportedly plans to turn the downtown convention space where it would have taken place into a makeshift field hospital for coronavirus patients. While this Ford plant is now rushing to manufacture masks and other personal protective equipment. Attention please, there is no congregating allowed. Cases are also skyrocketing in other major cities like Chicago, where an infant believed to be the nation's youngest victim died after testing positive for the virus. And down south, another American hotspot, New Orleans. We are being as creative as we can be, uh, but uh, unleashing more equipment is something that we desperately need as well. There are more than 3,000 cases in Louisiana, but in one town Sunday, Hundreds ignored the state's ban on large gatherings to attend church services. American cities stretch to their limit as the virus continues to surge. Interestingly, Michigan has put its manufacturing might into the battle against coronavirus, turning traditional auto manufacturing plants into manufacturing locations for traditional medical supply devices. Now, the governor did confirm that she received over 100,000 uh, N95 masks over the weekend. The U.S. Surgeon General declaring Detroit a hotspot and saying cases could get worse over the next week. And joining us now, the White House's Coronavirus Task Force Coordinator, Dr. Deborah Burks. Dr. Burks, good morning to you. It's good to have you with good us. Good morning. Good morning. So we've, we've heard this news now from the White House recommending that social distancing, what people should be doing, staying home, is expanded now for another month. The initial 15 days would have expired today, I believe. So what led to this change? What's the situation on the ground that requires this? You know, we get data every day um, from around the globe, but more importantly from the United States. I think everyone understands now that you can go from five to 50 to 500 to 5,000 cases very quickly. We see this in many metropolitan areas. We're very worried about every city in the United States and the potential for this virus to get out of control. And we really believe that Americans with the right information will stay home. And the president had said a couple of weeks ago he was hopeful, aspirational, that we could be back in business and packing masses on Easter Sunday. Obviously, this has changed. Now he's talking about potentially June 1st being a time that uh, America could return somewhat to normal. Where are you on that timeline? You know, I think we watch everything very carefully. Um, we, w we look at models, but we validate those models with the data that's coming in. And United States will look different than Europe, and Europe look different than Asia. And I think that we all have to be aware of that. It's not perfect science right now, because we're projecting based on what we have today. And we know that the doubling rate of this virus is very high. And so that's why these 30 days allows us to really do both diagnostics, finding out who is positive because they're sick, and allows us to also get surveillance fully in place to really answer your question. Yeah, it, you know, you're, you are in the middle of getting data, but you've seen quite a bit of data. I mean, to put it simply, is it worse than you would have expected it to be? Is, or is it better? Is the social distancing having an effect? I think in some of the metro areas, we were late in getting people to follow the 15-day guidelines. And so we know that from the time you start doing everything that you need, staying home, social distancing, not going out to any restaurant, bars, or even being careful in the grocery stores, absolutely religious hand washing, all of this, um, we see some metro areas came late to that. I think it will be when this is over, we'll have a lot of time to really compare data about what really worked with this epidemic so that if it comes back in the fall, we'll be better prepared both with treatments, but also in really understanding how it spreads. Dr. Fauci said yesterday we could see millions of cases in this country and as many as one to 200,000 deaths. Do you agree with that analysis? Is that a worst case scenario or something that uh, we should prepare ourselves as potentially likely? 
So in the flu models, the worst case scenario is between 1.6 million and 2.2 million deaths. That's the projection if you do nothing. So we've never really done all of these things that we're doing. We've put them into a model. We've looked at the Italy data with their self-isolation. And that's where we come up with if we do things together well, almost perfectly, we could get in the range of 100,000 to 200,000 fatalities. We don't even want to see wow, that. that, uh, that I know, but you know, you kind of take my breath away with that because I, what I hear you saying is that's sort of the best case scenario. If everything works and people do the things you're asking them to do, maybe you can hold the deaths to one to 200,000 in this country. Well, the best case scenario would be 100% of Americans doing precisely what is required. But we're not sure, based on the data that you're sharing from around the world and seeing these pictures, that all of America is responding in a uniform way to protect one another. So we also have to factor that in. Cities that don't social distances, that don't stay at home, that believe you can have social interactions, that believe you can have gatherings of homes of 20 and, and 10 people even, that is going to spread the virus even if everyone looks well. Yeah, I was, I was going to say, I believe on Meet the Press yesterday, you said that um, no state, no metro area will be spared. And I can imagine, you know, I grew up in Arizona. I, I remember watching things and thinking, oh, that's a big city problem. That's not going to happen here. What's your message to not just the, the metro areas, but to rural areas as well? So this virus, we think, can spread with a lot of asymptomatic and mild cases. And it's not until it gets into the vulnerable groups that you start to see the hospitalizations. So if you wait for that, if the metros and the rural areas don't take care now, by the time you see it, it has penetrated your community pretty significantly. And that's what we're concerned about. And that's why you have to prepare even though you think it's not there. Dr. Burks, I know it's a busy day, uh, nothing but busy days for you lately. Thank you very much for your time, ma'am. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Savannah. After weeks in limbo at sea, overnight, two Holland American cruise ships given the green light to cross the Panama Canal. The government there granting priority canal privileges to the MS Zandam and the MS Rotterdam, citing humanitarian and safety reasons. On board the Zandam, the bodies of four passengers who it's feared may have died from coronavirus. The cruise line says more than 100 others have fallen ill with flu-like symptoms, and at least two on board have tested positive for the virus. Cliff and Doris Kober, both healthy and in a cabin, they now call their jail cell. You've been on a ship with coronavirus. I assume you've been hiding in your room, but what has that anxiety been like? I mean, you're you're so close to it all. When I visualize a big bad boogeyman germ waiting outside the door. There is also passenger confusion. On Sunday, the Colbers say because they have no symptoms, they were told they were selected to move from the Zandam, the ship with suspected coronavirus, to the Rotterdam. Orlando Ashford, Holland America president, in a video statement. So first and foremost, I want to dispel the myth that there is an intention to create a healthy ship and a sick ship that will be managed separately. Instead, Holland America says the passengers who had interior rooms were moved to the other ship to give them a window and ventilation. The biggest problem now, where will both ships dock? They're scheduled to come to Port Everglades in Fort Lauderdale, but now there is growing pressure to turn them away, unless there is a way to isolate everyone with or without symptoms. Fort Lauderdale's mayor. These two ships cannot dock in Fort Lauderdale if there are sick passengers on board without any medical treatment there to meet them. But this morning, that emergency medical plan does not exist. The Colbers ask, what's the difference between them coming by boat and all the New Yorkers who traveled to Florida from the epicenter on planes and in cars? These ships are blocked. People coming into the airport can turn around, go back home or get a car and go somewhere else. We can't. We're in the middle of the ocean. We're stuck. So why are they picking on us? 
the passengers who got on these cruise ships got on March 7th. It was 24 hours later that the State Department issued its warning, as you noted at the top, Hoda. One of the questions that Colbers and other passengers have on these ships, of course, is if I'm not sick, will I get sick? And if I can't come into port here, is it possible that we could die at sea? Very, very difficult situation, Hoda. Oh, that is totally terrifying. So the question is, Gary, if they do get turned away from Fort Lauderdale, like how does this whole thing get resolved and how long will it take? Well, there's going to be a commission meeting, and the Broward County commissioners are going to have a meeting tomorrow to decide. They have a very short window because the ships are already in the Caribbean Sea to decide, will they let them in? One idea being floated is that everybody on board, whether they're ex- showing symptoms or not, would be taken down to Homestead Air Reserve Base and treated and uh, quarantined there for at least 14 days. But that is a plan that does not currently exist, and the mayor of Fort Lauderdale says he believes it's going to take President Trump's intervention to make something like that happen. This morning, a food and supply lifeline is about to be shut off. Instacart employs 200,000 independent contractors, and some are threatening to sit on the delivery sidelines unless they get additional hazard pay of at least $5 per trip and basic protective gear like hand sanitizer and masks. A lot of us are really literally making the decision between, you know, our health and our financial security right now. One man who just quit his Instacart job writing on Twitter, hashtag Instacart strike on Monday. Instacart's attempting to strike break by offering bonuses of $25. No, just last week, the company announcing plans to beef up its workforce with 300,000 more people. Instacart declined to comment on specifics, but in a statement said they're immensely grateful for the work of their employees, offering bonuses ranging from $25 to $200, More than a month of sick leave and soon hand sanitizer manufactured just for their shoppers. Honestly, daily, I sort of go through this argument in my head of am I a potential vector or am I actually helping? Shane Schlager delivers for DoorDash, a competitor service. He says he gets hand sanitizer for work, but not much else. Do you think you should be getting other PPE, masks and gloves? Should that be a given in this field? I think it should be. I've been personally using my own gloves. Um, I couldn't find any masks or I probably would uh, use those. DoorDash says they're providing financial assistance to eligible dashers diagnosed with COVID-19 or quarantined and changing the default delivery method to a no contact option, minimizing face time between dashers and customers. Schlager still delivering for now, but hundreds of miles away in Staten Island, a hundred workers at an Amazon warehouse are walking off the job today. We're very low on masks. We don't have the proper gloves. All we want is the building to be closed and professionally sanitized. I'm afraid to go to work. Amazon responding by saying these accusations are simply unfounded. We've taken extreme measures to keep people safe, tripling down on deep cleaning, procuring safety supplies that are available, and changing processes to ensure those in our buildings are keeping safe distances. This trend of striking for safety coming at a critical time for homebound Americans. A new study finding 40 million households have used online grocery delivery in just the last month, doubling the figure from just six months earlier. A surge in need as those on the delivery front lines are looking for a little peace of mind in these uncertain times. And a lot of companies, including Instacart and Amazon, are offering sick paid leave, but only if the employees test positive for COVID-19 or are quarantined. And of course, if you think you might be sick or have the coronavirus, the last thing public officials want you to do is to be out in public, much less delivering groceries or food. These days, connection and community come in unexpected forms from virtual happy hours. Why is it quarantine Because it's, it's water. To brunches and dinner parties now happening remotely. Thank God for all of our devices and our FaceTimes and our duos and our Zooms and everything we're using because it, it does not feel so awful. It, it, you still feel connected. NASA astronaut Nick Hag says some of the tools he used in space can help those of us trapped in our personal capsules here on Earth. When I was on orbit, I'd do crossword puzzles uh, with my boys over a video chat. And just being able to connect that way uh, was such a huge emotional boost. 
Zoom meetings have exploded in popularity over the past few weeks. It's now the number one free app for iPhone and Android. But not everyone has access to the internet or feels comfortable using it. Hi, Grandma. Hello, the phone call is back. Verizon says its phone traffic has gone way up. Each weekday, nearly 800 million calls are being made, twice the volume of Mother's Day. And people are staying on longer, too, 33%. Right now, one of the most kind things we could do is pick up the phone, take a picture of your smiling face, send it to that person who we know is alone or scared right now. For some special occasions, there are drive-by birthday wishes. For others, sign language. Grandma, look at the sign. It's a boy. I just had a feeling. <laughs> and for something that lasts even longer, old-fashioned letters are making a bit of a comeback, says Arkansas High School student Michelle Wells. Not a lot of people my age really do it, but I really enjoy it. If there's no time for that, a short text can say so much. Experts say even the little pings matter. Just checking in regularly with someone can make a big difference. For today, Joe Fryer, NBC News, Los Angeles. We're here for them. We are the community. It's definitely good to hear. You always want to hear that the wages are going up. We work hard, we bleed, we sweat, we cry when it comes to these cars. Without this pill, we die. He's doing the best he can for the country, and they're getting in the way. We're going to build the wall. We have no choice. This is an emergency. There are zero hours left to take action. Because we're incarcerated doesn't mean that we should lose our right to vote. This is the perfect time to graduate. There's like a lot of shooting happening. These are thoughtful voters who, more than anything, want these candidates to cut to the chase. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt, covering coronavirus with facts over fear. How do we know who belongs in isolation? What should we be conscious of? What's being worked on today? At a time of national crisis, turn to the most trusted TV news anchor in America. Need your true crime fix on the go? Dateline episodes are available as podcasts. Mysteries with a twist from the true crime original. Wow. Listen to Dateline wherever you get your podcasts. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. This is all I've got left. Who brought more to the caucuses? It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, 3 to 11 p.m. Eastern. from Washington. Why should your judgment be valued? I'd stake my judgment against anyone out there. Is party unity your concern right now, or is simply winning as many states as you well, can? Well, it's both. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. If it's digging in on the issues. Let's talk about money and politics. If it's asking the questions you want to ask. How do you reassure those supporters that you will sustain this? Just watch me. If it's navigating the winding road to the White House. And if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. The coronavirus outbreak. What's next? NBC News has in-depth coverage, answers to your questions, insight from medical experts, and up-to-the-minute live blog updates. For continuing coverage, turn to the networks and platforms of NBC News. The biggest fear that we have is that the healthcare system will become overwhelmed. What do we do when half of your doctors are out on quarantine? You have no more beds, all your ventilators are used up, and there are a thousand new diagnoses in a single day. What do you do then? That's what we're bracing for. Over the past week, we've seen hundreds of doctors and nurses take to social media to plead for basic supplies. They've been asking for gloves, masks, and gowns. PPE, personal.
personal protective equipment. You might have seen some of those stories shared on social media. We came up with this Get Me PPE hashtag, um, and I went on Twitter and asked people to share these stories, and people jumped in, and it was um, it was actually even more alarming than I expected. What were some of the most surprising ones? Uh, one of my physician friends posted a bag um, that her hospital was using. They put her name on it because um, you were supposed to put your PPE together um, at the end of your day, put it back in the bag, and reuse all of it the next day. People were posting pictures of and handmade. Is that normal? <laughs> is that normal, or do you no. take your PPE home? Never. I mean, you never store your PPE for the next day. It goes right into the garbage can. I mean, I've never um, used any of these items for more than a single patient because uh, of the risk of transmission. We generally take them off right after a patient and put them right into the garbage can. Nationally, um, I've heard estimates that uh, that most healthcare systems have no more than a one month supply, and this is just getting started. We're in a we're in the most vulnerable position, and we're willing to be in that vulnerable position. But without the protection, you're going to lose us. Uh, you're going to lose physicians, and you're going to lose nurses. And if you lose them in a small community like we are in, uh, then you don't have a backup for that. Um, and so that puts more burden on the larger institutions. Um, personally, I'm very, I'm very disillusioned. I see on the news every day um, our physicians and our nurses are being referred to as heroes, and I think that's wonderful. We appreciate it. We don't consider ourselves heroes, but we're going to keep coming and showing up every, every day. But what I'm concerned about is that if we're calling people heroes, but we're not willing to protect them, um, that's really scary. I want the public to know that we're here for you, and we absolutely take this 100% seriously. We're going to come every day to work. We're going to put our lives on the line. We're going to do everything we can to save your life. And so we need your help to make that possible. What we need to do now is focus on how do we how do we get these supply chains up and running? And that's not me saying, you know, hey, can you can you make masks or can you sew these masks that may not, you know, adequately protect people, but actually on a federal level petitioning our representatives, our policymakers, the people that really have the authority to, to get people to manufacture these. And, and I'm an emergency clinician who loves my job. I love to go to work. I also have a seven-month-old daughter and a two-and-a-half-year-old kid. I'm breastfeeding my seven-month-old. If I come home and I'm sick, I can't go back and I can't take care of you. And if I get my children sick, I also can't do the same thing. And so I need people to, to stay home and to really think very carefully before they go out or before they go, you know, gallivanting with others, because that's how we're going to be able to shut this down. That's what China showed us. That's what other nations have showed us. Um, and, and so I think that's the biggest thing that people can do. Making masks is, is great. You know, telling us, putting hearts in the windows, those things are great. But really social distancing is, I think, what's going to help turn this around from a lay person perspective. And that's, that's what people can do to help me as, as an emergency physician, as a mom, you know, to take care of this. I, I think that's what we need to do. Governments are taking measures to try and stop the spread of coronavirus. One of those measures to self-quarantine. These measures are having an impact on our economies, our workplaces, our relationships, and our grocery shelves. You've probably seen images like this one or this one. Scenes of people ravaging convenience stores to race to stock up on supplies as this pandemic gets worse. But this is not exactly what public health officials are recommending. What do you actually need in times like this? Here's what to keep in mind if you're planning an essential trip to a grocery store or pharmacy. Let's break it down into categories. So people who are high risk and people who are not. The CDC says that older adults and people who have serious medical conditions like lung disease, heart disease, and diabetes are at high risk. These individuals should quote, stock up on supplies, specifically these. Any medications that they need, they should stock up for at least 30 days. 
And if you can't get the medications from a pharmacy, you should potentially look into mail order prescription options. The CDC also encourages these high risk individuals to stock up on medical supplies like tissues, a thermometer, and over the counter medicine to tackle fever and cough symptoms. People should also stock up on food for a period of time. Now, even if you're not high risk, the government has guidelines for you in times of a pandemic, especially if you've been in contact with someone who's tested positive for coronavirus and need to self quarantine at a moment's notice. They say to have a two week supply of food and water. Focus on buying non perishable food items that are nutrient dense to make sure that you minimize your trips to the grocery store. They say to have fluids with electrolytes, vitamins, and like higher risk adults, your medications and over the counter medicines to treat fever symptoms and a cough. The Red Cross is also urging people to make sure they have the basic supplies, like laundry detergent, or if you have a child, make sure to get diapers. The government is also urging people to have electronic copies of their health records. They're also encouraging folks to make sure that they speak with their families and loved ones about what they may need if they get sick and need to be cared for. For people already stuck in their homes in quarantine, options are a little more limited. Services like DoorDash and Uber are encouraging no contact takeout deliveries, and Instacart is adding 300,000 shoppers to keep up with grocery store delivery demands. Amazon is also adding thousands of staff to boost its delivery services. And for cities that have issued shelter in place orders, many grocery stores and pharmacies are open because they are considered essential services. However, delivery is still encouraged to keep as much social distancing as possible. Now, notice, none of these guidelines say anything about buying toilet paper in bulk. In times of panic, it's not uncommon for people to rush to the store and grab things in massive quantities. But that means that for the people who can't afford to buy in bulk, they may be left with nothing when they really need it. Again, it's important to have the essentials and to make sure you're ready for a possible 14 day quarantine. Go to the CDC's website on coronavirus, cdc.gov slash coronavirus to learn more. The virus has changed our world. Empty streets, stalled economies, death and suffering. But it has also improved the air. When Chinese cities began sheltering in place, they saw air pollution fall by 30%. And here in the U.S., with traffic down in major cities by 40% or more, we are breathing 30% better atmosphere than we were when this began. It's interesting to watch the entire global society respond to an emergency like this. And I, I don't want to conflate coronavirus with climate change, but it does show that we are able to mobilize to protect ourselves from a threat. It's not just fewer people down here, it's fewer people in the sky. During March of 2019, over 2 million daily passengers went through a TSA checkpoint. In March of 2020, the TSA cleared not even 300,000 people a day. That's 88% fewer passengers, driving a 57% drop in commercial air traffic. What has this experience taught us? Well, it's clear we have a hard time preparing for future crises, even when we know what's coming. Despite warnings that we were vulnerable to a pandemic, we did nothing to prepare. And in fact, we did things to, to weaken our ability to prepare. And the same thing, unfortunately, is true about climate change. We've been warning about climate change for decades, and our political leaders have ignored those warnings. And unfortunately, what could be months of reduced pollution will not save the climate if we go back to business as usual when it's over. How would you like to see us learn some lessons from this? We need to get rid of fossil fuels burning for our energy system and replace it with non carbon emissions, and that would reduce greenhouse gas emissions, not temporarily and not because we're shutting down the economy, but permanently with a healthy economy. Economic growth and environmental protection are often cast as opposites, as if what's good for one harms the other. It certainly feels that way right now, but maybe there is a third option. The, the answer is not to shut down the economy to fix the environment. The answer is to fix the economy to fix the environment. Perhaps seeing how fragile our position is right now will help us all get ready for other global dangers in the future. 
You've pioneered a way in which to potentially reuse equipment. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Dr. John Lowe, who's in our uh, public health department here at uh, the University of Nebraska, uh, has uh, developed a protocol for using UV light that will kill the virus uh, to uh, sanitize uh, N95 masks. So we're uh, issuing people, say, three masks a day in a white bag that are clean. And at the time they finish th using those masks, they're in a brown bag, and then overnight they will be sanitized. And they'll get back the same masks that they were using. So someone could ultimately reuse the same mask for how long if they keep sanitizing it overnight? That's a very good question. We actually are in the process of studying that now to make sure that the repeated uh, UV sterilization does not break down the mask so it loses any of its protective value. We'll have answers on that this week so we can decide whether it's one, two, three, or more times. And what are you hearing from the nurses and doctors who are using this process and who are on the front lines and using those masks? I think our nurses and doctors really appreciate uh, all of our efforts uh, to make sure they have the right personal protective equipment. Uh, whether they're using a sanitized mask or one that came out of a box, it's really the same. Are you aware of any other hospitals do Doing this type of UV light? Is this something that you've been able to share with others? I think uh, this last weekend, Dr. Lowe shared his protocol with over a thousand uh, other hospitals and clinics. So I'm sure they're operationalizing it right now. There's also, of course, a shortage of other uh, personal protective equipment, whether it's routine masks, gowns, uh, particularly nasal swabs to collect samples is a real challenge. And uh, we're working with a 3D printing company to actually fabricate a, uh, a nasopharyngeal swab that can be used in place of what's currently in tests. Ultimately, what we're talking about during this pandemic is scale, whether it's scale of uh, swabs or scale of ventilators or uh, even just protocols. So when you are looking to tell other hospitals about uh, the types of things that you're doing and what you're seeing success in, um, what types of equipment do they need to acquire in order to be able to uh, pursue the UV light sanitation process? For the UV light sanitation process, there are either small boxes that can be used or there are actually towers that almost look like a small Charlie Brown type Christmas tree that can sanitize an entire room. We took a vacant hospital room, painted it with reflective paint, put some literal clotheslines in there, and the masks are placed in that room and the light is turned on for the appropriate amount of time. So there's a lot of light reflection to cover all the surfaces of the mask. If it's digging in on the issues. Let's talk about money and politics. If it's asking the questions you want to ask. How do you reassure those supporters that you will sustain this? Just watch me. If it's navigating the winding road to the White House. And if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Need your true crime fix on the go? Dateline episodes are available as podcasts. Mysteries with a twist from the true crime original. Wow. Listen to Dateline wherever you get your podcasts. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. This is all I've got left. Who brought more to the caucuses? It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, 3 to 11 p.m. Eastern. Nightly News with Lester Holt, covering coronavirus with facts over fear. How do we know who belongs in isolation? What should we be conscious of? What's being worked on today? At a time of national crisis, turn to the most trusted TV news anchor in America. From the president, a new timeline announcing the federal government's social distancing guidelines will stay in place Thank you. for at least another month. The peak in death rate is likely to hit in two weeks. Therefore, we will be extending our guidelines to April 30th 
to slow the spread. The president Sunday backing off his hope that the country would open up by Easter, now circling a new date on the calendar when he says life will finally get back to normal. We can expect that by June 1st, we will be well on our way to recovery. We think by June 1st, a lot of great things will be happening. Nothing would be worse than declaring victory before the victory is won. It comes as the president is now bracing Americans for a significant death toll. If we could hold that down, as we're saying to 100,000, it's a horrible number. Maybe even less, but to 100,000. So we have between 100 and 200,000. The White House Coronavirus Task Force emphasizing those higher figures. It's anywhere in the model between 80,000 and 160,000, maybe even potentially 200,000 people succumbing to this. I think it's entirely conceivable that if we do not mitigate to the extent that we're trying to do, that you could reach that number. Yeah, 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 it's possible. The president stressing the U.S. is facing an unprecedented crisis. I've been watching that for the last week on television. Body bags all over in hallways. I've been watching them bring in trailer trucks, freezer trucks. They're freezer trucks because they can't handle the bodies. There's so many of them. I've seen things that I've never seen before. I mean, I've seen them, but I've seen them on television in faraway lands. I've never seen them in our country. Those comments follow. The CEO of Northwell Health. To his left, Larry Schwartz, former secretary to the governor, who's been volunteering to help us here. Michael Israel, president and CEO of Westchester Medical Center uh, Network. And Deanne Creswell, commissioner in New York City Emergency Management Department. Uh, let me thank them all very much for being here. We just had a great meeting, uh, which I'll refer to in a moment. Let me also wish everyone happy National Doctors' Day. And this is a day that doctors are truly busy and truly stepping up to their oath and their passion uh, and literally saving lives. So we honor all the doctors in the state of New York today. Let me also thank the people from the Javits Center, Alan Steele, who's the director here. Javits Center has done many magnificent exhibitions and transformations, and they never cease to amaze me, but this is a transformation that I don't think anyone uh, could ever anticipate. 2,500 beds as an emergency hospital. It's a partnership uh, between the state and the federal government, and I want to thank the federal government very much for what they've done. The Army Corps of Engineers did a fantastic job moving in here and uh, getting everything set up as quickly as possible. It will become operational today, receiving the first few patients, and uh, we'll start to run the facility, and then we'll take it from there. Let me go through a couple of facts uh, to give you an update on where we are today and then we'll take your questions. In terms of the numbers of cases, you see the curve continues to go up, 7,195. You see the number of people tested continues to go up. This state is testing more people than any state in the United States, more per capita than China or South Korea. That is a good thing. We want to test, we want to find the positives, and we want to find uh, the positives so we can isolate, stop the transmission. We tested 14,000 people yesterday. The number of cases continues to go up, 6,984. Total number of cases, 66,000 cases. Uh, and those numbers are daunting, to be sure. You see it's continually, continuing to move across the state of New York. There's only one county now that does not have a COVID case. Anyone who says this situation is a New York City only situation is in a state of denial. You see this virus move across the state. You see the virus move across this nation. Uh, there is no American who is immune to this virus. I don't care if you live in Kansas. I don't care if you live in Texas. Uh, there is no American that is immune. What is happening to New York is not an anomaly. There's nothing about it, a New Yorker's immune system that is any different than any other American's immune system. So in many ways, New York is just a canary in the coal mine. What you see us going through here 
you will see happening all across this country. So part of what we're doing here is not only serving New Yorkers, but we believe that we're dealing with this pandemic at a level, intensity, and density that no one has seen before. And hopefully, uh, we'll learn lessons here that we can then share with people across this nation. In terms of the overall numbers, 66,000 have tested positive, 9,500 people are currently hospitalized, 2,000 ICU patients, 4,000 patients are discharged. Uh, that's an increase of 632. Uh, you don't often uh, focus on this line when we have these conversations, but people go into the hospital and people leave the hospital, and that's important to remember. Uh, we've dealt with some really deadly viruses before. We dealt with the Ebola virus. That's not what this is. Uh, most people will get sick. Most people will get sick and stay home and have some symptoms. That's 80%. About 20% will get sick, need hospitalization, they'll feel better, and they'll leave. Uh, it tends to be those people who are acutely ill, have an underlying illness, who have the most, uh, most problems. Most impacted states, New York, you see, is at 66,000. New Jersey is next with 13, California 6,000. So we have 10 times the problem that California is dealing with, 2,739 deaths in the state of New York, total of 148,000 cases, 2,739 deaths. That's a lot of loss, that's a lot of pain, that's a lot of tears, that's a lot of grief that people all across the state are feeling. 1,200 is up from 965 deaths. Yesterday, what you're seeing is people who have been, ventilator, been on ventilators for a long period of time. The longer you're on a ventilator, the less, less ventilator. And as we have now uh, some period of time when people first entered the hospital and were first intubated, we're seeing that death number go up as their length of time on the ventilator increases. To keep it in perspective, the Johns Hopkins numbers are still instructive. We've been studying this since China. Uh, so 732 deaths, 34,000 worldwide. Total hospitalized, we're still looking for a pattern on these cases that are coming in. We're still looking for a pattern in the data. Uh, the number goes up, the number goes down. There's no doubt that the number is still increasing. There's also no doubt that the rate uh, has slowed. We had a doubling of cases every two days then a doubling every three days, then a doubling every four days, then every five. We now have a doubling of, of cases every six days. So while the overall number is going up, the rate of doubling is actually down. The daily intubation rate is uh, way up. Again, sometimes it's just an anomaly. There's no clear pattern, as you can see from uh, those past several nights. Discharge rate, again, that by and large is going up. People come into the hospital, they stay for a period of time, and then they move on. But big picture is the situation is painfully clear now. There's no question what we're dealing with. There's no question as to the consequences. There's no question as to the grief and the loss of life. And there's no question about what we must do. There are only two missions. There are only two operations that we need to perform. First, the public has to be responsible. Stay at home. When I issued the stay at home order, it wasn't, it would be nice if you did. Uh, it is a mandate. Stay at home. If you're a non-essential worker, stay at home. If you leave the house, you're exposing yourself to danger. 
If you leave the house, you're exposing others to danger. You can get infected, go home and infect whoever is at home. So stay at home. I know the isolation can be boring and oppressive. It is better than the alternative. Life is options, right? Stay at home. That is the best option. If you are out, no proximity, six feet distancing. You don't want proximity to other people, and you want to stay away from places that are dense. Still in New York City, you have too many places with too much density. I mean, I don't know how many different ways to make the same point. New York City parks, we made the point there's too much density. You want to go to the park, go to the park, but not in a dense area, not in playgrounds where you're playing basketball with other people. Uh, and I have said that New York City is trying to reduce the density in those playgrounds. Uh, thus far, they have not been successful. If that continues, we'll take a mandatory action to close down playgrounds, uh, as harsh as that sounds, but it can actually save people's lives. So that's mission one. Mission two, and this is going to be more and more clear as we go on, the frontline battle is in the healthcare system. The frontline battle is going to be hospitals across the city, across the state, and across this nation. That is where this battle is fought. It's that simple. You know exactly where it's coming. You know exactly where the enemy is going to attack. They're going to infect a large number of people. That number of people descend on the healthcare system. The healthcare system can't deal with that number of people. You overwhelm the healthcare system. That's what's happening. So, first step was flatten the curve, reduce the density, keep people home. We've done everything that we can possibly do there. Second step is don't let the hospital system get overwhelmed. The soldiers in this fight are our health care professionals. It's the doctors, it's the nurses, it's the people who are working in the hospitals, it's the aides. They are the soldiers who are fighting this battle for us. You know the expression, save our troops, troops, quote unquote, in this battle, the troops are healthcare professionals. Those are the troops who are fighting this battle for us. We need to recruit more healthcare workers. We need to share healthcare professionals within this state and within this country. As governor of New York, I am asking healthcare professionals across the country, if you don't have a healthcare crisis in your community, please come help us in New York now. We need relief. We need relief for nurses who are working 12-hour uh, shifts, one after the other after the other. We need relief for doctors. We need relief for attendants. So if you're not busy, come help us, please. And we will return the favor. We will return the favor. New York, yes, we have it now intensely. There will be a curve. New York at one point will be on the other side of the curve. And then there will be an intense issue somewhere else in the nation. And the New York way is to be helpful. So. Help New York, we're the ones who are hit now. That's today, but tomorrow it's going to be somewhere else. Whether it's Detroit, whether it's New Orleans, it will work its way across the country. And this is the time for us to help one another. We need supplies desperately, and we're working on that. We just had a very good meeting where we discussed supplies. I want to thank Michael Evans from Alibaba, who's here with us today. I want to thank Elizabeth Jennings from the Asia Society, who's here with us today, uh, who are helping us source supplies. Because we're in a situation where you have 50 states 
all competing for supplies. The federal government is now also competing for supplies. Private hospitals are also competing for supplies. So we have created a situation where you literally have hundreds of entities looking to buy the same exact materials, basically from the same place, which is China, ironically enough. And we're fighting amongst ourselves. We're competing amongst ourselves. We're driving the prices up. When we started buying ventilators, they were under $20,000. The ventilators are now over $50,000 if you can find them. The ventilators didn't change that much in two weeks. The prices went up because literally we are driving the prices up. But we need to give our front line, our healthcare prof professionals, the supplies they need, and we need to do it now. Our rule here in New York has been planned forward to get ahead of the problem. The old expression is don't fight the last battle. This virus has been ahead of us from day one. We have been playing catch up from day one. You never win playing catch up. Get ahead of the problem. Don't fight today's fight. Plan for two weeks, three weeks, four weeks from now when you're going to have the apex and make sure that we're in a position to win the battle when the battle is truly drawn, which is going to be at the apex. That's where, why we are preparing stockpiles now. We're building a stockpile. The word stockpile, by definition, means not for immediate use. It means you're preparing for a battle to come. And you have to have the equipment, and you have to have it now. I've done disaster work all across the nation. I can tell you this. If you wait to prepare for the storm to hit, it is too late, my friends. You have to prepare before the storm hits. And in this case, the storm is when you hit that high point, when you hit that apex. How do you know when you're going to get there? You don't. There is no crystal ball. But there is science. And there is data, and there are health professionals who have studied this virus and its progress since China. We now have months of data. Listen to the scientists, listen to the mental health, the health care professionals, and follow the data, and that's what we're doing here in New York. We just had a great meeting where we brought the healthcare system from across the state of New York together to come up with one coordinated plan. Not private hospitals and public hospitals, not New York City hospitals and Long Island hospitals and Westchester hospitals and upstate hospitals, not big hospitals and small hospitals. The entire healthcare system convened, coordinated, working as one, for the first time in decades. No one can ever remember the way we have deployed and coordinated like this. Why? Because this is a statewide battle, and we want to make sure that we are all coordinated and we are all working together. And that's exactly what we've accomplished at this meeting. No politics. No partisanship, no division. There is no time for that, not in this state, not in this nation. This is a deadly, serious situation. And frankly, it's more important than politics. And it's more important than partisanship. And if there is division at this time, the virus will defeat us. If there was ever a moment for unity, this, my friends, is the moment. In this situation, there are no red states, and there are no blue states, and there are no red casualties, and there are no blue casualties. It's red, white, and blue. This virus doesn't discriminate. It attacks everyone, and it attacks everywhere. 
The President said this is a war. I agree with that. This is a war. Then let's act that way. And let's act that way now. And let's show a commonality and a mutuality and a unity that this country hasn't seen in decades. Because the Lord knows we need it today more than ever before. Questions, comments? Yeah, the question is that the President suggested that uh, PPE equipment may be going out the back door. Uh, first, uh, there is a warehouse in Edison, New Jersey. It's the New York City warehouse. Uh, we're creating a stockpile for someone to say, well, the warehouse has equipment in it. You should be using that equipment today. That defies the basic concept of planning and the basic operation that we have to have working, not just in this state, but across the country. Uh, if you are not preparing for the apex and for the high point, uh, you are missing the entire point of the operation. Uh, it is a fundamental blunder to only prepare for today. That's why, in some ways, we are where we are. We've been behind this virus from day one. You have the scientists and the data projections showing you a curve. The curve goes like this. You're over here. Prepare for the high point of the curve and do it now. When are you going to do it? The night before? What am I going to tell the hospitals when they call up and they say, we just had an influx of 50% more people, and we need more equipment, and we need more ventilators. Sorry? So the whole stockpile concept is to prepare for the future. In terms of a suggestion that uh, the PPE equipment is not going to a correct place, uh, I don't know what that means. I don't know what he's trying to say. Uh, if he wants to make an accusation, then let him make an accusation. Uh, but I don't know what he's trying to say by inference. The, we just had a conversation about exactly that. In New York City, there are basically two systems. There's what's called the Greater New York Hospital Association. Ken Rasky represents it. It's basically the private voluntary hospitals, Mount Sinai, uh, Columbia, et cetera. Uh, then there's the Health and Hospitals uh, Corporation, which are the public hospitals. You have those two systems. We just discussed that those two systems have to in this situation, undertake a balancing that they probably have never had to do before. In other words, you have 11 public hospitals. One hospital starts to get overrun. There's a high load in one hospital. Before that happens, transfer people to one of the hospitals that has more vacancies and less load. Distribute the load among those public hospitals and do it immediately. Do it on a daily basis. One hospital is starting to uh, overload, distribute, transfer. Same thing with the Greater New York Hospital Association. And then we said take it a step further. Once one system is near capacity, then the two systems will work together to share the load. Uh, and we just discussed that, and we all agreed to do it. There are, no legal, there are no legal barriers. If a hospital, let's stay with the public system, uh, because the public system, I think, is going to face the greatest stress. If a public hospital starts to get overloaded, transfer to another hospital with less of a load. 
I don't believe there are any restrictions. Ken Rasky, who is the expert on this, I would ask him to well, thank you, Governor, chime in. Uh, to, to that uh, fine question, we're going to uh, work as one cohesive family system uh, throughout New York, and the New York is, be is beyond the city itself, it's including the downstate area, both the island as well as Westchester. And, and I think what we're going to see is that balancing that the governor is, is uh, talking about, balance within the system, balance when, without the system, beyond it, as we go forward with the, as we encounter more and more stress. With each day that goes on, the stress points will increase. And, and as a result, that balancing is absolutely essential. And uh, because, of, uh, because of the leadership of the governor, it is clear to everybody that we are going to be one cohesive family in tackling this. Yeah. Yeah. Let me. Let me. We just spent a couple of hours doing it, and it's complicated. But the, let me give you the top line, if I might. The right now, basically, the hospital systems operate as basically separate systems. You have the public hospitals. You have the Greater New York hospitals. You have Westchester hospitals. You have Long Island hospitals, and then you have upstate hospitals. And they have their own trade associations, and public are public, and then the privates are the privates. We said we have to work as one system. So share staff, share resources. If one hospital is, uh, doesn't have enough masks, rather than that hospital have to scramble, let the other hospitals help. More mutual, Ken's word is a good one, a healthcare family as opposed to these distinct uh, operations. And we worked that through. Uh, to add on top of the state system, you then have now Javits, this facility, 2,500 beds, and the Comfort, the uh, ship that the president sent, 1,000 beds. These 2,500 beds at Javits and the 1,000 beds at, COVID, at uh, Comfort are non-COVID beds. Uh, the federal government, I asked them to uh, make the facilities COVID facilities they want to handle non-COVID people at Javits and Comfort, which means their function will be basically an overflow valve for existing hospitals. They can't take COVID patients, but they can take non-COVID patients. So when we talk about a hospital getting near capacity, they could then download, if you will, to uh, Javits and the Comfort. Uh, how many years have you known me? The question is, am I a, uh, unwilling to tangle with the president? How many years would you say you know me? All right, 20 years. Have you ever known a time in the 20 years that I am unwilling to tangle? I'm a tangler. Uh, look, uh, I understand what the president said about the, well, first, I think it was, uh, I thank the president because I take his comment as a compliment uh, the president com commented on a poll that said uh, people were pleased with uh, my leadership. Uh, and uh, I thank him for that. That was a compliment. As far as the president's comment about uh, having a political contest with me, I am not engaging the president in politics. Uh, my only goal is to engage the president in partnership. This is no time for politics. Uh, and, you know, lead by example. I'm not going to get into a political uh, dispute with the president. I'm not going to f rise to the bait of a political challenge. I'm not running for president. I was never running for president. I said from day one I wasn't running for president. I'm not running for president now. I'm not playing politics. I just want partnership 
to deal with this. Uh, and I said to the President quite clearly, look, when you do good things for my state and you're a good partner, I will be the first one to say you're a good partner. And I have. I went to the uh, uh, ship Comfort today. I said, thank you, Mr. President. We opened up this Javits Center. I said, thank you to the Army. Uh, they did a great job here, the Army Corps of Engineers. You do, when you help my state, I'll say thank you. If I believe that New York is not being served, the federal legislation that they passed, I will say that too, you know? Sometimes it's simple. Just tell the truth, right? Uh, and that's where we are, tell the truth. If you're doing the right thing by New York, I'll say it. If he's doing the wrong thing by New York or the rest of the country, I'll say it. But I'm not going to engage in politics. Not because I'm unwilling to tangle, but because I think it's inappropriate, and I think it's counterproductive, and I think it's anti-American. Forget the politics. Forget the politics. We have a national crisis. We are at war. There is no politics. There is no red and blue. It's red, white, and blue. So let's get over it and, again, lead by example. Well, we've, we have said that no one can get evicted for non-payment of rent. And that, to me, is the fundamental answer, right? That solves all of the above. Uh, you can't pay the rent. A lot of people can't pay the rent. They're not working. There's no income. I can't pay the rent. Landlord technically, legally had a right to say, okay, you're evicted. Uh, we said, I said, by executive order, there can be no evictions, period. If you pay the security deposit, you don't pay the security deposit, you pay part of the rent, none of the rent, you can't be evicted uh, for three months, period. Yeah, if they want to pay, they can pay, yeah. Again, I think our policy answers it. You cannot be evicted for non-payment of rent. It's not that you don't, it's not that you won't owe rent at one time, right? Because you signed the contract uh, and uh, even the people to whom you pay the rent have to pay the rent, right? And they have expenses. Uh, so no evictions for non-payment of rent. And then we'll see where we are and we'll see how long this goes on. Yes, sir. Yeah, well, we spoke about that today. Uh, Elmhurst Hospital is a New York City public hospital. We talked about the uh, Health and Hospital Corporation. It's one of the New York City public hospitals. Uh, it is uh, struggling. That's clear to everyone. And we spoke about it uh, directly in this meeting. And I've asked other hospitals to pitch in and help Elmhurst, and they've agreed. Uh, and to also anticipate other public hospitals that may uh, struggle as the numbers continue to increase and be ready to help them also. You know, we, uh, 100 to 200,000, White House estimates 100 to 200,000 as a uh, death toll. Um, we don't have projections in this state as to numbers of deaths. We're studying models, uh, which by the way, are done by very professional companies. I don't come up with these models. We have Cornell Weil working on McKinsey working on it, the Bill Gates Foundation. Uh, has an institute that does projections. We're studying the projections to see how we best deploy to make sure we're ready for the next battle, uh, make sure we're ready for the apex. Uh, is it 100,000, is it 200,000? Look, does it, 
the, whatever the number is, it's going to be staggering. The number is already staggering. Uh, our human life is a human life. We've lost over 1,000 New Yorkers. To me, we're beyond staggering already. We've reached staggering. Uh, and the only, only point now is do everything you can to save every life possible. That's what this is all about. Yeah, right now, a, a hospital, this is my opinion, a hospital is basically an isolated entity, right? Uh, one hospital has its own employees, has its own logo, has its own finances, does its own purchasing, has its staff. You then have associations of hospitals. Uh, and then you have the public, New York City public hospitals, which are one system, but still individual hospitals. That doesn't work in this environment. It just doesn't work. No one hospital has the resources to handle this. No one hospital can do its own procurement. No one hospital has enough staff. No one hospital can deal with the capacity. There has to be a totally different operating paradigm where all those different hospitals operate on, as one system. So when I run out of masks, I can call Brother Ken at the other hospital and say, I'm out of masks, can you send me some masks? When I refill, I'll send them back. Uh, we have to get to a point where I can say, I have too many people walking in the door. I can't handle it. And we are going to set a load threshold so that when you get near that load threshold, you can send people to other hospitals that have a lower uh, vacancy rate. Purchase together, use staff together, uh, download patients together, balance the load, and do it all across the state. Look, we have hospitals upstate New York that are experiencing none of this, where they have staff capacity, they have bed capacity. We need you now here in this fight and engaged. And that's a totally different concept. But that's what we did today. Ken, you want to comment? Well, yeah, yes, thank you, Governor. Uh, to the question, what, uh, what we're going to do is work very cohesively with the uh, state government, uh, the Department of Health uh, particularly, in putting together a, uh, a, a command center that will uh, receive all this information on an instantaneous basis and then begin uh, feeding out that information and instructions as to what to do. For example, just simply in discharging patients to this facility, this huge facility that, uh, that has been built by our colleagues here, th th this, is, this will create a way of decanting the pressure on our institutions. And, and that uh, information will go to a central place and transfers will be made, and that is part of this cohesiveness that we're talking about. The same uh, thing applies to supplies, ventilators, and all the other uh, stuff that goes into making a hospital work. This is going to be done, and we're, to, we're now in the process of pulling it off uh, in a complete basis. Tomorrow. Yeah, it's, it's, it's in the works right yeah. now, Gov. Uh, absolutely. It will do central purchasing, central right. stockpile, uh, rather than everyone have their own stockpile, and then distribute by need. We'll take one more, all the way in the back. The doctors are exactly right. Uh, the message is God bless you and thank you. We all applaud you. We are in awe of you. We're all inspired by you. We all wonder secretly, would we have the courage 
to really step up at a time of challenge. Uh, and they are doing it, and they are doing it every day. And we are all in their debt. And we respect them, and we love them for what they're doing. And they should have Amen. every piece of equipment that they need to do their job that is the least that we can do. And we are all doing everything we can to make that a reality. Thank you, guys. Let's go to work. This morning, as an emergency field hospital is being built in iconic Central Park, New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut are now under a 14-day travel advisory. The CDC is urging people in the nation's worst coronavirus hotspot to halt non-essential domestic travel, as cases top 70,000 in the three states, with over 1,000 deaths. Not a lockdown, something much more consistent with what we've been actually saying and doing in the city and state already, which is telling people to stay home unless they have an essential reason to go somewhere. Today, the USNS Comfort is due to dock in New York Harbor. It will serve as a floating thousand bed hospital for non-coronavirus patients, freeing up beds on land. We still have to take care of pregnant women who have to deliver. We have to take care of patients who need emergency uh, surgery. We have to take care of kids. <laughs> In the Bronx, ERs are packed. We are seeing a lot of younger patients that are coming through the door that are sicker as well. And that, that is surprising and a little scary. Concerns are also growing about the lack of personal protective equipment, or PPE, for healthcare workers. It's incredibly frustrating for us. Our, our coworkers are getting sick. President Trump once again casting doubt on the amount of protective gear New York authorities are requesting. We're delivering millions and millions of different products, and all we do is hear that, can you get some more? Also in need, police officers. More than 5,000 members of the NYPD have called out sick. An estimated 900 are believed to have COVID-19. We are hurting, we are crying, and we continue to fight. The department is also reporting the death of its first uniformed officer, 23-year veteran detective Cedric Dixon. Two other civilian employees have also died. May we never forget the sacrifice of those workers who put themselves in harm's way to keep you and your family safe. New York City's mayor says there will now be fines for not social distancing in public here in the city, ranging from $250 to $500. As for this field hospital, it is set to open tomorrow. America's Motor City now on the front lines in the fight against coronavirus. The U.S. Surgeon General now declaring Detroit a coronavirus hotspot. More than 5,000 cases have been reported in Michigan, and those numbers are expected to grow. Our emergency rooms have been packed. We are literally running out of inpatient capacity. Bob Riney oversees operations for the Henry Ford Health System in Detroit. In a leaked draft memo obtained by NBC News, the hospital outlines protocol in a worst case scenario, saying they would give priority treatment to those who would likely survive. The hospital acknowledged the letter, tweeting, we crafted a policy to provide guidance for making difficult patient care decisions. We hope never to have to apply them. Riney says hospitals are fighting a battle with no end in sight. Professionally, have you ever seen anything like this? You know, I've been in healthcare for 40 years and uh, been through a lot of different challenges that the industry has faced, but this one is different. This weekend, President Trump approved a disaster declaration for Michigan, unlocking federal assistance to help recovery efforts there. But not before criticizing the state's governor, Gretchen Whitmer, and her response to the outbreak, tweeting, failing Michigan governor must work harder. It's got to be all hands on deck. Uh, we are not one another's enemies. The enemy is the virus, and it is spreading, and it is taking American lives. Detroit's famous auto show has been canceled this year. Now, FEMA reportedly plans to turn the downtown convention space, where it would have taken place, into a makeshift field hospital for coronavirus patients. 
while this Ford plant is now rushing to manufacture masks and other personal protective equipment. Attention please, there is no congregating allowed. Cases are also skyrocketing in other major cities like Chicago, where an infant believed to be the nation's youngest victim died after testing positive for the virus. And down south, another American hotspot, New Orleans. We are being as creative as we can be, uh, but uh, unleashing more equipment is something that we desperately need as well. There are more than 3,000 cases in Louisiana, but in one town Sunday, hundreds ignored the state's ban on large gatherings to attend church services. American cities stretch to their limit as the virus continues to surge. Interestingly, Michigan has put its manufacturing might into the battle against coronavirus, turning traditional auto manufacturing plants into manufacturing locations for traditional medical supply devices. Now, the governor did confirm that she received over 100,000 uh, N95 masks over the weekend. The U.S. Surgeon General declaring Detroit a hotspot and saying cases could get worse over the next week. And joining us now, the White House's Coronavirus Task Force Coordinator, Dr. Deborah Burks. Dr. Burks, good morning to you. It's good to have you with good us. Good morning. Good morning. So we've, we've heard this news now from the White House recommending that social distancing, what people should be doing, staying home, is expanded now for another month. The initial 15 days would have expired today, I believe. So what led to this change? What's the situation on the ground that requires this? You know, we get data every day um, from around the globe, but more importantly from the United States. I think everyone understands now that you can go from five to 50 to 500 to 5,000 cases very quickly. We see this in many metropolitan areas. We're very worried about every city in the United States and the potential for this virus to get out of control. And we really believe that Americans with the right information will stay home. And the president had said a couple of weeks ago he was hopeful, aspirational, that we could be back in business and packing masses on Easter Sunday. Obviously, this has changed. Now he's talking about potentially June 1st being a time that uh, America could return somewhat to normal. Where are you on that timeline? You know, I think we watch everything very carefully. Um, we, w we look at models, but we validate those models with the data that's coming in. And United States will look different than Europe, and Europe look different than Asia. And I think that we all have to be aware of that. It's not perfect science right now, because we're projecting based on what we have today. And we know that the double ring rate of this virus is very high. And so that's why these 30 days allows us to really do both diagnostics, finding out who is positive because they're sick, and allows us to also get surveillance fully in place to really answer your question. Yeah, it, you know, you're, you are in the middle of getting data, but you've seen quite a bit of data. I mean, to put it simply, is it worse than you would have expected it to be? Is, or is it better? Is the social distancing having an effect? I think in some of the metro areas, we were late in getting people to follow the 15-day guidelines. And so we know that from the time you start doing everything that you need, staying home, social distancing, not going out to any restaurant, bars, or even being careful in the grocery stores, absolutely religious hand washing, all of this, um, we see some metro areas came late to that. I think it will be when this is over, we'll have a lot of time to really compare data about what really worked with this epidemic so that if it comes back in the fall, we'll be better prepared both with treatments, but also in really understanding how it spreads. Dr. Fauci said yesterday we could see millions of cases in this country and as many as one to 200,000 deaths. Do you agree with that analysis? Is that a worst case scenario or something that uh, we should prepare ourselves as potentially likely? So in the flu models, the worst case scenario is between 1.6 million and 2.2 million deaths. That's the projection if you do nothing. So we've never really done all of these things that we're doing. We put them into a model. We've looked at the Italy data with their self-isolation. And that's where we come up with, if we do things together well, almost perfectly, 
we could get in the range of 100,000 to 200,000 fatalities. We don't even want to see wow, that. that, uh, that I know, but you know, you kind of take my breath away with that because I, what I hear you saying is that's sort of the best case scenario. If everything works and people do the things you're asking them to do, maybe you can hold the deaths to one to 200,000 in this country. Well, the best case scenario would be 100% of Americans doing precisely what is required. But we're not sure, based on the data that you're sharing from around the world and seeing these pictures, that all of America is responding in a uniform way to protect one another. So we also have to factor that in. Cities that don't social distances, that don't stay at home, that believe you can have social interactions, that believe you can have gatherings of homes of 20 and, and 10 people even, that is going to spread the virus even if everyone looks well. Yeah, I was, I was going to say, I believe on Meet the Press yesterday, you said that um, no state, no metro area will be spared. And I can imagine, you know, I grew up in Arizona. I, I remember watching things and thinking, oh, that's a big city problem. That's not going to happen here. What's your message to not just the, the metro areas, but to rural areas as well? So this virus, we think, can spread with a lot of asymptomatic and mild cases. And it's not until it gets into the vulnerable groups that you start to see the hospitalizations. So if you wait for that, if the metros and the rural areas don't take care now, by the time you see it, it has penetrated your community pretty significantly. And that's what we're concerned about. And that's why you have to prepare even though you think it's not there. Dr. Burks, I know it's a busy day. Uh, nothing but busy days for you lately. Thank you very much for your time, ma'am. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Savannah. After weeks in limbo at sea, overnight, two Holland American cruise ships given the green light to cross the Panama Canal. The government there granting priority canal privileges to the MS Zandam and the MS Rotterdam, citing humanitarian and safety reasons. On board the Zandam, the bodies of four passengers who it's feared may have died from coronavirus. The cruise line says more than 100 others have fallen ill. Virus. Cliff and Doris Kober, both healthy and in a cabin, they now call their jails, and at least two on board have tested positive for the ship with coronavirus. I assume you've been hiding in your room, but what has that anxiety been like? I mean, you're you're so close to it all. But I visualize a big bad boogeyman germ waiting outside the door. There is also passenger confusion. On Sunday, the Colbers say because they have no symptoms, they were told they were selected to move from the Zandam, the ship with suspected coronavirus, to the Rotterdam. Orlando Ashford, Holland America president, in a video statement. So first and foremost, I want to dispel the myth that there is an intention to create a healthy ship and a sick ship that will be managed separately. Instead, Holland America says the passengers who had interior rooms were moved to the other ship to give them a window and ventilation. The biggest problem now, where will both ships dock? They're scheduled to come to Port Everglades in Fort Lauderdale, but now there is growing pressure to turn them away, unless there is a way to isolate everyone with or without symptoms. Fort Lauderdale's mayor. These two ships cannot dock in Fort Lauderdale if there are sick passengers on board without any medical treatment there to meet them. But this morning, that emergency medical plan does not exist. The Colbers ask, what's the difference between them coming by boat and all the New Yorkers who traveled to Florida from the epicenter on planes and in cars? These ships are blocked. People coming into the airport can turn around, go back home or get a car and go somewhere else. We can't. We're in the middle of the ocean. We're stuck. So why are they picking on us? The passengers who got on these cruise ships got on March 7th. It was 24 hours later that the State Department issued its warning, as you noted at the top, Hoda. One of the questions that Colbers and other passengers have on these ships, of course, is if I'm not sick, will I get sick? And if I can't come into port here, is it possible that we could die at sea? 
very, very difficult situation, Hoda. Oh, that is totally terrifying. So the question is, Gary, if they do get turned away from Fort Lauderdale, like how does this whole thing get resolved and how long will it take? Well, there's going to be a commission meeting, and the Broward County commissioners are going to have a meeting tomorrow to decide. They have a very short window because the ships are already in the Caribbean Sea to decide, will they let them in? One idea being floated is that everybody on board, whether they're showing symptoms or not, would be taken down to Homestead Air Reserve Base and treated and uh, quarantined there for at least 14 days. But that is a plan that does not currently exist, and the mayor of Fort Lauderdale says he believes it's going to take President Trump's intervention to make something like that happened. This morning, a food and supply lifeline is about to be shut off. Instacart employs 200,000 independent contractors, and some are threatening to sit on the delivery sidelines unless they get additional hazard pay of at least $5 per trip and basic protective gear like hand sanitizer and masks. A lot of us are really literally making the decision between, you know, our health and our financial security right now. One man who just quit his Instacart job writing on Twitter, hashtag Instacart strike on Monday. Instacart's attempting to strike break by offering bonuses of $25. No. Just last week, the company announcing plans to beef up its workforce with 300,000 more people. Instacart declined to comment on specifics, but in a statement said they're immensely grateful for the work of their employees, offering bonuses ranging from $25 to $200, more than a month of sick leave, and soon, hand sanitizer manufactured just for their shoppers. Honestly, daily, I sort of go through this argument in my head of, am I a potential vector or am I actually helping? Shane Schlager delivers for DoorDash, a competitor service. He says he gets hand sanitizer for work, but not much else. Do you think you should be getting other PPE, masks and gloves? Should that be a given in this field? I think it should be. I've been personally using my own gloves. Um, I couldn't find any masks or I probably would uh, use those. DoorDash says they're providing financial assistance to eligible dashers diagnosed with COVID-19 or quarantined and changing the default delivery method to a no contact option, minimizing face time between dashers and customers. Schlager still delivering for now, but hundreds of miles away in Staten Island, a hundred workers at an Amazon warehouse are walking off the job today. We're very low on masks. We don't have the proper gloves. All we want is the building to be closed and professionally sanitized. I'm afraid to go to work. Amazon responding by saying these accusations are simply unfounded. We've taken extreme measures to keep people safe, tripling down on deep cleaning, procuring safety supplies that are available, and changing processes to ensure those in our buildings are keeping safe distances. This trend of striking for safety coming at a critical time for homebound Americans. A new study finding 40 million households have used online grocery delivery in just the last month, doubling the figure from just six months earlier. A surge in need as those on the delivery front lines are looking for a little peace of mind in these uncertain times. And a lot of companies, including Instacart and Amazon, are offering sick paid leave, but only if the employees test positive for COVID-19 or are quarantined. And of course, if you think you might be sick or have the coronavirus, the last thing public officials want you to do is to be out in public, much less delivering groceries or food. These days, connection and community come in unexpected forms from virtual happy hours. Why is it quarantining? Because it's it's water to brunches and dinner parties now happening remotely. Thank God for all of our devices and our FaceTimes and our duos and our Zooms and everything we're using because it, it does not feel so awful. It, it, you still feel connected. NASA astronaut Nick Hag says some of the tools he used in space can help those of us trapped in our personal capsules here on Earth. When I was on orbit, I'd do crossword puzzles uh, with my boys over a video chat. And just being able to connect that way uh, was such a huge emotional boost. Zoom meetings have exploded in popularity over the past few weeks. It's now the number one free app for iPhone and Android. But not everyone has access to the Internet or feels comfortable using it. Hi, Grandma. Hello. The phone call is back. Verizon says its phone traffic has gone way up. Each weekday, nearly 800 million calls are being made, twice the volume of Mother's Day. And people are staying on longer, too, 33%. Right now, one of the most kind things we could do 
is pick up the phone, take a picture of your smiling face, send it to that person who we know is alone or scared right now. For some special occasions, there are drive-by birthday wishes. For others, sign language. Grandma, look at the sign. It's a boy. I just had a friend. <laughs> And for something that lasts even longer, old-fashioned letters are making a bit of a comeback, says Arkansas high school student Michelle Wells. Not a lot of people my age really do it, but I really enjoy it. If there's no time for that, a short text can say so much. Experts say even the little pings matter. Just checking in regularly with someone can make a big difference. For today, Joe Fryer, NBC News, Los Angeles. We're here for them. We are the community. It's definitely good to hear. You always want to hear that the wages are going up. We work hard. We bleed. We sweat. We cry when it comes to these cars. Without this pill, we die. He's doing the best he can for the country, and they're getting in the way. We're going to build the wall. We have no choice. This is an emergency. There are zero hours left to take action. Because we're incarcerated it doesn't mean that we should lose our right to vote. This is the perfect time to graduate. There's like a lot of shooting happening. These are thoughtful voters who, more than anything, want these candidates to cut to the chase. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt, covering coronavirus with facts over fear. How do we know who belongs in isolation? What should we be conscious of? What's being worked on today? At a time of national crisis, turn to the most trusted TV news anchor in America. Need your true crime fix on the go? Dateline episodes are available as podcasts. Mysteries with a twist from the true crime original. Wow. Listen to Dateline wherever you get your podcasts. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. This is all I've got left. Who brought more to the caucuses? It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, 3 to 11 p.m. Eastern. Manchester, from Washington. Why should your judgment be valued? I'd stake my judgment against anyone out there. Is party unity your concern right now, or is simply winning as many states as you well, can? Well, it's both. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. If it's digging in on the issues. Let's talk about money and politics. If it's asking the questions you want to ask. How do you reassure those supporters that you will sustain this? Just watch me. If it's navigating the winding road to the White House. And if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. The coronavirus outbreak. What's next? NBC News has in-depth coverage, answers to your questions, insight from medical experts, and up-to-the-minute live blog updates. For continuing coverage, turn to the networks and platforms of NBC News. Amid the coronavirus crisis, a plane operating as an air ambulance to help fight the outbreak, bursting into flames during takeoff in the Philippines, killing a U.S. and Canadian national as well as doctors and nurses. In Italy, priests bless coffins in rows, the death toll now nearly 11,000. The terrible new challenge, how to deal with so many dead. Italy has banned public funerals, instead they are attended by a handful of family, grieving alone, not allowed to see the body of their loved one. Coronavirus remorseless, removing sacred traditions, dividing families in life and death. In Spain, the hospital is now inundated with patients. The Spanish death toll, more than 6,800. A court of justice turned into a morgue to house the many taken by this most unjust of killers. France's frightening numbers, now more than 40,000 infected. So many, they're sending patients to Germany. So far, France has seen more than 2,600 die. 
But the numbers in Europe could be overshadowed by countries like India, where recorded infections are only beginning their ascent. India locking down, leading to crowds trying to get home. The reality of social distancing in a country of 1.3 billion. The British beginning a program of screening health workers for the virus. One drive through testing centre in a shuttered amusement park. A reminder of happier times. I want to update you on the latest steps the government is taking. The Prime Minister, himself infected with coronavirus, rallying his country on a cell phone from self-isolation. We are going to do it. We are going to, to do it together. The UK, like the US, facing a long fight. One British government health official says life will return to some kind of normality, but that could take three to six months. Another lesson from over here, Savannah. Some people struggling in Italy to keep to the lockdown. This is a, a marathon, not a sprint. But there they have found 50 people, get this, who are tested positive for coronavirus out and about. Those folks will now likely face jail, Savannah. After weeks in limbo at sea, overnight, two Holland American cruise ships given the green light to cross the Panama Canal. The government there granting priority canal privileges to the MS Zandam and the MS Rotterdam, citing humanitarian and safety reasons. On board the Zandam, the bodies of four passengers who it's feared may have died from coronavirus. The cruise line says more than 100 others have fallen ill with flu-like symptoms, and at least two on board have tested positive for the virus. Cliff and Doris Kober, both healthy and in a cabin, they now call their jail cell. You've been on a ship with coronavirus. I assume you've been hiding in your room, but what has that anxiety been like? I mean, you're you're so close to it all. And I visualize a big bad boogeyman germ waiting outside the door. There is also passenger confusion. On Sunday, the Colbers say because they have no symptoms, they were told they were selected to move from the Zandam, the ship with suspected coronavirus, to the Rotterdam. Orlando Ashford, Holland America president, in a video statement. So first and foremost, I want to dispel the myth that there is an intention to create a healthy ship and a sick ship that will be managed separately. Instead, Holland America says the passengers who had interior rooms were moved to the other ship to give them a window and ventilation. The biggest problem now, where will both ships dock? They're scheduled to come to Port Everglades in Fort Lauderdale, but now there is growing pressure to turn them away, unless there is a way to isolate everyone with or without symptoms. Fort Lauderdale's mayor. These two ships cannot dock in Fort Lauderdale if there are sick passengers on board without any medical treatment there to meet them. But this morning, that emergency medical plan does not exist. The Colbers ask, what's the difference between them coming by boat and all the New Yorkers who traveled to Florida from the epicenter on planes and in cars? These ships are blocked. People coming into the airport can turn around, go back home or get a car and go somewhere else. We can't. We're in the middle of the ocean. We're stuck. So why are they picking on us? The passengers who got on these cruise ships got on March 7th. It was 24 hours later that the State Department issued its warning, as you noted at the top, Hoda. One of the questions that Colbers and other passengers have on these ships, of course, is, if I'm not sick, will I get sick? And if I can't come into port here, is it possible that we could die at sea? Very, very difficult situation, Hoda. Oh, that is totally terrifying. So the question is, Gary, if they do get turned away from Fort Lauderdale, like how does this whole thing get resolved and how long will it take? Well, there's going to be a commission meeting, and the Broward County Commissioners are going to have a meeting tomorrow to decide. They have a very short window because the ships are already in the Caribbean Sea to decide will they let them in. One idea being floated is that everybody on board, whether they're ex showing symptoms or not, would be taken down to Homestead Air Reserve Base mm -hmm. and treated and uh, quarantined there for at least 14 days. But that is a plan that does not currently exist, and the mayor of Fort Lauderdale says he believes it's going to take President Trump's intervention to make something like that happened. Mm -hmm.
Johnson & Johnson is one of several companies that has developed a potential vaccine slated to be tested in clinical trials later this year. Alex Gorski is the chairman and CEO of Johnson & Johnson. Mr. Gorski, good morning. It's good to have you here. Well, Savannah, thank you very much for having us on this morning. Yes, I, we mentioned just one of them. There are actually several companies that are in this kind of arms race to get a vaccine. Moderna is in clinical trials already. Innovio slated to start clinical trials next month. A German company, CureVac, also researching a vaccine. Tell me about Johnson & Johnson's candidate for a vaccine. Why is it so promising? And when might clinical trials start? Sure, Savannah. First of all, just let me say how much we appreciate the important public service that you and your team are providing, keeping your viewers really educated and informed about this disease. And I know myself just watching over the weekend, it can be pretty distressing when you're seeing what's happening with, you know, mothers and fathers and patients and in some hospitals, particularly like in New York City. But what I can also tell you is we're seeing incredible collaboration and, and good news stories as well taking place, whether it's between some of the biopharmaceutical companies collaborating together, as you just mentioned, trying to get these vaccines out, uh, or other places. But look, today at Johnson & Johnson, we're really pleased to be able to announce that we have a vaccine candidate that based upon the testing that we've done, and, and we've been doing a lot in this area, in areas like SARS, Ebola, as were mentioned earlier, that we've got a candidate that has a high degree of probability of being successful against the COVID-19 virus. Now we also, and very important, is we've got the production capabilities to be able to ramp up production of this in a, in a relatively short period of time so that it can become available. That's why we're entering into this agree agreement with the government where you know, we're going to be investing more than a billion dollars, accelerating the clinical development as well as the production. And we want to make sure the patients, certainly here in the United States, but around the world, can get access in a very affordable way. In fact, we're going to make sure that we're offering yeah. this at a not-for-profit basis here uh, in, in the United States and around the globe. Well, that is uh, all really promising news. As you mentioned, you're working with BARDA, the Biomedical Advanced Research and Development Associates at the Department of Health and Human Services. So um, you mentioned a couple things there. I just want to drill down on it. How soon do you think, if the vaccine ultimately proves to be a successful one, how soon could it get to market? Because, you know, most estimates are 12 to 18 months. Is that the timeline for you as well, if this turns out to be uh, a successful vaccine? Well, Savannah, we've got all hands on deck. And in fact, this is like a moonshot for us at Johnson & Johnson. What would usually take five to seven years, we expect to be able to accomplish in five to seven months. So to give you an idea, we, we're working right now on early tests that tend to be very predictive of how these vaccines are eventually going to work in humans. And we want to, first of all, make sure that they're safe, that the platform is safe, that it can be effective. We anticipate starting in humans in September, we could have something called interim results where we, we use you know, statistical methodology to look and, and see, do we have a high degree of uh, success? We should have that by the end of the year, such that in an emergency yeah. situation, we could have vaccines ready in Q1 and Q2 of 2021. Now, it's also really important in these situations is that we ramp up production. So literally within the next few days and weeks we're going to start ramping up production of these vaccines as well and we should be able to have several hundred million doses available by the middle of next year and our goal is to have a billion prepared by the end of 2021. So it's, again, it, we're, it's so interesting we're, because you're kind of you're starting. Sorry to interrupt, but I just I hope people really focus on this because it's interesting and, and the companies have to who are doing this are taking a risk. You're basically producing the vaccine before you even know that it's effective in the hopes that this will be the one. That's look, that's what we have to do in this case. We're going to do everything mm -hmm. possible to make sure that we have a safe, effective vaccine available in the kind of quantities that can really make a difference. And frankly, just like the heroes in the hospitals are working right now, the leaders in our laboratories are working 24 seven to do everything they can to accelerate this process. Can I ask you one more question before I let you go about Tylenol? Sure. Obviously, it's a fever reducer. It's been harder and harder to find. I mean, I can't find it in my drugstore shelves right now. Uh, what is the company doing to ramp up supply so you can meet that demand? 
Sure. Well, look, it's the world's largest healthcare company. In addition to what we're doing, vaccines, we have taken our Tylenol lines, for example, and we've diverted certain formulations like the rapid release gel to just the caplet formulation that we can produce in much higher quantities and again, 24-7. Uh, we've converted some of our lines to hand sanitizer lines to make sure that you know we can get access to more hand sanitizer. So really, there's not an area of our business that we're not looking to say, where can we make a difference? Because ultimately, all of us are going to need to work together to kill this virus. Yeah, we, we really appreciate your time and uh, this news this morning. I know will give people a lot of uh, hope that perhaps you will be successful. Johnson & Johnson CEO Alex Gorski, sir, thank you very much. We really appreciate it. Well, Savannah, thank you so much. As many as 200,000 Instacart workers could instantly be off the front lines as early as tomorrow. A lot of us are really literally making the decision between, you know, our health and our financial security right now. They're demanding hazard pay and better safety gear or they'll strike, no longer shopping for and delivering your groceries. Instacart telling employees through blog post, we're immensely grateful for all that you do to support families and people in need. They're offering more than a month of pay for anyone diagnosed with COVID-19 and one-time bonuses. The anxiety also being felt at traditional grocers. Is it scary at all to go to work right now? I don't sleep much because I'm scared of what I will bring home to my children. Candace Oglesby lives in North Texas. Her son is immunocompromised. The cashier says she's in contact with people all day long and wants her national grocery employer, who she's not identifying, to acknowledge that and pay. They're putting their life and they're putting their safety and their health on the line. Many of America's largest grocery stores have ramped up pay and protections from temporary salary hikes to bonuses. And across the board, companies are putting up plexiglass at registers, installing social distancing reminders, and cleaning stores round the clock. Grocers in particular are at a higher risk, not as high a risk as, say, a healthcare worker, but they are at a higher risk than the general public. If you're worried about your safety when shopping, anytime you use any surface that people touch a lot, like card handles, for example, make sure you wipe it down with a disinfectant wipe, wear gloves, or you can also use a cloth as a barrier if you need to. Once you get inside the supermarket, stand at least six feet away from everybody else and do not touch your face. And once you get home, you got all these bags, wipe off every surface they touch. And for anything that comes inside of a box, take the contents out and wipe that off too. As shelves remain stocked, the people making sure they stay that way deemed essential employees by only a few states, opening up access to emergency childcare and testing. I would give anything to be able to test myself right now. Sam Brock, NBC News, Miami. We're back now with a deeply personal look at a day in the life of an intensive care nurse. Like so many of our healthcare heroes, she's working around the clock, tending to coronavirus patients and also taking care of her own family during this difficult time. This is her story. Time to start the day again. Good morning. My name is Elise Silpo. I'm a nurse practitioner in the medical ICU at North German Hassett. I'm about to take my temperature because every morning and every night, I'm taking my temperature to make sure I stay healthy to take care of my patients. So I'm by one of the nurses station right now and we have the doctor just watching in the room to make sure everything's going okay with the nursing staff inside. The unit that I work in is a COVID quarantined critical care unit, highest acuity, sickest patients that we have in the health system right now. People are 20, 30, 40, 50, much younger than we expected. This is the tubing from the, the ventilator. The ventilator is the breathing machine that goes to a patient. The tube goes into the patient's mouth, into the patient's lung, and inflates and deflates the lungs to help you breathe. If a patient's heart is not doing well, we put them on a cardiac bypass machine. This only affects the lungs and helps with the breathing. So now we need to bypass the lungs and this machine will purify the lungs and oxygenate the patient and give the patient oxygen while his lungs are healing. I have some tears and crying right now because I'm so tired. But I'm gonna take a deep breath and keep going on. I think I just needed that. 
a little let down. But now I'm gonna continue on and powering through back into the unit to stay strong. Today is day five of a 13 hour shift week. I usually do three days a week. I'm up to five 13 hour shifts this week and I'm tired. So I'm about to change my scrubs to head home to see my babies. Our deepest thanks to Elisa Sopo and everyone working right now. If it's digging in on the issues. Let's talk about money and politics. If it's asking the questions you want to ask. How do you reassure those supporters that you will sustain this? Just watch me. If it's navigating the winding road to the White House. And if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Need your true crime fix on the go? Dateline episodes are available as podcasts. Mysteries with a twist from the true crime original. Wow. Listen to Dateline wherever you get your podcasts. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. This is all I've got left. Who brought more to the caucuses? It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, 3 to 11 p.m. Eastern. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt, covering coronavirus with facts over fear. How do we know who belongs in isolation? What should we be conscious of? What's being worked on today? At a time of national crisis, turn to the most trusted TV news anchor in America. As the coronavirus continues its deadly march across the country, this warning for Americans. Looking at what we're seeing now, you know, I would say between 100 and 200,000 cases, excuse me, deaths. I mean, we're going to have millions of cases, but I, I just don't think that we really need to make a projection when it's such a moving target. What we do know, Jake, is that we got a serious mm -hmm. problem in New York. We have a serious problem in New Orleans, and we're going to be developing serious problems in other areas. This after the CDC issued a late Saturday travel advisory for New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut residents, telling them to refrain from non-essential domestic travel for two weeks. The notice creating confusion after President Trump first weighed the possibility of a short-term quarantine in those states, but later backed away from the idea. Governors were given full discretion over the new rollout and said the advisory is already in practice. It's totally consistent with everything we're doing. That's something that, uh, as I say, it's de facto happening already. We're uh, discouraging people from traveling uh, and making sure they stay as home as much as possible. With at least 59,000 positive cases and approximately 42 percent of coronavirus deaths in the U.S. centered in New York, Today Governor I'm Andrew Cuomo extended the stay-at-home order through April 15th, stretching into major holidays like Easter and Passover. The state is trying to get ahead of the outbreak's peak, mobilizing a temporary hospital at this Manhattan Convention Center and awaiting the arrival of the U.S. Naval ship that will provide extra beds for non-COVID-19 cases. And even more help is on the way. The president announcing that a flight arrived at JFK with millions of critical medical supplies for health care workers stretched thin. And after pressure from New York's governor, the governor of Rhode Island repealed the executive order that had police and National Guard members knocking on doors and checking cars for visiting New Yorkers, telling them they must self-quarantine for 14 days. And Kathy joins us now live from the Javits Center here in Manhattan. Kathy, normally that's a convention center now being made into an emergency field hospital. When will that be ready to operate and what's happening in Central Park? 
Well, Kate, a thousand beds have been added to the convention center behind me turned temporary hospital. It should be ready to go come tomorrow. And you mentioned Central Park. There is another emergency field hospital that's currently in the works. We saw triage tents going up today, and those should be operational on Tuesday. The silent descent of the unmistakable funnel captured on highway cameras. The warning's coming just in time. Valley View Fire Department, tornado warning near your area. Minutes later, a direct hit on Jonesboro, Arkansas. The tornado swelling by the second. One store owner nearly caught in its path, watching the twister chew through buildings just blocks away. All the on the ground. And I mean Jonesboro, I'd say to hell. In the storm's wake, miles of destruction and more than 20 people injured. The city mayor saying their shelter in place for coronavirus may have actually saved lives. I will say that, and I hate to say this, but with the coronavirus, I think there was not as many people in that building, and it could have been much worse. For the Burke family, the storm hits especially hard. Jared is a doctor, now living apart from wife Alyssa and son Zeke. His work with COVID-19 patients, keeping him from moments like this. This photo from just days ago captured the father high-fiving his son through a glass door. The picture taken in a home that no longer stands. On our Facebook page, Alyssa wrote, Our house is gone. Jared was inside, but he survived by the grace of God. Please pray for us as we begin to pick up the pieces. Tonight, the family's fate shared by dozens of others, now fighting to move forward from one crisis to another. Morgan Chesky, NBC News. There is some good news tonight about the good deeds by and for the hardworking people bringing us mail, packages, and newspapers. Is this silk almond milk? Is it silk? It all started when newspaper delivery man Greg Daly was grocery shopping and suddenly thought about an 88-year-old customer. You know, I thought to myself, well, if Mrs. Ross can't get the paper at her sidewalk, which is probably 20 feet. How's she getting groceries? He called her and sure enough, she yeah, needed yeah, items. Five minutes later, I'm standing online to pay for the stuff that, that I have. And she called me back and she goes, Greg, would you mind grabbing something for Mrs. Miller across the street? That's when he started putting this note inside every newspaper he delivers, offering to pick up groceries or basically anything. You know, they're amazing people. and. You know, if you get a chance to help them, you help them. It's very nice to meet you. Sandy Driska and her husband are quarantined at home. Your godson. Oh, gosh, Greg. And you know, he's not even asking for money. He's doing this out of the kindness of his heart. All over the country, families are appreciating delivery people, leaving notes and goodie bags, snacks and cold drinks, even toilet paper. Can we take one of these? Yeah, absolutely. It's for you. Oh, uh, man, you, you're a lifesaver. Thank you. In Phoenix, the Wilson family left hand sanitizer on their mailbox, thanking their mail carrier, Marco. Ann Diles, whose family's been delivering mail in Kentucky since the 1940s, wanted to help her mail carrier stay healthy, too. I think we should all take care of our mail carriers, so I think everybody should at least help them out a little bit. It feels good to help and to receive. Basically, it gives you, it gives you a warm feeling, and it also gives you so much faith in humanity that really throughout this virus, we're all there to help one another and we'll get through it. If it's digging in on the issues. Let's talk about money and politics. If it's asking the questions you want to ask. How do you reassure those supporters that you will sustain this? Just watch me. If it's navigating the winding road to the White House. And if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Need your true crime fix on the go? Dateline episodes are available as podcasts. Mysteries with a twist from the true crime original. Wow. Listen to Dateline wherever you get your podcasts. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. This is all I've got left. Who brought more to the caucuses? It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, 3 to 11 p.m. Eastern.
NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt, covering coronavirus with facts over fear. How do we know who belongs in isolation? What should we be conscious of? What's being worked on today? At a time of national crisis, turn to the most trusted TV news anchor in America.
is that the healthcare system will become overwhelmed. What do we do when half of your doctors are out on quarantine? You have no more beds, all your ventilators are used up, and there are a thousand new diagnoses in a single day. What do you do then? That's what we're bracing for. Over the past week, we've seen hundreds of doctors and nurses take to social media to plead for basic supplies. They've been asking for gloves, masks, and gowns. PPE, personal protective equipment. You might have seen some of those stories shared on social media. We came up with this get me PPE hashtag, um, and I went on Twitter and asked people to share these stories, and people jumped in, and it was um, it was actually even more alarming than I expected. What were some of the most surprising ones? Uh, one of my physician friends posted a bag um, that her hospital was using. They put her name on it because um, you were supposed to put your PPE together um, at the end of your day, put it back in the bag and reuse all of it the next day. People were posting pictures of and handmade. Is that normal? <laughs> is that normal or do you no. take your PPE home? Never. I mean, you never store your PPE for the next day. It goes right into the garbage can. I mean, I've never um, used any of these items for more than a single patient because uh, of the risk of transmission. We generally take them off right after a patient and put them right into the garbage can. Nationally, um, I've heard estimates that uh, that most healthcare systems have no more than a one-month supply, and this is just getting started. We're in a we're in the most vulnerable position, and we're willing to be in that vulnerable position, but. Without the protection, you're going to lose us. Uh, you're going to lose physicians, and you're going to lose nurses. And if you lose them in a small community like we are in, uh, then you don't have a backup for that. Um, and so that puts more burden on the larger institutions. Um, personally, I'm very, I'm very disillusioned. I see on the news every day um, our physicians and our nurses are being referred to as heroes, and I think that's wonderful. We appreciate it. We don't consider ourselves heroes, but we're going to keep coming and showing up every day. But what I'm concerned about is that if we're calling people heroes, but we're not willing to protect them, um, that's really scary. I want the public to know that we're here for you and we absolutely take this 100% seriously. We're gonna come every day to work. We're gonna put our lives on the line. We're gonna do everything we can to save your life. And so we need your help to make that possible. What we need to do now is focus on how do we how do we get these supply chains up and running? And that's not me saying, you know, hey, can you can you make masks or can you sew these masks that may not, you know, adequately protect people, but actually on a federal level, petitioning our representatives, our policymakers, the people that really have the authority to, to get people to manufacture these. And, and I'm an emergency clinician who loves my job. I love to go to work. I also have a seven month old daughter and a two and a half year old kid. I'm breastfeeding my seven month old. If I come home and I'm sick, I can't go back and I can't take care of you. And if I get my children sick, I also can't do the same thing. And so I need people to, to stay home and to really think very carefully before they go out or before they go you know, gallivanting with others because that's how we're gonna be able to shut this down. That's what China showed us. That's what other nations have showed us. Um, and, and so I think that's the biggest thing that people can do making masks is is great you know telling us putting hearts in the windows those things are great but really social distancing is i think what's going to help turn this around from a lay person perspective and that's that's what people can do to help me as, as an emergency physician as a mom you know to take care of this i, I think that's what we need to do just as there's proper etiquette for dinner at a five-star restaurant, there's proper etiquette when you're trying to stop the spread of a disease. So let's go through the do's and don'ts of social distancing. But first, let's define social distancing. Therefore, my administration is recommending that all Americans, including the young and healthy, work to engage in schooling from home when possible. Avoid gathering in groups of more than 10 people. Avoid discretionary travel. And avoid eating and drinking at bars, restaurants, and public food courts. The CDC defines social distancing as staying out of, quote, crowded public places where close contact with others may occur, and maintaining a distance, approximately six feet or two meters, from others when possible. 
Now let's go through some scenarios for healthy individuals. Scenario one, seeing friends and family. Dr. Deborah Burks, who is helping lead the White House coronavirus response, said it pretty bluntly. We're asking our older generation to stay in their homes. And we're asking the younger generations to support them in social contacting through videos and other Skype type functions, or just the simple telephone. We're asking the younger generations to stop going out in public places to bars and restaurants and spreading asymptomatic virus onto countertops and knobs and grocery stores and grocery carts. Do keep in touch with friends and family via video or phone calls, try to work from home, take classes online, don't put people at risk by coming into close contact with them or surfaces they might use. Scenario two, restocking on supplies. It's inevitable. You're going to have to get more supplies. How should you do it? Do shop for supplies at non-peak hours. For example, early mornings. Wipe down handlebars on shopping carts or baskets. Touch as few things as possible. Wash your hands before and after shopping. And try to limit the number of trips to the store. Don't go into crowded areas in the store and don't touch your face. Scenario three, if you really need to get somewhere, while environmentally friendly, public transportation might not be the best way to keep a six foot distance. Do drive a car, ride a bike, or walk whenever possible. Travel during off hours on public transit, and wash your hands. Don't commute in crowded vehicles. Avoid busy public transit hubs. And don't touch your face. Scenario four, going to the doctor. If you have a non-urgent doctor's appointment or medical concern, Dr. Burks' advice is, if I could just say one other thing to the hospitals and dentists out there. Things that don't need to be done over the next two weeks, don't get it done. If you're a person with an electric sur elective surgery, you don't want to go into a hospital right now. There's a lot of distraction. Um, there's a lot of people doing a lot of other things to save people's lives. So let's all be responsible and cancel things that we can cancel to really free up hospital beds and space. Do go to the doctor if you might need urgent medical attention. Don't go if it's not critical. Social distancing is about keeping the community safe by limiting close contact. This doesn't mean you can't go outside, but it does mean you have to rethink how you interact with the world around you. And if you only remember two things, keep a six foot distance and wash your hands. So I'm glad to see that you're practicing social distancing. That looks very nice. That's very good. I've worked in healthcare for my whole life. I always have told people that you, when you're sick, you should never think about the cost of healthcare. And doctors I know are not thinking about how much the cost of care is that they're giving, and patients should not be thinking about the cost of the care that they're getting. And certainly not in this moment, and not with something that could be deadly. Um, so I wasn't thinking about the cost at the time. What I was thinking was I was really concerned that I might die. For the last 15 months, I've been undergoing um, chemotherapy and radiation for lymphoma, which is um, a cancer of the white blood cells. So I had Medicaid, but my husband had accepted a job offer. We were getting ready to move to DC, and I had unenrolled in Medicaid when my husband um, signed for his job and signed up for his health insurance, because that's what the law requires. And you know, I just happened to be uncovered at the exact moment that I got sick. So about five days after I got the, te the final test results, you know, it came in an envelope and I have an online bill as well. <laughs> um, you know, they like sent it to me right away and I opened it and I was just like, I was like in shock. So my total bill was about $34,392. I'm saying that precisely, but it's like somewhere between $34,000 and $35,000. And some of the sort of like memorable costs that are associated with it, like the COVID-19 test panel was $907. Um, and great, like that might get paid for by some magical 
way, but that's 2% of the total bill for my care. Everything that the doctor and nurse who are treating me in isolation could possibly need has to be in the room waiting for me when I arrive at the emergency room. It has to stay in isolation, and then until they get a positive or negative test, anything they put in the room has to be billed to me because it has to be thrown away if it doesn't get used. And that's a very expensive process. Working class people in the U.S. can never catch a break. You get sick once and your like, credit is ruined and you have this huge debt. You know, I'm early on in this pandemic and there are going to be a lot of other people. And like, I want people to know up front that we have to organize now when, they're, when Congress is talking about all these big bailouts, that we have to reach out to them now if we want to make a change. I received excellent care. I'm here and alive today because... Our healthcare system is amazing and the cost is outrageous and that's not a political problem. It's not, you know, it's not doctor's faults, it's not patient's faults, it's a political problem that we have. Hey everyone, I'm Allison Mars. You're watching NBC News Now from my living room. Uh, a big thank you to Gotti Schwartz who took over last week while we were getting my home studio set up. It's our first day with it going, so let's hope things go smoothly. I got my Monday sweater on, so at least we know what day it is, because I know that's been a little bit of a an issue with these work from home days. Uh, we got a lot of information for you. I know uh, you have questions and concerns. We're going to try to cover everything we can and get through this coronavirus pandemic together. So let's head over to NBC News Now correspondent Alexa Liotto. She has the latest coronavirus headlines from NBCNews.com. Give us an update. Hey, Allison. Good to see you and uh, glad you're back. Lots of headlines today. The U.S. Navy hospital ship Comfort docking in Manhattan this morning to help bolster medical capacity for the city as it continues to grapple with the coronavirus pandemic. The floating hospital has the capacity for 1,000 beds and 12 operation rooms and will be ready to take patients within 24 hours. That's according to our local affiliate here, NBC New York. Now, New York is currently considered the epicenter of the pandemic in the United States, but the entire country is of course, facing the crisis. This morning, Dr. Deborah Burks, the White House Coronavirus Response Coordinator, had this to say. If we do things together well, almost perfectly, we could get in the range of 100,000 to 200,000 fatalities. And from NBC News' tech editor Jason Abruziz, Macy's is furloughing the majority of its 130,000-person workforce as the coronavirus pandemic takes a toll on American businesses. The company said in a statement that they, quote, have lost the majority of their sales due to store closures and that across Macy's, Bloomingdale's, and Blue Mercury brands, the company will be moving to the, quote, absolute minimum workforce to maintain basic operations. U.S. Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin calling into Fox Business today to say the economy should be back on track by June. You've talked about the economy coming roaring back. Uh, you hold with that? We come roaring back after June 1st? I think so. I think we're going to have a rough quarter because we've shut down major parts of the economy. But our economy was in great shape. Our economy was the, the economy that was really growing and, and leading the world. Mnuchin adding the Trump administration will be providing eight weeks of payroll to small businesses, which totals around $350 billion. That's according to NBC's Lucy Bailey. And some new numbers released just earlier from Louisiana, a surge in coronavirus cases now totaling over 4,000 statewide. That's a jump of 485 cases from yesterday. And New Orleans specifically seeing a rise of 130 new cases, bringing the total to 1,480. That's from NBC News' Blaine Alexander. And Florida Governor Ron DeSantis announced Announcing today he'll be signing a safer at home executive order for four counties in South Florida as cases in the state near or surpass 5,000, uh, according to a according to the latest numbers from Florida's uh, health department. The governor has made news recently for not mandating a statewide stay at home order as other states across the country across the country have implemented. And Allison, those are the headlines for this hour. We'll be updating you with more. Some unbelievable headlines. Thank you so much. And forgive me for not saying your first name. We got a couple devices here I have to shut off before we get into our next hour. Uh, of course, you could check out our live blog, NBCNews.com slash coronavirus. We'll have plenty more updates for you there. 200,000 Americans could die from the coronavirus. That is according to Dr. Anthony Fauci. Take a listen. 
I mean, looking at what we're seeing now, you know, I would say between 100 and 200,000 cases, but I don't want to be held to that because it's, it's, it's uh, excuse me, deaths. I mean, we're, we're going to have millions of cases. Joining me now, Dr. Nahid Bedelia, infectious disease physician and medical director of the Special Pathogens Unit at Boston University School of Medicine. Doctor, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for having me. This morning on the Today Show, Dr. Deborah Burks echoed Dr. Fauci, saying that even if we take aggressive measures, the U.S. could see 200,000 deaths from the coronavirus. Those are just staggering numbers. Do you agree with them? I do. You know, and there's a study at the end of last week from the Institute of Health Metrics and Evaluation from the University of Washington that a lot of people think took a, a pretty, you know, a positive perspective that if we all follow the, the social distancing, the isolating the cases who get sick and we test like crazy, then, you know, then we might be in that number of 100,000 to 200,000. But even then, you know, when we do that, that study basically showed that most states are going to fall short for the needs that they have for hospital beds, about 61,000 hospital beds, you know, short of what they already have and about 15,000 ICU beds short of what they already have, which is where this flattening the curve, this idea that we don't want everybody to get sick together comes in. Um, as we project out um, to looking at those cases. President Trump said this morning that he expects the U.S. will hit its coronavirus peak in about two weeks. Listen to this. Around Easter, that's going to be your spike. That's going to be the highest point, we think. And then it's going to start coming down from there. That will be a day of celebration. And we just want to do it right. So we picked the end of April, uh, the last day, April 30th. What do you make of that? Do you think that we will hit that peak around mid-April? Is there a way to tell? I, I think that it's it's much more complicated than that, than that right? Because there's no one peak. Mm -hmm. Every state is going to hit a peak at a different time, depending on what their outbreak looks like and how much testing is being done. Um, we do know that physical distancing works. There's a study from Northeastern and Oxford that showed that, look at China's number. When they put this into place, it does work. But it's not that we hit a peak and then everything is done, it's that we hit a peak and you have a plateau where you want fewer number of people, the acceleration of cases decreases. And, in, and given that, I think that's the message that we need to send is that the cases will continue. It's just that we won't be accelerating if we follow all mm -hmm. the guidance that we're sort of looking at. But all the states, everybody has to do that together. So yesterday, President Trump extended the national social distancing guidelines to April 30th. Given what you've just said about not being really sure about the peak and just that a peak could happen in different states at different times, is that April 30th extension long enough or do you think it might need to be later than that? I think it's going to be a different reality for every single state. Um, and that's why ensuring that mm -hmm. everybody starts out at a similar place right now with the same kind of restrictions. You know, if we could if we could do this perfectly, the whole country go into isolation, go into mm -hmm. quarantine um, and do the social distancing and 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 use that as a temporizing measure. Right. It's not like somehow the, the virus will magically disappear, because what we need to do in that interim is increase right. our testing, fight everybody who's sick you know, improve our hospitals so they can handle this capacity. Um, if we do that, we come closer to that. But I think most people think that the number is probably going to be more than just another two weeks. I think the reality is this may go on for a couple of months at different at different frequency of cases, at different acceleration of the number mm -hmm. of new cases that we see. We know we need to be socially distancing right now, but when we eventually do come out of this, is there a right and a wrong way to ease out of social distancing? Do you just go back to life as normal or do you sort of need to work your way back out into the regular world? I, I think it's going to be a while before we unlearn the lessons that we've learned, you know, in this. I, I don't, and we're, everybody, the whole world is holding their breath with China as it's, you know, easing is, um, its, um, its guidance on social distancing. And they're doing it in, again, a, a graded uh, manner for exactly the reasons that you talked about, because you don't want to, the minute you let down the guard, you don't want to see that spike of cases again. Right. Um, but I, I think the lessons around, you know, maintaining good hand hygiene and, and being home when we're sick are things that probably I think are going to be ingrained in our culture, I hope, for a while, because those are the measures that will help us with the coronavirus if it returns in the fall, if with a flu season that occurs next year that happens every year. Um, all those things, I think, are, are going to be uh, something that we take away from this. 
Yeah, it, it seems like it'll be a while before we uh, get out of these good hand washing habits. I think a lot of folks are, are really uh, doing that as often as possible. And it's something that we've all become very accustomed to. Uh, let me ask you this. The FDA approved a coronavirus test that can get results in less than 15 minutes. Could that help us get a handle on this outbreak? Uh, the FDA actually was very busy at the end of last week and over the weekend. So aside from a whole slew of emergency use authorization, so the, the permission to use these tests that look promising, they also released a whole number of guidance around, you know, how do you decontaminate your, the masks that healthcare workers are using, the N95s and others in the hospital setting? Yeah. How do we clean them in between uses? And so the test itself is promising because um, it's basically taking, again, the same type of samples from the person's body and running it uh, at a higher speed at 15 minutes and, and doing a lot more tests together. The real test of this will be when it gets rolled out in the clinical setting uh, to see if, if, it, if it has the same type of accuracy that they've seen when they're looking at it in the laboratory with clinical samples that they had in, in house. And so the kind of factors that matter there are, you know, how, are people, how well are people collecting the samples, you know, how, how well are laboratories able to adopt the, the procedures to get the, the sensitivity and specificity, which is the ability of the test to actually detect a test a disease when it resists and then to actually detect it compared to other diseases that might be present um, in the person. And so uh, a little bit to go, cautious optimism on the test is gonna make a huge difference in identifying mm -hmm. people. But, but the other things that FDA has done, including the decon of the contamination of masks, is also going to have a huge role in improving healthcare worker capacity and hospital capacity in, in taking care of these patients. Yeah, you just mentioned a couple of times the new restrictions or the, the loosening of restrictions on sterilizing masks. Uh, what changes did the FDA make? You mentioned you think that'll be helpful? Yeah, so a few different ones. One thing that they did was, you know, as you know, the supply chains for respirator masks, the masks that we use in the, in the hospital setting, um, in patients particularly that we might be doing procedures in which the virus may be in the room for a longer period of time, those, those we've run out of a lot of supplies, right? And so what they did is, one, they said, what are the manufacturers that are foreign that hit the same level of technical specifications that you could buy from? So they laid out a guidance on how hospitals and others can acquire those tests. The second is they said, you know, the, the, you have these N95s. There are papers out there that have been around for a while, including uh, one by Patel, a study the company Patel did that looked at um, a technology that we use in the hospital all the time to actually decontaminate other, uh, decontaminate other medical equipment, such as vaporized hydrogen peroxide. And so what they did was they provided an emergency use authorization to Patel. Um, and hopefully it's, it's the opening of, of, of others to be able to do the same, which is using this technology um, to show that you can, A, remove the virus from the mask in between use, and two, the, the mask itself does not lose its integrity, and so it's safe for healthcare workers to keep using it. So here's the awesome thing. With this technology, you could use the same mask as, well, as long as it's not damaged during use 20 times. So you're basically increasing the supply of masks by 20 times if wow. this, if this uh, procedure works. Uh, we've been talking about the masks that uh, medical professionals have been using. I know the advice for the average person has been not to purchase and use masks because you're taking them away from healthcare workers who need them. Your advice for people who are trying to go out, go to the grocery store when they need to, uh, how can they do those kinds of things and stay safe? Is there a smart way to either use gloves or hand sanitizers or wipes that can just help people uh, you know, do the basic things that they absolutely have to and get back home as safely as possible? Thanks, Hells. And so important thing to sort of step back on this is how is this disease transmitted, right? It, it, it's in the fluid that's in, in the cough and the sneeze of someone who's sick. And the worst way to get exposed is to be around someone and they actually cough or sneeze on you uh, because mm -hmm. you get the virus. And then it gets transmitted into your ears, your nose, your eye, I'm sorry, your nose, your mouth, your eyes. And so, uh, but the other way that people get infected is when someone's sick, and they leave a little bit of the virus in the, in the fluid that's coming from their cough and sneezing on the surface, and then you touch it. So it doesn't go through your hands. It's that you're taking your hands and then touching your face uh, with that. And so the great, um, I think, a great guide to do this is good hand hygiene always works. If you're doing some uh, work such as mm -hmm. actually taking care of someone who's sick at home, that's when gloves are really helpful because you know you might come into contact with a lot of those things that are dirty around the house. 
uh, when you're outside, the biggest thing is, A, don't go outside if you're sick. If you can get help, ask others to get the things that you need uh, because you don't want to contribute to potentially, you know, putting this virus out there that others may be exposed to. Uh, but the other is when you're staying away from people who might be sick in the public, the use of masks is, you know, in the in the ideal setting, if used perfectly, the best use of it is when you're sick, putting it on so you don't make other people sick. But the, the difference is okay. that when people use masks, I've seen them use it and they use their hands to sort of adjust their masks. And you're kind of defe defeating your, the purpose here when you're taking your hands and potentially touching your face, which is what you don't want to do. And so the, the big lesson here is that the first step is hand hygiene and cleaning surfaces and then isolating when you're sick and using a mask when you're sick. If you know how to use the mask properly, uh, potentially there could be some benefit, but really it's when you are sick that it plays the biggest role. All right, Dr. Bedelia, thank you so much for all of your great advice. We will try to keep up the uh, hand hygiene cleaning services and not touching our faces. I appreciate all the great advice. Help has arrived in New York City, where right now there are more than 36 thousand coronavirus cases. The U.S. NS Comfort pulled into port this morning. It's here to primarily help hospitals that are just overwhelmed with patients. Here's New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio moments after the ship docked. It's a very emotional moment. Um, I went up on the roof here to watch the Comfort come in, and I had this incredible feeling of peace, actually, that help was finally coming, that um, we were not alone, so I'm going to keep calling the president, I'm going to keep appealing to him to get us all the help we need for these really tough weeks, and then again, we will turn around and help everyone else in this country right after. Rahima Ellis is at the pier in New York City where the U.S. NS Comfort is docked. Rahima, who will be treated on this ship? Well, this ship is to help ease the burden at our brick and mortar hospitals, if you will, who can now focus on COVID-19 patients. The people who are coming here will have other problems uh, health-wise, from minor to critical issues. All kinds of things continue to happen in the city beyond the COVID-19, but that and COVID-19 uh, going on in a hospital has just brought them to the brink of disaster. So. The mayor and the governor have been pleading for more facilities, more beds to come through. This one is a thousand bed facility, which will concentrate on that. So in addition to this, as you know, the Javits Center is going to be opening this week. That's another thousand beds of, uh, of a field hospital. And then they have 68 beds that are opening up this week. And of all places, iconic Central Park in an effort again to ease the burden that's going on at our hospitals around the area. I should tell you this, Allison, just a few minutes ago, there was a, a, a large group of people who were gathered here to get a look at this ship. It is a comforting sight to see the USNS comfort here. But police are saying people gathering here is exactly what they don't want to happen. I heard you in the segment before talking about whether or not social distancing is working. So a police officer in his car over the loudspeaker just said a moment ago, this is not a tourist attraction. You have to move along because people were gathered too close together. That's one of the biggest things that both the mayor and the governor have been talking about, that while they are starting to see that the rate of doubling of cases is easy, one of the biggest concerns is making certain that people abide by the, the warnings, if you will, not to be too close together. Social distancing is the way that they can hopefully lower the intensity of the spread of this coronavirus. Even here in New York, Allison, what they've gone so far to do is they are removing the basketball hoops from some of the playgrounds in New York because people have been going out on, the, on very nice days, unlike today, and having pick up basketball games, running into each other, falling into each other, grabbing on each other, exactly what health officials say you should not do. Yeah, when the weather's nice in the city, you see a lot of folks out there, whether it's on the West Side Highway, in the parks, uh, along the river, uh, sometimes getting just a little bit too close. I'd like to ask you one more question uh, about this naval ship. This is not the first time the Comfort has been sent to New York City. Uh, can you tell us when it was here before? Uh, the last time was for 9-11. At that point, it was expected mm. that it might need to 
provide some assistance for those who might have been injured when those planes crashed into the Twin Towers. But unfortunately, nearly 3,000 people died. And what this ship was then turned into was really a comfort ship for those health, those health workers and first responders who found themselves overwhelmed with the task at hand. And they needed not only a place of respite, but also a place where they could come for some mental health counseling, if you will. And this ship provided that comfort for people back then, as it is providing assistance and comfort for people now. It's supposed to be up and running, they say, within the next 24 hours. Allison? The name of that ship, so appropriate. Thank you so much, Rahima. And a quick programming note for you tomorrow. Join Savannah Guthrie, Hoda Kotb, and the NBC News team for a live primetime special on the coronavirus pandemic. Our team of correspondents around the world will be providing critical, real-time information. Our experts will answer your questions about the coronavirus. That's tomorrow at 10 p.m. Eastern and Pacific on NBC, MSNBC, and right here on NBC News now. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. This is all I've got left. Good afternoon from the spin It's room. news made for your streaming world. NBC News Now. here for them. We are the community. It's definitely good to hear. You always want to hear that the wages are going up. We work hard. We bleed. We sweat. We cry when it comes to these cars. Without this pill, we die. He's doing the best he can for the country, and they're getting in the way. We're going to build the wall. We have no choice. This is an emergency. There are zero hours left to take action. Because we're incarcerated doesn't mean that we should lose our right to vote. This is the perfect time to graduate. There's like a lot of shooting happening. These are thoughtful voters who, more than anything, want these candidates to cut to the chase. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt, covering coronavirus with facts over fear. How do we know who belongs in isolation? What should we be conscious of? What's being worked on today? At a time of national crisis, turn to the most trusted TV news anchor in America. Need your true crime fix on the go? Dateline episodes are available as podcasts. Mysteries with a twist from the true crime original. Wow. Listen to Dateline wherever you get your podcasts. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. This is all I've got left. Who brought more to the caucuses? It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, 3 to 11 p.m. Eastern. Manchester, Washington. Why should your judgment be valued? I'd stake my judgment against anyone out there. Is party unity your concern right now, or is simply winning as many states as you well, can? Well, it's both. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. If it's digging in on the issues, let's talk about money and politics. If it's asking the questions you want to ask, how do you reassure those supporters that you will sustain this? Just watch me. If it's navigating the winding road to the White House, and if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. The coronavirus outbreak. What's next? NBC News has in-depth coverage, answers to your questions, insight from medical experts, and up-to-the-minute live blog updates. For continuing coverage, turn to the networks and platforms of NBC News. Hospitals across the country dealing with an influx of coronavirus patients. Two healthcare professionals share what it's like on the front lines of this pandemic. Hello, my name is Jeremy Rose. I'm an ER doctor at Mount Sinai Beth Israel in Manhattan. Tomorrow I'm gonna to go work on the COVID unit. It's 5 a.m., I'm in the middle of my overnight shift, and we've 
just intubated a patient who's uh, in his mid-50s. He's going to the ICU. And one of the really, really bizarre and unnerving things about this illness is that it makes you alone. Um, everyone describes all the critical care units as war zones um, because that's what it looks like. Uh, no one looks like they're in their usual scrubs with all all the things that they're trying to wear to attempt to protect themselves. We cannot have visitors in the hospital because they may be infected as well. And so tonight, when I intubated this man, uh, he had no family with him, he's alone. And when he goes to the ICU, he will be alone. And if he dies, he may very well die alone. I bumped into one of my attendings and some of my colleagues, and they're like, oh, what are you doing tomorrow? And I'm like, oh, I'm off. Yes, I'm off. And uh, they were like, well, you see that patient. That patient needs uh, somebody to care for them tomorrow. They're going to have, you know, CVHD, and they have all the things going wrong, multi-system organ failure, lungs failing, heart failing. I don't even know what else is failing on this person, but uh, God bless them. And um, I decided that I would stay. During this time, which is unfortunately a terrible time, where people are dying and where people are getting very, very sick, I want you to know that inside the hospital, we are pulling together like we have never pulled together before. And I look around at my nursing colleagues, I look around at everybody in the hospital doing every job, and I can't help thinking to myself that maybe now is our moment. Now is our moment to rise above this terrible disaster. And what I would say to you is if we pull together like we have pulled together in the hospital, we can and we will rise above this. It's gonna be a challenge. These poor people are so amazingly ill. Um, this virus, this tiny virus is literally, is literally ominous. It's crazy. Um, so we'll see what tomorrow holds. Amazon workers at a New York City warehouse walked off the job today. They're protesting how the companies handled the coronavirus outbreak. They say the safety protocols in place aren't enough to protect them. NBC News business and tech correspondent Jolene Kent joins me now. And Joe, great to have you with us. What do these Amazon workers want? What are they asking for today? They say that they're asking for the basics. They know that one person has tested positive for COVID-19, so they believe that there are other cases, and they don't believe they have enough personal protective equipment. And we're talking about the masks and the gloves that they want. There's also been discussion of social distancing and whether or not the adequate steps have been taken on that front. So that's the Staten Island case. We're also hearing of a new petition that's being circulated here in Southern California mm -hmm. in the Inland Empire at some of the... Uh, uh, fulfillment centers here. You may not know this, but uh, this area of Southern California has the largest concentration of Amazon fulfillment center, those warehouses, uh, where all of the orders are processed. So there are similar grievances and concerns here on the ground. But I do want to point out that Amazon did respond, and they told us that they believe that these accusations are unfounded. They call their employees heroes fighting for their communities, and they do believe they're providing enough gear. Joe, we know Amazon isn't the only company that's facing some backlash right now. Instacart employees planned an emergency walk-off today also. What can you tell us about that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just got off the phone with one of the organizers, an Instacart shopper who's been shopping for Instacart for about five years. Their concern is also their own health. As they go into these grocery stores, what is it like to go in? How crowded it is? They're not being provided the sanitizer and the hazard pay and the sick pay that they believe they deserve as they serve on the front lines. As so many people are homebound and unable to do groceries, of course, Instacart is getting a huge surge in orders the same way Amazon has as well. So Instacart, mm. since we started reporting on this last week, they did say they will be providing a higher default level for tips and some bonus pay. And then after increased pressure over the weekend, they said they're sourcing and getting their own hand sanitizer out to their shoppers. But the Instacart uh, shopper that I spoke to in Chicago, Matthew Tellis, he says that, look, this is just not enough. It's part of a larger systemic problem of having these workers out during coronavirus, risking their lives, trying to deliver what basics so many people need.
Yeah, Joe, they've just been doing incredible work, getting folks the things that they need, putting their own lives in danger to make sure that people have supplies, food, all the things they need in their homes during this crazy time. Uh, we are so grateful for all of the work that they are doing and thankful to you so much for your reporting today. Sure. New York City hospitals and funeral homes just overwhelmed with coronavirus cases. Sky News correspondent Cordelia Lynch spoke to people who have lost members of their family and to those organizing their burials. I'll get that. You felt your home? Gerard Newfeld Funeral Home is a family run business. Yes, we're open. How can I help you? And it's overwhelmed. The bodies of COVID-19 victims. Small groups, yes. Keep coming. If you just give me a call to let me know when you're coming, because we are a little busy and I want to make sure somebody is here to sit down and speak with you properly. The caskets are closed, the chairs largely bereft of mourners, but the work doesn't stop. Demand is just unfortunately a lot of debts all at the same time. So we're trying to manage services for all the families in a proper way, whatever they want to do. So, and it's just a lot of families all at the same time. So we're trying to get fit in schedules, trying to keep track of who's, you know, which day, which family's going to go and go from there. Just down the road is Elmhurst Hospital, the center of the outbreak, where doctors say the situation is apocalyptic. Crazy. I mean, people are unfortunately passing away in, in big numbers. And because they live in this area, and I'm the only funeral home left in this area, they're coming to me. So, so I'm trying to accommodate them best I can. So, and every day, more yeah. and more bodies come. Yes, yes. I mean, we left uh, the office last night, and I think we had about 12 services or so scheduled. and. Shortly after I left the office, within uh, two hours, I had three more services. And then this morning, as soon as we came in, we put on three or four more services. So um, that's what's happening. And, and it's only 12 o'clock. Robert Lugo has just lost his grandmother, Anna. Isolated in her suffering, her family now robbed of the chance to grieve together. But my grandmother died alone. <laughs> No, it's not my grandma. Like, she died alone. We didn't even get to say bye to her. And I understand that's part of the death process. But she was there. She was in the hospital. She was feet away. We couldn't even see her. We couldn't talk to, talk to her. We couldn't even give her, like, that boost of morale to say, hey, you know, you're going to come out of this. Or we need you to come out of this. Like, there was nothing. What would you say to those people who don't think coronavirus is a serious threat? If you don't think that it's a serious threat, here I am. I lost my grandmother in the, in the midst of less than a week. Her family had just celebrated her 80th birthday. They call her the glue. Now they too are sick. Because she was exposed to the virus, they also became exposed to the virus. And half of our family members right now are in quarantine because they tested positive. With collective mourning forbidden and traditional rituals removed, death is marked by a drive through. The crematories really aren't letting anybody in. The cemeteries are limiting it for the most part to people staying in their cars and just watching the burial from the graveside. Joe now negotiates at the gates, carrying candles for the families that can't. Sometimes when it's so brief, it, it almost leaves them still feeling hollow, like, you know, what just happened? They don't have enough time to process it. You know, and it, it's heartbreaking. It, it, it's really sad. Joe and his father are vulnerable handling infected bodies, but they keep going, determined to offer dignity to those who left this world without a hand to hold.
You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. This is all I've got left. Good afternoon from the spin room. It's news made for your streaming world. NBC News Now. If it's digging in on the issues. Let's talk about money and politics. If it's asking the questions you want to ask. How do you reassure those supporters that you will sustain this? Just watch me. If it's navigating the winding road to the White House. And if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Need your true crime fix on the go? Dateline episodes are available as podcasts. Mysteries with a twist from the true crime original. Wow. Listen to Dateline wherever you get your podcasts. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. This is all I've got left. Who brought more to the caucuses? It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, 3 to 11 p.m. Eastern. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt, covering coronavirus with facts over fear. How do we know who belongs in isolation? What should we be conscious of? What's being worked on today? At a time of national crisis, turn to the most trusted TV news anchor in America. All right, let's go over now to Leanne Caldwell. She has the latest on the stimulus package from Capitol Hill. And Leanne, President Trump pushed back his social distancing uh, guidelines at least until April 30th. That means the economy is going to probably continue to take a hit for at least another month. What's Congress working on now to counter that? Yeah, Allison, Allison, Congress is under no impression that they are done with uh, trying to help this economy. They know that uh, the peak is still down the road and a lot more needs to be done. So what's happening on the Hill right now, while members are both all back in their districts, most of them anyway, in the House and the Senate, um, their aides and they're still talking on the phone trying to come up with what a phase four is going to look like. Um, I'm told by sources that they're starting those discussions now. They actually started them last week. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi has been pretty public with what she wants in the phase four of this bill. That includes additional money for states. Uh, we heard Governor Cuomo over the past week talking about how what they got in the phase three portion was not nearly enough. And so Pelosi agrees with that. She says states are going to need a lot more to deal with this crisis. In addition, uh, she is um, talking a lot about um, uh, beefed up family, uh, paid family medical leave um, and more things to help workers. She thinks that the corporations and the big businesses with their half a trillion dollars at least of loans that they're expected to get got plenty in this bill. And so she's looking Looking at more help for individuals and small businesses, Allison. Leanne, we've heard quite a bit from uh, Pelosi, as you've said. Does that mean the House is taking the lead on this next bill? Uh, what Pelosi has said is that she thinks that the four corners should do that. And I do that in quotes because that means Pelosi, the Republican House leader McCarthy, uh, the Senate Democratic leader Schumer, and then, of course, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell. Um, it's unclear at this point. Uh, of course, the House and the Senate, they always battle with each other and they would want to be yeah. the lead writers in these sorts of legislation. But while Pelosi has her committees already working on this stuff, uh, the Senate is already going to work as well, too. Uh, we, it could be a much more equitable uh, participation where we saw in the second bill, uh, Pelosi took the lead. In the third bill, the Senate uh, took the lead. Um, the parameters are not worked out yet, but uh, they're all getting to work and trying to get their ideas in there first. 
Leanne, we know President Trump called into Fox News this morning. While he was uh, talking uh, with them, he reacted to some comments that Nancy Pelosi made about the president's early handling of this pandemic. Here's that exchange. When they see you and Cuomo uh, working together, I think people are heartened by it. But then when you see Speaker Pelosi come out and say, President Trump's denial at the beginning of this was deadly. As the president fiddles, people are dying. What's your reaction to that? Well, you know, it's a sad thing. Look, she's a uh, sick puppy, in my opinion. She really is. She's got a lot of problems, and that's a horrible thing to say. And I stopped all very, some very, very infected, very, very sick people, thousands coming in from China long earlier than anybody thought, including the experts. Nobody thought we should do it except me. You know, she doesn't mention that, and that was early. And don't forget, she was playing the impeachment game, you know, her game where she ended up looking like a fool. Leanna, a lot of Americans are concerned about wasting time, whether it's the Trump administration's initial response to the coronavirus pandemic or how long it took Congress to pass its last stimulus package. Can Democrats and Republicans work with the Trump administration quickly and effectively to get another package passed? Yeah, they've proven they've been able to do so um, twice now, really three times. They've they've passed three bills, but the president hasn't been involved in these negotiations. He's been he's been not even overseeing. He's been put afar. Uh, Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin is the person who is leading the negotiations on behalf of the White House, um, bringing the president in at the very last moment uh, to negotiate these things. We also know, Allison, that uh, Speaker Pelosi and the president haven't spoken in about five months since the very early stages of the impeachment process. Um, and so that relationship is completely broken down. But uh, with Mnuchin at the helm, uh, talking with McConnell and Pelosi and Schumer and McCarthy, they've gotten things done. And I know that there's been a lot of criticism that it has taken a long time. But, you know, I, I err on the side of uh, one of the people who have covered Congress for quite a long time, and they have never Never worked at this speed yeah. before. Uh, being able to pass a two trillion dollar bill in about a week is a phenomenal pace for Congress, and they're already at work again. Um, of course, there's lots of obstacles and bumps down the road, but people on both sides of the aisle in Congress both say that uh, if the president remains at arm's length, things can get done. Yeah, Leanne, one thing is for sure, what seems like a long time for the average American is pretty quick work uh, in the government. Uh, one more question on timing for you. Last week's stimulus package included money for Americans and American businesses that are struggling. Uh, back to this timeline issue, when can Americans expect to receive that government relief? Yeah, well, small businesses can start to apply for their loans um, already. Uh, you know, I called the Small Business Administration hotline last week, last Thursday, I believe it was, and their line was up and running, waiting to hear from small businesses on what their needs were. Um, as far as individuals for the direct payments, um, you know, we could expect people to get those within the next week and a half to two weeks. Uh, it still takes a while. It's not immediate. Um, if you did pay your your taxes electronically and they have your bank account system through the IRS, then you're going to get your money a lot faster. If they have to mail you a check, it's going to take a little bit longer. It could take five weeks to get those checks. But as we all know, you know, mortgage and rent payments are due any day now. We're approaching the first of the month. And so that those checks cannot get out fast enough for so many Americans, Allison. Yeah, Leanne, Wednesday, the first coming quickly. I know a lot of people are concerned about that deadline to make payments. Leanne Caldwell, thanks so much for being with us. Always great to see you. Thank you. All right, let's go now to NBCNews.com. Senior White House reporter Shannon Pettypiece. She has the latest on President Trump's response to the coronavirus pandemic. And Shannon, last week, the president wanted to get the economy up and running by Easter, April 12th. He's now pushed that back about two weeks. What changed his mind there? was well, really an Oval Office meeting over the weekend with Dr. Fauci and Dr. Bricks, two of the lead public health officials um, dealing with the coronavirus. You know, today was the day that the president's 15-day guidelines about social distancing and you know, avoiding things like eating out at restaurants and, and large group gatherings were supposed to expire. Um, the president had signaled last week, obviously, that he wanted to get the economy up and running as soon as possible. Uh, Easter being an aspirational deadline, White House aides were telling us they were trying to come up 
up with a plan to give to the president for how at least some parts of the country could get online. That was last week, though. Over the weekend, what we've been hearing uh, is that Dr. Fauci and Dr. Bricks presented a uh, plan, uh, some modeling to the president, some estimates of the number of fatalities there could be in the U.S., with them ranging from 2 million uh, deaths should nothing be done to 100,000 deaths should things be done uh, almost perfectly when it comes to social distancing and keeping uh, the society basically at home uh, for months uh, or you know weeks to continue. Uh, as Dr. Fauci put it in an interview today, the president saw those numbers, shook his head, and said, I guess I've got to do it, referring to extending this timeline to April. So now what we are hearing from the president after that, that Oval Office meeting, that instead of the country getting back open in uh, Easter, around that Easter holiday, April 12th, uh, that's when we could actually see cases in the country nationwide spiking. Shannon, Leanne Caldwell just told us Congress is already looking into a phase four stimulus bill. A Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin actively worked with Congress on the last measure. Will he be as involved in this phase? Uh, that's very likely, because there was a sense in the White House that Mnuchin did a pretty good job uh, balancing uh, the communication between the White House uh, and the Hill. I mean, to Leanne's point that the president and Nancy Pelosi haven't spoken to each other in months, um, Mnuchin was on the phone with Pelosi multiple times a day, five, six, seven, eight times a day, we were told at certain points, uh, working very closely with her and with Chuck Schumer. Uh, so, you know, the White House is pretty pleased with how the, the most recent mm -hmm. uh, aid package came out. So I think, yeah, well, we could definitely see Mnuchin playing this role going forward. Shannon, we know the president's uh, set to address the nation again today. What can we expect? Well, I think one of the things we're all going to be pressing them on is what more can be done? What mm -hmm. more needs to be done? Uh, for example, this estimate of 100,000 to 200,000 deaths. Um, you know, one question I have is not only what timeline are we talking about here, um, but what do we need to do to make sure uh, the deaths don't exceed that um, a sadly optimistic estimate? What more would we like to see, um, would they like to see Americans doing? Shannon, before I let you go, a quick campaign question for you. We're not seeing Joe Biden and Bernie Sanders on the trail anymore as Americans are being asked to stay home and large gatherings have been canceled. The president isn't holding any rallies right now. Where does this leave the president's reelection campaign? Well, those rallies, as you mentioned, were so essential to his presidential campaign. He was doing, um, on average, one rally a week this year until everything ground to the halt. Um, not only is it a way to get local media and fire up his base, but they're big fundraising opportunities. You get people at the rallies to donate money. Uh, you get them to sign up to volunteer. Uh, so obviously, those are off the table. The campaign says it still is doing sort of virtual campaigning, uh, doing events online. Um, volunteers have still been making phone calls. Um, I was told that that um, uh, two weekends ago now, they made 1.5 million phone calls, volunteers did, to voters who they are targeting. Um, that was around coronavirus, telling them what the president is doing, uh, telling them things they can do to stay safe, and directing them to the government website. So a bit of a public service phone call, but also a way to highlight the president's leadership at this time. All right, Shannon Pettypiece, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. And the coronavirus crisis is impacting voter registration and raising concerns that many Americans might miss their chance to get on the rolls before November's presidential election. NBC News senior digital politics reporter Alex Seitzwald joins me now. Alex, how is the coronavirus crisis affecting voter registration? Yeah, Allison, well, this would typically be prime time for voter registration in a presidential election year, but everything is ground to a halt. You can't go out knocking on doors with clipboards to register people. You can't go to events. You can't even stand outside of a grocery store. Uh, DMVs, where about 45 percent of voter, re voter registrations come from because of the Motor Voter Act, they're shut down. Libraries, uh, post offices, high schools where you can pick up a voter registration form, those are shut down. Too. So all of these groups that would right now be sending hundreds of people out into the field to be signing people up on the rolls, they've had to switch entirely to digital organizing, keep their people at home. And uh, there's a big concern that for young voters who are just turning 18, for people who have moved to new addresses and need to re-register, or people who just sat out the last few elections want to come uh, on the rolls now and participate, that they're not going to be able to because they, they want to have access to get on the rolls. 
Let, let me ask you this, Alex. You mentioned that this is really the crunch time when a lot of Americans register to vote, but you can register to vote year round. Why is it that in the months leading up to a presidential election, uh, the people sort of sort of make that rush? Yeah, that's right. I mean, it's really just the interest and attention that is on yeah. politics. Uh, you know, yes, you can register at any time, but in the run up to the 2016 election, uh, 77 and a half million voter registration applications were filed. So that's a huge, you know, portion of the U.S. population. There's also a ton of money that gets poured in uh, to both Republican and Democratic efforts that the parties themselves do registration, the campaigns do registration, and all these allied groups. So, uh, you know, if you're trying to get people to pay attention to politics, especially targeting people who are not typically involved in politics, which is who you're targeting with registration efforts, a time when people are typically paying attention to politics is the time to do it. Yeah, if we weren't dealing with coronavirus right now, I think people would be getting a lot of reminders that now is the time to think about uh, getting out and voting this fall. So what are some uh, alternatives for canvassers? Are there digital organizing options, things they can do uh, to sort of keep up their work? And what challenges are they facing on that front? Yeah, for sure. And this is actually one place uh, where the Internet can really come in handy. And there's been a lot of progress in states where now 40 states have online uh, voter registration or, or 39 and, and one more is in the process of adopting it now. Uh, so that can be really helpful. And there are places like Vote.org and other uh, groups that have been doing online voter registration for years. A lot of this has just come online in the past year. Uh, in New York, it was in January, just a couple months ago, that they set up the online voter registration system. But that still leaves people out. There are people who don't have access to the internet, uh, visually disabled people who can't use the internet in typical ways, people who have struggled with English. Uh, since, and sometimes you need to print out a form online and mail it in. A lot of people don't own printers. You can't go to a library to print it out. Uh, getting to a post office box is be tricky. There's, yes, there's access to a lot of parts of the country, but there's also a lot of people, uh, you know, the marginalized groups in general who are going to have a harder time even taking advantage of those options. A lot of challenges in our country right now. Even voter registration. Alex Seitzwald, thanks so much for being with us. Italy recorded its lowest number of new coronavirus cases since the country went into lockdown on March 10th. NBC News foreign correspondent Matt Bradley is in one of Europe's coronavirus hotspots. Yeah, Allison, you know, normally I'm the bearer of bad news from here in Italy, but today I have kind of mixed news. After two straight days of declines, it looks like the death rate has finally gone back up again. So there was some optimism that those two days of declining death rates from an all-time high just a couple of days ago might mean that Italy had turned the corner, but no, it looks like the deaths are uh, once again climbing. But, you know, we have to also look at other indicators. This has actually seen another record here in Italy, this time a positive one. We saw the highest single number of uh, recoveries in one day. That's the number of people who were deemed by doctors to have been fully recovered by the disease. That's now more than 1,500 in one day. That's a huge number and much higher than we've been seeing in the past couple days, the past couple weeks even. So that's a really good indicator. People uh, here in Italy are leaving the hospitals, not just dying. Because remember, Italy has an enormously high death rate one that's higher, far higher than the U.S. or China, even higher than countries like Iran. And that's why it has managed to now beat by twice the number that we've seen in China, even though China is a country that's about 25 times the size of Italy. So there was also another glimmer of hope in another indicator, and that was the number of people who have tested positive for this disease has now slowed. So in other words, we're still seeing a large number of people who are newly testing positive for COVID-19. But what we're actually seeing now is that that number is no longer rising exponentially. It's slowing down and starting to flatten. That's what we talk about when we say flattening the curve. In other words, it's no longer shooting up. It's kind of just rising in a straight line or even kind of slowing down a little bit. That's a good sign. And it's something that a lot of Italian epidemiologists and government officials have been waiting to see. Because remember, this country is now well into its third week of a nationwide lockdown. And everybody here who's been sitting at home and you can't even hear anything on the streets, they've been wondering for so long when they were finally going to start to see the effects of this lockdown in the actual statistics. Well, now we're starting to see not really, really positive signs, but we're starting to see what could be the beginning of the end. 
Now, I'm not going to go as far as to say that myself, because Italy has a way of surprising in a very, very negative way. So it, tomorrow we could wake up and, and see uh, really negative numbers once again. We've seen that before in the past when there's been a, like a slight change for the positive. It just goes right back into very, very negative numbers. But it looks like this could mean that the number of new transmissions is finally slowing down and could be a matter of weeks before the tide starts to turn. But Italian officials aren't going to be taking any chances with that, nor should they. They're going to be extending this national lockdown probably for another two weeks, well into mid-April. That's the prudent thing to do, and that's what it seems like Italian officials are going to be doing, despite the fact that, you know, just like everywhere in the world, this virus is having a devastating effect both on the economy and the national psyche. Michigan is becoming one of the nation's coronavirus hotspots with more than 5,000 confirmed cases and over 100 deaths. The state's governor asking for help, warning that their health systems are just overwhelmed. NBC News correspondent Morgan Radford is in Detroit. And Morgan, what are you hearing on the ground there? What are the most urgent needs in hospitals there right now? Well, right now they need personal protective equipment, Allison, but we also just got brand new numbers this hour from the governor. We now have nearly 6,500 cases here in the state of Michigan, making it the fourth largest total across the entire country. So that's what these new hot spots are up against. And right now we're standing in front of ground zero. This is Henry Ford Hospital behind me here in Detroit, and they are servicing about one third of those coronavirus patients here. Inside behind me, there's almost 300 positive cases inside. Now, if you remember, just a few days ago, there was a leaked memo from that hospital, and they essentially outlined what they would do if resources became even more scarce than they are right now. And they said, effectively, their doctors are going to have to make the difficult decision about who lives and who dies, who gets that life-saving treatment. So, as you can imagine, that sent a ripple shock through the community and certainly throughout the country when people realize that those are the types of decisions our American doctors will be having to face if they cannot get their hands on the resources they need. But these aren't just the, the only first responders who are taking a hit, Allison. Also, we've got almost 500 police officers just in the city of Detroit who are now in quarantine. The chief of police has also uh, been tested positive for coronavirus. And also in the fire department, there are also 109 people who have been affected uh, by this pandemic. So oh. these are some harsh numbers here in the city of Detroit. And part of the concern is that, you know, we've been paying a lot of attention to these coastal cities. I know I've been reporting in New York and New Jersey. Our colleagues have been reporting out in California and the state of Washington. And so these Midwestern cities and these hot spots now, as they've been deemed, they're worried. Are they going to be behind those coastal cities yeah. when it comes to getting in line for that protective gear? And that's what their doctors are facing. And when I spoke to the chief operating officer of this hospital, he said, we have enough for today, but the question is tomorrow. Allison. Oh, what a what a big question there. Morgan, we know private companies like the automakers are trying to jump in and help out. What have they been able to do to help there? Yeah, that's what's really fascinating. Look, I, I love Motor City. Uh, I come here a lot. My fiance is from here. And what's really impressive about this place is the people. Um, they have obviously a huge manufacturing presence here. And so you've got these entire auto factories that are now converting their factories to make medical supplies. And that's just to create a stopgap. So that's how important it is for these people, members of this community, to come together and help the very people who are on the front lines inside, like the hospitals one behind me. It is an incredible city. What I would say about that memo that was leaked is it was one page of a multi-page document that is normal for organizations to put in place through ethicists to really make sure that if we ever got to a point where we had to make very, very difficult decisions that we would in advance have tested the thinking and the protocols around that. We are not there, um, but I think advanced organizations really make sure that they're looking at things from all levels because you never want to make those decisions at the time that you have no choice. So, Allison, that was Bob Briney. He's the CEO that I mentioned speaking to here at the hospital. And what was heartening about what he said was that he said, look, this is, of course, a startling memo to someone who's just reading it for the first time. But the reality is that any advanced healthcare system or any advanced unit that functions like a healthcare system needs to have some sort of protocol like this in place. I think it's just hard for people like you and me who don't have medical degrees. If we have, you know, older people that we love and care about, nobody wants to hear that, you know, they're only going to give 
priority to the people who have a higher likelihood of surviving. It's a hard thing to hear, but he's saying that's a tough type of decision yeah. that people have to make in situations like this and one that they hope they never will have to make. Allison. All right, Morgan, thanks so much. And uh, thank you for helping us out there. I know we put the sound before the question, but you clear things up nicely. Appreciate you. Of course, no problem. And the Dow starting off the week on a pretty positive note after surging 12 percent last week. That was its biggest weekly gain since the 1930s. NBC News senior business correspondent Stephanie Rule joins me now. And Steph, I'd like to welcome you uh, from your home to my home. Wonderful to have you here. Thanks for hanging out with us. Uh, it looked like the markets liked the president's message today, the national social distancing guidelines being extended to April 30th. What else were uh, investors in the markets into today? Absolutely. Well, what you said is the key thing, because we can sit and talk about the president and his bluster uh, and his gut feelings and what he says at the press conferences. But what he does policy wise is what matters most to markets. So on Friday, obviously, we saw the passage of the two trillion dollar stimulus package. And even though that might not be enough, it's something. It's a concrete plan for businesses, big and small. But what you said earlier is what matters most, that social distancing. Remember, the president said he had a feeling it would be beautiful if America could be open for business come Easter Sunday. But yesterday, what did he do? He didn't listen to his gut. He listened, he listened to the health experts. He listened to Anthony Fauci, who said, Mr. President, this isn't going to work. And now that President Trump has pushed that social distancing deadline to the end of the month, that is a positive for markets. Because even if you say, what do you mean, Stephanie? Businesses want to get up and running. They want to get up and running when it's safe to do so. It's much worse for business if we open prematurely and we don't curb the spread of this pandemic. If there's an outbreak even bigger, that would be terrible from a health perspective and a financial perspective. So they like to see the president listening to the experts. Steph, I know Johnson & Johnson's stock did pretty well today after breaking uh, some vaccine news. What can you tell us about that? Absolutely. We learned from Johnson & Johnson that they are getting closer on their vaccine. Come September, they're going to actually be able to do some human testing. And if that goes well, they could possibly get a vaccine by 2021. That's a huge positive. We saw not just Johnson & Johnson, but other names in that sector, because as you heard from the president in the last day or so, the FDA is working closely with pharmaceutical companies, not necessarily to cut corners, but to cut some red tape to try to move things mm -hmm. forward as fast as possible. And the market certainly likes that. So do individuals. All right, let's talk about the stimulus package, because there are a ton of questions about how it will make its way to big and to small businesses. And the banks have just been getting overwhelmed with calls from small business owners today trying to figure out how this all works. What can you tell us? OK, so let's walk you through this. There's this 350 billion dollar okay. package, small business loans. They're called the Paycheck Protection Program. The way it works, small businesses who have been impacted by corona in any way are eligible to get an eight week loan that if they keep all of their employees on, I'm talking 100 percent of their employees, then they will get that loan completely forgiven paid for. Now, if they already let those employees go, if they already had layoffs, well, then they're going to need to hire those people back. Let's say they only hire back 50%. Well, then they can get 50% forgiven and they'll have to pay back that other 50%, but it's a very long-term loan at a very low interest rate. So it's, it's a positive. Now, one of the reasons though mm -hmm. banks are overwhelmed I want you to just think about this. This is being run out of the Small Business Association Administration. They had 3,000 employees last year. They processed 58,000 loans. This year, we're talking an increase, $350 billion, and some large portion of the 30 million small businesses are going to be out there looking for a loan, especially if it's forgiven. So, of course, there's not that much information out there, so people are frantically calling their banks to get more information. But banks don't have all the answers. And legally, because of anti-money laundering laws and know your customer laws, banks aren't even allowed to service these loans for any business that's not an existing customer. So right now, whether you're talking people flooding these websites trying to file for unemployment or now small businesses flooding banks to try to get a handle on these loans, 
The, the bill has passed. The government has said there's $2 trillion to give out, but now there's a massive log jam with people trying to get it. Yes, yeah, Steph, uh, I live in a house uh, with a husband who runs a small business, and he spent a whole lot of time on that website yesterday. A lot of questions people have, and I know uh, a lot of phone calls will be coming in throughout the week. Uh, hey, the St. Louis Fed said today that we could see 47 million job losses because of coronavirus and unemployment somewhere around 32 percent. Those are some pretty scary projections. What should people think of that? Listen, these are big numbers. The St. Louis Fed predict, uh, yeah. according to their analysis, there are 66 million jobs that are that they think are at high risk of layoffs. These are production jobs, sales jobs, restaurant, food service jobs. Those are risky jobs. Then you've got 27 million that are called high touch job, meaning you're close to close, personal. I'm talking about barbers, hairstylists, personal trainers. There's a lot of jobs out there that are simply not possible or at best highly challenged the longer we keep social distancing in place. All right, Steph, I know we have some economic reports out this week that could impact the markets. March consumer confidence is coming up, unemployment claims, payroll data. What are the things that people should be looking out for? What are the biggies that could move the markets this week? All of these matter. Consumer confidence, jobs. Remember, okay. the thing that has been driving the markets over the last few years has been consumer confidence, business confidence, right? We have been spending. It's not that companies were earning more. We didn't see PE ratios jack up. What we saw was confidence. And right now, given the arrangements, people aren't out there spending. I would look at those numbers, but you've got to also pay attention to oil. Oil now dropping to $20 a barrel. We have not seen this in years. So on one hand, it's a positive for people out there getting gas. It's $2. There's even some states recording that they're seeing gas at a dollar. I mean, that's extraordinary. At different times in history, that's positive for the consumers. You say, well, get out there. Time to get in the right. car with your family and go to a theme park, head on vacation. But that's obviously not what's happening right now. And remember, we have more independent oil producers in the U.S. today than we ever have. So those second tier oil producers are simply getting crushed with oil prices this low. Steph Rule, we know you're working around the clock. Thanks so much for making the time to be with us from our home cam to yours. I hope you guys stay safe and well. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Well, Wednesday is the first of the month, and that means rent, mortgage payments, and a lot of bills are due. But what if you don't have the income to pay for them right now? Matt Schultz, Chief Credit Analyst at Lending Tree, joins me now. Matt, uh, great to have you here. Thanks so much. Uh, I know a lot of people Thank are you. really worried right now about not being able to pay their bills. So let's start with mortgage payments and rent. Obviously, people are worried about losing their homes if they can't make those payments. But also, they don't want to wreck their credit if they're paying late or delaying by months. What should they do? The, the most important thing for folks to do is to talk to their lender or their landlord and see what they can do. A lot of major lenders are offering to defer payments or, or sometimes reduce payments in the short term. As we all go through this crisis, it's turning everybody's financial lives upside down. It's, it's just so important that whatever payment we're talking about really the day to take action is today. There's no need to wait until you're right up upon those payment deadlines. So, Matt, let me ask you this, because I know credit cards are in particular your specialty. Uh, if you can't pay your bill on time or at all right now, what do you do? Because I know there you, you could be dealing with late fees, high interest. And again, people are worried about wrecking their credit. What can you call your credit card company and ask them for? You can ask them for a lot, frankly. If you call the 800 number on the back of your credit card, um, banks have these so-called hardship programs that kick in when there are hurricanes, earthquakes, and other disasters like that. And the coronavirus certainly applies. So in these sorts of cases, it's, it's a case-by-case -case basis. Your mileage may vary. But a lot of times, what will be offered up are things like short-term interest rate reductions 
waived late okay. fees and higher credit limits, and you might even be able to get a minimum payment reduced or sometimes even waived. What's the best approach on these phone calls? Because I think a lot of people might be thinking, uh, I've never had this kind of a problem before. I don't have a lot of debt. I'm, I've never thought of myself as someone who's in a hardship, but now I am. And I don't want these credit card companies to think I'm messing with them. How do you approach this in the best way? What should you be prepared to say and do? You really just need to be honest. It may it may require a little bit of pride swallowing, but these are really strange times and people need to do these sorts of things. They need to understand that the banks aren't going to come to you and give you these breaks. You need to call and ask them because nobody cares as much about your money and your credit as you do. So it's worth your time. Tell them your story. Tell them if you are unemployed or you've lost a bunch of client income or something like that, or if you're having a medical emergency related to this, tell them that, and that can get the conversation rolling. Matt, we know the first is Wednesday. So what if you can pay this Wednesday? You can make this month's payments, but this might be the very last month that you can cover. Is it too soon to make those calls now before your money runs out or should you get out ahead of it? You should absolutely get out ahead of it. Given how many people are going to be making these phone calls and how long you might end up being on hold and how long this process could take to kind of work through, the closer you get to the deadline of when that payment is due, the dicier it can be. So do yourself a favor. Ease up the stress on your own life and make that call today. Don't wait. Really stressful times for a lot of folks. Matt, you always have great advice, and I think what you said today really rings true. No one cares about your money or your credit more than you do. You have to ask. They won't ask you. Uh, Matt Schultz with Lending Tree, great to have you with us. Thanks so much. Thank you, Allison. Well, good afternoon, everybody. We, um, we, are now getting into the next phase of uh, not only our planning, uh, but to begin the process of actualizing those plans in real time. Uh, let me give people an update on where we are in the state of California. In particular, in the last four days, we have seen a doubling of the number of hospitalizations related to COVID-19. In the last four days, double the population that's been hospitalized. We've also seen a tripling of the number of ICU patients in our system in the last four days. Uh, these have long been projected based upon our modeling. Consequence, uh, we have for weeks now been organizing ourselves around a, th uh, a surge that will require roughly two-thirds increase in capacity within our hospital system. Uh, that requires three fundamental things. It requires finding new places uh, to put people, uh, number two requires having adequate supplies from PPEs to the ventilators. Uh, and importantly, number three requires people. And today we are announcing a new effort, uh, health, healthcore.ca.gov, healthcore.ca.gov, uh, that will provide a platform uh, to match individuals that may have retired in the last five years, may be in the process of getting licensed or relicensed, people that are in nursing schools or medical schools uh, that are nearing the completion of those efforts to incorporate and encourage them uh, to get on this platform to provide for the kind of human capital surge that we'll need uh, to meet the moment over the course of the next number of weeks as these numbers continue to rise. Uh, we couldn't be more pleased by the incredible professionalism of our nurses and doctors, our, our professional representatives uh, that came together across many uh, differences and organized uh, around a framework of providing more flexibility, more surge capacity within the system uh, by providing scope of practice reforms, by allowing us to utilize our existing resources in a more resourceful way. Uh, I want to thank all of the representatives for putting aside, again, those differences uh, and meeting this moment head on to provide the flexibility 
that is required uh, to meet this moment. Uh, we have an executive order that went out uh, that will provide flexibility through June 30th. This is temporary flexibility on staffing ratios, on scope of practice for nurse practitioners, EMTs, uh, and others. Uh, we are going out now uh, to deeply find the kind of talent, though, that is necessary beyond the scope of practice changes and beyond the regulatory changes and to make sure that we have the adequate workforce, uh, looking uh, for mental health experts, looking uh, for more EMTs, more pharmacists, uh, looking for more phlebotomists, looking for more experts in respiratory care and the like, technicians, administrators, doctors, nurses. Uh, we are calling on you uh, to step up and step in and meet this moment. Uh, we have more licensed healthcare professionals in the state of California than any state in the nation, some 766,000 uh, professionals in the state of California. But we estimate we have the capacity to increase our ranks by an additional 37,000 plus professionals that are in that time of life where they again may have just recently retired or they're in the process of getting their license and their degrees. And so we are very, very hopeful uh, with this effort uh, that we will see a surge of individuals to be paid and compensated uh, to participate in the workforce uh, and distributed uh, throughout our care delivery system all around the state of California. Uh, I will have uh, an individual and representative uh, here in a moment to talk more specifically about what that means and uh, also to remind everybody it's National Doctors Day uh, in the United States of America. And again, just deep respect and admiration uh, for all of our frontline employees uh, for meeting this moment. I also want to express deep respect and admiration uh, to Mark Zuckerberg uh, and Facebook, uh, well aware of the need to surge with our healthcare capacity. Uh, they are providing stipends for individuals that need transportation funding, uh, that need childcare support, uh, if they're going to participate in this workforce that uh, can get the kind of support uh, on things that otherwise we other wouldn't be paid for. Now, things not just like childcare uh, and transportation, things like hospital or rather hotel rooms and accommodations. So they put up $25 million and we're very grateful uh, to Facebook uh, for providing those stipends to help us in areas uh, where uh, we need a little bit extra support. Again, that's the spirit of California. That's the spirit of this moment. It's the spirit that's driving our resolve. Uh, driving that resolve as well uh, is the uh, aggregation of all of these physical assets that have taken place and shape over the course of the last few weeks. From the USNS Mercy uh, that now took their first patients just yesterday in Los Angeles uh, to the 2,000 rooms uh, that will be surging uh, from the support of the federal government, uh, these field, field medical uh, stations. We already uh, have our Santa Clara operation up and running. Uh, we have Riverside up and running. Uh, we have work being done in Los Angeles and San Mateo that will share some of that surge in San Francisco, part of the FMS uh, process. Again, already operationalized. Seton Hospital uh, already operationalized that we brought into the portfolio of assets here in the state. Uh, we've been talking over the weekend uh, to get St. Vincent, 366 beds in Los Angeles, fully staffed up as well. And we'll have some specific announcements on that in the next few days. Community Hospital down in Long Beach, uh, we're starting to see that uh, all take shape in real time. We have other hospitals we've identified in addition uh, to the FMS sites in the U.S. NS Mercy. Uh, we are also looking uh, to get some 1,000 skilled nursing facility units up and running, uh, and we have indeed uh, made real progress in other areas from Fairview and Porterville, uh, and now working with the Army Corps of Engineers that has now looked at 15 uh, high priority sites. They have got four more that they'll be looking out from the Sleep Train Center here in Sacramento uh, to Oakland Coliseum, to the LA Coliseum and other sites throughout the state of California, looking at those sites as potential surge sites, all part of the plan uh, to increase by 50,000 beds our available capacity uh, within our healthcare delivery system. Uh, we have distributed now some 32.6 million 
uh, N95 masks in the state of California. Uh, we have our sights on getting that 101 million uh, that we have locked up into the state and every couple of days, uh, more of that PPE comes in, not just N95 masks, but coveralls and shields and gowns and gloves, uh, glove sets and the like. And so as soon as we get them in, we get them out. Uh, yesterday, uh, we were getting in uh, a number of ventilators uh, into Bloom Energy for refurbishing and reconfiguration. I'm very pleased the 150 that came from LA as part of the national stockpile, all of those have been completed and are done and are being sent back out into LA County. And I just want to encourage folks, if you have a, a line on ventilators, um, it doesn't matter if they're brand new, uh, maybe you have a few pieces lying around your basement or the house. Uh, I don't mean to be flip uh, here or flippant. Uh, we'll take them. Uh, we've got the folks here in Silicon Valley uh, that can do miracles uh, with old equipment and refurbish that equipment. Uh, I just mentioned a few days ago uh, that our community college system, uh, they found 192 ventilators, not all of them in perfect shape. Some of them used for, uh, for training and the like, but we'll take whatever we can get. We currently have uh, 4,252 ventilators that we've locked down. Our goal is to get to 10,000 uh, ventilators. We're looking to procure new ones from around the globe, um, and we're hopeful that the federal government can assist us beyond the 170 that came into LA County. But if they don't, uh, we'll be as resourceful as we possibly can. So on the physical asset side, that surge of 50,000 beds, uh, we're making real progress. On PPE and lining up and identifying uh, those needs, we're making uh, progress, but still more needs to be done. Uh, but as it relates to personnel and people, nothing more valuable uh, and nothing more potent uh, to meet this moment. And so if you're a, a nursing school student or medical school student, uh, uh, we need you. Uh, if you've just retired in the last few years, we need you. Uh, if you are looking to expand your scope of practice and have particular expertise in any particular capacity, uh, we need you and we encourage you to take a look at that healthcore.ca.gov website, five simple steps. Uh, we'll ask you basic questions and we'll help you with your relicensing. We'll help you uh, with the protocols and processes uh, to get you up and running uh, and get you out the door uh, so that you can support uh, the needs of people of the state of California uh, all throughout our state. Uh, we've seen an increase, a modest 8.3% in terms of the total number of positives last night, 5,763 total uh, COVID-19 positives in the state of California. But it's those hospitalization numbers, it's those ICU numbers uh, that we are most focused on. And again, those numbers are starting uh, to go back up again along the lines of our model. So the next few weeks are going to be critical in the state of California. In the next few weeks, uh, we're going to do more to flex and to surge uh, and uh, do more uh, to together uh, to meet this moment. And before I turn it over uh, to the doctor, I, I want to just remind people of how they can meet this moment. Um, all of you that uh, have the capacity uh, to contribute can contribute uh, most significantly by practicing physical distancing, by continuing the good work that we've done in this state, including over this weekend. We had to shut down all 280 parking lots uh, in our state parks system. We saw a reduction in the kind of surge of activity in our parks and on our beaches compared to the previous weekend, but we want you to continue to do that. There's nothing more potent and powerful in terms of meeting this moment than practicing uh, that physical distancing. Socially connected, let's be resourceful uh, in addressing the needs of others. Uh, and I couldn't be more proud of our partnership with Nextdoor and the volunteers, some 8 million people they were able to connect with to check in on our seniors, to check in on people that are struggling with social isolation uh, and may need uh, not just food and medicine, but also may need a person to call, just check in and see how they're doing. So nothing more important for individuals if they want to contribute in this moment, they continue to do the incredible work you have done uh, in the nation's largest state to practice uh, physical distancing. Uh, number two, I uh, just want to remind people uh, that if you know anybody in the medical uh, profession, if you know people uh, that you think are willing to contribute uh, their time and energy in a compensated way to go to this new website so we can meet the healthcare surge as well. Uh, so partners, uh, well, cross the spectrum, private sector, 
Facebook, the public sector, uh, with the incredible contributions of nonprofits and civic minded individuals, uh, will continue uh, to row in the same direction, continue to meet this moment uh, as we have in the state of California. Uh, in addition, uh, and happy to answer questions, uh, we are significantly increasing our efforts on homelessness. I'm happy to go into details uh, around that, but I want to now turn it over uh, to Dr. Constant, uh, who has been part of our partnership uh, with the California Medical Association, uh, working uh, across the spectrum of healthcare professionals uh, that helped us with guidance uh, and was willing to, again, work with us to create the flexibility and to create the kind of licensing reforms uh, that temporarily are needed to meet this moment. And I just want to thank Dr. Uh, Constant uh, for that effort and her energy and ask her to come to the podium and talk a little bit about uh, a little bit more about what we're looking for uh, on the medical side for this search. Doctor. Thank you. First, I wanted to take this moment to thank Governor Newsom and California's public health leaders for the swift action that they've had in terms of our physical distancing and our sheltering in place, because it is really helping the healthcare team. It's helping us, uh, the time has really been crucial to help us learn about this new virus as healthcare providers, how best to treat it, and how to create the systems of care so that we're there and ready for the sickest when they need us. Today is National Doctors Day, and I want to first extend my heartfelt gratitude to all my physician colleagues, as well as everyone in the healthcare world taking care of our patients for your vital service at this time for both our patients and our communities. This crisis is already impacting thousands of physicians uh, across California, not just those who are directly taking care of COVID-19 patients, but also the thousands of others whose practices have been forced to close over the past several weeks. But even amidst, amidst this uncertainty and personal hardship, over 500 physicians have reached out to the California Medical Association to ask, how can they help during this time? Either directly treating the sickest patients or stepping in to help fill in the gaps for the people that are taking care of our sickest patients. In fact, all members of our healthcare team are showing tremendous courage and bravery, continuing to treat patients even though they worry about the personal protection equipment that they need to keep them safe. I am very grateful to Governor Newsom for his intense focus on delivering the personal protective equipment to our workers who are on the front lines of this pandemic to ensure that California is doing everything that they can to protect our physicians, our nurses, and all members of the healthcare team. Many of us were drawn to careers in medicine because of the opportunity to truly help others. This is the work that we've been called to do. Now is our time. We're asking all medical professionals, physicians, nurses, physician assistants, and all members of the healthcare team to join us to take care of Californians through this surge. For many of us, that means stepping outside of our comfort zone and leaning into our inner strength. We're calling on the spirit of all healthcare workers across California to step up and help to serve the patients of our state. I've been humbled and deeply moved by the many stories of the physicians and others whose tr true selflessness has really led with compassion and heartwarming, caring solidarity through this. I know we're gonna hear many, many, many more stories of this true humanity in the weeks to come. So thank you to all of you who've already worked long hours and who will continue to work tire tirelessly to help our patients. We truly appreciate you and thank you in advance for your continued courage and your service. And please reach out to the healthcare, or sorry, healthcore.ca.gov to sign up to be here for our patients and our communities. Thank you. Thank you, doctor. We're all struggling with the healthcore.ca.gov uh, site, but we just got it up and, and operationalized it. Look, I want to just make this point. I'm very proud. You know, California, 
has some of the, well, in fact, the highest standards uh, of personal protection. Uh, long champion uh, by the Medical Association, long champion by the California Nurses Association uh, in terms of ratios, in terms of protective gear. Uh, and those are things that we are very, very proud of. Uh, and I recognize at this moment uh, of anxiety, in order to meet this moment, we've got to temporarily suspend some components uh, of some of the licensing and scope of practice uh, as it relates to meeting the care needs uh, of those Californians. And so it, it took a lot uh, for those organizations uh, to uh, participate and step up, and I want to just thank them uh, personally on behalf of millions of Californians. We're very grateful for your willingness to do so at this moment. And again, uh, I'll remind you, this is temporary. This is not permanent. Uh, no games are being played, uh, and we have deep admiration and respect for all of you and deep gratitude uh, that you're willing to work with us uh, to meet this moment. Uh, so with that, um, broad strokes, uh, that's uh, the call to action today to all California healthcare professionals uh, to help participate and go on this site. Uh, and we look forward uh, to any questions uh, that anyone may have as well. Katie Orr, KQED. Uh, Governor, um, we understand that the California Department of Health won't release the total number of hospitalizations uh, county by county. Um, is that a number that you have? Do you have the statewide number of hospitalizations? And if so, will you make that more publicly available given how useful it is to track the disease? Yeah, it's well, it's 1,432, as I said. Uh, that number substantially higher than the first number we gave you a couple days ago, which was 746. As a consequence, roughly doubled uh, in four days. Uh, and we'll provide more information on that as needed. The number of ICU beds today is at 597. You may recall four days ago it was at 200. So can't be more precise than that. Uh, we have a 19.9 percent increase overnight in the ICU uh, bed capacity and a 14.3 percent overnight increase in the hospitalization uh, capacity. As it relates to your very specific uh, uh, component of question, as it relates to the county level, uh, we will provide that information. I'll make sure you get it. Carla Marinucci, Politico. Hi, Governor. Thanks for doing this. I, I, I've got a two-part question. I hope that's okay. Um, on the first one, we're, we're two weeks into the Bay Area shelter-in-place orders, and, uh, you know, California as a whole is faring better than uh, a couple of other states, New York, New Jersey, Louisiana. Just your thoughts. Do you think that those orders have flattened the curve in the Bay Area, as some UCSF doctors suggested over the weekend? And, and my second question is on the school closures. We're three weeks into those, and some of the schools are providing instruction in different ways. Some are giving video classroom lessons. Others are pointing families to websites with worksheets. Does the state need to do more than just provide guidelines? And, you know, what do you think of the situations in which districts and teachers are engaged in disputes? So I hope that's okay, but two-part question. Thanks. Let me, uh, let me talk about the schools. At 2 o'clock today, all 58 county superintendents are getting on the phone and we'll have more detailed information to provide you uh, after that conference call that goes deep into the issue not only of distance learning uh, but special education uh, and the issue related uh, to food distribution. So that's the agenda today and then a very sober conversation we're going to have about the expectations for the remainder of the school year. But the answer to your question is yes. We need to do more, uh, and let me fill in the blanks based on the details uh, that come out of that call uh, this afternoon. Uh, and by the way, on Thursday, we have another webinar specifically related to distance learning for special uh, needs uh, kids as well, which only reinforces uh, my uh, affirmation uh, that, yes, we need to do more, uh, and we are trying to do that in real time. Uh, as it relates to the bending of the curve, um, I I'm not going to, you know, we're in the middle of this. And uh, I think it would be too easy for us uh, to assert uh, a belief uh, at this moment about what has or has not worked, except to say this, we know what does work, and that's physical distancing. And we believe very strongly the stay-at-home order uh, has uh, helped advance our efforts in reducing uh, the stress on the system that we believe would have already materialized in more acute ways had we not advanced those protocols when we did. 
we have not been sitting around over the last uh, week or two. Uh, we have been preparing over the last week or two, and that stay-at-home order has advanced uh, that effort. It's bought us time to prepare. But I want to make this point. I made it from the outset. Uh, when you see a tripling of the ICU uh, beds, when you see a doubling of hospitalizations just over a four-day period, uh, that's a point of not just consideration. It's a point uh, of, of, of obvious uh, concern as it relates to our ability to meet not only uh, the physical needs uh, of that surge, but the personal protective equipment that is required of it, and obviously the human capital that we're speaking of today. And so uh, I don't want to say uh, that it's worked, but I will say uh, I think it's, we have benefited uh, in terms of our capacity to prepare, uh, but we're very sober about what uh, these trend lines uh, are looking to, uh, looking or at least instructing uh, over the next couple of weeks. Governor, you mentioned you wanted to increase the, the number of medical workers by about 37,000. Uh, that just seems like a really large logistical challenge. I'm wondering how the state can go about uh, doing that in a short amount of time. And, and do you know where they would go? Would they go to field hospitals or existing hospitals or both? No, and thank you for the opportunity to clarify. That's just the universe of individuals that are retired or in active licenses that we project. Uh, are out there. So that's not the number that we're trying to bring in. That's the universe uh, that we're trying to call from. Uh, so we're looking for thousands and thousands of individuals. And again, it depends on the expertise. Uh, it depends on the specific skill set. And we're parsing those out throughout the system, working very collaboratively uh, with our entire hospital uh, system, as well as our skilled nursing facilities, our assisted living, congregate facilities, and the like. It's all part of this larger uh, system. And so uh, we're scoping uh, a universe of 37,000, uh, and those will break down in real time, and it's geographic, it's system by system, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's capacity that we're looking for, let me be specific, uh, when we open up the sleep train center. Uh, it's a capacity we're looking for when we open up these vehicle uh, field medical stations. Uh, that capacity differentiates itself on needs. In Riverside, they may have certain needs. Santa Clara County has different needs. Uh, counties can absorb more in these more resourced parts of the state. They can absorb less, so we have to supplement that in other parts of the state. So it's an interim process, uh, but the universe is 37,000 uh, and thousands is the number that we hope in very real terms uh, in short order uh, will present themselves and we can start making those matches. Rachel Swan, SF Chronicle. Hi, uh, Governor. I just wanted to clarify again about this 37,000. Would um, the, the nursing students you mentioned, would they be granted provisional licenses to practice? And then what would happen after the pandemic is over? Would they go back to school or what would happen? Yeah, let me ask Dr. Galley to come up. We can talk specifically about that. Sure. So our goal is to recruit both retired and active folks, people who have part-time uh, roles now who can increase their hours. And to your specific question about students, uh, depending on where they are in their training, we're obviously looking to people who were near graduation and uh, fulfilling their degrees. So many are not able to finish those last few months because schools are out because of the COVID-19 response. So who better than those folks who are really close to being done to bring into the workforce now, essentially continue their clinical training with the support of experienced nurses or other health professionals that are in the same line of work that they will be and invite them into the work. And depending on where they were and how many months they are surging, we will have to work with our um, licensing boards to determine whether they've completed enough of their training to get fully licensed on an ongoing basis or whether they need to return back to the classroom and their clinical rotations to finish up and get their license uh, down the road. Next question. Angela Hart, Kaiser Health News. Hey, Governor, thank you for taking our questions. Um, we wanted to ask, so looking at your projections and the modeling that you all have done, um, when do they indicate that the state could be reaching um, the capacity in terms of the hospital beds needed? 
Um, when could they be overwhelmed? Uh, roughly, if you can't provide a specific date, when roughly would that happen? Um, and then just one more thing to tail on the end of that is um, we're wondering if you're, if the, the state's plans to expand capacity are being done in addition to what individual hospitals and hospital systems might be doing, or is it or is it spearheading the, the, the across-the-board response? Just on that, we are working hand-in-glove uh, within the system. I'll remind you. Uh, roughly 75,000 licensed beds in the state of California. Uh, we requested uh, a surge of the system, 50,000 beds, 30,000 of those uh, requirement within the hospital system themselves, which represents roughly a 40% surge. Uh, and so that's actively being advanced within the hospital system itself. We are required for the additional uh, 20,000 to go out uh, and access and resource additional capacity. As I said, USNS Mercy is part of that. Uh, all of these field medical stations are part of that. And all of uh, these other hospitals that we're bringing online, Fairview, Porterville, and these other assets that I referred to that the Army Corps of Engineers and others are looking towards are part of those 20,000. So that's an integrated strategy uh, within and externally uh, outside of that system, but all being coordinated uh, through the folks here at the State Operations Center. Uh, as it relates to your other part of the question of when we're seeing peak, uh, that's determined on the basis of our personal behavior, that's determined on the basis of abiding by the stay-at-home order, making sure essential versus non-essential uh, business is being uh, conducted, uh, and on the basis of our modeling and projections uh, over the last uh, weeks, not just those four-day period that I gave you as a snapshot. I can just say this without getting into uh, the specifics and showing you a chart of a worst-case scenario or a best-case scenario and having people run with those things, uh, that over the course of the next few weeks, uh, we are very confident uh, that in the aggregate, and that's a distinction, in the aggregate, uh, that we will be able to resource the needs both physically uh, and if we're successful with the health core.ca.gov efforts with the human resources. In addition, though, I continue to make the case that PPE and the supply side of this uh, continues to be a challenge. And despite the 32.6 million N95 masks uh, we put out, tens of millions have already been requested of the state uh, throughout our system and beyond the system. As you know, uh, this is a huge issue for our grocers, a big issue for uh, those that deliver the groceries, uh, and many others that are also looking for personal protective gear uh, as well. So we need more work there, resource uh, on the health and human service side. Uh, but over the course of the next few weeks, I have some confidence in our capacity to meet the moment. Dr. Galley uh, can help fill in and amplify or uh, redirect consideration uh, to what I may have just said. Governor, uh, you hit it right on the nose. I think at the moment, uh, the modeling that we show and where we are with our projections and actuals is that our current uh, efforts around surge meet the moment and that we're able to take care of anybody who needs a hospital bed today, anyone who needs a ICU bed or needs a ventilator, and our efforts to increase staff increased beds, increased supplies are on track to continue to meet that for weeks to come. And just to reiterate what the governor said, that as we continue our physical distancing efforts, that those are going to help us change what those curves and lines look like. So to continue supporting our neighbors and our communities to do that well is of utmost importance. And I, I know it's an old mantra, decisions, not conditions, determine our fate and future. Decisions not conditions. So I, I don't live on the basis of economic forecasts any more than healthcare forecasts. I live on the basis of our capacity to bend curves, to change uh, expectations by changing behavior. And that's why what Dr. Galley said is, is so foundational, so incredibly important. The power and potency we have as individuals to radically change these projections. 
that resides in each and every one of us, in each and every decision we make each and every day. Uh, and that social pressure we're seeing out there for people to do the right thing uh, is the most powerful enforcement tool we have. And we'll continue to use that uh, as our moral authority is advanced all throughout the state of California. And to the extent we have to exercise our formal authority as it relates to licensing uh, and business revocation because people abuse it uh, in law enforcement, we will. Uh, but again, I, I'm just incredibly blessed and pleased to live in a state where so many people get it and increasingly are getting it done. Next question, please. Karen Luna, Los Angeles Times. Hi, Governor. I have a two-part question. So one is based on your community surveillance testing and your modeling that you've done today, how many people do you think are infected with the virus in California? And then the second part kind of adds on to what Angela asked, but I'm curious why um, you're reluctant to give a peak date and why Californians shouldn't know kind of the, the date that the administration is working off of right now. Well, because first of all, just on that, it's a dynamic uh, model and it radically is different, I can assure you, than it was just four or five days ago. Um, and if we had a model that I can more confidently say, based on all of these conditions and everything being static, uh, then we would provide it to you. But I, I can assure you uh, we are running those models in real time. And remember, these models aren't just on the basis of current infection rates or the community surveillance and the testing. It's also on the base, basis of movement. Uh, it's a base of all these inputs. We mentioned this a few weeks ago, uh, working with Esri, uh, working with Blue Dot, working with Facebook, Apple, and others. Uh, we have our modeling uh, that is done on a daily basis based upon these patterns, as well as patterns across the rest of the country and around the rest of the world. Uh, more specifically, though, Dr. Galley can fill in a little bit more in terms of making sure that you're satisfied uh, that uh, we are providing uh, that information in real time and give you a sense of preview of our thinking as it relates to making more public uh, those best and worst case scenarios. Sure, I'll, I'll come back to the a number that the governor uses frequently, which is our 50,000 additional beds. That number is based on the model. So we are preparing it. We call it our phase one number. Um, because we know that depending on how we perform with our physical distancing efforts across the state, that that number is tracked towards an expectation that we meet this moment with physical distancing, and that's what we're going to need based on our models. We project that we will need that towards the second half of the month of May, so we are very busy trying to build towards that. That includes at least an additional 10,000 beds in an ICU setting with ventilators to be able to support that number of patients. So those are the numbers we are certainly working towards. Um, it does not mention the total number of people who are infected or who test positive because that is highly dependent on our increasing work to bring on testing. But the um, lives and people in emergency rooms and hospital beds and in ICUs requiring ventilation support do not lie. We have good intel into those numbers on a daily basis with all of our healthcare partners. And we believe that will continue to guide us on this road that we've been on towards that middle of May target. And we are constantly reassessing, as the governor has said. These numbers are very dynamic. We know that every single day we get additional information about what the actuals are that help us adjust that model. And we hope, because of our great performance here in California with physical distancing, that we will continue to tell positive stories of where that's going. That said, we continue to prepare for a situation where we'll need at least 50,000 beds. And if we need to adjust that and say we need more down the road, I'm confident. Um, and the governor will be communicating that to all of you in real time. I should just note on, on the modeling. Uh, one of the areas that is also dynamic is not just on the surge modeling, but the slack uh, of the system within the system, meaning uh, the hospitals have done a magnificent job 
as it relates to reducing the number of elected surgeries and reducing uh, the total census within the hospital system uh, to a degree that, candidly, in our original models, we did not anticipate. Uh, it just goes to the incredible capacity within this system uh, to prepare uh, for this moment. And so, as a consequence on the surge, that slack, that number, phase one, still remains around 50,000, despite all the other uh, changing conditions in and around uh, our modeling. Uh, hi, Governor. Um, thanks for taking questions. Um, can you more explicitly explain how far the executive order goes in terms of suspending the rules? Um, what exactly are you waiving with respect to staffing ratios and scope of practice? Good. I'll let Dr. Galley, who helped prepare it, answer that in more detail. So essentially, we um, uh, on two fronts, uh, I'll mention it does mention the ratios and allows us to work with our facilities and our labor partners to um, move beyond our current ratios, whether that's for nurses or other staff uh, positions, so that we can meet the demand in our surge facilities and existing hospitals. So it is not specifically outlined to, to the number, but it does give us the flexibility and room to work within reasonable uh, measures with the current or the uh, uh, conditions we expect. In regards to who we are inviting back into the workforce or accelerating them into the workforce, there are a number of things that have to do with who can get licensed, how they can reinstate their license, and being flexible and waiving some of those tried and true conditions that allow us to, for example, somebody who's been out of the work, workforce for just under five years or five years and less to allow them to come in immediately to meet the surge demand on health workforce. So it's both in the areas of uh, staffing ratios as well as allowing individuals to come into the workforce that are currently not there but do have the capability of being licensed very quickly. Hi, Governor. Thanks for taking questions. I um, wanted to see if there were any updates on numbers for testing kits um, as far as how many are available to the state for those testing for COVID-19 how many are needed, and what the backlog is for pending tests right now? Well, the biggest backlog is, is swabs. It's now the principal uh, limiting factor of our ability to increase tests throughout the state of California. Uh, swabs, as well as the media to transport the swabs. Uh, we continue to need, though this becomes less of uh, a restrictive reality, uh, the reagents, the RNA extraction kits, but for some of the other pro older protocols, old by standards of days, not just uh, weeks, uh, we obviously see uh, the need for more uh, of those reagents and RNA extraction. Uh, that said, the new throughput uh, technology that's coming on, uh, all of the announcements you've heard in the last uh, 24, 48 hours, including this morning. Uh, there is not a company that has been referenced either by your own reporting or someone else's that hasn't been in contact with us that we're not in contact with. Uh, but I want to caution folks on this. The scale ability of some of these promoted testing protocols, 10 minute home test, 45 minutes, whatever it is, the scalability uh, is not there as advertised. And I say this because we're practitioners of this. We have the resources and we're deeply engaged with these companies. Uh, they have many uh, uh, parts, but they are missing some others in order to adopt uh, and strategize the kind of scale uh, that is being promoted and people are demanding and deserving of. The answer to your question is we need exponentially more testing throughout the state of California. Uh, and we've been looking at advanced conversations uh, on looking at blood-based tests, looking at the antibody frame, uh, which is all part of our strategy to get people back uh, and move uh, from uh, dealing with this crisis head on to coming back into some semblance of normalcy. Uh, and those protocols and those processes, those negotiations are happening in real time. I mentioned just yesterday, we were down or day before at Bloom Energy, right next door to us was one of the, uh, a, a well-known, at least well-discussed 
uh, company in that space. Uh, they're a California-based company. We're engaging them along with many, many others. I don't know if, Doctor, you want to amplify this a little bit more, but uh, this is uh, in real time 90% of what I think Dr. Galley is doing. <laughs> that is the case. Um, we are working with uh, just about every testing entity that we can uh, reach out to to figure out what they can provide California. We know that it's not going to be a single solution, as the governor said. There's not one company or one strategy that's going to make a difference. We continue to work on the PCR tests, which are the ones that uh, I think many people are familiar with, and now moving into the serologic testing zone to allow us to bring on another modality to, to meet our testing needs across the state. We continue to work very hard to make sure that people on the front lines, our healthcare workforce, our first responders, get the testing they need to feel safe and confident that they can be with their families and continue to work. And additionally, that we get patients in the hospital who we aren't sure if they are COVID-19 positive, but we suspect they are based on their symptoms, the test so that we can take care of them in the safest, most efficient way. So all of those priorities notwithstanding, we continue to grow our testing capacity, both that that's sponsored and supported by the state, but those efforts that are happening locally, county by county, system by system. And we're here to fill in those gaps, supporting those systems to be able to scale on their own so that together the local story with the state story lifts up an enormous amount of testing available to all Californians so that our projections can be validated and we can look into the future with a little bit more information. And, and just to provide a little bit more information, it's not just um, the specimen samples, it's not just the diagnostics, it's, it's how long a diagnostic process is taking. The number of pending tests out there uh, is extraordinarily frustrating because of the delay in getting that information back uh, into the system, uh, into the patient's uh, uh, inbox. And so tens of thousands of tests have been conducted, uh, but we do not have the results yet. And that's the number of PUIs that we reference, people under uh, investigation within the hospital system, in our ICUs that we have uh, made public over the course of the last few days and will continue to make public, but also more broadly, uh, men and women that are watching uh, first line uh, first responders and frontline employees uh, that deserve to know those test results. You're hearing six, seven, eight. I heard example of 12 days, one case, to get those test results. We need to see that improved as well. Final question, Elizabeth Aguilera, Cal Matters. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask just a, if I could do a two-part question. Um, the first question is, you know, their health course site that you're talking about uh, says that this is going to be paid for and that, that physicians or other healthcare professionals who sign up will be paid, malpractice insurance will be covered. Can you discuss if the state's going to be covering that, if the entity that you send folks to is covering that, and what is the estimated cost or the budget line for that, at least now, not knowing who or how many people might sign up? And then on the second question, maybe for Dr. Galley, is can you be more specific regarding changes to scope of practice, especially regarding nurse practitioners and physician's assistants, because other states have been giving independent to those professionals and there's also been discussion you know in the legislature for several years regarding that as well yeah well we're providing the temporary flex in that space through june 30th uh, and those conversations we're all intimately familiar with in the state of California, particularly with our nurse practitioners. Uh, but this order does provide that flex through June 30th. Let me uh, speak about the costs. The costs are being borne in a myriad of ways within the system, by the state, uh, as well as the federal government. FEMA and their reimbursement processes, obviously the federal support that we're receiving uh, will help us with those efforts. Uh, the cost uh, though we will address uh, and is being processed in real time. And uh, I can assure you cost is not uh, the issue from my humble perspective. We are always mindful of costs and we do not believe in waste or abuse. And by the way, let me talk about abuse when it comes to procuring PPE. The scams out there are real. Uh, people are being investigated, not just for price, price gouging, uh, but uh, investigated by FBI and others. And I just caution 
uh, individuals. Again, this is a time individually, not just uh, for large institutions like states and hospital systems to be very, very wary of uh, people that overpromise and don't deliver at all, let alone under deliver, uh, and people that are scamming uh, individuals at the moment. But we uh, are not in that, uh, that business, and we will provide appropriate compensation uh, for individuals, and that comes through the traditional system uh, that provides those support, be it the Medicaid system, Medi-Cal in California, Medicare, uh, myriad of other supports that come through the federal government as well as the state government. And Dr. Galley, perhaps you want to amplify on the nurse practitioners, but I think uh, that question was answered June 30th, temporary, uh, and ra ratios uh, along the same lines as well. Yeah, the only thing I would amplify is that we, we set dates around this and we are always looking at whether those are the right days, dates ba based on the conditions on the ground. And as the governor said, this is not, uh, there is no effort here to extend beyond our surge need any of these flexes or rule changes because we are sensitive to the ongoing conversations with a number of people who are here with us now and haven't been as much in, in recent days, that these are decisions that Californians take very seriously, that we work hand in glove with our legislators and our uh, trade organizations to, to make in this unique situation where we are prepared to meet the needs of thousands of Californians, tens and thousands of Californians needs this now, and we will be looking at it over the weeks and months to come. Thank you. Um, so th that, uh, that concludes uh, this conversation. We look forward to uh, many more in the next couple of days. Let me just uh, make one closing statement. I just want to thank our partners at the county level uh, and the city level, Daryl Steinberg, among many others, uh, Mayor Licardo uh, and Mayor Garcetti, uh, Mayor Libby Schaff, I can continue, uh, Mayor uh, London Breed, others that uh, have been active in trying to get resourced uh, through the state's uh, procurement of hotel rooms for homeless individuals. We're up to uh, over 5,000 hotel rooms now that are available uh, at the county level, at the city level. We recognize we need to do a lot more, some 5,491 uh, rooms to be precise. Uh, we're getting those trailers out, uh, but we don't want to get them out until we have the support services uh, overlaid. We'll be meeting with CSAC on the phone uh, uh, teleconference today to talk more our counties uh, about how they can continue to support uh, the most vulnerable Californians out on the streets and sidewalks. Again, top priority for us, and we recognize we have a lot more work to do in that space as well. I'll just close by reminding everybody at home, we also have a lot more work to do to continue uh, as patiently as we can uh, to extend the stay-at-home order and recognize that, you know, if you've ever, you know, gone skydiving, the worst thing a human being can do is cut the parachute uh, when you're not even close to the ground. We're not yet close to the ground, so let us not run that 90-yard dash. Let's continue to follow through on the incredible work that's been done and the commitment that we all have to meet this moment head on. Take care, everybody. Hey everyone, I'm Allison Mars. You are watching NBC News Now. Welcome to my home studio. Let's go over to NBC News Now correspondent Alexa Liotto. She has the latest coronavirus headlines from NBCNews.com. Hey, Allison. Lots of developments this evening. California has seen the number of hospitalizations double in the last four days and the number of patients admitted to the ICU triple as a result of COVID-19. California Governor Gavin Newsom calling on medical professionals to volunteer to help with the crisis. Virginia Governor Ralph Northam issued a stay-at-home order today impacting 8.5 million residents similar to other states. Virginia residents are allowed to leave their homes for essential trips only, like going to the pharmacy see the uh, grocery store or for exercise. That's from NBC's Alicia Fieldstat. And Maryland also issuing a stay-at-home order for all residents today, adding that any person who has traveled outside of the state in recent weeks should self-quarantine for 14 days. Some workers at Amazon's Fulfillment Center in Staten Island walked out in protest today over the company's handling of the coronavirus pandemic. I'm doing this because of my health and my fellow workers' health as well. It should be closed down. It should be cleaned properly. 
Amazon told WNBC's Miles Miller of the more than 5,000 employees working at the Staten Island warehouse, 15 people, less than half a percent, participated in the walkout. They also said that the company has, quote, taken extreme measures to keep people safe. They say that includes, quote, tripling down on cleaning and procuring safety supplies as well. Some grim numbers from NBC's Yulia Tomazan and Hernan Munoz Rato, Spain, officially surpassed China in terms of the total number of reported coronavirus infections. Spain's health ministry on Monday reporting just over 85,000 total cases, higher than China's reported total, which currently stands at 81,470. And just as a reminder for viewers, the United States has the most confirmed coronavirus cases of any country worldwide, with more than 140,000. That's according to the latest NBC News count. From NBC's Courtney QB, the Pentagon is instructing commanders at American mili military installations, both domestic and abroad, to stop providing specific numbers on COVID-19 cases to the media and to the public. A spokesman for the Pentagon cited operational security concerns and said they'd be providing numbers for each service, but not base-specific information, saying they didn't want this information to fall into the wrong hands. And finally, in Pittsburgh, hundreds of people in cars lining up to get support from a Pittsburgh Pittsburgh Food Bank this morning. The drive through was organized by the Greater Pittsburgh Community Food Bank, and so many cars lined up, you just see there, that traffic had to be restricted. Allison, that's the latest developing news for now. Back to you. Incredible work by the uh, Greater Pittsburgh Food Bank. Used to live there, know the group very well. They do great things. Thank you so much. And you can visit you our live ahead. blog at NBCNews.com slash coronavirus for more updates anytime. A field hospital is being set up right now in the middle of New York's Central Park. NBC News correspondent Gabe Gutierrez has been following the progress there all day long. Allison, this is a bit of a surreal sight in the iconic Central Park. And a field hospital is being built right now. It's expected to open tomorrow and bring 68 hospital beds, much needed hospital beds, as New York continues to battle the pandemic. Now, take a look right there. Uh, those are some of the beds that are being constructed, as well as critical ventilators, which New York authorities say they desperately need. Now, for days, Mayor Bill de Blasio and Governor Cuomo have said that the need for ventilators is increasing. You can see behind me Samaritan's Purse, which is the charitable organization that is building this field hospital across the street from Mount Sinai Hospital. That is one of the uh, medical facilities in the hospital system that say that they expect to be overwhelmed. Now, this field hospital will take in patients not just from this hospital across the street, but also from Mount Sinai West on the city's west side. Now, other hospitals, especially in Brooklyn and the Bronx, have been overwhelmed over the past couple of days, Allison, and doctors and nurses have been saying that they expect a huge and even bigger influx of patients over the next several days and weeks. You can see some of the supplies that have been brought here as well. Personal protective equipment, PPE, also necessary over the coming days. But Allison, 68 beds here in this emergency field hospital, that is just a small fraction of what local authorities say will be needed. Uh, they expect the apex of this pandemic over the next uh, couple of weeks. Again, just 68 beds here, but the USNS Comfort also docking here in New York Harbor. That'll add another 1,000 beds, overflow uh, space, as well as eight other makeshift hospitals being built throughout the region. Doctors and nurses here are preparing, again, this emergency field hospital being built right here in Central Park, expected to open tomorrow. Allison. FEMA is sending 60 ambulances to New York City today to help the city deal with a record-breaking five-day spike in 911 medical emergency calls and dozens more ambulances on the way. NBC News Investigations correspondent Tom Winter joins me now. And Tom, New York topped 1,000 coronavirus deaths today. What's the latest on the cases here? Yeah, the latest on the cases, Allison, is that uh, primarily this is being driven by New York City numbers, and they're not very good. We're now into the upper 700s in deaths. Uh, that was as of 10 a.m., the 10 a.m. update this morning. So obviously, we expect that number uh, to have gone higher. We were kind of averaging 60 to 80 deaths a day in the last couple of days. Now, we've, we've gotten over 100 deaths a day. Uh, so that's obviously difficult news. Now, there's no good news whenever we talk about deaths, of course. Uh, one thing that we are seeing, though, is a consistent trend 
as far as the statistics, as far as who's getting this and who's dying from it. Uh, so right now, there's no unexpected surprises. That's allowing, obviously, first responders and healthcare workers uh, to focus their attention on the right groups of people. Um, predominantly, we've seen uh, almost 50 percent of the deaths be people 75 years of age or older. Uh, and on top of that, uh, a number of the deaths, uh, with the exception of a rare few, uh, have involved people that did not have underlying conditions. So it's mostly those people, those underlying illnesses uh, in folks that are older that are really being hit hard by this, Allison. Tom, we do know New York City reported its first death of a minor. What do you know mm. about that particular case? Yeah, so the, the details are a little bit uh, sparse. Now, because of the HIPAA, uh, which is the Patients' Privacy Act, uh, we're not getting a lot of information uh, on any of the victims of, uh, of the coronavirus uh, because they're protected by law, uh, unless people come and speak with us about it. But the one thing we do know about, I talked about those underlying illnesses, Alice, and we know that this minor mm -hmm. uh, had underlying illness. Uh, and so what is that defined as? Uh, that might be somebody who has, a, has kidney or liver issues. That might be somebody who has uh, an issue with diabetes may already have some sort of a, uh, a lung issue. Um, so I'm speaking about emphysema. I'm speaking about somebody who might be a, a heavy smoker and has had issues with their lungs in the past, and of course, any heart difficulties. So uh, it just depends um, on the particular individual. But uh, like I said, I think it's right now, we're only 13 cases or only 13 deaths in New York City where somebody didn't have one of those underlying illnesses. Uh, and with that uh, minor child, uh, that's the exact same situation there. There was an underlying illness, uh, according to the city's health department. Tom, yesterday the president suggested that masks at a New York hospital were mm. going out the back door. How's New York Governor Andrew Cuomo responding to that? Well, as you can imagine, uh, the governor who has uh, talked about often the need for PPE, that protective equipment, the masks, the gloves, uh, mm -hmm. and has really strenuously argued for it and has stockpiled it. Uh, that's something that uh, he took a little bit of exception to today. Allison, let's take a listen. In terms of a suggestion that uh, the PPE equipment is not going to a correct place, uh, I don't know what that means. I don't know what he's trying to say. Uh, if he wants to make an accusation, then let him make an accusation. Uh, but I don't know what he's trying to say by inference. So, Allison, I think, you know, what the governor is essentially saying is, look, I'm not sure what you're talking about, um, and I'd like you to prove it. And if you're going to make an accusation, flat out say it. Um, I can tell you that based upon letters that we've reviewed uh, from the heads of surgery at New York Presbyterian Hospital, from my discussions with uh, the commissioner of the fire department, who obviously heads up the EMS here, who's being uh, saturated, as you said before, with calls, as well as the commissioner of the NYPD, uh, they've all talked about the tremendous burn rate. That's kind of the technical, the industry term if you will, uh, for what's going on. And so, you know, in a typical hospital or in the New York Presbyterian system, according to uh, their head of surgery in a letter that has been made public, uh, he said typically they would average maybe 4,000 masks a day that they would go through. Uh, right now, they're pushing 40,000 to as much as 70,000 masks a day. Anytime they use that, that term, the ventilator, that specific medical piece of equipment, uh, Alice said they need to use a mask. And because it, it aerosols uh, and essentially gets that virus so much in the air uh, that when they treat somebody and they use that equipment, they have to get rid of that mask. Uh, if they take that into another room or take that outside of uh, uh, kind of the containment area where they're, where they're handling coronavirus patients, uh, you're almost guaranteeing that other people are going to be exposed, including the people that we're relying on uh, to treat the people with this virus. So uh, it is completely plausible, based on the experts that we've talked to, that this amount of PPE, the mask and the gloves, et cetera, are being used every day, Allison. Tom, we know the Navy hospital ship, the USNS Comfort, arrived in New York City today and that it'll mm -hmm. treat non-coronavirus patients. When will those patients start being transferred? Uh, so we should see uh, both that uh, very impressive uh, naval ship that came into the harbor this morning. You're looking at it now yeah. just before it docked uh, in, in all as well as the hospital beds that have been put uh, in at the Javits Center, which isn't very far away from where this ship is going to be, uh, talking about altogether a couple of thousand uh, hospital beds. Uh, we should start to see those come online this week. Uh, the Javits Center, we should start to see patients go there within the next couple of days, uh, day or so. Uh, and then we should see a little bit while longer before the uh, 
a comfort is set up and going. They've got to power it up. They've got to you know make sure it's uh, stocked and ready to go. As you said, this is not for coronavirus patients, uh, but New York City still has a ton of people, and they still have a ton of medical need yeah. uh, on top of what's going on with coronavirus. So these facilities are going to be set up uh, to take care of uh, patients that suffer other injuries or ailments, uh, basically take the load off those hospitals so they can really focus on those COVID-19 patients. Tom, we also know more of New York City's firefighters and police officers have tested positive for the mm -hmm. coronavirus. How's the city addressing those cases? Uh, so right now, uh, it may surprise folks that are not in an area right now where there's a tremendous amount of spread of mm -hmm. coronavirus. If you're not in uh, one of the major cities or major states that have been impacted by this, uh, there's no more self-quarantining. So in other words, if you and I uh, were working in a patrol car together and I got coronavirus, you're not out for 14 days, not in New York City anymore. You're going to work tomorrow, uh, and you're going to work until you have one of the symptoms, so a high fever, a cough, uh, maybe a sore throat with a runny nose. If you have one of those symptoms, you're out on a, uh, on, on a medical leave until you resolve that. Either maybe you have coronavirus or maybe you're suffering something else. Uh, right now, the New York uh, City Police Department pushing 15 percent of their workforce is out sick uh, as they approach 1,000 cases. Uh, we ticked over 900 today to 930 this morning of uh, of members mm -hmm. of the NYPD that have coronavirus, the fire department, that includes the firefighters and the EMTs critically. Uh, they're right now pushing 260 plus cases of confirmed uh, coronavirus. Uh, so when we look at that, uh, basically we're at the point here where New York first responders, they have to work unless they're sick. There's just so much spread within the community. They're just as likely to get it through their jobs as they are to get it from uh, a family member, uh, somebody that they cross uh, on the way to work. Uh, it's just kind of a situation we can't get out of, Allison. All right, Tom, thank you so much for those latest numbers out of New York. Really appreciate your reporting. We're going to head over to the White House now for the daily coronavirus task force briefing. Let's listen in. Will not arrive for another two weeks. The same modeling also shows that by very vigorously following these guidelines, we could save more than one million American lives. Think of that, one million American lives. Our future is in our own hands, and the choices and sacrifices we make will determine the fate of this virus and really the fate of our victory. We will have a great victory. We have no other choice. Every one of us has a role to play in winning this war. Every citizen, family, and business can make the difference in stopping the virus. This is our shared patriotic duty. Challenging times are ahead for the next 30 days. And this is a very vital 30 days. We're sort of putting it all on the line. This 30 days so important because we have to get back. But the more we dedicate ourselves today, the more quickly we will emerge on the other side of the crisis. And that's the time we're waiting for. The more we commit ourselves now, the sooner we can win the fight and return to our lives, and they will be great lives, maybe better than ever. Today, we reached a historic milestone in our war against the coronavirus. Over one million Americans have now been tested, more than any other country by far, not even close, and tested accurately. And I think what I'd like to do is ask Secretary Azar, who's done a fantastic job to come up and just say a few words about the fact that we reached substantially now more than one million tests. Please. Thank you, Alex. Well, thank you, Mr. President, for your leadership in marshalling all the resources that we have for this unprecedented testing effort. And thank you, Mr. Vice President, for leading a whole of economy approach to testing. As the President mentioned today, the United States hit more than one million samples tested, a number that no other country has reached. We're now testing nearly 100,000 samples a day, also a level that no other country has reached. I want to thank every partner that has been involved in this effort. That includes all of the men and women of the FDA and the CDC, including Director Redfield and Commissioner Hahn. Together, the FDA and CDC have worked to balance the need for testing on an aggressive scale with the scientific rigor that Americans expect. Working with our testing coordinator, Admiral Girois, they have now truly unleashed the ingenuity of the private sector and our state and local leaders, the centerpieces of America's historic approach 
to testing. I want to thank those state and local leaders who have used their on-the-ground resources and knowledge to lead testing and make it much more easily accessible to the Americans who need it. I'm also grateful to FEMA, with whom we are now working closely to get state and local partners what they need. I also want to thank CMS, where Administrator Verma has given healthcare providers unprecedented flexibility to scale up capacity for testing and treatment and has ensured that tests will be paid for. Finally, we would not be where we are today without the many American companies, entrepreneurs and scientists who have worked day and night to develop, as of today, 20 different emergency testing options. With the FDA responding to requests for authorization typically within 24 hours, the number of options is growing nearly every day. FDA has also opened up new options for using the available tests, like self-swabbing and new options for reagents. I also want to thank FDA and other components of HHS for incredibly rapid action on other tools that we need. This weekend, we actually worked to secure 30 million tablets from Sandoz and 1 million tablets from Bayer of hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine, which are potential COVID-19 treatments, and we authorized Battelle's new decontamination machines, which can each sterilize thousands of essential N95 masks for reuse every day. So thank you, Mr. President, for your leadership, and thank you to everybody who's played a part in getting us where we are today. I'd like to ask uh, Dr. Hahn to come up, FDA, because we have some really good stuff. Uh, first of all, the numbers have been incredible on testing, but in the days ahead, we're going to go even faster, and we have something from Abbott Labs, which is right here, and that's a five-minute test, highly accurate. And I maybe can uh, show that as we listen to our FDA commissioner, the job he's done and the uh, approval process. Uh, we talked about the uh, chloroquine and the hydroxychloroquine just now. Uh, I thought that I'd mention it, but Alex has already done that. But we have that now under test with 1,100 people in New York, and it was only the fast approval by FDA that allowed us to do that. It was a really rapid approval. And uh, Dr. Please say a few words. So this is the first one on the line of the five-minute test from Abbott. Thank you, Mr. President, for your leadership. Thank you, Mr. Vice President, for your leadership of the task force. Um, I'm very proud of FDA staff work in the last few months to expedite the availability of testing in this country. I'm also incredibly appreciative of private industry's ingenuity and willingness to work with us quickly to develop and distribute those tests. We've had a substantial addition to testing uh, with the authorization of point-of-care tests, especially the Abbott point-of-care test, which the President has pulled out of the box. A point-of-care test is a test that gives you a result where you're getting care. This is truly a, uh, a patient-centered approach, whether it's the doctor's office, a hospital, an emergency room, an urgent care center, or a drive-by testing site. Just like tests for flu or strep, where you go to the doctors, you get the test done, you can get an answer within minutes of having this test done. Now, uh, with those tests being approved for Abbott and for others, these are available around the country. They're planning to scale up the number of tests that can be put out throughout the country over the next month, and patients can get the answer within as little as 15 to five minutes. And then, of course, an appropriate plan of treatment can be given. Um, uh, we at FDA are working quickly uh, with Abbott as well and other testing approaches, and normally these tests take months to develop. I was on the phone today with the Abbott CEO. He told me that normally this is a nine to 12 month approach to developing a point of care test. They did this in collaboration with FDA and US government within weeks. Abbott has shared that they will be delivering these tests tomorrow and then we'll be ramping up. Just have to emphasize one thing, the most innovative and safe products come from the private sector in partnership with government, taking an all hands on deck approach, just like in this case. And the other point here is that Abbott and FDA work together to make sure that we had a fast, reliable, and accurate test to market. Thank you. Great job. Really great job. Thank you, Steve. So, the pharmaceutical company, Sandoz, uh, has been working with us very closely. And as Alex mentioned a little bit, 30 million doses of the hydroxychloroquine to the United States government has been given. 
And Bayer has donated 1 million doses of the chloroquine, which will soon be distributed to states and state health officials around the country. Te Teva Pharmaceuticals is also donating 6 million doses of hydroxychloroquine to U.S. hospitals, 6 million doses. So the uh, private sector, as you say, Steve, it's been amazing what's happened, really amazing. And we're going to introduce you to some of the greatest business executives in the world today, no matter where you go. And they're going to say a little bit about what they're doing. And then we have so many more. The FDA has also authorized the Atil's uh, N95 respirator mask sterilization kits. It's uh, an incredible thing. I've been asking why are we throwing these masks away? You look at some of these masks and they're significant pieces of equipment. And I say, how come you throw them away? Why aren't they using sterilization techniques? And uh, I got a call from Mike DeWine, the governor of Ohio. And he's a tremendous guy, tremendous governor. And he said, we have a company named Batil and they're having a hard time getting approval from the FDA. And I called up Dr. Hahn, and within a very short period of time, they got the approval, Steve. We really appreciate it. I want to thank Mike, and I want to thank Steve. And uh, they're going to be able, each machine now can disinfect 120,000 masks per day. Now think of that. Each machine can disinfect 120,000 masks per day. It'll be just like a new one. It could go up to about 20 times for each mask. So each mask can go through this process 20 times. And they have uh, two in Ohio, one in New York, and one will soon be shipped to Seattle, Washington, and also uh, to Washington, D.C. So that's going to make a tremendous difference on the masks. This morning, I spoke to our nation's governors to help each state get the medical supplies they need. And yesterday, uh, Vice President Mike Pence asked our nation's hospitals to begin reporting total bed capacity, ICU bed capacity, ventilator capacity, and vital medical supply levels on a daily basis. And Mike, thank you for the great job. Thank you very much. In New York, the 2,900 bed hospital under construction, which is now completed, they completed it in three days, you might say three and a half days, at the Javits Center, will be completed today, will be and when you look, so they're going up, I think we're going to be adding some more beds, which will be completed today. And we've opened up, whoops, there goes our box. And my hair's blowing around, and it's mine. <laughs> One thing you can't get away with, if it's not used, you got a problem, if you're president. And nearly 3,000 medical beds will become operational. The U.S. Navy ship Comfort also arrived today, equipped with 12 operating rooms and 1,000 hospital beds. Work has begun on additional temporary hospital sites, including a 600-bed capacity nursing home facility in Brooklyn and numerous floors of a high-rise building on Wall Street. So it's been really uh, pretty amazing what they've done. The Army Corps of Engineers, what they've done, they've done, they, they just completed, think of it, a 2,900-bed hospital in New York in just about three days, maybe four days. And the whole city's talking about it. On top of that, we floated in a great ship, which is going to be a thousand rooms, which is being used for uh, patients outside of what we're focused on. And that will free up a lot of rooms for what we're focused on. So it's been great. The Army Corps of Engineers has awarded contracts for the construction of alternate care facilities also at the State University at Stony Brook, State University Old Westbury, and the Westchester Community Center. We're sending 60 ambulances to New York City today. We have a total of 60. We're getting some additional ones, with up to 190 more to follow at different locations. Uh, to date, FEMA has obligated more than $1.3 million, billion dollars in federal support to the state of New York. So we're spending a lot of money in New York. It's a hot, it's a hotbed, there's no question about it. And we're spending a lot of time, effort on New York, New Jersey, 
Spoke with Governor Cuomo a lot. Spoke with Governor Murphy a lot in New Jersey. And we're, uh, we're really getting the job done. People are very impressed, and I'm very impressed by the people in FEMA, the people in the Army Corps of Engineers, because what they've done, I've never seen anybody do anything like it. In addition to the 8,100 ventilators that we've already delivered over the next 48 hours, we're delivering more than 1,000. We're going 400 ventilators are going to Michigan very shortly, 300 going to New Jersey, 150 ventilators to Illinois, 150 to Louisiana, and 50 to Connecticut. FEMA and HHS already delivered 11.6 million N95 respirators, 26 million surgical masks, 5.3 million face shields, 4.4 million surgical gowns, and 22 million gloves. And I don't know if you just saw, it just came over the wires that Ford just announced just a little while ago that they will produce, along with General Electric Healthcare, 50,000 ventilators, and they're going to be doing it in less than 100 days. And top of that, we have other companies that are doing ventilators, including General Motors. But we have uh, nine other companies doing ventilators as we outpace what we need. We're going to be sending them to Italy. We're going to be sending them to France. We're going to be sending them to Spain, where they have tremendous problems, and other countries as we, as we can. But the fact that we're doing so many so quickly is a tribute to our great companies. More than 14,000 National Guard members have been activated and can help supplement state and local efforts to distribute personal protective equipment where we're sending a lot. We have plane loads coming in. Uh, we have 51 loads from various locations all around the world. And uh, they're landing. We had our first big cargo plane land this morning. And we're getting it from all over the world. And we're also sending things that we don't need to other parts. I just spoke to the Prime Minister of Italy, and we have additional capacity. We have additional product that we don't need. We're going to be sending approximately $100 million worth of, of things, of surgical and medical and hospital things to Italy. And Giuseppe was very, very happy. I will tell you that they're having a very hard time. Joining us this afternoon are CEOs of the great American companies that are fulfilling their patriotic duty by producing or donating medical equipment to help meet our most urgent needs. What they're doing is incredible. And these are great companies. Darius, Domchek of Honeywell, you know that. And Darius has been uh, somebody that I've dealt with in the past. And he's a great leader of a great company. Deborah Waller of Jockey International. A friend of mine, Mike Lindell of My Pillow. Boy, do you sell those pillows? It's unbelievable what you do. David Taylor of Procter and Gamble, and Greg Hayes of United Technologies Corporation. And I just want to tell all of you that America is very grateful to you and what you've done, amazing job you've done, and we thank you very much. Uh, I'd like you to come up and say a couple of words, if you might, about your companies. Mike, come on up. Come on up, fellas, please. Come on up. You have to say what you're doing, because it's been really incredible. Go ahead. Okay, well, my pill is a U.S. vertically integrated company which has been forced to adjust to the changing business environment as a result of the pandemic. My pill is uniquely positioned as a U.S. company that functions as a manufacturer, logistics management distributor, and direct to consumer. Given our current business lines, we are experiencing the effects of this pandemic firsthand. What my pill has done was establish an internal task force which is monitoring future needs of companies across the country as a result of this pandemic. And given our position, we've begun to research and develop new protocols to address the current and future needs of U.S. businesses across multiple sectors. How companies are going to prepare themselves when they once again open up and, and changes to their current operations in order to adjust to future threats and pandemics. My pillow has designated some of its call center to help U.S. companies navigate the many issues that resulted from this pandemic. 
We've, de we've dedicated 75% of my manufacturing to produce cotton face masks. I'm up to, in three days, I was up to 10,000 a day. By Friday, I want to be up to 50,000 a day. Um, I'm proud to manufacture our products in the United States, and I'm even more proud to be able to serve our nation in this great time of need. Thank you, Mr. President, for your call to action, when, which has empowered companies like MyPillow to help our nation win this invisible war. Now I wrote something off the cuff, if I can read this. <laughs> God gave us grace on November 8, 2016, to change the course we were on. God had been taken out of our schools and lives. A nation had turned his back on God. And I encourage you to use this time at home to get to home to get back in the word, read our Bibles and spend time with our families. Our president gave us so much hope where just a few short months ago, we had the best economy, the lowest unemployment and wages going up. It was amazing. With our great president, vice president, and this administration, and all the great people in this country praying daily, we will get through this and get back to a place that's stronger and safer than ever. I did not know he was going to do that, but he's a friend of mine, and I do appreciate it. Thank you, Mike. Very much. First of all, Mr. President, Mr. Vice President, the entire administration, and all the agencies, thank you for your strong leadership during this time of crisis. It is noticed, and it's making a difference. Second of all, I'd like to say a big thank you to all the healthcare workers out there. You're putting yourself in arm's way every day, and we really respect what you're doing, and we couldn't be thankful enough for it. And I can tell you that more help's on the way. We as Honeywell, we're an industrial technology company. One of the businesses that we're in, we protect the industrial workers. But what we're doing today is we're repurposing a lot of that equipment to serve the healthcare worker. A few days ago, we announced the startup of a new manufacturing facility in Rhode Island. We're going to be hiring 500 employees. We have already 200 on board, and we're going to be starting the production of N95 masks within the next two weeks. Furthermore, today we're announcing the startup of another manufacturing facility in Arizona. We're going to be hiring another 500 people, and we're going to be starting up production in that facility by the middle of May. So in total, we've doubled our production of N95 masks already. It's going to double again within the next 60 days. Then within the next 90 days, we're going to have a 5x the capacity we do today. Furthermore, we're going to be providing other safety equipment to support all the efforts going on. Lastly, I want to say a big thank you to all the Honeywell employees and also announce a $10 million fund for them for all the hourly and administrative employees who are having a hard time during this time of crisis. Thank you, Mr. President. That's fantastic. Normally I'd shake his hand, but we're not supposed to do that anymore. So that's okay. Great job. Thank you to Honeywell. Please go ahead. Second, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. President and Mr. Vice President, on your guidance during this unprecedented time. And I'm very honored to be here today. Founded by a minister 144 years ago, Jockey International is a family-owned company headquartered in Kenosha, Wisconsin. Since 1876, we have been providing socks and underwear for generations of families. It is part of our DNA to roll up our sleeves and help our country in her time of need. During World War II, we made parachutes for the military. And today, we are eager to serve this great country by providing support for the healthcare workers on the front lines of this fight. As the President and Vice President have said, it's a whole of America approach, and we are committed. Jockey has had a long-standing partnership with Encompass Group, headquartered in Georgia, serving the healthcare community. When we learned of the critical need for PPE, we knew we had to help. That meant restarting production on Tier 3 isolation gowns. Monumental lifting by Jockey, Encompass, FEMA, and the FDA was done in just a few days to be production ready. As a result, we expect to begin delivering 30 to 50,000 gowns per week, helping those that need it the most right now. In addition, this week, we are also donating 10,000 units of scrubs to the frontline doctors and nurses at the Javits Convention Center in New York City. We would not have been able to do this 
Without the collaboration of the administration, representatives from the federal agencies, and Congressman Brian Stiles. Thank you very much, Mr. President and Mr. Vice, Mr. Vice President. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. President, Mr. Vice President, for bringing us together today. I'm proud to be able to represent the men and women of Procter & Gamble, who every day, 24 hours a day, are working to build and make essential cleaning products, hygiene products, and healthcare products for families everywhere. These include healthcare workers and the institutions that are serving those in the front line. P&G people are the faces that brands you know and trust. Brands like Tide, Ampers, Bounty, Charmin, Mr. Clean, and Vicks. In addition to making, packing, and shipping these essential items, they've worked together to transform our plants, to make things we've never made before, like hand sanitizers and facial masks. Some of these are already getting to national, state, and local agencies. Some of them are in the hospitals already. Everywhere around the world, PNG people are working every day to serve everybody, consumers, and they're working together to bring together the full capability of our research and development, our engineering, our manufacturing, and our communications capability to make sure we make a difference to the consumers we serve and to all the audience that we can make a difference to. And I want to thank them and I'm very grateful for what they do every day in service to others. Thank you, Mr. President, Mr. Vice President, for bringing us together today. Good afternoon. I'm Greg Hayes from United Technologies. And on behalf of the 240,000 employees of United Technologies and the 70,000 employees at Raytheon, which will join together with UTC this Friday, I want to first of all say thank you to the President and the Vice President for your leadership during what is really a war. It's a different war than anybody has ever fought before, but it's a war that we're uniquely qualified to help. As one of the world's largest defense contractors and some of the best technology, we're using that technology to try and solve some real-world problems. Today we're working with the Air Force to try and help uh, pilots as they're moving uh, medical evacuees with the COVID-19 virus such that they can be protected and that the patients can be protected. Again, we're working also with logistics, and if you think about a war, strategy is important, but logistics wins war. And it's, imp it's imperative, I think, with FEMA, along with the, the Mr. Navarro's office, that we coordinate all of these activities. Last week, we donated about 90,000 pieces of personal protective equipment to FEMA. Next week, we'll have another almost million. Again, working through our supply chain partners around the world. We're also today, this week, beginning the manufacture of face shields using the additive technologies that we have, the machines that we have available within UTC, we'll be able to produce approximately 10,000 shields in the next four weeks. Again, all needed equipment. We stand ready to help in any way we can. We don't need the Defense Production Act to ask us to act. All of the people at UTC and Raytheon are focused on this war and winning it. Again, I also want to say thank you to all of our employees for their work during this crisis, as well as to the frontline medical and other first responders. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great Those are great companies. Thank you very much. I'd like to ask Seema to come up and say a few words about what you're doing and what's happening and how positive it's been. I really appreciate it. Come on up, Seema. Thank you, Mr. President. And let me start by saying I want to convey my deepest sympathies to those that have lost loved ones to the coronavirus. We're all thinking of you. Today is Doctor's Day, and even without it, I want to send a message of gratitude to the foot soldiers in this war, men and women that are providing care and comfort to Americans that have been affected by the virus. Your country is grateful. And in short, as the President has said, we are engaged in a war against an invisible enemy. In wartime, the assumptions of peacetime must be revisited and adjusted to meet the demands of the moment. And so under the President's leadership, CMS is waiving a wide and unprecedented range of regulatory requirements. Now many healthcare systems won't need these waivers, and they shouldn't use them if they don't need them, but the flexibilities are there. In a time of crisis, regulations shouldn't stand in the way of patient care. And there are several components to our announcement today, but the first one 
is CMS's Hospitals Without Walls. And this is going to allow hospital systems to create new treatment sites outside of their facility to expand capacity and be able to safely separate patients that are infected with the coronavirus and those that are not. Now FEMA is doing incredible work setting up temporary hospitals in New York and other areas, but under these waivers, we are empowering local communities to complement and augment the work of FEMA and allowing hospital systems to tap into the capacity that already exists in their communities, making use of dorms and hotels or gymnasiums, and allowing the main hospital to focus on those that need the most intensive care. There are surgery centers out there today that are delaying elective surgeries, and they may have excess capacity that can be devoted to hospital-like care. And we are also making changes to the Medicare program to facilitate testing. So some people that need a coronavirus test can't leave their home, or patients that are in a nursing home, and now we will pay for labs to go out to these locations and perform testing. And we're also expanding the workforce. We are taking action today to relax some of our regulations to allow hospitals to increase their workforce. And we're allowing a broad range of flexibilities so that we can let healthcare workers operate at the top of their license. And we are also allowing our hospitals to give to provide more support for our healthcare workers. Under today's regulations, they can only provide minimal support to healthcare workers, but now we're going to allow them to provide childcare, meals, laundry services. And then there's also telehealth. The president already directed a dramatic expansion of telehealth to our nation's 62 million seniors with Medicare, and we're so proud of all the healthcare, um, healthcare providers and patients that have rapidly implemented telehealth. But today we're announcing that we're going to go even further, and we're going to be paying for doctors to, to um, make phone calls with their patients and provide care over the phone. And we're getting rid of long-standing barriers to telehealth in the Medicare program, allowing emergency rooms to use telehealth and eliminating requirements that some visits be provided face-to-face. -face. And I also want to mention that on Saturday, the President directed CMS to offer advanced payments for healthcare providers that are experiencing cash flow problems. We know that many providers are complying with our recommendations to delay non-essential elective surgeries, and they shouldn't be penalized for doing the right thing. Now, I've barely scratched the surface of all the flexibilities that we are offering healthcare workers and healthcare systems. These flexibilities will provide a lot of flexibility from regulations that are ill-suited to the unprecedented needs of this emergency. And doctors and nurses and other healthcare professionals that are working long hours and sacrificing time with their families and risking their lives will have the flexibility that they need to confront the needs of the coronavirus pandemic. And there are many heroes in this war, but I want to take an opportunity to thank the team at CMS. These folks have worked day and night. Um, the, the flexibilities that are in this regulation, in any regulation, usually take CMS a year. But we did this in two weeks, and I couldn't be more honored and privileged to serve alongside these dedicated public servants. Thank you. You're doing a great job. So we are in the midst of something that is very difficult, but we are going to win. It's just a question of when. We want to do it as quickly as possible. We want to have as few deaths as possible. And uh, we will meet again tomorrow for some statistics uh, and some updates as to where we are, where we think we're going, and timing. I think timing is going to be very important because we have to get our country back. We have to get our country back to where it was and maybe beyond where it was because we've learned so much. But we will have lost a lot of people. And uh, in many ways, they're heroes. And if you look at uh, what's happening with our medical professionals, it's a danger. They're, they're warriors. Men and women are doing a job that uh, the likes of which I don't think anyone's ever seen. Uh, I see them coming out of planes today, going into New York, going into the most dangerous locations, dangerous areas. And they go in there, and they just want to do the job. And uh, you see the numbers. You see the numbers like I see the numbers. I have some friends that are unbelievably sick. We thought they were going in for a mild stay, and 
In one case, uh, he's unconscious in a coma. And you say, how did that happen? So I just want to thank all of the great professionals, men and women, uh, doctors and nurses and paramedics and first responders and law enforcement, by the way. If you look at New York and you see how the effect that this had on law enforcement, it's been incredible. These are great people, firefighters, great people. They're helping in so many different ways. So thank you very much. And if you'd like, we'll take a few questions. Yeah, please. Yesterday, you, you said that you would be extending the guidelines through the end of April and that you'd be giving us specifics right. tomorrow. Do you expect that the guidelines will just carry on the guidelines uh, that have been in place now for 15 days? Could there potentially be some modification? Also, you have some travel restrictions that come up for reconsideration. Yeah. The one from the EU on April 13th. Right. Canada, U.S., Mexico, border sure. they'll be staying. April the 21st. They'll be staying. What, what will happen with all They'll that? be staying, and we may add a few more, but the guidelines will be very much as they are, and maybe even toughened up a little bit. But they're having a big impact. They're having a tremendous impact, and we're starting to see it. And that's the key. We're starting to see the impact that they're having. And, and if I could ask you, too, uh, you talked about Ford now ramping up production yeah. of ventilators. The government is sending right. thousands of ventilators across the country. Uh, clearly, the supply is, is increasing. But when you look at, at the production curve uh, against the hospitalization curve, uh, can you guarantee that everyone who needs a ventilator in the next few weeks will be able to get one? Well, I think that some are ramping up to a level that they're not going to have to, John. And I think that uh, we also have kept in reserve. We have almost 10,000 ventilators uh, in our line. We have them. We've held back just because we did the stockpile. Uh, we didn't want to give them because we don't know where the emergency. This hits. It hits like so fast. It comes so quickly. And we have 10,000. We're probably going to send some of them now. We've been sending a lot to Michigan and various other states. We'll probably send some additional ones to Michigan. New York's been doing very well, but we can add some more to New York. We're adding them to the areas that are having a problem. Even Alabama, all of a sudden, uh, flared up a little bit, as you saw over the last couple of days. And we'll send them down to Alabama. So we have 10,000. We kept them for this very specific purpose. Uh, it sounds like a lot, but it's not when you think about it. But we're making a lot, and when you see, you're talking about hundreds of thousands being made in a very short period of time, because if you look at what uh, just, so we have now uh, 10 companies at least making the ventilators. And we say go ahead because honestly, other countries really, they'll never be able to do it. It's a very complex piece of equipment and it's, it's big and expensive. So do you believe as, as we approach this peak in a couple of weeks that there will be enough for the American population? I do think so, yes, I do think so. Uh, I think we're gonna be in very good shape. And we had a great call today with the governors and uh, they were, I actually said, I hope that the media is listening to this call because it was a really good call. And that was uh, randomly selected largely uh, Democrats and Republicans. And they're, uh, I think for the most part, they were saying thank you for doing a great job. And we discussed that at the end of the call. So really, uh, people are very happy with what we're doing. Now, the circumstances are so terrible because of what's going on. But I think they're very impressed by the federal government. I watched that beautiful ship floating in today into, uh, you know, weeks ahead of schedule, almost four weeks ahead of schedule into New York Harbor, Comfort. And I watched the Mercy floating in to Los Angeles a week ago, almost a week ago. And uh, they are stocked. They are really ready to go. They're stocked with both talent and tremendous amounts of equipment. And uh, the Navy and everybody else involved, they got it ready so fast. It's, it's just incredible what they can do. They've geared up. That's why, I mean, I, I am so impressed by the people involved. Mike and I were talking about it before, the level of genius to put it all together so quickly. This wasn't a month ago, nobody ever heard of this. Nobody had any idea. Uh, the Mercy was being maintained. It was in maintenance for a month. And when they heard we needed it, and I was surprised, they said, sir, we're ready to go. I said, what do you mean? You're not going to be ready for three weeks. No, sir. We're all ready to go. It was incredible. So, and we've had many instances like this. I think the building of the hospital, 2,900 beds in uh, a matter of days, a few days, is just incredible. Uh, Governor Cuomo was impressed, and 
uh, Gavin Newsom was impressed by what we've been doing with Gavin in uh, California, in Los Angeles area in particular, but really San Francisco, all over, all over California. Uh, when you look at what we're doing with Michigan, we're getting along very well with Michigan. It's a great, great place. We're sending a lot of things to Michigan because that's becoming a hotbed, uh, especially a specific area, as you know. It's become very hot. It's become, uh, I don't know, could even at some point supersede, but it's, it's got to be taken care of. So we're, uh, the relationship we have with the governors, I, I just wish you could, because we took a lot of calls from a lot of different states, and I wish you could have heard. Even a thing where, like, the governor of Ohio calls, where he has a company that does the sterilization, but they have a problem because it's not going quickly at the FDA, and I call up Steve, and Steve comes in, and, he said, uh, we'll get it done, and they checked it, and they got it done almost immediately. And originally, they were approving it for 10,000 masks, and then it was supposed to be for 80, and they ultimately approved it for 120,000. That's a tremendous number. And I kept wondering, why aren't they sterilizing these masks? I assume maybe you couldn't do it. But then I'd look at them, and they'd look like, you know, it's not cloth. It's something that looks like it could be sterilized, and that's what they've done. And, that's the, the, the machine that is over there, actually. They have a piece of the machine over there. I won't bother showing it to you. And this is incredible when you talk about five minutes, 15 minutes, and highly accurate, and not nearly as uh, disturbing to do as the other tests. So we've just gotten better. We're doing things that nobody else ever thought of. Please. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, the DMV has issued stay-at-home orders, but Governor Ralph Northam of Virginia took it pretty far. He issued a 70-day stay-at-home order. Is that constitutional, first off? And secondly, do you think it's warranted to go ahead and issue a 70-day guidance at this point? Well, we're letting the governors do in their states pretty much what they want with our supervision, and they consult with us in all cases. Uh, some go further than others, as you know. I mean, I could give you plenty of examples, but I'm not going to do that because uh, we never want to be controversial. But uh, some of the governors have taken it a step further. Uh, Did he and people are, questioning, people are questioning that. But look, staying at home uh, with respect to what we're talking about doesn't bother me at all. People should be staying at home. That's what we want. Uh, OAN, please, OAN. 2,405 Americans have died from coronavirus in the last 60 days. Yeah. Meanwhile, you have 2,369 children who are killed by their mothers through elective abortions each day. That's 16 and a half thousand children killed every week. Yeah. Two states have suspended elective abortion to make more resources available for coronavirus cases. That's Texas and Ohio. Do you agree with states who are placing coronavirus victims above elective abortions? And should more states be doing the same? Well, I think what we're doing is we're trying to, as a group, governors, and that's Republicans and Democrats, we're just working together to solve this problem. Uh, that's been a, uh, what you're mentioning has been going on for a long time, and it's a, it's a sad event, a lot of sad events in this country. But what we're doing is now we're working on the virus, we're working on that hidden enemy, and I think we're doing a great job on, uh, as good a job as you could possibly do when, uh, when Tony and Deborah came up with numbers yesterday to say that if we did nothing, you could lose 2.2, up to 2 point, maybe beyond, maybe beyond, but 2.2 million people if we did nothing. And I can't tell you what the unfortunate final toll is going to be, but it's going to be a very small fraction of that. So uh, we're doing an awfully good job, I think, with what we're doing. Please, go ahead. Please. Are you considering it all a nationwide stay-at-home order? I know there's a lot of states that have put them in place, but some haven't. I'm just wondering if you were considering some sort of broad stay-at-home order. And then I have a question for Dr. Burks, too. Yeah. Well, we've uh, talked about it. We, uh, you know, there obviously there are some parts of the, of the country that are in far deeper trouble than others. There are other parts that, frankly, are not in trouble at all. So hopefully, hopefully we'll be able to keep it that way by doing what we're doing. Uh, so we talked about quarantine, as you know, the other day. A group came to me and they wanted to do the quarantine, and I said, let's think about it, and we did, and we studied it, and by the time the evening came, it just was something that was very unwieldy, very tough to enforce, and something we didn't want to do. Uh, 
uh, but we did advisory, and uh, I think that's doing well. I mean, I, I see, I look at the streets, you look at New York, where there's, I look down Fifth Avenue, today they were showing a shot of Fifth Avenue, and sort of prime time, and there was almost nobody on Fifth Avenue. I've never seen that before. There was no car, there was no anything. So I think the people of this country have done an incredible job. Uh, if we do that, we will let you know, but it, it's pretty unlikely, I would think, at this time. Can I ask a quick question for Dr. Burke? Yes. Um, so, Dr. Burks, if you don't mind, um, you had mentioned uh, today that this model that predicts 100,000 deaths is if we do things almost perfectly. So I wanted to know, are we currently doing things almost perfectly, or are there more things we need to be doing to cap, you know, you know to, to not exceed that 100,000, 200,000 model? Please, Thank you. I think that's a really great question. Um, and tomorrow we'll go through all of the graphs and all the information that we took to the president for the decision. But when you, and I just want to thank the data team that's working day and night to get, I mean, I usually get my data about 2 a.m. from them, um, and they assimilate all the data from all the states. And when you look at all of the states together, all of them are moving in exactly the same curves. And so that's why we really believe this needs to be federal guidance so that every state understands that it may look like two cases today that become 20, that become 200, that become 2,000. And that's what we're trying to prevent. And I think states still have that opportunity, but they're going to have to do all of these recommended. And these recommendations are recommendations that the globe is using. And so we really do recommend that every governor, every mayor looks very carefully and ensures that their communities are utilizing these guidance. It, it is amazing. You look at Louisiana, and for a long time it was just, it was just staying at nothing. And then all of a sudden, I look one day and I see a lot and a lot and a lot, and then it explodes. And now we're working very carefully and very. Uh, Powerfully with them, we're building hospitals, so we're building a lot of different things for Louisiana. So it's very important. Yeah, please. Mr. President, um, Dr. Fauci has warned that this could be seasonal, seasonal cyclical virus. So, and maybe both of you could comment on this, and Dr. Burks as well. Are you prepared for this to strike again, say, in the fall? All the efforts that are taking place right now to contain this, to be proactive, uh, and. Yeah. You We're prepared. Do. I hope it doesn't happen. Doctor, would you like to say something about that? I hope it doesn't happen, but we're certainly prepared. In fact, I would anticipate that that would actually happen because of the degree of transmissibility. However, if you come back in the fall, it will be a totally different ball game of what happened when we first got hit with it in the beginning of this year. There will be several things that will be different. Our ability to go out and be able to test, identify, isolate, and contact trace would be orders of magnitude better than what it was just a couple of months ago. In addition, we have a number of clinical trials that are looking at a variety of therapeutic interventions. We hope one or more of them will be available. And importantly, as I mentioned to you many times at these briefings, is that we have a vaccine that's on track and multiple other candidates so I would anticipate that, you know, a year to a year and a half, we'd be able to do it under an emergency use. If we start seeing an efficacy signal, we may be able to even use a vaccine at the next season. So things are going to be very, very different. What we're going through now is going to be more than just lessons learned. It's going to be things that we have available to us that we did not have before. Okay, please. Go ahead. Scott Gottlieb, your former FDA commissioner, wrote a roadmap for recovery after yeah, the coronavirus. Yeah, very interesting, I saw it. He suggests, uh, the, the roadmap suggests that everybody wear a mask in public. Is that something that the task force thinks is a good idea? Well, we haven't discussed it to that extent, but it's certainly something we could discuss. We're getting certainly the number of masks that you need. Uh, we are in the process of talking about things. I saw his suggestion on that. So we'll take a look at it for a period of time, not forever. I mean, you know, we want our country back. We're not going to be wearing masks forever, but it could be for a short period of time. After we get back into gear, people could, I could see something like that happening for a period of time. But I would hope it would be a very limited period of time. Doctors, 
they'll come back and say for the rest of our lives we have to wear masks. And the, the roadmap also talks about um, doing GPS for social distancing, maybe follow, following people's phones, and hotels for isolation for people. Um, giving them free hotel rooms. Are, are those ideas that you're looking at? Well, the GPS, that's a very severe idea. I've been hearing about a GPS, so what happens? A siren goes off if you get too close to somebody. That's pretty severe, but he's uh, somebody who was with me for a long time. He worked, he did a great job at FDA, so. Uh, so we're gonna, we're taking a look. I just, I just received it a little while ago. He sent it over, so very good. Go ahead, let's give it a shot. Yes, sir. Uh, what do you say to Americans who are upset with you? over the way you downplayed this crisis over the last couple of months. Uh, we have it very much under control in this country. Coronavirus is very much under control in the USA. It's going to disappear. It's like a miracle. It will disappear. Uh, in March 4th, uh, we have a very small number of people in this country infected. March 10th, we're prepared. We're doing a great job with it. It will go away. Just stay calm. It will go away. What do you well, say to Americans? It will go away. And I do want them to stay calm. And we are doing a great job. If you look at those individual statements, the role should stay calm. Uh, it will go away. You know, it, you know it is going away. And it will go away. And we're going to have a great victory. And it's people like you and CNN that say things like that, that uh, it's why people just don't want to listen to CNN anymore. You could ask a normal question. The statements I made are, I want to keep the country calm. I don't want panic in the country. I could cause panic much better than even you. I could do much, I would make you look like a minor league player. But you know what, I don't want to do that. I want to have our country be calm and strong and fight and win, and it will go away. And it is incredible, the job that all of these people are doing, putting them all together, the job that they're doing. I am very proud of the job they're doing, that Mike Pence is doing, that the task force has done that Honeywell and Procter and & Gamble and Mike and all of these people have done. I'm very proud. It's, it's almost a miracle, and it is, the way it's all come together. And instead of asking a nasty, snarky question like that, you should ask a real question. And other than that, I'm going to go to somebody else. Please, go ahead. Thank please. you, sir. Thank you. Um, so you expressed some concern. Uh, you expressed some concern in the past that medical supplies were going out the back door and that perhaps yeah. some hospitals were doing things worse Well, I expressed you. what was told to me by a tremendous uh, power in the business. Uh, he said that at a New York hospital, for a long period of time, he was giving 10,000, maybe maximum 20,000 masks over a short time, and all of a sudden he's giving 300,000. And I said, no matter how bad this is, could that be possible? He said, no. So there's only a couple of things that could happen. Is it going out the back door? And I've reported it to the city and let the city take a look at it. But when you go from 10,000 masks to 300,000 masks, Mike, over the same period of time, there's something going on. Now, I'm not making any charges, but when everyone's looking for masks, and by the way, that's another thing, we're making a lot of masks, and the sterilization process is gonna save a lot of time and a lot of masks. But when, when you have the biggest distributor of product that distributes to many of the big hospitals and hospital chains. And he brings up a statistic like that, and I know you're trying to make a big deal out of it, but you shouldn't be. You should actually go over to the hospital and find out why. You shouldn't be asking me. I'm just saying are it's you, the way it is. You, uh, you should go over there as a great reporter. I have no idea who you are, but that's okay. You should go over there, go to the hospital, and find out how come you used to get 10,000 masks and you had a full hospital. New York City, always full. And how come now you have 300,000 masks? Despite the virus at all, you have three. How do you go from 10 to 300,000? And this is very serious stuff. I mean, I could see from 10 to 20 or from 10 to 40 or 50 or something. But how do you go from 10 to 300,000 masks? So what I think you should do is a, I'm sure you're a wonderful investigative reporter. You should go to the hospital and find out why. Okay, Are you yeah. asking your DOJ to look into it, sir? Steve, please. Well, it's, uh, it's so bad for the economy, but the economy is number two on my list. First, I want to save a lot of lives. We're going to get the economy back. I think the economy is going to come back very fast. Uh, Steve's just asking about the economy, what's it like? Uh, we basically shut down our country. 
And we did that in order to keep people separated, keep people apart. They're not working in offices. They're not in airplanes together. You know, we really shut it down. And, you know, 150, 151 other countries are pretty much shut down. But here, we're the, we had the greatest economy in the world. We had the greatest economy in the history of our country. And I had to go from doing a great job for three years to shutting it down. But you know what? We're going to build it up, and we're going to build it up rapidly. And I think in the end, we'll be stronger for it. We learned a lot. We learned a lot. And I have to say, we've had great relationships with a lot of countries. Uh, China sent us some stuff, which was terrific. Russia sent us a very, very large plane load of things, medical equipment, uh, which was very nice. Uh, other countries sent us things that I was very surprised at, very happily surprised. Uh, we learned a lot. We're learning a lot. And we're also learning that the concept of borders is very important, Steve. It's very important. Having borders is very, very important. But we have uh, done an incredible job. The economy is going to come back. My focus is saving lives. That's the only focus I can have. We're going to bring the economy back, and we'll bring it back fast. Yeah, please. Go ahead. Please. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. President. You said several times that the United States has ramped up testing. So just talk a little quicker, or a little louder. Mr. President, you said several times that the United States has ramped up testing, but the United States is still not testing per capita as many, as many people as other countries like South Korea. Why is that, and when do you think that that number will be on par with other countries? Yeah, well, it's, it's very much on par. The, the, look, 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 per capita, we have areas of country that's very hard. I know South Korea better than anybody. It's a very tight. Do you know how many people are in Seoul? Do you, do you know how big the city of Seoul is? The question's about 38 million people. That's bigger than anything we have. 38 million people all tightly wound together. We have vast farmlands. We have vast areas where they don't have much of a problem. In some cases, they have no problem whatsoever. We have done more tests. What I didn't, I didn't talk about per capita. We have done more tests by far than any country in the world by far our testing is also better than any country in the world and when you look at that as simple as that looks that's something that's a game changer and every country wants that every country so rather than asking a question like that you should congratulate the people that have done this testing because we inherited this administration inherited a broken system a system that was obsolete a system that didn't work it was okay for a tiny, small group of people, but once you got beyond that, it didn't work. We have built an incredible system to the fact where we have now done more tests than any other country in the world, and now the technology is really booming. I just spoke to, uh, well, I spoke to a lot. I'm not gonna even mention. I spoke to a number of different testing companies today, and the job that they've done and the job that they're doing is incredible. But when Abbott comes out and does this so quickly, it's really unreal. In fact, one company I have to say that stands out in the job, and I think I can say this, I don't want to insult anybody else, but Roach. Roach has been incredible uh, in the testing job they've done, and they're ramping it up exponentially. It's up, 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 up. And you should be saying congratulations instead of asking a really a snarky question because I know exactly what you mean by that. You should be saying congratulations to the men and women who have done this job, who have inherited a broken testing system and who have made it great. And if you don't say it, I'll say it. I want to congratulate all of the people. You have done a fantastic job and we will see you all tomorrow. Thank you very much. Thank you. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. This is all I've got left. Good afternoon from the spin it's room. News. Let's talk about money and politics. If it's asking the questions you want to ask. Amazon workers at a New York City warehouse walked off the job today. They're protesting how the companies handled the coronavirus out. Hospitals across the country dealing with an influx of coronavirus patients. Two healthcare professionals share what it's like on the front lines of this pandemic. 
Hello, my name is Jeremy Rose. I'm an ER doctor at Mount Sinai Beth Israel in Manhattan. Tomorrow I'm going to go work on the COVID unit. It's 5 a.m. I'm in the middle of my overnight shift, and we've just intubated a patient who's uh, in his mid-50s. He's going to the ICU, and one of the really, really bizarre and unnerving things about this illness is that it makes you alone. Um, everyone describes all the critical care units as war zones um, because that's what it looks like. Uh, no one looks like they're in their usual scrubs with all, all the things that they're trying to wear to attempt to protect themselves. We cannot have visitors in the hospital because they may be infected as well. And so tonight when I intubated this man, uh, he had no family with him, he's alone. And when he goes to the ICU, he will be alone. And if he dies, he may very well die alone. I bumped into one of my attendings and some of my colleagues, and they're like, oh, what are you doing tomorrow? And I'm like, oh, I'm off. Yes, I'm off. And uh, they were like, well, you see that patient. That patient needs uh, somebody to care for them tomorrow. They're going to have you know, CVHD, and they have all the things going wrong, multi-system organ failure, lungs failing, heart failing. I don't even know what else is failing on this person, but uh, God bless them. And um, I decided that I would stay. During this time, which is unfortunately a terrible time, where people are dying and where people are getting very, very sick, I want you to know that inside the hospital, we are pulling together like we have never pulled together before. And I look around at my nursing colleagues, I look around at everybody in the hospital doing every job, and I can't help thinking to myself that maybe now is our moment. Now is our moment to rise above this terrible disaster. And what I would say to you is if we pull together like we have pulled together in the hospital, we can and we will rise above this. It's gonna be a challenge. These poor people are so amazingly ill. Um, this virus, this tiny virus, is literally, is literally ominous. It's crazy. Um, so we'll see what tomorrow holds. New York City hospitals and funeral homes just overwhelmed with coronavirus cases. Sky News correspondent Cordelia Lynch spoke to people who have lost members of their family and to those organizing their burials. I'll get that. Home. Gerard Newfeld Funeral Home is a family-run business. Yes, we're open. Okay. And it's overwhelmed. The bodies of COVID-19 victims. Small groups, yes. Keep coming. If you just give me a call to let me know when you're coming, because we are a little busy, and I want to make sure somebody is here to sit down and speak with you properly. The caskets are closed, the chairs largely bereft of mourners, but the work doesn't stop. Demand is just unfortunately a lot of debts all at the same time. So we're trying to manage services for all the families in a proper way, whatever they want to do. So, and it's just a lot of families all at the same time. So we're trying to get fit in schedules, trying to keep track of who's, you know, which day, which family's going to go and go from there. Just down the road is Elmhurst Hospital, the center of the outbreak, where doctors say the situation is apocalyptic. Crazy, I mean, people are unfortunately passing away in, in big numbers, and because they live in this area, and I'm the only funeral home left in this area, they're coming to me, so, so I'm trying to accommodate them best I can, so. And every day, more and more bodies come. Yes, yes. I mean, we left uh, the office last night, and I think we had about 12 services or so scheduled. And shortly after I left the office, within uh, two hours, I had three more services. And then this morning, as soon as we came in, we put on three or four more services. So um, that's what's happening. And, and it's only 12 o'clock. Robert Lugo has just lost his grandmother, Anna. Isolated in her suffering, her family now robbed of the chance to grieve together. But my grandmother died alone. <laughs> that was not my grandma. She died alone. We didn't even get to say bye to her. 
And I understand that's part of the death process. But she was there, she was in the hospital, she was feet away. We couldn't even see her, we couldn't talk to, talk to her, we couldn't even give her like that boost of morale to say, hey, you know, you're gonna come out of this, or we need you to come out of this. Like, there was nothing. What would you say to those people who don't think coronavirus is a serious threat? If you don't think that it's a serious threat, here I am. I lost my grandmother in the, in the midst of less than a week. Her family had just celebrated her 80th birthday. They call her the glue. Now they too are sick. Because she was exposed to the virus, they also became exposed to the virus. And half of our family members right now are in quarantine because they tested positive. With collective mourning forbidden and traditional rituals removed, death is marked by a drive-through. The crematories really aren't letting anybody in. The cemeteries are limiting it for the most part to people staying in their cars and just watching the burial from the graveside. Joe now negotiates at the gates, carrying candles for the families that can't. Sometimes when it's so brief, it, it almost leaves them still feeling hollow, like, you know, what just happened? They don't have enough time to process it. You know, and it, it's heartbreaking. It, it, it's really sad. Joe and his father are vulnerable handling infected bodies, but they keep going, determined to offer dignity to those who left this world without a hand to hold. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. This is all I've got left. Good afternoon from the spin it's room. It's news made for your streaming world. NBC News Now. If it's digging in on the issues. Let's talk about money and politics. If it's asking the questions you want to ask. How do you reassure those supporters that you will sustain this? Just watch me. If it's navigating the winding road to the White House. And if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Need your true crime fix on the go? Dateline episodes are available as podcasts. Mysteries with a twist from the true crime original. Wow. Listen to Dateline wherever you get your podcasts. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. This is all I've got left. Who brought more to the caucuses? It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, 3 to 11 p.m. Eastern. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt, covering coronavirus with facts over fear. How do we know who belongs in isolation? What should we be conscious of? What's being worked on today? At a time of national crisis, turn to the most trusted TV news anchor in America. Allison Mars, you're watching NBC News Now from my living room. Uh, a big thank you to Gotti Schwartz, who took over last week while we were getting my home studio set up. It's our first day with it going, so let's hope things go smoothly. I got my Monday sweater on, so at least we know what day it is, because I know that's been a little bit of a, an issue with these work-from-home days. Uh, we got a lot of information for you. I know uh, you have questions and concerns. We're going to try to cover everything we can and get through this coronavirus pandemic together. So let's head over to NBC News Now correspondent Alexa Lioto. She has the latest coronavirus headlines from NBCNews.com. Give us an update. 
Hey, Allison. Good to see you and uh, glad you're back. Lots of headlines today. The U.S. Navy hospital ship Comfort docking in Manhattan this morning to help bolster medical capacity for the city as it continues to grapple with the coronavirus pandemic. The floating hospital has the capacity for 1,000 beds and 12 operation rooms and will be ready to take patients within 24 hours. That's according to our local affiliate here, NBC New York. Now, New York is currently considered the epicenter of the pandemic in the United States, but the entire country is of course, facing the crisis. This morning, Dr. Deborah Burks, the White House Coronavirus Response Coordinator, had this to say. If we do things together well, almost perfectly, we could get in the range of 100,000 to 200,000 fatalities. And from NBC News' tech editor Jason Abruzzi's, Macy's is furloughing the majority of its 130,000-person workforce as the coronavirus pandemic takes a toll on American businesses. The company said in a statement that they, quote, have lost the majority of their sales due to store closures, and that across Macy's, Bloomingdale's, and Blue Mercury brands, the company will be moving to the, quote, absolute minimum workforce to maintain basic operations. U.S. Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin calling into Fox Business today to say the economy should be back on track by June. You talked about the economy coming roaring back. Uh, you hold with that? We come roaring back after June 1st? I think so. I think we're going to have a rough quarter because we've shut down major parts of the economy. But our economy was in great shape. Our economy was the, the economy that was really growing and, and leading the world. Mnuchin adding the Trump administration will be providing eight weeks of payroll to small businesses, which totals around $350 billion. That's according to NBC's Lucy Bailey. And some new numbers released just earlier from Louisiana, a surge in coronavirus cases now totaling over 4,000 statewide. That's a jump of 485 cases from yesterday. And New Orleans specifically seeing a rise of 130 new cases, bringing the total to 1,480. That's from NBC News' Blaine Alexander. And Florida Governor Ron DeSantis announced Announcing today he'll be signing a safer at home executive order for four counties in South Florida as cases in the state near or surpass 5,000 uh, according to a according to the latest numbers from Florida's uh, health department. The governor has made news recently for not mandating a statewide stay at home order as other states across the country across the country have implemented. And Allison, those are the headlines for this hour. We'll be updating you with more. Some unbelievable headlines. Thank you so much. And forgive me for not saying your first name. We got a couple devices here I have to shut off before we get into our next hour. Uh, of course, you could check out our live blog, NBCNews.com slash coronavirus. We'll have plenty more updates for you there. 200,000 Americans could die from the coronavirus. That is according to Dr. Anthony Fauci. Take a listen. I mean, looking at what we're seeing now, you know, I would say between 100 and 200,000 cases, but I don't want to be held to that because it's, it's, it's uh, excuse me, deaths. I mean, we're, we're going to have millions of cases. Joining me now, Dr. Nahid Bedelia, infectious disease physician and medical director of the Special Pathogens Unit at Boston University School of Medicine. Doctor, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for having me. This morning on the Today Show, Dr. Deborah Burks echoed Dr. Fauci, saying that even if we take aggressive measures, the U.S. could see 200,000 deaths from the coronavirus. Those are just staggering numbers. Do you agree with them? I do. You know, and there's a study at the end of last week from the Institute of Health Metrics and Evaluation at the University of Washington that a lot of people think it took a, a pretty, you know, a positive perspective is that if we all follow the, the social distancing, the isolating the cases who get sick and we test like crazy, then, you know, then we might be in that number of 100,000 to 200,000. But even then, you know, when we do that, that study basically showed that most states are going to fall short for the needs that they have for hospital beds, about 61,000 hospital beds, you know, short of what they already have and about 15,000 ICU beds short of what they already have, which is where this flattening the curve, this idea that we don't want everybody to get sick together comes in. Um, as we project out um, to looking at those cases. President Trump said this morning that he expects the U.S. will hit its coronavirus peak in about two weeks. Listen to this. 
around Easter, that's going to be your spike. That's going to be the highest point, we think. And then it's going to start coming down from there. That will be a day of celebration. And we just want to do it right. So we picked the end of April, uh, the last day, April 30th. What do you make of that? Do you think that we will hit that peak around mid-April? Is there a way to tell? I, I think that it's it's much more complicated than that, than that right? Because there's no one peak. Mm -hmm. Every state is going to hit a peak at a different time, depending on what their outbreak looks like and how much testing is being done. Um, we do know that physical distancing works. There's a study from Northeastern and Oxford that showed that, look at China's number. When they put this into place, it does work. But it's not that we hit a peak and then everything is done. It's that we hit a peak and you have a plateau where you want fewer number of people, the acceleration of cases decreases. And, in, and given that, I think that's the message that we need to send is that the cases will continue. It's just that we won't be accelerating if we follow all mm -hmm. the guidance that we're sort of looking at, but all the states, everybody has to do that together. So yesterday, President Trump extended the national social distancing guidelines to April 30th. Given what you've just said about not being really sure about the peak and just that a peak could happen in different states at different times, is that April 30th extension long enough or do you think it might need to be later than that? I think it's going to be a different reality for every single state. Um, and that's why ensuring that mm -hmm. everybody starts out at a similar place right now with the same kind of restrictions. You know, if we could if we could do this perfectly, the whole country go into isolation, go into mm -hmm. quarantine um, and do the social distancing and 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 use that as a temporizing measure. Right. It's not like somehow the, the virus will magically disappear, because what we need to do in that interim is increase right. our testing, fight everybody who's sick you know, improve our hospitals so they can handle this capacity. Um, if we do that, we come closer to that. But I think most people think that the number is probably going to be more than just another two weeks. I think the reality is this may go on for a couple of months at different, a different frequency of cases, a different acceleration of the number mm -hmm. of new cases that we've seen. We know we need to be socially distancing right now, but when we eventually do come out of this, is there a right and a wrong way to ease out of social distancing? Do you just go back to life as normal or do you sort of need to work your way back out into the regular world? I, I think it's going to be a while before we unlearn the lessons that we've learned, you know, in this. I, I don't, and we're, everybody, the whole world is holding their breath with China as it's, you know, easing is, um, its, um, its guidance on social distancing. And they're doing it in, again, a, a graded uh, manner for exactly the reasons that you talked about, because you don't want to, the minute you let down the guard, you don't want to see that spike of cases again. Right. Um, but I, I think the lessons around, you know, maintaining good hand hygiene and, and being home when we're sick are things that probably I think are going to be ingrained in our culture, I hope, for a while, because those are the measures that will help us with the coronavirus if it returns in the fall, if with a flu season that occurs next year that happens every year. Um, all those things, I think, are, are going to be uh, something that we take away from this. Yeah, it, it seems like it'll be a while before we uh, get out of these good hand washing habits. I think a lot of folks are, are really uh, doing that as often as possible. And it's something that we've all become very accustomed to. Uh, let me ask you this. The FDA approved a coronavirus test that can get results in less than 15 minutes. Could that help us get a handle on this outbreak? Uh, the FDA actually was very busy at the end of last week and over the weekend. So aside from a whole slew of emergency use authorizations, so the, the permission to use these tests that look promising, they also released a whole number of guidance around, you know, how do you decontaminate your, the masks that healthcare workers are using, the N95s and others in the hospital setting? Yeah. How do we clean them in between uses? And so the test itself is promising because um, it's basically taking, again, the same type of samples from the person's body and running it uh, at a higher speed at 15 minutes and, and doing a lot more tests together. The real test of this will be when it gets rolled out in the clinical setting uh, to see if, if, it, if it has the same type of accuracy that they've seen when they're looking at it in the laboratory with clinical samples that they had in, in house. And so the kind of factors that matter there are, you know, how, how well are people collecting the samples? You know, how, how well are laboratories able to adopt the, the procedures to get the, the sensitivity and specificity, which is the ability of the test to actually detect a test? A disease when it resists and then to actually detect it compared to other diseases that might be present um, in the person. And so uh, a little bit to go. Cautious optimism on the test is going to make a huge difference in identifying mm -hmm. people. But but the other things that FDA has done, including the decon of uh, decontamination of masks, is also going to have a huge role in improving healthcare worker capacity and hospital capacity in, in taking care of these patients.
Yeah, you just mentioned a couple of times the new restrictions or the, the loosening of restrictions on sterilizing masks. Uh, what changes did the FDA make? You mentioned you think that'll be helpful? Yeah, so a few different ones. One thing that they did was, you know, as you know, the supply chains for respirator masks, the masks that we use in the, in the hospital setting, um, in patients particularly that we might be doing procedures in which the virus may be in the room for a longer period of time, those, those we've run out of a lot of supplies, right? And so what they did is, one, they said, what are the manufacturers that are foreign that hit the same level of technical specifications that you could buy from? So they laid out a guidance on how hospitals and others can acquire those tests. The second is they said, you know, the the you have these N95s. There are papers out there that have been around for a while, including uh, one by Patel, a study the company Patel did that looked at um, a technology that we use in the hospital all the time to actually decontaminate other uh, decontaminate other medical equipment, such as vaporized hydrogen peroxide. And so what they did was they provided an emergency use authorization to Patel. Um, and hopefully it's, it's the opening of, of, of others to be able to do the same, which is using this technology um, to show that you can, A, remove the virus from the mask in between use, and two, the, the mask itself does not lose its integrity, and so it's safe for healthcare workers to keep using it. So here's the awesome thing. With this technology, you could use the same mask as, well, as long as it's not damaged during use 20 times. So you're basically increasing the supply of masks by 20 times if wow. this, if this uh, procedure works. Uh, we've been talking about the masks that uh, medical professionals have been using. I know the advice for the average person has been not to purchase and use masks because you're taking them away from healthcare workers who need them. Your advice for people who are trying to go out, go to the grocery store when they need to, uh, how can they do those kinds of things and stay safe? Is there a smart way to either use gloves or hand sanitizers or wipes that can just help people uh, you know, do the basic things that they absolutely have to and get back home as safely as possible? Cells. And so important thing to sort of step back on this is how is this disease transmitted, right? It, it, it's in the fluid that's in, in the cough and the sneeze of someone who's sick. And the worst way to get exposed is to be around someone and they actually cough or sneeze on you uh, because mm -hmm. you get the virus. And then it gets transmitted into your ears, your nose, your eye, I'm sorry, your nose, your mouth, your eyes. And so, uh, but the other way that people get infected is when someone's sick, and they leave a little bit of the virus in the in the fluid that's coming from their cough and sneezing on the surface, and then you touch it. So it doesn't go through your hands. It's that you're taking your hands and then touching your face uh, with that. And so the great, um, I think, a great guide to do this is good hand hygiene always works. If you're doing some uh, work such as mm -hmm. actually taking care of someone who's sick at home, that's when gloves are really helpful because you know you might come into contact with a lot of those things that are dirty around the house. Uh, when you're outside, the biggest thing is, A, don't go outside if you're sick. If you can get help, ask others to get the things that you need uh, because you don't want to contribute to potentially, you know, putting this virus out there that others may be exposed to. Uh, but the other is when you're staying away from people who might be sick in the public, the use of masks is, you know, in the in the ideal setting, if used perfectly, the best use of it is when you're sick, putting it on so you don't make other people sick. But the, the difference is that when people use masks, I've seen them use it and they use their hands to sort of adjust their masks. And you're kind of defe defeating your, the purpose here when you're taking your hands and potentially touching your face, which is what you don't want to do. And so the, the big lesson here is that the first step is hand hygiene and cleaning surfaces and then isolating when you're sick and using a mask when you're sick. If you know how to use the mask properly, uh, potentially there could be some benefit, but really it's when you are sick that it plays the biggest role. All right, Dr. Bedelia, thank you so much for all of your great advice. We will try to keep up the uh, hand hygiene cleaning services and not touching our faces. I appreciate all the great advice. Amazon workers at a New York City warehouse walked off the job today. They're protesting how the companies handled the coronavirus outbreak. They say the safety protocols in place aren't enough to protect them. NBC News business and tech correspondent Jolene Kent joins me now. And Joe, great to have you with us. What do these Amazon workers want? What are they asking for today? They say that they're asking for the basics. They know that one person has tested positive for COVID-19, so they believe that there are other cases, and they don't believe they have enough personal protective equipment. And we're talking about the masks and the gloves that they want. There's also been discussion of social distancing and whether or not the adequate steps have been taken on that front. So that's the Staten Island case. We're also hearing of a new petition that's being circulated here in Southern California mm -hmm. in the Inland Empire at some of the... Uh, 
uh, fulfillment centers here. You may not know this, but uh, this area of Southern California has the largest concentration of Amazon fulfillment center, those warehouses, uh, where all of the orders are processed. So there are similar grievances and concerns here on the ground. But I do want to point out that Amazon did respond, and they told us that they believe that these okay. accusations are unfounded. They call their employees heroes fighting for their communities, and they do believe they're providing enough gear. Joe, we know Amazon isn't the only company that's facing some backlash right now. Instacart employees planned an emergency walk-off today also. What can you tell us about that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just got off the phone with one of the organizers, an Instacart shopper who's been shopping for Instacart for about five years. Their concern is also their own health. As they go into these grocery stores, what is it like to go in? How crowded it is? They're not being provided the sanitizer and the hazard pay and the sick pay that they believe they deserve as they serve on the front lines. As so many people are homebound and unable to do groceries, of course, Instacart is getting a huge surge in orders the same way Amazon has as well. So Instacart, mm. since we started reporting on this last week, they did say they will be providing a higher default level for tips and some bonus pay. And then after increased pressure over the weekend, they said they're sourcing and getting their own hand sanitizer out to their shoppers. But the Instacart uh, shopper that I spoke to in Chicago, Matthew Tellis, he says that, look, this is just not enough. It's part of a larger systemic problem of having these workers out during coronavirus, risking their lives, trying to deliver what basics so many people need. Yeah, Joe, they've just been doing incredible work, getting folks the things that they need, putting their own lives in danger to make sure that people have supplies, food, all the things they need in their homes during this crazy time. Uh, we are so grateful for all of the work that they are doing and thankful to you so much for your reporting today. Help has arrived in New York City, where right now there are more than 36 thousand coronavirus cases. The U.S. NS Comfort pulled into port this morning. It's here to primarily help hospitals that are just overwhelmed with patients. Here's New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio moments after the ship docked. It's a very emotional moment. Um, I went up on the roof here to watch the Comfort come in, and I had this incredible feeling of peace, actually, that help was finally coming, that um, we were not alone, so I'm going to keep calling the president, I'm going to keep appealing to him to get us all the help we need for these really tough weeks, and then again, we will turn around and help everyone else in this country right after. Rahima Ellis is at the pier in New York City where the U.S. NS Comfort is docked. Rahima, who will be treated on this ship? Well, this ship is to help ease the burden at our brick and mortar hospitals, if you will, who can now focus on COVID-19 patients. The people who are coming here will have other problems uh, health-wise, from minor to critical issues. All kinds of things continue to happen in the city beyond the COVID-19, but that and COVID-19 uh, going on in a hospital has just brought them to the brink of disaster. So. The mayor and the governor have been pleading for more facilities, more beds to come through. This one is a thousand bed facility, which will concentrate on that. So in addition to this, as you know, the Javits Center is going to be opening this week. That's another thousand beds of, of, of a field hospital. And then they have 68 beds that are opening up this week. And of all places, iconic Central Park in an effort again to ease the burden that's going on at our hospitals around the area. I should tell you this, Allison, just a few minutes ago, there was a, a, a large group of people who were gathered here to get a look at this ship. It is a comforting sight to see the USNS comfort here. But police are saying people gathering here is exactly what they don't want to happen. I heard you in the segment before talking about whether or not social distancing is working. So a police officer in his car over the loudspeaker just said a moment ago, this is not a tourist attraction. You have to move along because people were gathered too close together. That's one of the biggest things that both the mayor and the governor have been talking about, that while they are starting to see that the rate of doubling of cases is easing, one of the biggest concerns is making certain that people abide by the, the warnings, if you will, 
not to be too close together. Social distancing is the way that they can hopefully lower the intensity of the spread of this coronavirus. Even here in New York, Allison, what they've gone so far to do is they are removing the basketball hoops from some of the playgrounds in New York because people have been going out on the on very nice days, unlike today, and having pickup basketball games, running into each other, falling into each other, grabbing on each other, exactly what health officials say you should not do. Yeah, when the weather's nice in the city, you see a lot of folks out there, whether it's on the West Side Highway, in the parks, uh, along the river, uh, sometimes getting just a little bit too close. I'd like to ask you one more question uh, about this naval ship. This is not the first time the Comfort has been sent to New York City. Uh, can you tell us when it was here before? Uh, the last time was for 9-11. At that point, it was expected mm. that it might need to provide some assistance for those who might have been injured when those planes crashed into the Twin Towers. But unfortunately, nearly 3,000 people died. And what this ship was then turned into was really a comfort ship for those health, those health workers and first responders who found themselves overwhelmed with the task at hand. And they needed not only a place of respite, but also a place where they could come for some mental health counseling, if you will. And this ship provided that comfort for people back then, as it is providing assistance and comfort for people now. It's supposed to be up and running, they say, within the next 24 hours. Allison? The name of that ship, so appropriate. Thank you so much, Rahima. And a quick programming note for you tomorrow. Join Savannah Guthrie, Hoda Kotb, and the NBC News team for a live primetime special on the coronavirus pandemic. Our team of correspondents around the world will be providing critical, real-time information. Our experts will answer your questions about the coronavirus. That's tomorrow at 10 p.m. Eastern and Pacific on NBC, MSNBC, and right here on NBC News now. All right, let's go over now to Leanne Caldwell. She has the latest on the stimulus package from Capitol Hill. And Leanne, President Trump pushed back his social distancing uh, guidelines at least until April 30th. That means the economy is going to probably continue to take a hit for at least another month. What's Congress working on now to counter that? Yeah, Allison, Allison, Congress is under no impression that they are done with uh, trying to help this economy. They know that uh, the peak is still down the road and a lot more needs to be done. So what's happening on the Hill right now, while members are both all back in their districts, most of them anyway, in the House and the Senate, um, their aides and they're still talking on the phone trying to come up with what a phase four is going to look like. Um, I'm told by sources that they're starting those discussions now. They actually started them last week. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi has been pretty public with what she wants in the phase four of this bill. That includes additional money for states. Uh, we heard Governor Cuomo over the past week talking about how what they got in the phase three portion was not nearly enough. And so Pelosi agrees with that. She says states are going to need a lot more to deal with this crisis. In addition, uh, she is um, talking a lot about um, a beefed up family, uh, paid family medical leave um, and more things to help workers. She thinks that the corporations and the big businesses with their half a trillion dollars at least of loans that they're expected to get got plenty in this bill. And so she's looking at more help for individuals and small businesses, Allison. Leanne, we've heard quite a bit from uh, Pelosi, as you've said. Does that mean the House is taking the lead on this next bill? Uh, she, what Pelosi has said is that she thinks that the four corners should do that. And I do that in quotes because that means Pelosi, the Republican House leader McCarthy, uh, the Senate Democratic leader Schumer, and then, of course, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell. Um, it's unclear at this point. Uh, of course, the House and the Senate, they always battle with each other and they would want to be yeah. the lead writers in these sorts of legislation. But while Pelosi has her committees already working on this stuff, uh, the Senate is already going to work as well, too. Uh, we, it could be a much more equitable uh, participation where we saw in the second bill, uh, Pelosi took the lead. In the third bill, the Senate uh, took the lead. Um, the parameters are not worked out yet, but uh, they're all getting to work and trying to get their ideas in there first. 
Leanne, we know President Trump called into Fox News this morning. While he was uh, talking uh, with them, he reacted to some comments that Nancy Pelosi made about the president's early handling of this pandemic. Here's that exchange. When they see you and Cuomo uh, working together, I think people are heartened by it. But then when you see Speaker Pelosi come out and say, President Trump's denial at the beginning of this was deadly. As the president fiddles, people are dying. What's your reaction to that? Well, you know, it's a sad thing. Look, she's a uh, sick puppy, in my opinion. She really is. She's got a lot of problems, and that's a horrible thing to say. And I stopped all very, some very, very infected, very, very sick people, thousands coming in from China long earlier than anybody thought, including the experts. Nobody thought we should do it except me. You know, she doesn't mention that. And that was early. And don't forget, she was playing the impeachment game, you know, her game where she ended up looking like a fool. Leanna, a lot of Americans are concerned about wasting time, whether it's the Trump administration's initial response to the coronavirus pandemic or how long it took Congress to pass its last stimulus package. Can Democrats and Republicans work with the Trump administration quickly and effectively to get another package passed? Yeah, they've proven they've been able to do so um, twice now, really three times. They've they've passed three bills, but the president hasn't been involved in these negotiations. He's been he's been not even overseeing. He's been put afar. Uh, Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin is the person who's leading the negotiations on behalf of the White House, um, bringing the president in at the very last moment uh, to negotiate these things. We also know, Allison, that uh, Speaker Pelosi and the president haven't spoken in about five months since the very early stages of the impeachment process. Um, and so that relationship is completely broken down. But uh, with the Mnuchin at the helm, uh, talking with McConnell and Pelosi and Schumer and McCarthy, they've gotten things done. And I know that there's been a lot of criticism that it has taken a long time. But, you know, I, I err on the side of uh, one of the people who have covered Congress for quite a long time, and they have never Never worked at this speed yeah. before. Uh, being able to pass a $2 trillion bill in about a week is a phenomenal pace for Congress. And they're already at work again. Um, of course, there's lots of obstacles and bumps down the road. But people on both sides of the aisle in Congress both say that uh, if the president remains at arm's length, things can get done. Yeah, Leanne, one thing is for sure, what seems like a long time for the average American is pretty quick work uh, in the government. Uh, one more question on timing for you. Last week's stimulus package included money for Americans and American businesses that are struggling. Uh, back to this timeline issue, when can Americans expect to receive that government relief? Yeah, well, small businesses can start to apply for their loans um, already. Uh, you know, I called the Small Business Administration hotline last week, last Thursday, I believe it was, and their line was up and running, waiting to hear from small businesses on what their needs were. Um, as far as individuals for the direct payments, um, you know, we could expect people to get those within the next week and a half to two weeks. Uh, it still takes a while. It's not immediate. Um, if you did pay your taxes electronically and they have your bank account system through the IRS, then you're going to get your money a lot faster. If they have to mail you a check, it's going to take a little bit longer. It could take five weeks to get those checks. But as we all know, you know, mortgage and rent payments are due any day now. We're approaching the first of the month. And so that those checks cannot get out fast enough for so many Americans, Allison. Yeah, Leanne, Wednesday, the first coming quickly. I know a lot of people are concerned about that deadline to make payments. Leanne Caldwell, thanks so much for being with us. Always great to see you. Thank you. And the coronavirus crisis is impacting voter registration and raising concerns that many Americans might miss their chance to get on the rolls before November's presidential election. NBC News senior digital politics reporter Alex Seitz-Wald joins me now. Alex, how is the coronavirus crisis affecting voter registration? Yeah, Alison, well, this would typically be prime time for voter registration in a presidential election year, but everything is ground to a halt. You can't go out knocking on doors with clipboards to register people. You can't go to events. You can't even stand outside of a grocery store. Uh, DMVs, where about 45 percent of voter, voter registrations come from because of the Motor Voter Act, they're shut down. Libraries, uh, post offices, high schools where you can pick up a voter registration form, those are shut down 
too. So all of these groups that would right now be sending hundreds of people out into the field to be signing people up on the rolls, they've had to switch entirely to digital organizing, keep their people at home. And uh, there's a big concern that for young voters who are just turning 18, for people who have moved to new addresses and need to re-register, or people who just sat out the last few elections want to come uh, on the rolls now and participate, that they're not going to be able to because they, they want to have access to get on the rolls. This, Alex, you mentioned that this is really the crunch time when a lot of Americans register to vote, but you can register to vote year round. Why is it that in the months leading up to a presidential election, other uh, people sort of sort of make that rush? Yeah, that's right. I mean, it's really just the interest and attention that is on yeah. politics. Uh, you know, yes, you can register at any time. But in the run up to the 2016 election, uh, 77 and a half million Voter registration applications were filed. So that's a huge, you know, portion of the U.S. population. There's also a ton of money that gets poured in uh, to both Republican and Democratic efforts. That the parties themselves do registration, the campaigns do registration, and all these allied groups. So, uh, you know, if you're trying to get people to pay attention to politics, especially targeting people who are not typically involved in politics, which is who you're targeting with registration efforts, a time when people are typically paying attention to politics is the time to do it. Yeah, if we weren't dealing with coronavirus right now, I think people would be getting a lot of reminders that now is the time to think about uh, getting out and voting this fall. So what are some uh, alternatives for canvassers? Are there digital organizing options, things they can do uh, to sort of keep up their work? And what challenges are they facing on that front? Yeah, for sure. And this is actually one place uh, where the Internet can really come in handy. And there's been a lot of progress in states now, 40 states have online uh, voter registration, or, or 39 and, and one more is in the process of adopting it now. Uh, so that can be really helpful. And there are places like vote.org and other uh, groups that have been doing online voter registration for years. A lot of this has just come online in the past year. Uh, in New York, it was in January, just a couple months ago, that they set up the online voter registration system. But that still leaves people out. There are people who don't have access to the Internet, uh, visually disabled people who can't use the Internet in typical ways, people who have struggled with English. Uh, since, and sometimes you need to print out a form online and mail it in. A lot of people don't own printers. You can't go to a library to print it out. Uh, getting to a post office box would be tricky. There's, yes, there's access to a lot of parts of the country, but there's also a lot of people, uh, you know, the marginalized groups in general who are going to have a harder time even taking advantage of those options. A lot of challenges in our country right now. Even voter registration. Alex Seitzwald, thanks so much for being with us. Italy recorded its lowest number of new coronavirus cases since the country went into lockdown on March 10th. NBC News foreign correspondent Matt Bradley is in one of Europe's coronavirus hotspots. Yeah, Alison, you know, normally I'm the bearer of bad news from here in Italy, but today I have kind of mixed news. After two straight days of declines, it looks like the death rate has finally gone back up again. So there was some optimism that those two days of declining death rates from an all-time high just a couple of days ago might mean that Italy had turned the corner, but no, it looks like the deaths are uh, once again climbing. But, you know, we have to also look at other indicators. This has actually seen another record here in Italy, this time a positive one. We saw the highest single number of uh, recoveries recoveries in one day. That's the number of people who were deemed by doctors to have been fully recovered by the disease. That's now more than 1,500 in one day. That's a huge number and much higher than we've been seeing in the past couple days, the past couple weeks even. So that's a really good indicator. People uh, here in Italy are leaving the hospitals, not just dying. Because remember, Italy has an enormously high death rate one that's higher, far higher than the U.S. or China, even higher than countries like Iran. And that's why it has managed to now beat by twice the number that we've seen in China, even though China is a country that's about 25 times the size of Italy. So there was also another glimmer of hope in another indicator, and that was the number of people who have tested positive for this disease has now slowed. So in other words, we're still seeing a large number of people who are newly testing positive for COVID-19. But what we're actually seeing now is that that number is no longer rising exponentially. It's slowing down and starting to flatten. That's what we talk about when we say flattening the curve. In other words, it's no longer shooting up. It's kind of just rising in a straight line or even kind of slowing down a little bit. 
that's a good sign. And it's something that a lot of Italian epidemiologists and government officials had been waiting to see, because remember, this country is now well into its third week of a nationwide lockdown. And everybody here who's been sitting at home, and you can't even hear anything on the streets, they've been wondering for so long when they were finally going to start to see the effects of this lockdown in the actual statistics. Well, now we're starting to see not really, really positive signs, but we're starting to see what could be the beginning of the end. Now, I'm not going to go as far as to say that myself, because Italy has a way of surprising in a very, very negative way. So it, tomorrow we could wake up and, and see uh, really negative numbers once again. We've seen that before in the past when there's been a, like a slight change for the positive. It just goes right back into very, very negative numbers. But it looks like this could mean that the number of new transmissions is finally slowing down and could be a matter of weeks before the tide starts to turn. But Italian officials aren't going to be taking any chances with that, nor should they. They're going to be extending this national lockdown probably for another two weeks, well into mid-April. That's the prudent thing to do, and that's what it seems like Italian officials are going to be doing, despite the fact that, you know, just like everywhere in the world, this virus is having a devastating effect both on the economy and the national psyche. Michigan is becoming one of the nation's coronavirus hotspots with more than 5,000 confirmed cases and over 100 deaths. The state's governor asking for help, warning that their health systems are just overwhelmed. NBC News correspondent Morgan Radford is in Detroit. And Morgan, what are you hearing on the ground there? What are the most urgent needs in hospitals there right now? Well, right now they need personal protective equipment, Allison, but we also just got brand new numbers this hour from the governor. We now have nearly 6,500 cases here in the state of Michigan, making it the fourth largest total across the entire country. So that's what these new hot spots are up against. And right now we're standing in front of ground zero. This is Henry Ford Hospital behind me here in Detroit, and they are servicing about one third of those coronavirus patients here. Inside behind me, there's almost 300 positive cases inside. Now, if you remember, just a few days ago, there was a leaked memo from that hospital, and they essentially outlined what they would do if resources became even more scarce than they are right now. And they said, effectively, their doctors are going to have to make the difficult decision about who lives and who dies, who gets that life-saving treatment. So, as you can imagine, that sent a ripple shock through the community and certainly throughout the country when people realize that those are the types of decisions our American doctors will be having to face if they cannot get their hands on the resources they need. But these aren't just the, the only first responders who are taking a hit, Allison. Also, we've got almost 500 police officers just in the city of Detroit who are now in quarantine. The chief of police has also uh, been tested positive for coronavirus. And also in the fire department, there are also 109 people who have been affected uh, by this pandemic. So oh. these are some harsh numbers here in the city of Detroit. And part of the concern is that, you know, we've been paying a lot of attention to these coastal cities. I know I've been reporting in New York and New Jersey. Our colleagues have been reporting out in California and the state of Washington. And so these Midwestern cities and these hot spots now, as they've been deemed, they're worried. Are they going to be behind those coastal cities yeah. when it comes to getting in line for that protective gear? And that's what their doctors are facing. And when I spoke to the chief operating officer of this hospital, he said, we have enough for today, but the question is tomorrow. Allison. Oh, what a what a big question there. Morgan, we know private companies like the automakers are trying to jump in and help out. What have they been able to do to help there? Yeah, that's what's really fascinating. Look, I, I love Motor City. Uh, I come here a lot. My fiance is from here. And what's really impressive about this place is the people. Um, they have obviously a huge manufacturing presence here. And so you've got these entire auto factories that are now converting their factories to make medical supplies. And that's just to create a stopgap. So that's how important it is for these people, members of this community, to come together and help the very people who are on the front lines inside, like the hospitals one behind me. It is an incredible city. What I would say about that memo that was leaked is it was one page of a multi-page document that is normal for organizations to put in place through ethicists to really make sure that if we ever got to a point where we had to make very, very difficult decisions that we would in advance have tested the thinking and the protocols around that. We are not there, um, but I think advanced organizations really make sure that they're looking at things from all levels because you never want to make those decisions at the time that you have no choice. 
So, Allison, that was Bob Briney. He's the CEO that I mentioned speaking to here at the hospital. And what was heartening about what he said was that he said, look, this is, of course, a startling memo to someone who's just reading it for the first time. But the reality is that any advanced healthcare system or any advanced unit that functions like a healthcare system needs to have some sort of protocol like this in place. I think it's just hard for people like you and me who don't have medical degrees. If we have, you know, older people that we love and care about, nobody wants to hear that, you know, they're only going to give priority to the people who have a higher likelihood of surviving. It's a hard thing to hear, but he's saying that's a tough type of decision that people have to make in situations like this and one that they hope they never will have to make. Allison. All right, Morgan, thanks so much. And uh, thank you for helping us out there. I know we put the sound before the question, but you clear things up nicely. Appreciate you. Hey, everyone, I'm Allison Mars. You are watching NBC News Now. Welcome to my home studio. Let's go over to NBC News Now correspondent Alexa Liotto. She has the latest coronavirus headlines from NBCNews.com. Hey, Allison, lots of developments this evening. California has seen the number of hospitalizations double in the last four days and the number of patients admitted to the ICU triple as a result of COVID-19. California Governor Gavin Newsom calling on medical professionals to volunteer to help with the crisis. Virginia Governor Ralph Northam issued a stay-at-home order today impacting 8.5 million residents similar to other states. Virginia residents are allowed to leave their homes for essential trips only, like going to the pharmacy the uh, grocery store or for exercise. That's from NBC's Alicia Fieldstad. And Maryland also issuing a stay-at-home order for all residents today, adding that any person who has traveled outside of the state in recent weeks should self-quarantine for 14 days. Some workers at Amazon's Fulfillment Center in Staten Island walked out in protest today over the company's handling of the coronavirus pandemic. I'm doing this because of my health and my fellow workers' health as well. It should be closed down. It should be cleaned properly. Amazon told WNBC's Miles Miller of the more than 5,000 employees working at the Staten Island warehouse, 15 people, less than half a percent, participated in the walkout. They also said that the company has, quote, taken extreme measures to keep people safe. They say that includes, quote, tripling down on cleaning and procuring safety supplies as well. Some grim numbers from NBC's Yulia Tomazan and Hernan Munoz Rato. Spain officially surpassed China in terms of the total number of reported coronavirus infections. Spain's health ministry on Monday reporting just over 85,000 total cases, higher than China's reported total, which currently stands at 81,470. And just as a reminder for viewers, the United States has the most confirmed coronavirus cases of any country worldwide, with more than 140,000. That's according to the latest NBC News count. From NBC's Courtney Cuby, the Pentagon is instructing commanders at American military installations, both domestic and abroad, to stop providing specific numbers on COVID-19 cases to the media and to the public. A spokesman for the Pentagon cited operational security concerns and said they'd be providing numbers for each service, but not base-specific